Section 1 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew, 1812-1887. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. The Destroyers of Vermin Part 1 The Rat Killer In the Brill, or rather in Brill Place, Somerstown, there is a variety of courts branching out into Chapel Street, and in one of the most angular and obscure of these is to be found a perfect nest of rat catchers. Not altogether professional rat catchers, but for the most part, sporting mechanics and costermongers. The court is not easily to be found, being inhabited by men not so well known in the immediate neighbourhood as perhaps a mile or two away, and only to be discovered by the aid and direction of the little girl at the neighbouring cat's meat shop. My first experience of this court was the usual disturbance at the entrance. I found one end or branch of it filled with a mob of eager listeners, principally women, all attracted to a particular house by the sounds of quarrelling. One man gave it as his opinion that the disturbers must have earned too much money yesterday, and a woman speaking to another who had just come out, lifting up both her hands and laughing, said, Here they are, at it again. The rat killer whom we were in search of was out at his stall in Chapel Street when we called, but his wife soon fetched him. He was a strong, sturdy-looking man, rather above the middle height, with light hair, ending in sandy whiskers, reaching under his chin, sharp, deep-set eyes, a tight, skinned nose that looked as if the cuticle had been stretched to its utmost on its bridge. He was dressed in the ordinary corduroy costermonger habit, having, in addition, a dark blue guernsey drawn over his waistcoat. The man's first anxiety was to show us that rats were not his only diversion, and in consequence he took us into the yard of the house, where in a shed lay a bulldog, a bull bitch, and a litter of pups just a week old. They did not belong to him, but he said he did a good deal in the way of curing dogs when he could get them. On a shelf in this shed were two large dishes, the one containing mussels without the shells, and the other eels. These are the commodities in which he deals at present, so that he is properly what one would call a pickled eel seller. We found his room on the first floor clean and tidy, of a good size, containing two bedsteads and a large sea chest, besides an old-fashioned rickety mahogany table, while in a far corner of the room, perhaps waiting for the cold weather and the winter's fire, was an armchair. Behind the door hung a couple of dog leads made of strong leather and ornamented with brass. Against one side of the wall were two framed engravings of animals and a sort of chart of animated nature, while over the mantel shelf was a variety of most characteristic articles. Among these appeared a model of a bulldog's head, cut out of sandstone and painted in imitation of nature, a most marvellous piece of ugliness. He was the best dog I ever see, said the host, and when I parted with him for a ten-pound note, a man as worked in the new road took and made this model. He was a real beauty, was that dog. The man as carved that there didn't have no difficulty in holding him still, because he was very good at that sort of thing, and when he'd looked at anything, he couldn't be off doing it. There were also a great many common prints about the walls, a penny each frame and all, among which were four dogs, all ratting, a gamecock, two Robinson Crusoes, and three scripture subjects. There was, besides, a photograph of another favourite dog, which he'd had give him. The man apologised for the bareness of the room, but said, You see, master, my brother went over to America, contracting for a railway under Pito's, and they sends to me about a year ago, telling me to get together as many likely fellows as I could, about a dozen, and take them over as excavators, and when I was ready, to go to Pito's and get what money I wanted. But when I'd got the men, 
sold off all my sticks, and went for the money, they told me my brother had got plenty, and that, if he wanted me, he ought to be ashamed of himself, not to send some over himself. So I just got together these few things again, and I ain't heard of nothing at all about it since. After I had satisfied him that I was not a collector of dog tax, trying to find out how many animals he kept, he gave me what he evidently thought was a treat, a peep at his bulldog, which he fetched from upstairs, and let it jump about the room with a most unpleasant liberty, informing me the while how he had given five pound for him, and that one of the first pups he had got by a bull he had got five pounds for, and that cleared him. That punch, note the bulldog's name, end note, he said, is as quiet as a lamb, wouldn't hurt nobody. I frequently takes him through the streets without a lead. Certainly he killed a cat the t'other afternoon, but he couldn't help that, cause the cat flew at him, though he took it as quietly as a man would a woman in a passion, and only went at her just to save his eyes. But you couldn't easy get him off, master, when he once got a hold. He was a good one for rats, and, he believed, the staunchest and tricksiest dog in London. When he had taken the brute upstairs, for which I was not a little thankful, the man made the following statement. I am a Londoner. I've travelled all about the country. I'm a native of Ivor in Buckinghamshire. I've been three year here at these lodgings, and five year in London altogether up to last September. Before I come to London, I was nothing, sir, a labouring man, an excavator. I come to London the same as the rest, to do anything I could. I was at work at the excavations at King's Cross Station. I work as hard as any man in London, I think. When the station was finished, I, having a large family, thought I'd do the best I could, so I went to the foreman at the Caledonian sawmills. I stopped there a twelve month, but one day I went for a load and a half of lime, and where you fetches a load and a half of lime, they always gives you fourpence. So as I was having a pint of beer out of it, my master came by and saw me drinking, and gave me the sack. Then he wanted me to ax his pardon, and I might stop. But I told him I wouldn't beg no one's pardon for drinking a pint of beer as was give me. So I left there. Ever since the Great Western was begun, my family has been distributed all over the country, wherever there was a railway making. My brothers were contractors for Pito, and I generally worked for my brothers, but they have gone to America and taken a contract for a railway at St. John's, New Brunswick, British North America. I can do anything in the excavating way. I don't care what it is. After I left the Caledonian sawmills, I went to Billingsgate and bought anything I could see a chance of getting a shilling out on, or towards keeping my family. All my lifetime I've been a-dealing a little in rats, but it was not till I come to London that I turned my mind fully to that sort of thing. My father always had a great notion of the same. We all like the sport. When any on us was in the country and the farmers wanted us to, we'd do it. If anybody here tell of my being an activish chap like in that sort of way, they'd get me to come for a day or so. If anybody has a place that's eaten up with rats, I goes and gets some ferrets and takes a dog, if I've got one, and manages to kill him. Sometimes I keep my own ferrets, but mostly I borrows them. This young man that's with me, he'll sometimes have an order to go fifty or sixty mile into the country, and then he buys his ferrets or gets them the best way he can. They charges a good sum for the loan of them, sometimes as much as you get for the job. You can buy ferrets at Leadenhall Market for five shillings or seven shillings. It all depends. You can't get them all at one price. Some of them is real cowards to what others is. Some won't even kill a rat. The way we tries them is we puts them down anywhere, in a room maybe, with a rat. And if they smell about or won't go up to it, why, they won't do. Because you see, sometimes the ferret has to go up a hole and at the end there may be a dozen or sixteen rats. And if he hasn't got the heart to tackle one on him, why, he ain't worth a farm. I have kept ferrets for four or five months at a time, but they're nasty, stinking things. I've had them get loose, but, bless you, they do no harm. They're as innocent as cats. They won't hurt nothing. You can play with them like a kitten. Some puts things down to catch rats. 
sorts of pison, which is their secret. But I don't. I relies upon my dogs and ferrets, and nothing else. I went to destroy a few rats up at Russell Square. There was a shore come right along, and a few holes. They was swarmed with them there, and didn't know how it was. But the cleverest men in the world couldn't catch many there, cause you see, master, they run down the hole into the shore, and no dog could get through a rat hole. I couldn't get my living, though, at that business. If any gentleman comes to me and says he wants a dog cured or a few rats destroyed, I does it. In the country they give you fourpence a rat, and you can kill sometimes as many in a farmyard as you can in London. The most I ever got for destroying rats was four bob, and then I filled up the brickwork and made the holes good, for there was no more come. I calls myself a coster. Some calls ourselves general dealers, but I doesn't. I goes to market, and if one thing don't suit, why, I buys another. I don't know whether you've heard of it, master, or not, but I'm the man, as they say, kills rats. That's to say, I kills them like a dog. I'm almost ashamed to mention it, and I shall never do it any more, but I've killed rats for a wager often. You see, it's often been done like for a lark. We've been all together daring one another and trying to do something as nobody else could. I remember the first time I did it for a wager. I was up at blank, where they've got a pit. There was a bulldog a-killing rats, so I says, Oh, that's a duffing dog. Any dog could kill quicker than him. I'd kill again him myself. Well, then they chafed me, and I weren't going to be done, so I says, I'll kill again that dog for a sovereign. The sovereign was staked. I went down to kill eight rats again the dog, and I beat him. I killed him like a dog, with my teeth. I went down hands and knees and bit him. I've done it three times for a sovereign, and I've won each time. I feels very much ashamed of it, though. On the hind part of my neck, as you may see, sir, there's a scar. That's where I was bit by one. The rat twisted itself round and held on like a vice. It was very bad, sir, for a long time. It festered and broke out once or twice. But it's all right now. Rats the rat, though small, weak, and contemptible in its appearance, possesses properties that render it a more formidable enemy to mankind, and more injurious to the interests of society, than even those animals that are endued with the greatest strength and the most rapacious dispositions. To the one we can oppose united powers and superior arts. With regard to the other, experience has convinced us that no art can counteract the effects of its amazing fecundity, and that force is ineffectually directed against an animal possessed of such variety of means to elude it. There are two kinds of rats known in this country. The black rat, which was formerly universal here, but is now very rarely seen, having been almost extirpated by the large brown kind, which is generally distinguished by the name of the Norway rat. This formidable invader is now universally diffused through the whole country, from whence every method has been tried in vain to exterminate it. This species is about nine inches long, of a light brown colour, mixed with tawny and ash. The throat and belly are of a dirty white, inclining to grey. Its feet are naked and of a pale flesh colour. The tail is as long as the body, covered with minute dusky scales, thinly interspersed with short hairs. In summer it frequents the banks of rivers, ponds and ditches, where it lives on frogs, fishes and small animals. But its rapacity is not entirely confined to these. It destroys rabbits, poultry, young pigeons and so on. It infests the granary, the barn and the storehouse, does infinite mischief among corn and fruit of all kinds and not content with satisfying its hunger, frequently carries off large quantities to its hiding place. It is a bold and fierce little animal, and when closely pursued, will turn and fasten on its assailant. Its bite is keen, and the wound it inflicts is painful and difficult to heal, owing to the form of its teeth, which are long, sharp, and of an irregular shape. The rat is amazingly prolific, usually producing from 12 to 18 young ones at any time. Their numbers would soon increase beyond all power of restraint, 
were it not for an insatiable appetite that impels them to destroy and devour each other. The weaker always fall a prey to the stronger, and a large male rat, which usually lives by itself, is dreaded by those of its own species as their most formidable enemy. It is a singular fact in the history of those animals that the skins of such of them as have been devoured in their holes have frequently been found curiously turned inside out, every part being completely inverted, even to the ends of the toes. How the operation is performed, it would be difficult to ascertain, but it appears to be effected in some peculiar mode of eating out the contents. Besides the numbers that perish in these unnatural conflicts, they have many fierce and inveterate enemies that take every occasion to destroy them. Mankind has contrived various methods of exterminating these bold intruders. For this purpose, traps are often found ineffectual, such being the sagacity of the animals, that when any are drawn into the snare, the others, by such means, learn to avoid the dangerous allurement, notwithstanding the utmost caution may have been used to conceal the design. The surest method of killing them is by poison. Nux vomica, ground and mixed with oatmeal, with a small proportion of oil of rhodium and musk, have been found from experience to be very effectual. The water rat is somewhat smaller than the Norway rat, its head larger and its nose thicker. Its eyes are small, its ears short, scarcely appearing through the hair. Its teeth are large, strong and yellow. The hair on its body thicker and longer than that of the common rat, and chiefly of a dark brown colour mixed with red. The belly is grey, the tail five inches long, covered with short black hairs, and the tip with white. The water rat generally frequents the sides of rivers, ponds and ditches, where it burrows and forms its nest. It feeds on frogs, small fish and spawn, swims and dives remarkably fast and can continue a long time under water. In Mr. Charles Fothergill's Essay on the Philosophy, Study and Use of Natural History, 1813, we find some reflections which remind us of Ray and Durham. We shall extract a few paragraphs which relate to the subject in hand. Quote, Nothing can afford a finer illustration of the beautiful order and simplicity of the laws which govern the creation than the certainty, precision and regularity with which the natural checks in the superabundant increase of each tribe of animals are managed. And every family is subject to the operation of checks peculiar to the species, whatever it may be, and established by a wise law of the Most High to counteract the fatal effects that might arise from an ever-active populative principle. It is by the admirable disposition of these checks, the contemplation of which is alone sufficient to astonish the loftiest and most comprehensive soul of man, that the whole system of animal life in all its various forms is kept in due strength and equilibrium. This subject is worthy of the naturalist's most serious consideration. This great law, Mr. F. proceeds, pervades and affects the whole animal creation, and so active, unwearied and rapid is the principle of increase over the means of subsistence amongst the inferior animals that it is evident whole genera of carnivorous beings amongst beasts, birds, fish, reptiles and insects have been created for the express purpose, note, question mark, end note, of suppressing the redundancy of others and restraining their numbers within proper limits. But even the natural checks are insufficient to restrain the effects of a too rapid populative principle in some animals, which have therefore certain destructive propensities given to them by the Creator, that operate powerfully upon themselves and their offspring, as may be particularly observed in the natural history of the rabbit, but which is still more evidently and strikingly displayed in the life and economy of the rat. It has been calculated by Mr. Pennant, and there can be no doubt of the truth of the statement, that the astonishing number of 1,274,840 
may be produced from a single pair of rabbits in the short space of four years, as these animals in their wild state breed seven times in a year and generally produce eight young ones each time. They are capable of procreation at the age of five or six months, and the doe carries her burden no more than thirty days. But the principle of increase is much more powerful, active and effective in the common grey rat than in any other animal of equal size. This destructive animal is continually under the furore of animal love. The female carries her young for one month only, and she seldom or never produces a less number than twelve, but sometimes as many as eighteen at a litter. The medium number may be taken for an average, and the period of gestation, though of such short continuance, is confined to no particular season of the year. The embraces of the male are admitted immediately after the birth of the vindictive progeny, and it is a fact which I have ascertained beyond any doubt that the female suckles her young ones almost to the very moment when another litter is dropping into the world as their successors. A celebrated Yorkshire rat catcher, whom I have occasionally employed, one day killed a large female rat that was in the act of suckling twelve young ones, which had attained a very considerable growth. Nevertheless, upon opening her swollen body, he found thirteen quick young that were within a few days of their birth. Supposing, therefore, that the rat produces ten litters in the course of a year, and that no check on their increase should operate destructively for the space of four years, a number not far short of three million might be produced from a single pair in that time. Now the consequence of such an active and productive principle of increase, if suffered continually to operate without check, would soon be fatally obvious. We have heard of fertile plains devastated and large towns undermined in Spain by rabbits, and even that a military force from Rome was once requested of the great Augustus to suppress the astonishing numbers of the same animal overrunning the island of Majorca and Menorca. This circumstance is recorded by Pliny. If, therefore, rats were suffered to multiply without the restraint of the most powerful and positive natural checks, not only would fertile plains and rich cities be undermined and destroyed, but the whole surface of the earth in a very few years would be rendered a barren and hideous waste, covered with myriads of famished grey rats, against which man himself would contend in vain. But the same Almighty Being who perceived a necessity for their existence has also restricted their numbers within proper bounds by creating to them many very powerful enemies, and still more effectually by establishing a propensity in themselves, the gratification of which has continually the effect of lessening their numbers, even more than any of their foreign enemies. The male rat has an insatiable thirst for the blood of his own offspring. The female, being aware of this passion, hides her young in such secret places as she supposes likely to escape notice or discovery, till her progeny are old enough to venture forth and stand upon their own energies. But notwithstanding this precaution, the male rat frequently discovers them and destroys as many as he can nor is the defence of the mother any very effectual protection, since she herself sometimes falls a victim to her temerity and her maternal tenderness. Besides this propensity to the destruction of their own offspring when other food fails them, rats hunt down and prey upon each other with the most ferocious and desperate avidity, inasmuch as it not unfrequently happens in a colony of these destructive animals that a single male of more than ordinary powers, after having overcome and devoured all competitors, with the exception of a few females, reigns the sole bloody and much dreaded tyrant over a considerable territory, dwelling by himself in some solitary hole, and never appearing abroad without spreading terror and dismay, even amongst the females whose embraces he seeks. 
In this relentless and bloody character may be found one of the most powerful and positive of the checks which operate to the repression of this species within proper bounds, a character which attaches in a greater or less degree to the whole moose genus, and in which we may readily perceive the cause of the extirpation of the old black rats of England, mus ratus, for the large grey rats, having superior bodily powers united to the same carnivorous propensities, would easily conquer and destroy their black opponents wherever they could be found, and whenever they met to dispute the title of possession or of sovereignty. End quote. When the young rats begin to issue from their holes, the mother watches, defends, and even fights with the cats in order to save them. A large rat is more mischievous than a young cat, and nearly as strong. The rat uses her foreteeth, and the cat makes most use of her claws, so that the latter requires both to be vigorous and accustomed to fight in order to destroy her adversary. The weasel, though smaller, is a much more dangerous and formidable enemy to the rat, because it can follow it into its retreat. Its strength being nearly equal to that of the rat, the combat often continues for a long time. But the method of using their arms by the opponents is very different. The rat wounds only by repeated strokes with his foreteeth, which are better formed for gnawing than biting and being situated at the extremity of the lever, or jaw, they have not much force. But the weasel bites cruelly with the whole jaw, and instead of letting go its hold, sucks the blood from the wounded part, so that the rat is always killed. End of section one. Section two. Of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Destroyers of Vermin, Part 2. A Night at Rat Killing. Considering the immense number of rats which form an article of commerce with many of the lower orders whose business it is to keep them for the purpose of rat matches, I thought it necessary, for the full elucidation of my subject, to visit the well-known public house in London, where, on a certain night in the week, a pit is built up, and regular rat-killing matches take place, and where those who have sporting dogs, or are anxious to test their qualities, can, after such matches are finished, purchase half a dozen or a dozen rats for them to practice upon, and judge for themselves of their dogs' performances. To quote the words printed on the proprietor's card, quote, he is always at his old house at home as usual to discuss the fancy generally, end quote. I arrived at about eight o'clock at the tavern where the performances were to take place. I was too early, but there was plenty to occupy my leisure in looking at the curious scene around me and taking notes of the habits and conversation of the customers who were flocking in. The front of the long bar was crowded with men of every grade of society, all smoking, drinking, and talking about dogs. Many of them had brought with them their fancy animals, so that a kind of canine exhibition was going on. Some carried under their arm small bulldogs, whose flat pink noses rubbed against my arm as I passed. Others had sky terriers, curled up like balls of hair, and sleeping like children, as they were nursed by their owners. The only animals that seemed awake, and under continual excitement, were the little brown English terriers, who, despite the neat black leathern collars by which they were held, struggled to get loose, as if they smelt the rats in the room above, and were impatient to begin the fray. There is a business-like look about this tavern, which at once lets you into the character of the person who owns it. The drinking seems to have been a secondary notion in its formation, for it is a low-roofed room without any of those adornments which are now generally considered so necessary to render a public house attractive. The tubs where the spirits are kept are blistered with the heat of the gas, 
and so dirty that the once brilliant gilt hoops are now quite black. Sleeping on an old hall chair lay an enormous white bulldog, a great beauty, as I was informed, with a head as round and smooth as a clenched boxing glove, and seemingly too large for the body. Its forehead appeared to protrude in a manner significant of water on the brain, and almost overhung the short nose through which the animal breathed heavily. When this dog, which was the admiration of all beholders, rose up, its legs were as bowed as a tailor's, leaving a peculiar pear-shaped opening between them, which, I was informed, was one of its points of beauty. It was a white dog with a sore look from its being peculiarly pink round the eyes, nose, and indeed at all the edges of its body. On the other side of the fireplace was a white bull terrier dog with a black patch over the eye, which gave him rather a disreputable look. This animal was watching the movements of the customers in front, and occasionally, when the entrance door was swung back, would give a growl of inquiry as to what the fresh comer wanted. The proprietor was kind enough to inform me, as he patted this animal's ribs, which showed like the hoops on a butter firkin, that he considered there had been a little of the greyhound in some of his back generations. About the walls were hung clusters of black leather collars, adorned with brass rings and clasps, and preeminent was a silver dog collar, which, from the conversation of those about me, I learnt was to be the prize in a rat match, to be killed for in a fortnight's time. As the visitors poured in, they, at the request of the proprietor, not to block up the bar, took their seats in the parlour, and, accompanied by a waiter who kept shouting, "'Give your orders, gentlemen!' I entered the room. I found that, like the bar, no pains had been taken to render the room attractive to the customers, for with the exception of the sporting pictures hung against the dingy paper, it was devoid of all adornment. Over the fireplace were square glazed boxes, in which were the stuffed forms of dogs famous in their day. Preeminent among the prints was that representing the wonder tiny. Five pounds and a half in weight, as he appeared killing two hundred rats. This engraving had a singular look from its having been printed upon a silk handkerchief. Tiny had been a great favourite with the proprietor and used to wear a lady's bracelet as a collar. Among the stuffed heads was one of a white bulldog with tremendous glass eyes sticking out as if it had died of strangulation. The proprietor's son was kind enough to explain to me the qualities that had once belonged to this favourite. They've spoilt her in stuffing, sir, he said. Made her so short in the head. But she was the wonder of her day. There wasn't a dog in England as would come nigh her. There's her daughter, he added, pointing to another head, something like that of a seal. But she wasn't reckoned half as handsome as her mother, though she was very much admired in her time. That there is a dog, he continued, pointing to one represented with a rat in its mouth. It was as good as any in England, though it's so small. I've seen her kill a dozen rats, almost as big as herself, though they killed her at last. For sewer rats are dreadful for giving dogs canker in the mouth. And she wore herself out with continually killing them, though we always rinsed her mouth out well with peppermint and water while she were at work. When rats bite, they are poisonous, and an ulcer is formed, which we were obliged to lance. That's what killed her. The company assembled in the parlour consisted of sporting men, or those who, from curiosity, had come to witness what a rat match was like. Seated at the same table, talking together, were those dressed in the costermonger's suit of corduroy, soldiers with their uniforms carelessly unbuttoned, coachmen in their livery, and tradesmen who had slipped on their evening frock coats and run out from the shop to see the sport. The dogs belonging to the company were standing on the different tables, or tied to the legs of the farms, or sleeping in their owner's arms, and were in turn minutely criticised, their limbs being stretched out as if they were being felt for fractures, and their mouths looked into as if a dentist were examining their teeth. Nearly all the little animals were marked with scars from bites. 
Pity to bring him up to rat killing, said one who had been admiring a fierce looking bull terrier, although he did not mention at the same time what line in life the little animal ought to pursue. At another table, one man was declaring that his pet animal was the exact image of the celebrated rat killing dog, Billy at the same time pointing to the picture against the wall of that famous animal as he performed his wonderful feat of killing five hundred rats in five minutes and a half. There were amongst the visitors some French gentlemen who had evidently witnessed nothing of the kind before, and whilst they endeavoured to drink their hot gin and water, they made their interpreter translate to them the contents of a large placard hung upon a hat-peg and headed, Every man has his fancy, ratting sports in reality. About nine o'clock, the proprietor took the chair in the parlour, at the same time giving the order to shut up the shutters in the room above and light up the pit. This announcement seemed to arouse the spirits of the impatient assembly, and even the dogs tied to the legs of the tables ran out to the length of their leathern thongs, and their tails curled like eels as if they understood the meaning of the words. "'Why, that's the little champion,' said the proprietor, patting a dog with thighs like a grasshopper, and whose mouth opened back to its ears. "'Well, it is a beauty. I wish I could gammon you to take a fiver for it.' Then, looking round the room, he added, "'Well, gents, I'm glad to see you look so comfortable.' The performances of the evening were somewhat hurried on by the entering of a young gentleman whom the waiters called Cap'n. "'Now, Jem, when is this match coming off?' the captain asked impatiently, and despite the assurance that they were getting ready, he threatened to leave the place if kept waiting much longer. This young officer seemed to be a great fancier of dogs, for he made the round of the room, handling each animal in its turn feeling and squeezing its feet and scrutinizing its eyes and limbs with such minuteness that the French gentlemen were forced to inquire who he was. There was no announcement that the room above was ready, though everybody seemed to understand it, for all rose at once, and mounting the broad wooden staircase, which led to what was once the drawing-room, dropped their shillings into the hand of the proprietor and entered the rat-killing apartment. The pit, as it is called, consists of a small circus, some six feet in diameter. It is about as large as a centre flower bed, and is fitted with a high wooden rim that reaches to elbow height. Over it, the branches of a gas lamp are arranged, which light up the white painted floor, and every part of the little arena. On one side of the room is a recess, which the proprietor calls his private box and this apartment the captain and his friend soon took possession of, whilst the audience generally clambered upon the tables and forms, or hung over the sides of the pit itself. All the little dogs which the visitors had brought up with them were now squalling and barking and struggling in their master's arms, as if they were thoroughly acquainted with the uses of the pit, and when a rusty wire cage of rats, filled with the dark moving mass, was brought forward, the noise of the dogs was so great that the proprietor was obliged to shout out, Now, you that have dogs, do make them shut up. The captain was the first to jump into the pit. A man wanted to sell him a bull terrier, spotted like a fancy rabbit, and a dozen of rats was the consequent order. The captain preferred pulling the rats out of the cage himself, laying hold of them by their tails and jerking them into the arena. He was cautioned by one of the men not to let them bite him, for, Believe me, were the words, You'll never forget, Cap'n. These here are none of the cleanest. Whilst the rats were being counted out, some of those that had been taken from the cage ran about the painted floor and climbed up the young officer's legs, making him shake them off and exclaim, Get out, you varmint! Whilst others of the ugly little animals sat upon their hind legs, cleaning their faces with their paws. When the dog in question was brought forth and shown the dozen rats, he grew excited and stretched himself in his owner's arms, whilst all the other animals joined in a full chorus of whining. "'Chuck him in!' said the captain. 
and over went the dog, and in a second the rats were running round the circus, or trying to hide themselves between the small openings in the boards round the pit. Although the proprietor of the dog endeavoured to speak up for it by declaring it was a good un and a very pretty performer, still it was evidently not worth much in a rat-killing sense, and if it had not been for his second, who beat the sides of the pit with his hand and shouted, Hi! Hi! At him! in a most bewildering manner, we doubt if the terrier would not have preferred leaving the rats to themselves to enjoy their lives. Some of the rats, when the dog advanced towards them, sprang up in his face, making him draw back with astonishment. Others, as he bit them, curled round in his mouth and fastened on his nose, so that he had to carry them as a cat does its kittens. It also required many shouts of, Drop it, dead him! before he would leave those he had killed. We cannot say whether the dog was eventually bought, but from its owners exclaiming, in a kind of apologetic tone, Why, he never saw a rat before in all his life! We fancy no dealings took place. The captain seemed anxious to see as much sport as he could, for he frequently asked those who carried dogs in their arms whether his little one would kill, and appeared sorry when such answers were given as, My dog's mouth's a little out of order, Captain, or I've only tried him at very small ones. One little dog was put in the pit to amuse himself with the dead bodies. He seized hold of one almost as big as himself, shook it furiously till the head thumped the floor like a drumstick, making those around shout with laughter, and causing one man to exclaim, He's a good un at shaking heads and tails, ain't he? Preparations now began for the grand match of the evening, in which fifty rats were to be killed. The dead uns were gathered up by their tails and flung into the corner. The floor was swept, and a big flat basket produced, like those in which chickens are brought to market, and under whose iron wire top could be seen small mounds of closely packed rats. This match seemed to be between the proprietor and his son, and the stake to be gained was only a bottle of lemonade, of which the father stipulated he should have first drink. It was strange to observe the daring manner in which the lad introduced his hand into the rat cage, sometimes keeping it there for more than a minute at a time, as he fumbled about and stirred up with his fingers the living mass, picking out, as he had been requested, only the big uns. When the fifty animals had been flung into the pit, they gathered themselves together into a mound, which reached one-third up the sides, and which reminded one of the heap of hair-sweepings in a barber's shop after a heavy day's cutting. These were all sewer and water-ditch rats, and the smell that rose from them was like that from a hot drain. The captain amused himself by flicking at them with his pocket-handkerchief, and offering them the lighted end of his cigar, which the little creatures tamely snuffed at and drew back from as they singed their noses. It was also a favourite amusement to blow on the mound of rats, for they seemed to dislike the cold wind which sent them fluttering about like so many feathers. Indeed, whilst the match was going on, whenever the little animals collected together and formed a barricade, as it were, to the dog, the cry of, blow on him, blow on him, was given by the spectators, and the dog's second puffed at them as if extinguishing a fire, when they would dart off like so many sparks. The company was kept waiting so long for the match to begin, that the impatient captain again threatened to leave the house, and was only quieted by the proprietor's reply of, My dear friend, be easy, the boy's on the stairs with the dog and true enough, we shortly heard a wheezing and a screaming in the passage without, as if some strong-winded animal were being strangled, and presently a boy entered, carrying in his arms a bull terrier in a perfect fit of excitement, foaming at the mouth and stretching its neck forward so that the collar which held it back seemed to be cutting its throat in two. The animal was nearly mad with rage, scratching and struggling to get loose. Lay hold a little closer up to the head, or he'll turn round and nip ya, said the proprietor to his son. 
Whilst the gasping dog was fastened up in a corner to writhe its impatience away, the landlord made inquiries for a stopwatch and also for an umpire to decide, as he added, whether the rats were dead or alive when they're killed, as Paddy says. When all the arrangements had been made, the second and the dog jumped into the pit, and after letting him see him a bit, the terrier was let loose. The moment the dog was free, he became quiet in a most business-like manner, and rushed at the rats, burying his nose in the mound, till he brought out one in his mouth. In a short time, a dozen rats with wetted necks were lying bleeding on the floor, and the white paint of the pit became grained with blood. In a little time, the terrier had a rat hanging to his nose, which, despite his tossing, still held on. He dashed up against the sides, leaving a patch of blood as if a strawberry had been smashed there. "'He doesn't squeal, that's one good thing,' said one of the lookers-on. As the rats fell on their sides after a bite, they were collected together in the centre, where they lay quivering in their death grasps. "'Hi, butcher! Hi, butcher!' shouted the second. "'Good dog! Brrrr!' And he beat the sides of the pit like a drum, till the dog flew about with new life. Dead and drop it, he cried, when the terrier nosed at a rat kicking on its side, as it slowly expired of its broken neck. Time, said the proprietor, when four of the eight minutes had expired, and the dog was caught up and held panting, his neck stretched out like a serpent's, staring intently at the rats, which still kept crawling about. The poor little wretches, in this brief interval, as if forgetting their danger, again commenced cleaning themselves, some nibbling the ends of their tails, others hopping about, going now to the legs of the lad in the pit and sniffing at his trousers, or, strange to say, advancing, smelling, to within a few paces of their enemy, the dog. The dog lost the match, and the proprietor, we presume, honourably paid the bottle of lemonade to his son. But he was evidently displeased with the dog's behaviour, for he said, He won't do for me. He's not one of my sort. Here, Jim, tell Mr. G. He may have him if he likes. I won't give him house room. A plentiful shower of halfpence was thrown into the pit as a reward for the second who had backed the dog. A slight pause now took place in the proceedings, during which the landlord requested that the gentlemen would give their minds up to drinking. You know the love I have for you, he added jocularly, and that I don't care for any of you, whilst the waiter accompanied the invitation with a cry of, Give your orders, gentlemen, and the lad with the rats asked if any other gentleman would like any rats. Several other dogs were tried, and amongst them one who, from the size of his stomach, had evidently been accustomed to large dinners, and looked upon rat-killing as a sport and not as a business. The appearance of this fat animal was greeted with remarks such as, Why don't you feed your dog? and You shouldn't give him more than five meals a day. Another impatient bull terrier was thrown into the midst of a dozen rats. He did his duty so well that the admiration of the spectators was focused upon him. Ah, said one, he'd do better at a hundred than twelve. Whilst another observed, rat killing's his game, I can see. While the landlord himself said, he's a very pretty creature, and I'd back him to kill against anybody's dog at eight and a half or nine. The captain was so startled with this terrier's cleverness that he vowed that if she could kill fifteen in a minute, he'd give a hundred guineas for her. It was nearly twelve o'clock before the evening's performance concluded. Several of the spectators tried their dogs upon two or three rats, either the biggest or the smallest that could be found, and many offers as to what he wanted for the dog, and many inquiries as to who was its father, were made before the company broke up. At last the landlord, finding that no gentleman would like a few rats, and that his exhortations to give their minds up to drinking, produced no further effect upon the company, spoke the epilogue of the rat tragedies in these words, quote, 
Gentlemen, I give a very handsome solid silver collar to be killed for next Tuesday. Open to all the world, only they must be novice dogs, or at least such as is not considered phenomenons. We shall have plenty of sport, gentlemen, and there will be loads of rat killing. I hope to see all my kind friends, not forgetting your dogs likewise, and may they be like the Irishmen all over, who had good trouble to catch and kill em, and took good care they didn't come to life again. Gentlemen, there is a good parlour downstairs where we meet for harmony and entertainment. End quote. Jimmy Shaw the proprietor of one of the largest sporting public houses in London, who is celebrated for the rat matches which come off weekly at his establishment, was kind enough to favour me with a few details as to the quality of those animals which are destroyed in his pit. His statement was certainly one of the most curious that I have listened to, and it was given to me with a readiness and a courtesy of manner such as I have not often met with during my researches. The landlord himself is known in pugilistic circles as one of the most skilful boxers among what is termed the lightweights. His statement is curious, as a proof of the large trade which is carried on in these animals, for it would seem that the men who make a business of catching rats are not always employed as exterminators for they make a good living as purveyors for supplying the demands of the sporting portion of London. The poor people, said the sporting landlord, who supply me with rats, are what you may call barn door labouring poor, for they are the most ignorant people I ever come near. Really, you would not believe people could live in such ignorance. Talk about Latin and Greek, sir. Why, English is Latin to them. In fact, I have a difficulty to understand them myself. When the harvest is got in, they go hunting the hedges and ditches for rats. Once, the farmers had to pay tuppence a head for all rats caught on their grounds, and they nailed them up against the wall. But now that the rat catchers can get threepence each by bringing the vermin up to town, the farmers don't pay them anything for what they catch but merely give them permission to hunt them in their stacks and barns, so that they no longer get their tuppence in the country, though they get their threepence in town. I have some twenty families depending upon me. From Clavering in Essex, I suppose I have hundreds of thousands of rats sent to me in wire cages, fitted into baskets. From Enfield I have a great quantity, but the catchers don't get them all there but travel round the country for scores of miles, for you see threepence ahead is money. Besides, there are some liberal farmers who will still give them a halfpenny ahead into the bargain. Enfield is a kind of headquarters for rat catchers. It's dangerous work, though, for you see, there is a wonderful deal of difference in the species of rats. The bite of sewer or water ditch rats is very bad. The water and ditch rat lives on filth. But your barn rat is a plump fellow, and he lives on the best of everything. He's well off. There's as much difference between the barn and sewer rats as between a brewer's horse and a costermonger's. Sewer rats are very bad for dogs. Their coats is poisonous. Some of the rats that are brought to me are caught in the warehouses in the city. Wherever there is anything in the shape of provisions, there you are sure to find Mr. Rat, an intruder. The catchers are paid for catching them in the warehouses, and then they are sold to me as well, so the men must make a good thing of it. Many of the more courageous kind of warehousemen will take a pleasure in hunting the rats themselves. I should think I buy, in the course of the year, on the average, from 300 to 700 rats a week. Note, Taking 500 as the weekly average, this gives a yearly purchase of 26,000 live rats. End note. That's what I kill taking all the year round, you see. Some first-class chaps will come here in the daytime and they'll try their dogs. They'll say, Jimmy, give the dog a hundred. After he's polished them off, they'll say perhaps, hang it, give him another hundred. Bless you, he added in a kind of whisper. 
I've had noble ladies and titled ladies come here to see the sport, on the quiet, you know. When my wife was here, they would come regular, but now she's away, they don't come so often. The largest quantity of rats I've bought from one man was five guineas worth, or thirty-five dozen, at threepence a head, and that's a load for a horse. This man comes up from Clavering in a kind of cart, with a horse that's a regular phenomena, for it ain't like a beast nor nothing. I pays him a good deal of money at times, and I'm sure I can't tell what he does with it, but they do tell me that he deals in old iron and goes buying it up though he don't seem to have much of a headpiece for that sort of fancy neither. During the harvest time, the rats run scarcer, you see, and the catcher turns up, rat-catching, for harvest work. After the harvest, rats get plentiful again. I've had as many as two thousand rats in this very house at one time. They'll consume a sack of barley meal in a week, and the brutes, if you don't give em good stuff, they'll eat one another, hang em. I'm the oldest canine fancier in London, and I'm the first that started ratting. In fact, I know I'm the oldest caterer in rat killing in the metropolis. I began as a lad, and I had many noble friends, and was as good a man then as I am now. In fact, when I was seventeen or eighteen years of age, I was just like what my boy is now. I used at that time to be a great public character, and had many liberal friends. Very liberal friends. I used to give them rat sports, and I have kept to it ever since. My boy can handle rats now just as I used to then. Have I been bit by them? Hi, hundreds of times. Now some people will say, rub yourself over with caraway and stuff, and then the rats won't bite you. But I give you my word and honour it's all nonsense, sir. As I said, I was the first in London to give rat sports, and I've kept to it ever since. Bless you, there's nothing that a rat won't bite through. I've seen my lads standing in the pit with the rats running about them, and if they haven't taken the precaution to tie their trousers round with a bit of string at the bottom, they'd have as many as five or six rats run up their trouser legs. They'll deliberately take off their clothes and pick them out from their shirts and bosoms and breeches. Some people is amused, and others is horror-struck. People have asked them whether they ain't rubbed. They'll say, yes, but that's as a lark, cause sometimes when my boy has been taking the rats out of the cage, and somebody has taken his attention off talking to him, he has had a bite, and will turn to me with his finger bleeding and say, yes, I'm rubbed, ain't I, father? Look here. A rat's bite is very singular. It's a three-cornered one, like a leech's. Only deeper, of course, and it will bleed for ever such a time. My boys have sometimes had their fingers go dreadfully bad from rat bites, so that they turn all black and putrid-like, aye, as black as the horse hair covering to my sofa. People have said to me, you ought to send the lad to the hospital and have his finger took off. But I've always left it to the lads, and they've said, oh, don't mind it, father, it'll get all right by and by, and so it has. The best thing I ever found for a rat bite was the thick bottoms of porter casks put on as a poultice. The only thing you can do is to poultice, and these porter bottoms is so powerful and draws so that they'll actually take thorns out of horses' hoofs and feet after steeplechasing. In handling rats, it's nothing more in the world but nerve that does it. I should faint now if a rat was to run up my breeches, but I have known the time when I've been covered with them. I generally throw my dead rats away now, but two or three years since, my boys took the idea of skinning them into their heads, and they did about three hundred of them, and their skins was very promising. The boys was, after all, obliged to give them away to a furrier, for my wife didn't like the notion, and I said, throw them away, but the idea strikes me to be something, and one that is lost sight of, for the skins are warm and handsome-looking, a beautiful grey. There's nothing turned so quickly as dead rats, so I am obliged to have my dustmen come round every Wednesday morning, and regularly enough they call too, for they know where there is a bob and a pot. I generally prefer using the authorised dustmen, though the others come sometimes, the flying dustmen they call them, and if they're first, they has the job. 
It strikes me, though, that to throw away so many valuable skins is a good thing lost sight of. The rats want a deal of watching and a deal of sorting. Now, you can't put a sewer and a barn rat together. It's like putting a Russian and a Turk under the same roof. I can tell a barn rat from a ship rat or a sewer rat in a minute, and I have to look over my stock when they come in or they'd fight to the death. There are six or seven different kinds of rats, and if we don't sort them, they tear one another to pieces. I think when I have a number of rats in the house that I am a lucky man if I don't find a dozen dead when I go up to them in the morning, and when I tell you that at times, when I've wanted to make up my number for a match, I have given twenty-one shillings for twenty rats. You may think I lose something that way every year. Rats even now is occasionally six shillings a dozen, but that, I think, is most inconsistent. If I had my will, I wouldn't allow sewer ratting, for the rats in the shores eats up a great quantity of sewer filth and rubbish, and is another species of scavenger in their own way. After finishing his statement, the landlord showed me some very curious specimens of tame rats, some piebald and others quite white, with pink eyes, which he kept in cages in his sitting room. He took them out from their cages and handled them without the least fear, and even handled them rather rudely, as he showed me the peculiarities of their colours. Yet the little tame creatures did not once attempt to bite him. Indeed, they appeared to have lost the notion of regaining their liberty, and when near their cages, struggled to return to their nests. In one of these boxes, a black and a white rat were confined together, and the proprietor, pointing to them, remarked, I hope they'll breed, for though white rats is very scarce, only occurring, in fact, by a freak of nature, I fancy I shall be able, with time and trouble, to breed them myself. The old English rat is a small jet-black rat, but the first white rat, as I heard of, come out of a burial ground. At one time I bred rats very largely, but now I leaves that fancy to my boys, for I've as much as I can do, continuing to serve my worthy patrons. End of section 2 Section 3 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Destroyers of Vermin, Part 3. Jack Black. As I wished to obtain the best information about rat and vermin destroying, I thought I could not do better now than apply to that eminent authority, the Queen's Rat Catcher and accordingly I sought an interview with Mr. Jack Black, whose handbills are headed, quote, V.R. Rat and Mole Destroyer to Her Majesty, end quote. I had already had a statement from the Royal Bug Destroyer relative to the habits and means of exterminating those offensive vermin, and I was desirous of pairing it with an account of the personal experience of the Queen of England's rat catcher. In the sporting world, and among his regular customers, the Queen's Rat Catcher is better known by the name of Jack Black. He enjoys the reputation of being the most fearless handler of rats of any man living, playing with them, as one man expressed it to me, as if they were so many blind kittens. The first time I ever saw Mr. Black was in the streets of London, at the corner of Hart Street, where he was exhibiting the rapid effects of his rat poison by placing some of it in the mouth of a living animal. He had a cart then with rats painted on the panels, and at the tailboard, where he stood lecturing, he had a kind of stage rigged up, on which were cages filled with rats and pills and poison packages. Here I saw him dip his hand into this cage of rats and take out as many as he could hold, a feat which generally caused an oh of wonder to escape from the crowd, especially when they observed that his hands were unbitten. Women more particularly shuddered when they beheld him place some half-dozen of the dusty-looking brutes within his shirt next his skin, and men swore the animals had been tamed as he let them run up his arms like squirrels, 
and the people gathered round beheld them sitting on his shoulders cleaning their faces with their front paws or rising up on their hind legs like little kangaroos and sniffing about his ears and cheeks but those who knew mr black better were well aware that the animals he took up in his hand were as wild as any of the rats in the sewers of london and that the only mystery in the exhibition was that of a man having courage enough to undertake the work i afterwards visited jack black at his house in battersea i had some difficulty in discovering his country residence and was indebted to a group of children gathered round and staring at the bird-cage in the window of his cottage for his address their exclamations of delight at a grey parrot climbing with his beak and claws about the zinc wires of his cage and the hopping of the little linnets there in the square boxes scarcely bigger than a brick made me glance up at the door to discover who the bird fancier was when painted on a bit of zinc just large enough to fit the shaft of a tax cart i saw the words j black rat destroyer to her majesty surmounted by the royal initials v r together with the painting of a white rat mr black was out sparrer catching as his wife informed me for he had an order for three dozen which was to be shot in a match at some tea gardens close by when i called again mr black had returned and i found him kneeling before a big rusty iron wire cage as large as a sea chest and transferring the sparrows from his bird-catching apparatus to the more roomy prison he transacted a little business before i spoke to him for the boys about the door were asking can i have one for a penny master there is evidently a great art in handling birds for when mr black held one he took hold of it by the wings and tail so that the little creature seemed to be sitting upright and had not a feather rumpled while it stretched out its neck and looked around it the boys on the contrary first made them flutter their feathers as rough as a hairball and then half smothered them between their two hands by holding them as if they wished to keep them hot i was soon at home with mr black he was a very different man from what i had expected to meet for there was an expression of kindliness in his countenance a quality which does not exactly agree with one's preconceived notions of rat-catchers his face had a strange appearance from his rough uncombed hair being nearly grey and his eyebrows and whiskers black so that he looked as if he wore powder mr black informed me that the big iron wire cage in which the sparrows were fluttering about had been constructed by him for rats and that it held over a thousand when full for rats are packed like cups he said one over the other but he added business is bad for rats and it makes a splendid havery besides sparrers is the rats of birds sir for if you look at them in the cage they always huddles up in a corner like rats in a pit and they are almost vermin in colour and habits and eats anything the rat catcher's parlour was more like a shop than a family apartment in a box with iron bars before it like a rabbit hutch was a white ferret twisting its long thin body with a snake-like motion up and down the length of its prison as restlessly as if it were a miniature polar bear when mr black called polly to the ferret it came to the bars and fixed its pink eyes on him a child lying on the floor poked its fingers into the cage but polly only smelt at them and finding them not good to eat went away mr black stuffs animals and birds and also catches fish for viveria against the walls were the furred and feathered remains of departed favourites each in its glazed box and appropriate attitude there was a famous polecat a first rater at rats we were informed here a ferret that never was equalled this canary had earned pounds that linnet was the wonder of its day the enormous pot-bellied carp with the miniature rushes painted at the back of its case was caught in the regent's park waters in another part of the room hung fishing lines and a badger's skin and lead bobs and curious eel hooks 
the latter as big as the curls on the temples of a Spanish dancer, and from here Mr. Black took down a transparent-looking fish, like a slip of parchment, and told me that it was a fresh-water smelt, and that he caught it in the Thames, the first he ever heard of. Then he showed me a beetle suspended to a piece of thread, like a big spider to its web, and this, he informed me, was the Thames beetle, which either lived by land or water. You get em, continued Mr. Black, when they are swimming on their backs, which is their nature, and when they turns over, you find them beautifully crossed and marked. Round the room were hung paper bags, like those in which housewives keep their sweet herbs. All of them there, sir, contain cured fish for eating, Mr. Black explained to me. I'm called down here the Battersea Otter, he went on, for I can go out at four in the morning and come home by eight with a barrow full of fresh water fish. Nobody knows how I do it, because I never takes no nets or lines with me. I assure them I catch em with my hands, which I do, but they only laugh incredulous like. I knows the fishes' hearts and watches the tides. I sells fresh fish perch, roach, dace, gudgeon, and such like, and even small jack, at threepence a pound, or what they'll fetch. And I've caught near the Wandsworth Black Sea, as we calls it, half a hundredweight sometimes, and I never took less than my handkerchief full. I was inclined, like the inhabitants of Battersea, to be incredulous of the rat catcher's hand fishing, until, under a promise of secrecy, he confided his process to me. And then not only was I perfectly convinced of its truth, but startled that so simple a method had never before been taken advantage of. Later in the day, Mr. Black became very communicative. We sat chatting together in his sanded bird shop, and he told me all his misfortunes, and how bad luck had pressed upon him and driven him out of London. I was fool enough to take a public house in Regent Street, sir, he said. My daughter used to dress as the rat catcher's daughter and serve behind the bar, and that did pretty well for a time, but it was a brewer's house and they ruined me. The costume of the rat catcher's daughter was shown to me by her mother. It was a red velvet bodice embroidered with silver lace. With a muslin skirt and her hair down her back, she looked very genteel, added the parent. Mr. Black's chief complaint was that he could not make an appearance, for his uniform, a beautiful green coat and red waistcoat, were pledged. Whilst giving me his statement, Mr. Black, in proof of his assertions of the biting powers of rats, drew my attention to the leathern breeches he wore, as were given him twelve years ago by Captain B. These were pierced in some places with the teeth of the animals, and in others were scratched and fringed, like the wash-leather of a street knife-seller. His hands, too, and even his face, had scars upon them from bites. Mr. Black informed me that he had given up tobacco since a accident he met with from a pipe. I was smoking a pipe, he said, and a friend of mine by chance jobbed it into my mouth, and it went right through to the back of my palate, and I nearly died. Here his wife added, There's a hole there to this day you could put your thumb into. You never saw such a mouth. Mr. Black informed me in secret that he had often, unbeknown to his wife, tasted what cooked rats were like, and he asserted that they were as moist as rabbits and quite as nice. If they are sure rats, he continued, just chase them for two or three days before you kill them. And they are as good as barn rats, I give you my word, sir. Mr. Black's statement was as follows, quote, I should think I've been a ratting almost for five and thirty year. Indeed, I may say from my childhood, for I've kept at it almost all my life. I've been dead near three times from bites, as near as a toucher. I once had the teeth of a rat break in my finger, which was dreadful bad, and swole and putrefied so that I had to have the broken bits pulled out with tweezers. When the bite is a bad one, it festers and forms a hard core in the ulcer, which is very painful and throbs very much indeed, 
and after that core comes away, unless you cleans them out, well, the sores, even after they seem to be healed, break out over and over again, and never cure perfectly. This core is as big as a boiled fish's eye, and as hard as a stone. I generally cuts the bite out clean with a lancet, and squeege the humour well from it, and that's the only way to cure it thorough. As you see, my hands is all covered with scars from bites. The worst bite I ever had was at the manor house, Hornsey, kept by Mr. Burnell. One day when I was there, he had some rats get loose, and he asked me to catch them for him, as they was wanted for a match that was coming on that afternoon. I had picked up a lot, indeed, I had one in each hand, and another again my knee, when I happened to come to a sheaf of straw, which I turned over, and there was a rat there. I couldn't lay hold on him, cause my hands was full, and as I stooped down, he ran up the sleeve of my coat and bit me on the muscle of the arm. I shall never forget it. It turned me all of a sudden and made me feel numb. In less than half an hour, I was took so bad I was obliged to be sent home, and I had to get someone to drive my cart for me. It was terrible to see the blood that came from me. I bled awful. Burnell, seeing me go so queer, says, Here, Jack, take some brandy. You look so awful bad. The arm swole and went as heavy as a ton weight pretty well, so that I couldn't even lift it and so painful I couldn't bear my wife to ferment it. I was kept in bed for two months through that bite at Burnell's. I was so weak I couldn't stand, and I was dreadful feverish, all warmth-like. I knew I was going to die, cause I remember the doctor coming and opening my eyes to see if I was still alive. I've been bitten nearly everywhere, even where I can't name to you, sir, and right through my thumbnail too, which, as you see, always has a split in it though it's years since I was winded. I suffered as much from that bite on my thumb as anything. It went right up to my ear. I felt the pain in both places at once, a regular twinge, like touching the nerve of a tooth. The thumb went black, and I was told I ought to have it off, but I knew a young chap at the Middlesex Hospital who wasn't out of his time, and he said, No, I wouldn't, Jack, and no more I did. And he used to strap it up for me. But the worst of it was, I had a job at Camden Town one afternoon after he had dressed the wound, and I got another bite lowered down on the same thumb, and that flung me down in my bed, and there I stopped, I should think, six weeks. I was bit bad too in Edward Street, Hampstead Road, and that time I was sick near three months and close upon dying. Whether it was the poison of the bite or the medicine the doctor gave me, I can't say, but the flesh seemed to swell up like a bladder regular blood like After all, I think I cured myself by cheating the doctor, as they calls it, for instead of taking the medicine, I used to go to Mr. Lank's house in Albany Street, note the publican, end note, and he'd say, What'll you have, Jack? And I used to take a glass of stout, and that seemed to give me strength to overcome the pison of the bite, for I began to pick up as soon as I left off doctor's stuff. When a rat's bite touches the bone, it makes you faint in a minute, and it bleeds dreadful. Ah, most terrible. Just as if you had been struck with a penknife. You couldn't believe the quantity of blood that come away, sir. The first rats I caught was when I was about nine years of age. I catched them at Mr. Strickland's, a large cowkeeper in Little Albany Street, Regent's Park. At that time, it was all fields and meadows in them parts and I recollect there was a big orchard on one side of the sheds. I was only doing it for a game, and there was lots of ladies and gents looking on and wondering at seeing me taking the rats out from under a heap of old bricks and wood where they had collected themselves. I had a little dog, a little redden it was, who was well known through the fancy, and I wanted the rats for to test my dog with, I being a lad what was fond of the sport. I wasn't afraid to handle rats even then, it seemed to come natural to me. I very soon had some in my pocket and some in my hands, carrying them away as fast as I could and putting them into my wire cage. You see, the rats began to run as soon as we shifted them bricks, and I had to scramble for them. Many of them bit me, and to tell you the truth, I didn't know the bites were so many, or I dare say I shouldn't have been so venturesome as I was. After that, I bought some ferrets, four of them, off a man of the name of Butler, what was in the rat-catching line, and afterwards went out to Jamaica to kill rats there. 
I was getting on to ten years of age then, and I was, I think, the first that regularly began hunting rats to exterminate them, for all those before me used to do it with drugs, and perhaps never handled rats in their lives. With my ferrets, I at first used to go out hunting rats round by the ponds in Regent's Park, and the ditches, and in the cow sheds round about. People never paid me for catching, though maybe, if they was very much infested, they might give me a trifle. But I used to make my money by selling the rats to gents as was fond of sport, and wanted them for their little dogs. I kept to this till I was thirteen or fourteen year of age, always using the ferrets, and I bred from them too. Indeed, I still got the strain, note, breed, end note, of them same ferrets by me now. I've sold them ferrets about everywhere. To Jim Byrne I've sold some of the strain, and to Mr. Anderson, the provision merchant, and to a man that went to Ireland. Indeed, that strain of ferrets has gone nearly all over the world. I never lost a ferret out ratting. I always let them loose, and put a bell on mine, arranged in a peculiar manner, which is a secret. And I then put them into the main run of the rats, and let them go to work. But they must be ferrets that's well trained for working dwellings, or you'll lose them as safe as death. I've had them go away two houses off and come back to me. My ferrets is very tame, and so well trained, that I'd put them into a house and guarantee that they'd come back to me. In Grosvenor Street, I was clearing once, and the ferrets went next door and nearly cleared the house, which is the Honourable Mrs. F.'s, before they came back to me. Ferrets are very dangerous to handle if not well trained. They are very savage, and will attack a man or a child as well as a rat. It was well known at Mr. Hamilton's at Hampstead, it's years ago this is, there was a ferret that got loose what killed a child, and was found sucking it. The bite of him is very dangerous, not so poisonous as a rat's, but very painful. And when the little things is hungry, they'll attack anything. I've seen two of them kill a cat, and then they'll suck the blood till they fill themselves, after which they'll fall off like leeches. The weasel and the stoat are, I think, more dangerous than the ferret in their bite. I had a stoat once, which I caught when out ratting at Hampstead for Mr. Cunningham the butcher, and it bit one of my dogs, Black Bess by name, the truest bitch in the world, sir, in the mouth, and she died three days afterwards at the ball at Kilburn. I was along with Captain K, who'd come out to see the sport, and whilst we were at dinner and the poor bitch lying under my chair, my boy says, says he, Father, Black Bess is dying and had scarce spoke the speech when she was dead. It was all through the bite of that stoat, for I opened the wound in the lip, and it was all swole and dreadful ulcerated, and all down the throat it was inflamed most shocking, and so was the lungs quite red and fiery. She was hot with work when she got the bite, and perhaps that made her take the poison quicker. To give you a proof, sir, of the savage nature of the ferrets, I was one night at Jimmy Shaw's, where there was a match to come off with rats, which the ferret was to kill, and young Bob Shaw, note Jim's son, end note, was holding the ferret up to his mouth and giving it spittle, when the animal seized him by the lip and bit it right through, and hung on as tight as a vice, which shows the spitefulness of the ferret, and how it will attack the human frame. Young Shaw still held the ferret in his hand, whilst it was fastened to his lip and he was saying, oh, oh, in pain. You see, I think Jim kept it very hard to make it kill the rats better. There was some nobleman there, and also Mr. George of Kensal Newtown was there, which is one of the largest dog fanciers we have. To make the ferret leave go of young Shaw, they bit its feet and tail, and it wouldn't, cause, as I could have told him, it only made it bite all the more. At last, Mr. George says he to me, For God's sake, Jack, take the ferret off. I didn't like to intrude myself upon the company before, not being in my own place, and I didn't know how Jimmy would take it. Everybody in the room was at a standstill, quite horrified, and Jimmy himself was in a dreadful way for his boy. I went up and quietly forced my thumb into his mouth and loosed him, and he killed a dozen rats after that. They all said, "'Bravo, Jack, you are a plucked one.' And the little chap said, "'Well, Jack, I didn't like to holler, but it was dreadful painful.' 
his lips swole up directly, as big as a nigger's, and the company made a collection for the lad of some dozen shillings. This shows that, although a ferret will kill a rat, yet, like the rat, it is always wicious, and will attack the human frame. When I was about fifteen, sir, I turned to bird-fancying. I was very fond of the sombre linnet. I was very successful in raising them, and sold them for a deal of money. I've got the strain of them by me now. I've raised them from some I purchased from a person in the coal-yard, Drury Lane. I give him two pounds for one of the periwinkle strain, but afterwards I heard of a person with, as I thought, a better strain, Lawson of Holloway, and I went and give him thirty shillings for a bird. I then raised them. I used to go and catch the nestlings off the common and raise them under the old trained birds. Originally, Linnets was taught to sing by a bird organ, principally among the weavers years ago, but I used to make the old birds teach the young ones. I used to molt them off in the dark by covering the cages up, and then they'd learn from hearing the old ones singing and would take the song. If any did not sing perfectly, I used to sell them as cast-offs. The Linnets is a beautiful song. There are four and twenty changes in a linnet song. It's one of the beautifulest songbirds we've got. It sings toys, as I call them. That is, it makes sounds which we distinguish in the fancy as the tolloc eek eek quick wheat, single eek eek quick wheats, or eek eek quick chowls, each pipe chowl, laugh, each pow chowls, rattle, pipe, fear, pew, and poi. This seems like great to you, sir, but it's the tunes we use in the fancy. What we terms fear is a sound like fear, as if they was frightened. Laugh is a kind of shake, nearly the same as the rattle. I know the sounds of all the English birds and what they say. I could tell you about the nightingale, the black cap, hedge warbler, garden warbler, petty chat, red start, a beautiful songbird, the willow wren, little warblers they are, Linnets, or any of them, for I have got their sounds in my ear and my mouth. As if to prove this, he drew from a side pocket a couple of tin bird whistles which were attached by a string to a buttonhole. He instantly began to imitate the different birds, commencing with their call, and then explaining how, when answered to in such a way, they gave another note, and how, if still responded to, they uttered a different sound. In fact, he gave me the whole of the conversation he usually carried on with the different kinds of birds, each one being, as it were, in a different language. He also showed me how he allured them to him when they were in the air, singing in the distance, and he did this by giving their entire song. His cheeks and throat seemed to be in constant motion as he filled the room with his loud imitations of the lark, and so closely did he resemble the notes of the bird that it was no longer any wonder how the little things could be deceived. In the same manner he illustrated the songs of the nightingale and so many birds that I did not recognise the names of some of them. He knew all their habits as well as notes, and repeated to me the peculiar chirp they make on rising from the ground, as well as the sound by which he distinguishes that it is uneasy with curiosity, or that it has settled on a tree. Indeed, he appeared to be acquainted with all the chirps which distinguished any action in the bird, up to the point when, as he told me, it circles about and then falls like a stone to the ground with its pitch. The nightingale, he continued, is a beautiful songbird. They're plucky birds too, and they hear a call and answer to anybody, and when taken in April, they're plucked enough to sing as soon as put in a cage. I can catch a nightingale in less than five minutes. As soon as he calls, I calls to him with my mouth, and he'll answer me, both by night or day, either from a spinny, note, a little copse, end note, a dell or a wood, wherever he may be. I make my scrapes, note, that is, clear away the dirt, end note, set my traps and catch them, almost before I've tried my luck. I've kept sometimes thirty in a day, for although people have got a notion that nightingales is scarce, still those who can distinguish their song in the daytime know that they are plentiful enough, almost like the lark. You see, persons fancy that them nightingales as sings at night is the only ones living, but it's wrong. 
for many of them only sings in the day. You see, it was when I was about eighteen I was beginning to get such a judge about birds, sir. I sold to a butcher of the name of Jackson, the first young un that I made money out of, for two pounds it was, and I've sold loads of em since for thirty shillings or two pounds each, and I've got the strain by me now. I've also got by me now the bird that won the match at Mr. Lockwood's in Drury Lane, and won the return match at my own place in High Street, Marabun. It was in the presence of all the fancy. He's multied pied, note, piebald, end note, since, and gone a little white on the head and the back. We only sang for two pounds a side. It wasn't a great deal of money. In our matches we sing by both gas and daylight. He was a master baker I sang against, but I forget his name. They do call him Holy Face, but that's a nickname, because he's very much pockmarked. I wouldn't sell that bird at all for anything. I've been offered ten pounds for it. Captain K put ten sovereigns down on the counter for him, and I wouldn't pick him up, for I've sold lots of his strain for a pound each. When I found I was a master of the birds, then I turned to my rat business again. I had a little rat dog, a black tan terrier of the name of Billy, which was the greatest stock dog in London of that day. He is the father of the greatest portion of the small black tan dogs in London now, which Mr. Isaac, the bird fancier in Princess Street, purchased one of the strain for six or seven pounds, which Jimmy Massey afterwards purchased another of the strain for a monkey, a bottle of wine, and three pounds. That was the rummest bargain I ever made. I've raised and trained monkeys by shoals. Some of mine is about now in shows exhibiting, one in particular, Jimmy. One of the strain of this little black tan dog would draw a badger twelve or fourteen pounds to his six pounds, which was done for a wager, because it was thought the badger had his teeth drawn, but he hadn't, as was proved by his biting Mr. P from Birmingham, for he took a piece clean out of his trousers, which was pretty good proof, and astonished them all in the room. I've been offered a sovereign a pound for some of my little terriers, but it wouldn't pay me at that price for they weren't heavier than two or three pounds. I once sold one of the dogs of this same strain for fourteen pounds to the Austrian ambassador. Mrs. H., the banker's lady, wished to get my strain of terriers, and she gave me five pounds for the use of him. In fact, my terrier dog was known to all the London fancy. As rat-killing dogs, there's no equal to that strain of black tan terriers. It's fifteen years ago since I first worked for government. I found that the parks was much infested with rats, which had undermined the bridges and gnawed the drains, and I made application to Mr. Westley, who was superintendent of the park, and he spoke of it, and then it was wrote to me that I was to fulfil the situation, and I was to have six pounds a year, but after that it was altered, and I was to have so much ahead, which is threepence. After that, Newton, what was a warmint destroyer to Her Majesty, dying, I wrote in to the Board of Ordnance when they appointed me to each station in London, that was, to Regency Park Barracks, to the Knightsbridge and Portland Barracks, and to all the other barracks in the metropolis. I've got the letter now by me, in which they says they is proud to appoint me. I've taken thirty-two rats out of one hole in the islands of Regency Park, and found in it fish, birds, and loads of eggs, duck eggs, and every kind. It must be fourteen year since I first went about the streets exhibiting with rats. I began with a cart and almost a donkey, for it was a pony scarce bigger. But I've had three or four big horses since that, and ask anybody, and they'll tell you, I'm noted for my cattle. I thought that by having a kind of costume, and the rats painted on the cart, and going round the country, I should get my name about, and get myself knowed. And so I did for folks had come to me, so that sometimes I've had four jobs of a day from people seeing my cart. I found I was quite the master of the rat, and could do pretty well what I liked with him, so I used to go round Finchley, Highgate, and all the suburbs, and show myself, and how I handled the warmint. I used to wear a costume of white leather breeches, and a green coat and scarlet whisket, and a gold band round my hat, and a belt across my shoulder. I used to make a first-rate appearance, such as was becoming the uniform of the Queen's rat-catcher. 
Lord bless you, I've travelled all over London, and I'll kill rats again anybody. I'm open to all the world for any sum, from one pound to fifty. I used to have my belts painted at first by Mr. Bailey, the animal painter, with four white rats. But the idea come into my head that I'd cast the rats in metal, just to make more appearance for the belt, to come out into the world. I was nights and days at it, and it gave me a deal of bother. I could manage it nohow, but by my own ingenuity and perseverance I succeeded. A man asked me a pound apiece for casting the rats. That would have been four pound. I was very certain that my belt, being a handsome one, would help my business tremendous in the sale of my composition. So I took a mould from a dead rat in plaster, and then I got some of my wife's saucepans, and by G blank, I casted him with some of my own pewter pots. The wife, who was standing by, here exclaimed, Oh, my poor saucepans! I remember him. There was scarce one left to cook our whittles with. Thousands of moulders, continued Jack Black, used to come to see me do the casting of the rats, and they kept saying, You'll never do it, Jack. The great difficulty, you see, was casting the high, which is a black bead, into the metal. When the belt was done, I had a great success, for, bless you, I couldn't go a yard without a crowd after me. When I was out with my cart, selling my composition, my usual method was this. I used to put a board across the top and form a kind of counter. I always took with me an iron wire cage, so big a one that Mr. Barnett, a Jew, laid a wager that he could get into it, and he did. I used to form this cage at one end of the cart and sell my composition at the other. There were rats painted round the cart. That was the only show I had about the vehicle. I used to take out the rats and put them outside the cage, and used to begin the show by putting rats inside my shirt, next my bosom, or in my coat and breeches pocket, or on my shoulder, in fact, all about me, anywhere. The people would stand to see me take up rats without being bit. I never said much, but I used to handle the rats in every possible manner, letting them run up my arm and stroking their backs and playing with them. Most of the people used to fancy they had been tamed on purpose until they'd see me take fresh ones from the cage and play with them in the same manner. I all this time kept on selling my composition, which my man Joe used to offer about, and whenever a packet was sold, I always tested its virtues by killing a rat with it afore the people's own eyes. I once went to Tottenham to sell my composition and to exhibit with my rats afore the country people. Some countrymen, which said they were rat catchers, came up to me whilst I was playing with some rats and said, Ugh, you're not a rat catcher. That's not the way to do it. They were startled at seeing me sell the pison at such a rate, for the shilling packets was going uncommon well, sir. I said, No, I ain't a rat catcher and don't know nothing about it. You come up and show me how to do it. One of them come up on the cart and put his hand in the cage and curious enough, he got three bites directly, and afore he could take his hands out, they was nearly bit to ribbons. My man Joe says he, I tell you, if we ain't rat catchers, who is? We are the regular rat catchers. My master kills em, and then I eats em. And he takes up a live one and puts its head into his mouth, and I puts my hand in the cage and pulls out six or seven in a cluster and holds em up in the air without even a bite. The countrymen burst out laughing, and they said, Well, you're the best we ever see. I sold near four pounds worth of composition that day. Another day, when I'd been out flying pigeons as well, carriers, which I fancies to, I drove the cart, after selling the composition, to the King's Arms, Hanwell, and there was a feller there, a tailor by trade, what had turned rat catcher. He had got with him some fifty or sixty rats, the miserablest mangy brutes you ever see in a tub, taking him up to London to sell. I, hearing of it, was determined to have a lark, so I goes up and takes out ten of them rats and puts them inside my shirt next my bosom, and then I walks into the parlour and sits down and begins drinking my ale as right as if nothing had happened. I scarce had seated myself when the landlord, who was in the lay, says... I know a man who'll catch rats quicker than anybody in the world. This put the tailor chap up, 
so he offers to bet half a gallon of ale he would, and I takes him. He goes to the tub and brings out a very large rat, and walks with it into the room to show to the company. Well, says I to the man, why, I, who ain't a rat catcher, I've got an even bigger one here. And I pulls one out from my bosom. And here's another, and another, and another, says I, till I had placed the whole ten on the table. That's the way I catch em, says I. They come of their own accord to me. He tried to handle the warmints, but the poor fellow was bit, and his hands was soon bleeding furiously, and I without a mark. A gentleman as knowed me said, This must be the Queen's rat catcher, and that spilt the fun. The poor fellow seemed regular done up, and said, I shall give up rat catching, you've beat me. Here I've been travelling with rats all my life, and I never see such a thing afore. When I've been in a mind for travelling, I've never sold less than ten shillings worth of my composition, and I've many a time sold five pounds worth. Ten shillings worth was the least I ever sold. During my younger career, if I'd had a backer, I might one week with another have made my clear three pounds a week, after paying all my expenses and feeding my horse and all. I challenge my composition and sell the art of rat destroying against any chemical rat destroyer in the world for any sum. I don't care what it is. Let anybody, either a medical or druggist manufacturer of composition, come and test with rats again me, and they'll pretty soon find it out. People pay for composition instead of employing the Queen's rat catcher, what kills the warmint and lays down his composition for nothing into the bargain likewise. I also destroy black beetles with a composition which I always keep with me again it's wanted. I often have to destroy the beetles in wine cellars which gnaw the paper off the bottles, such as is round the champagne and French wine bottles. I've killed lots of beetles too for bakers. I've also sterminated some thousands of beetles for linen drapers and pork sausage shops. There's two kinds of beetles, the hard shell and the soft shell beetle. The hard shell one is the worst, and that will gnaw cork, paper, and anything woolen. The soft shelled one will gnaw bread or food, and it also lays its eggs in the food, which is dreadful nasty. There's the house ant too, which there is some thousands of people as never saw. I exterminate them as well. There's a Mrs. B at the William the Fourth public house, Hampstead. She couldn't lay her child's clothes down without getting on full of ants. They've got a sting somewhere in feel like a horse flies, and is more annoying than dangerous. It's cockroaches that are found in houses. They're dreadful nasty things, and will bite, and they're equal to the Spanish flies for blistering. I've tried all insects on my flesh to see how they bite me. Cockroaches will undermine similar to the ant, and loosen the bricks the same as the cricket. It's astonishing how so small an insect as them will scrape away such a quantity of mortar as they do, which thing infests grates, floorings, and such like. The beetle is a most extraordinary thing, which will puzzle most people to exterminate, for they lay such a lot of eggs as I would never guarantee to do away with beetles, only to keep them clear, for if you kills the old ones, the eggs will revive, and young ones come out of the wainscoting and such like, and then your employers will say, Why, well, you were paid for exterminating, and yet here they are. One night in August, the night of a very heavy storm, which maybe you remember, sir, I was sent for by a medical gent as lived opposite the load of hay, Hampstead, whose two children had been attacked by rats while they were sleeping in their little cots. I traced the blood, which had left lines from their tails, through the openings in the lath and plaster which I followed to where my ferrets come out of, and they must have come up from the bottom of the house to the attics. The rats gnawed the hands and feet of the little children. The lady heard them crying and got out of her bed and called to the servant to know what the child was making such a noise for, when they struck a light and then they see the rats running away to their holes. Their little nightgowns was covered with blood, as if their throats had been cut. I asked the lady to give me one of the nightgowns to keep as a curiosity, for I considered it a phenomenon, and she gave it to me. But I never was so vexed in all my life as when I was told the next day that a maid had washed it. I went down the next morning and exterminated them rats. 
I found there was of the species of rat, which we term the blood rat, which is a dreadful spiteful feller, a snake-headed rat, and infests the dwellings. There may have been some dozens of them altogether, but it's so long ago I almost forget how many I took in that house. The gent behaved uncommon handsome and said, Mr. Black, I could never pay you for this. And ever afterwards, when I used to pass by that there house, the little dears, when they see me, used to call out to their mamma, Oh, here's Mr. Ratty, ma. They were very pretty little fine children, uncommon handsome, to be sure. I once went to Mr. Holland's in Edward Street, Regent's Park, a cowkeeper he was, where he was so infested that the cows could not lay down or eat their food, for the rats used to go into the manger and fight at them. Mr. Holland said to me, Black, what shall I give you to get rid of them rats? And I said to him, says I, Well, Mr. Hollands, you're a poor man, and I leave it to you. He's got awful rich since then. I went to work, and I actually took out three hundred rats from one hole in the wall, which I had to carry them in my mouth and hands, and under my arms, and in my bosom and pockets, to take them to the cage. I was bit dreadful by them, and suffered greatly by the bites, but nothing to lay up for, though very painful to the hands. To prevent the rats from getting out of the hole, I had to stop it up by putting my breast again it, and then they was jumping up again me and gnawing at my whisker. I should think I exterminated five hundred from them premises. Ah, I did wonders round there, and everybody was talking of my feats. I'll tell you about another cowkeeper's, which Mr. Hollands was so gratified with my skill what I had done, that he pays me handsome and generous, and gives me a recommendation to Mrs. Browns of Camden Town and there I exterminated above seven hundred rats, and I was a near being killed, for I was stooping down under the manger when a cow heard the rats squeak, and she butts at me and sends me up again the bull. The bull was very savage, and I fainted, but I was picked up and washed, and then I come to. Whilst doing that job at Mrs. Brown's, I had to lie down on the ground and push my naked arm into the hole till I could reach the rats as I'd driven up in the corner, and then pull them out with my hand. I was dreadful bit, for I was obliged to handle them anyhow. My flesh was cut to ribbons and dreadful lacerated. There was a man Mrs. Brown had got of the name of John, and he wouldn't believe about the rats, and half thought I brought him with me, so I showed him how to catch rats. You see, rats have always got a main run, and from it go the branch runs on each side, like on a herring bone and at the end of the branch runs is the bolt holes for coming in and out at. I instantly stopped up all the bolt holes and worked the rats down to the end of the main run. Then I broke up the branch runs and stopped the rats getting back, and then, when I'd got them all together at the end of the main run, I put my arm down and lifted them up. I have had at times to put half my body into a hole and thrust down my arm, just like getting rabbits out of their burrows. Sometimes I have to go myself into the holes, for the rats make such big ones there's plenty of room. There was a Mrs. Perry in Albany Street that kept an oil and coke shop. She were infested with rats dreadful. Three of her shop boys had been sent away on suspicion of stealing fat, instead of which it was the rats. For between the walls and the vault I found a hundred and a half of fat stowed away. The rats was very savage and I should think there was two hundred of them. I made a good bit of money by that job, for Mrs. Perry gave the fat to me. I have had some good finds at times, rat hunting. I found under one floor in a gent's house a great quantity of table napkins and silver spoons and forks, which the rats had carried away for the grease on them. Shoes and boots gnawed to pieces, shifts, aprons, gowns, pieces of silk, and I don't know what not. Servants had been discharged, accused of stealing them their things. Of course, I had to give them up, but there they was. I was once induced to go to a mews in Tavistock Place near Russell Square, which was regular infested by rats. They had sent to a man before, and he couldn't do nothing with them, but I soon exterminated them. The rats there had worried a pair of beautiful chestnut horses by gnawing away their hoofs and nearly driving them mad, which I saw myself and there was all their teeth marks, for I could scarcely believe it myself till I see it. 
I found them near a cartload of common bricks under the floor and near the partition of the stable, which, when the men pulled the woodwork down, the coachman says he, Well, Retcatcher, if you'd been employed years ago, a deal more corn would have gone into the horses. This coachman gave me a recommendation to a muffin maker in Hanway Yard, and I went there and killed the rats. But a most singular thing took place there. My ferret got away and run through into a house in Oxford Street, kept by a linen draper, for the young men come to say that the rat catcher's ferret was in their shop and had bit one of their lady customers. I worked the ferret through three times to make sure of this, and each time my little dog told me it was true. You see, a well-trained dog will watch and stand and point to the ferret working underground, just as a painter does to game. And although he's above ground, yet he'll track the ferret through the runs underneath by the smell. If the ferret is lost, which I tell by the dog being uneasy, I say to the dog, Hi, lost! And then he instantly goes on scent and smells about in every direction, and I follows him, till he stands exactly over the spot where it may be, and then I have either to rise a stone or lift a board to get him out. I've ratted for years for Mr. Hodges of Hodges and Lomans in Regent Street, and he once said to me that he was infested dreadful with rats at the house, which he took for the children at Hampstead. So I went there and witnessed certainly the most curious circumstance, which puzzles me to this day. I had to lay on my belly half in the hole and pull out the rats, and on looking at them as I bring them up, I am astonished to find that nearly every one of them is blind and has a speck in the eye. I was never so much astonished in my life, for they was as a wall-eyed dog might be. I supposed it to be from lightning. I couldn't account for it no other ways, for at that time there was a very heavy lightning and floods up there, which maybe you might remember, sir. They was chiefly of the blood rat species, small snake-headed rats with a big fine tail. They was very savage with me, and I had them run all over me before I catch them. Rats are everywhere about London, both in rich and poor places. I've catched rats in 44 Portland Place, at a clergyman's house there. There was 200 and odd. They had undermined the oven so that they could neither bile nor bake. They had underpinioned the stables and let every stone down throughout the premises pretty well. I had to crawl under a big leaden cistern which the rats had underpinioned, and I expected it would come down upon me every minute. I had one little ferret kill thirty-two rats under one stone, and I lifted the dead ones up in the presence of the cook and the butler. He didn't behave well to me, the gent didn't, for I had to go to my lawyers afore I could get paid, and after the use of my skill. And I had to tell the lawyer I'd pawn my bed to stick to him and get my earnings. But after all, I had to take one-third less than my bill. This, thinks I, isn't the right thing for Portland Place. Rats will eat each other like rabbits, which I've watched them, and seen them turn the dead one's skins out like pussies, and eat the flesh off, beautiful clean. I've got cages of iron wire, which I made myself, which will hold one thousand rats at a time, and I've had these cages piled up with rats, solid-like. No one would ever believe it, to look at a quantity of rats and see how they will fight and tear one another about. It's astonishing, so it is. I never found any rats smothered by putting them in a cage so full, but if you don't feed them every day, they'll fight and eat one another. They will, like cannibals. My general contracts with my customers by the year or month or job. There's some gents I've worked for these 15 years, such as Mr. Robson, the coach builder, Liverts Hotel, Showbridge, Mr. Lloyd's, the large tobacconist, the commercial life assurance, Lord Duncanon's, and I can't recollect how many more. My terms is from one guinea to five pounds per annum, according to the premises. Besides this, I have all the rats that I catch, and they sell for threepence each. But I've done my work too well, and wherever I went, I've cleared the rats right out, and so my customers have fell off. I have got the best testimonials of any man in London, and I could get a hatful more tomorrow. Ask anybody I've worked for, and they'll tell you about Jack Black. One night I had two hundred rats in a cage placed in my sitting room, and a gent's dog 
happened to get at the cage and undid the door, snuffing about, and let them all loose. Directly I come in, I knew they was loose by the smell. I had to go on my knees and stomach under the beds and sofas and all over the house, and before twelve o'clock that night I had got them all back again into the cage and sold them after for a match. I was so fearful they'd get gnawing the children, having exterminated them in a house where children had been gnawed. I've turned my attention to everything connected with animals. I've got the best composition for curing the mange in a horse or a dog, which has regular astonished medical gents. I've also been bit by a mad dog, a black retriever dog, that died raving mad in a cellar afterwards. The only thing I did was I washed the wound with salt and water and used a turpentine poultice. Mrs. Black here interposed, exclaiming, Oh dear me, the salt and water he's had to his flesh, it ought to be as hard as iron. I've seen him put lumps of salt into his wounds. Mr. Black then continued, I never had any uneasiness from that bite of a mad dog. Indeed, I never troubled myself about it, or even thought of it. I've caught some other things beside rats in my time. One night I saw a little South African cat going along the new road. I thought it was a curious species of rat, and chased it, and brought it home with me. But it proved to belong to Mr. Herring's menagerie in the new road, so I let him have it back again. Another time I met with two raccoons, which I found could handle me just as well as I could handle a rat, for they did bite and scratch awful. I put them in the cart and brought them home in a basket. I never found out to whom they belonged. I got them in Ratcliffe Highway, and no doubt some sailors had brought them over and got drunk and let them loose. I tried them at killing rats, but they weren't no good at that. I've learned a monkey to kill rats but he wouldn't do much. I'd only give them a good shaking when they bit him. After I found the raccoons no good, I trained a badger to kill rats, and he was superior to any dog, but very difficult in training to get him to kill, though he'll kill rabbits fast enough, or any other kind of game, for they're rare poachers or badgers. I used to call her Polly. She killed in my own pit, for I used to oblige my friends that wouldn't believe it possible with the sight. She won several matches. The largest was in a hundred match. I also exterminate moles for Her Majesty, and the woods and forests, and I've exterminated some hundreds for different farmers in the country. It's a curious thing, but a mole will kill a rat and eat it afterwards, and two moles will fight wonderful. They've got a mouth exactly like a shark, and teeth like saws. Ah, a wonderful saw mouth. They're a very sharp-biting little animal, and very painful. A rat is frightened of one, and don't like fighting them at all. I've bred the finest collection of pied rats which has ever been known in the world. I had above eleven hundred of them, all variegated rats, and of a different species and colour, and all of them in the first instance bred from the Norwegian and the white rat, and afterwards crossed with another species. I've raised some of the largest tailed rats ever seen. I've sent them to all parts of the globe, and near every town in England. When I sold them off, three hundred of them went to France. I catched the first white rat I had at Hampstead, and the black ones at Messrs. Hodges and Lomans in Regent Street, and then I bred in. I have them fawn and white, black and white, brown and white, red and white, blue-black and white, black-white and red. People come from all parts of London to see them rats, and I supplied near all the happy families with them. Burke, who had the happy family showing about London, has had hundreds from me. They got very tame, and you could do anything with them. I've sold many to ladies for keeping in squirrel cages. Years ago I sold them for five and ten shillings apiece, but towards the end of my reading them I let them go for two and six. At a shop in Leicester Square, where Contello's hatching eggs machine was, I sold a sow and six young ones for ten shillings, which formerly I have had five pounds for, being so docile, like a sow sucking her pigs. End of section three. Section four of London Labour and the London Poor, volume three, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry.
The Destroyers of Vermin, Part 4. The Sewer Man. He is a broad-shouldered, strongly built man, with a stoop in his shoulders and a rather dull cast of features, from living so much in the shores, note, sewers, end note. His eyes have assumed a peering kind of look that is quite rat-like in its furtiveness. He answered our questions with great good humour, but, in short, monosyllabic terms, peculiar to men who have little communion with their fellows. The parlour in which the man lives was literally swarming with children when we paid him a visit. They were not all belonging to him, nor was it quite pleasant to find that the smell of the tea which had just been made was overpowered by the odour of the rats, which he keeps in the same room. The week's wash was hanging across the apartment and gave rather a slovenly aspect to the room, not otherwise peculiar for its untidiness. Against the wall were pasted some children's characters, which his second son, who is at the coal shed, has a taste for, and which, as the shoreman observed, is better than sweet stuff for him, at all events. A little terrier was jumping playfully about the room, a much more acceptable companion than the bulldog whose acquaintance we had been invited to make, in the same court, by the rat-killer. The furniture and appointments of the parlour were extremely humble, not to say meagre, in their character. After some trouble in getting sufficiently lucid answers, the following was a result. There are not so many rats about as there used to be, not a five hundredth part so many. I've seen long ago twenty or thirty in a row, near where the slaughterhouses are, and that like. I catch them all down the shores. I run after them and pick them up with my hand, and I take my lantern with me. I have caught rats these six or seven years. When the money got to be lowered, I took to catching on them. One time I used to take a dog with me, when I worked down St. John's Woodway. They fetches all prices, does rats. Some I get threepence apiece for, some tuppence. Some tuppence halfpenny, cordon who has em. I works on the shores, and our time to leave off is four. I comes home and gets my tea, and if there's sale for them, why I goes out and catches a few rats. When I goes out, I can catch a dozen, but years ago I could catch two or three dozen without going so far, and that shows there's not so many now about. I find some difficulty in catching on them. If they gets into the drain, you can't get em. Where the drains lay low to the shore, it's most difficult, but where the drain is about two feet and a half from the shore, you gets a better chance. Three or four dozen I used to catch, but I haven't catched any this last two or three weeks. In this hot weather, people don't like to be in a room where killing is going on, but in the winter time, a man will have his pint of beer and see a little sport that way. Three or four year ago, I did catch a good many. There was a sale for him. I could go and catch two dozen in three hours, and that sooner than I can do a dozen now. It's varmint as wants to be destroyed. Rats'll turn round when they find themselves beat, and sometimes fly at your hand. Sometimes I've got bit, not very badly though. To tell the truth, I don't like it. When they grip, they do hold so tight before they'll let go. I've been a shoreman these fifteen or sixteen year, ever since this flushing commenced. I was put on by the commissioners in Hatting Garding, but the commissioners is all done away with since government took to it. I'm employed by the parish now. Every parish has to do its own flushing. We cleanses away all the soil what's down below and keeps the shore as sweet as what we possibly can. Before I took to this life, I was what they call a navvy. I used to help to make the shores. And before that, I was in the country at farmer's work. Catching them rats ain't all profit, cause you have to keep em and feed em. I've got some here, if I was to get sixpence apiece for, why, it wouldn't pay me for their feed. I give them barley generally, and bits of bread. There's a many about now catching, who does nothing else, and who goes down in the shores when they have no business there at all. They does well by rats when they've good call for em. They can go down two or three times a day, and catch a dozen and a half a time. But they can't do much now. There's no killing going on. They takes them to beer shops and sells them to the landlords, who gets their own price for them if there's a pit. Time ago you couldn't get a rat under sixpence. 
But the tax on dogs has done away wonderful with rat killing. London would swarm with rats if they hadn't been catched as they has been. I can go along shores and only see one or two now, sometimes see none. Times ago, I've drove away twenty or thirty afore me. Round Newport Market, I've seen a hundred together, and now I go round there and perhaps won't catch one. As for poisoning them under buildings, that's wrong. They're sure to lay there and rot, and then they smell so. No, poisoning ain't no good, especially where there's many on em. I've sold Jack Black a good many. He don't catch so many as he gets killed. He's what they call rat catcher to her majesty. When I goes rat catching, I generally takes a bag with me. A trap is too much to lug about. Some parts of the shores I can find my way about better than I can up above. I could get in nigh here and come out at High Park. Only the worst of it is you're always on the stoop. I never hear talk of anybody losing themselves in the shores, but a stranger might. There's some what we calls gully hunters, as goes about with a sieve, and near the gratings find perhaps a few halfpence. Years ago we used to find a little now and then, but we may go about now and not find tuppence in a week. I don't think any shoreman ever finds much. But years ago in the city perhaps a robbery might be committed, and then they might be afraid of being found out and chuck the things down the drains. I come from Oxfordshire, about four miles from Henley Pontens. I haven't got now quite so many clods to tramp over, nor so many hills to climb. I gets two shilling a dozen if I sells the rats to a dealer, but if I takes them to the pit myself, I gets three shillings. Rats has come down lately. There's more pits, and they kills them cheaper. They used to kill them at six shillings a dozen. I've got five children. These here are not all belonging to me. Their mother's gone out of nothing, and my wife's got to mind them. My oldest son is sixteen. He's off for a sailor. I had him on me for two years doing nothing. He couldn't get a place. And towards the last, he didn't care about it. He would go to sea, so he went to the marine school, and now he's in the East Inji service. My second is at a coal shed. He gets three shillings a week. But Lord, what's that? He eats more than that let alone clothes, and he wears out such a lot of shoe leather. There's a good deal of wear and tear, I can tell you, in carrying out coals and such like. The Penny Mouse Trap Maker This man lived in a small cottage at the back of Bethnal Green Road, and the little railed space in front of the humble dwelling was littered with sundry evidences of the inmate's ingenuity. Here was a mechanical carriage the crippled father had made to drive himself along, and a large thaumatrope or disc of painted figures that seemed to move while revolving rapidly before the eye, and this, I afterwards learnt, the ingenious cripple had made as a street exhibition for a poor man whom he was anxious to put in the way of doing something for himself. The principal apartment in the little two-roomed house was blocked up with carpenter's benches and long planks were resting against the wall, while the walls themselves were partly covered with tools and patterns of the craft pursued, and in one corner there were heaps of the penny mouse traps and penny money boxes that formed the main articles of manufacture. In a little room adjoining this, and about the size of a hen house, I found the cripple himself in bed, but still sitting up with a small desk like bench before him, and engaged in the act of cutting and arranging the wires for the little wooden traps in which he dealt. And as I sat by his bedside, he told me the following story. I am, he said, a white wood toy maker in a small way. That is, I make a variety of cheap articles, nothing beyond a penny, in sawed and planed pine wood. I manufacture penny and halfpenny money boxes, penny and halfpenny toy bellows, penny carts, penny garden rollers, penny and halfpenny dolls' tables, and wash-hand stands, chiefly for baby houses, penny dressers with drawers for the same purpose, penny wheelbarrows and bedsteads, penny crossbows, and the mouse trap that I am about now. I make all the things I have named for warehouses, for what are called the cheap Birmingham and Sheffield houses. I paid the same price for whatever I make, with the exception of the mouse trap. For the principal part of the penny articles that I make, I get seven shillings for twelve dozen, that is, seven pence a dozen. 
and for the halfpenny articles I get three shillings sixpence at the rate of threepence halfpenny a dozen. For the penny mouse traps, however, I am paid only one pound for thirty-six dozen, and that's a shilling less than I get for the same quantity of the other shilling articles. Whilst for the penny boxes, I'm paid only at the rate of a halfpenny each. You will please to look at that, sir," he said, handing me his account book with one of his employers for the last year. You will see there that what I am saying is perfectly correct, for there is the price put to every article. And it is but right that you should have proof that what I am telling you is the truth. I took of one master for penny mouse traps alone. You perceive, thirty-six pounds ten shillings from January to December eighteen forty-nine, but that is not all gain. You understand. Out of that, I have to pay above one half for material. I think altogether my receipts of the different masters I worked for last year came to about a hundred and twenty pounds. I can't lay my hands on the bills just now. Yes, it's about a hundred and twenty pounds. I know for our income. That is, my clear gains is about one pound to one pound five shillings every week. So, calculating more than one half what I take to go for the expense for material, that will bring it to just about to what I state. To earn the twenty-five shillings a week, you'll understand there are four of us engaged: myself, my wife, my daughter, and son. My daughter is eighteen, and my son eleven. That is my boy, sir. He's reading the family friend just now. It's a little work I take in for my girl for her future benefit. My girl is as fond of reading as I am, and always was. My boy goes to school every evening and twice on a Sunday. I am willing that they should find as much pleasure from reading as I have in my illness. I found books often lull my pain. Yes, I have indeed for many hours. For nine months, I couldn't handle a tool. And my only comfort was the love of my family and my books. I can't afford them now, for I have no wish to incur any extraneous expense, while the weight of the labour lies on my family more than it does on myself. Over and over again, when I have been in acute pain with my thigh, a scientific book or a work on history or a volume of travels would carry my thoughts far away, and I should be happy in all my misery. Hardly conscious that I had a trouble, a care, or a pang to vex me, I always had love of solid works. For an hour's light reading, I have often turned to a work of imagination, such as Milton's Paradise Lost and Shakespeare's plays. But I prefer science to poetry. I think every working man ought to be acquainted with general science. If he is a mechanic, let his station be ever so simple, he will be sure to find the benefit of it. It gives a man a greater insight into the world and creation, and it makes his labour a pleasure and a pride to him when he can work with his head as well as his hands. I think I have made altogether about one hundred and six gross of mouse traps for the master whose account I have given you, and as many more for other employers in the course of the last year. I calculate that I made more than thirty thousand mouse traps from January to December, eighteen forty-nine. There are three or four other people in London making penny mouse traps besides myself. I reckon they may make among them near upon half as many as I do, and that would give about forty-five or fifty thousand penny mouse traps made in London in the course of the year. I myself brought out the penny mouse trap in its improved shape and with the improved lever spring. I have no calculations as to the number of mice in the country. Or how soon we should have caught them if we go on at this rate, but I think my traps have to do with that. They are bought more for toys than for use, though they are good for mice as well as children. And though we have so many dozen mouse traps about the house, I can assure you we are more troubled with mice here than most people. The four of us here can make twenty-four dozen traps in the day, but that is all we can get through comfortable. For eighteen dozen, we get about ten shillings at the warehouse, and out of that, I reckon our clear gains are near upon four shillings, or a little less than one shilling a head. Take one with the other, we can earn about a penny an hour. And if it wasn't for me having been a tailor originally and applying some of my old tools to the business, we shouldn't get on so quick as we do. With my shears, I can cut twenty-four wires at a time, and with my thimble, I thread the wires through the holes in the sides. I make the springs, cut the wires, and put them in the traps. 
My daughter planes the wood and gouges out the sides and bottom, bores the wire holes and makes the door as well. My wife nails the frames ready for wiring, and my son fixes the wires in their places when I have entered them. Then the wife springs them, after which the daughter puts in the doors and so completes them. I can't form an idea as to how many penny and halfpenny money boxes I made last year. I might have made altogether 8,000, or 5,000 halfpenny and 3,000 penny ones. I was originally brought up to the tailoring business, but my master failed and my sight kept growing weaker every year. So as I found a good deal of trouble in getting employment at my own trade, I thought I would take to the birdcage making. I had been doing a little at it before as a pastime. I was fond of birds and fonder still of mechanics, so I was always practising my hands at some craft or other in my overtime. I used to make dissected maps and puzzles, and so when standing for employment, I managed to get through the slack of the year. I think it is solely due to my taste for mechanics and my love of reading scientific books that I am able to live so comfortably as I do in my affliction. After I took to birdcage making, I found the employment at it so casual that I could not support my family at it. This led my mind to toy making, for I found that cheap toys were articles of more general sale. Then I got my children and my wife to help me, and we managed to get along somehow. For you see, they were learning the business, and I myself was not in much of a condition to teach them, being almost as inexperienced at the trade as they were. And besides that, we were continually changing the description of toy that we manufactured, so we had no time to perfect ourselves. One day, we were all at work at garden rollers. The next, perhaps, we should be upon little carts. Then, maybe, we should have to go to dolls' tables or wheelbarrows. So that, with the continual changing the description of toy that we manufactured from one thing to another, we had a great difficulty in getting practised in anything. While we were all learning, you may imagine that, not being so quick then as we are now, we found a great difficulty in making a living at a penny toy business. Often we had merely dry bread for breakfast, tea and supper, but we ate it with a light heart, for I knew repining wouldn't mend it, and I always taught myself and those about me to bear our trials with fortitude. At last I got to work regularly at the mouse traps, and having less changing, we learnt to turn them out of hand quicker and to make more money at the business. That was about four years ago, and then I was laid up with a strumous abscess in the thigh. This caused necrosis, or decay of the thigh bone, to take place, and it was necessary that I should be confined to my bed until such time as a new thigh bone was formed and the old decayed one had sloughed away. Before I lay up, I stood at the bench until I was ready to drop, for I had no one who could plane the boards for me, and what could I do? If I didn't keep up, I thought we should all starve. The pain was dreadful, and the anxiety of mind I suffered for my wife and children made it a thousand times worse. I couldn't bear the idea of going to the workhouse, and I kept on my feet until I couldn't stand no longer. My daughter was only sixteen then, and I saw no means of escape. It was at that time my office to prepare the boards for the family, and without that they could do nothing. Well, sir, I saw utter ruin and starvation before us. The doctor told me it would take four years before a new bone would be formed, and that I must lay up all the while. What was to become of us all in the meantime, I could not tell. Then it was that my daughter, seeing the pain I suffered, both in body and mind, came to me and told me not to grieve, for that she would do all the heavy work for me, and plane up the boards, and cut out the work as I had done. But I thought it impossible for her to get through such hard work, even for my sake. I knew she could do almost anything that she set her mind to, but I little dreamt that she would be able to compass that. However, with the instinct of her affection, I couldn't call it anything else, for she learnt at once what it had taken me months to acquire. She planed and shaped the boards as well as I myself could have done after years of practice. The first board she did was as cleanly done as she can do it now, and when you think of the difficulties she had to overcome, what a mere child she was, and that she had never handled a plane before, how she had the grain of the wood to find out, to learn the right handling of her tools, 
and a many little niceties of touch that workmen only can understand, it does seem to me as if some superior power had inspired her to aid me. I have often heard of birds building their nests of the most beautiful structure without ever having seen one built before, and my daughter's handiwork seemed to me exactly like that. It was a thing not learnt by practice, but done in an instant, without teaching or experience of any kind. She is the best creature I ever knew or ever heard tell of on earth. At least, so she has been to me all her life, I without a single exception. If it hadn't been for her devotion, I must have gone to the workhouse, and perhaps never been able to have got away from it, and had my children brought up as paupers. Where she got the strength to do it is as much a mystery to me as how she did it. Though she was but a mere child, so to speak, she did the work of a grown man, and I assure you the labour of working at the bench all day is heavy, even for the strongest workman. And my girl is not overstrong now. Indeed, she was always delicate, from a baby. Nevertheless, she went through the labour, and would stand to the bench the whole of the day, and with such cheerful good humour, too, that I cannot but see the hand of the Almighty in it all. I never knew her to complain of fatigue, or even go to her work without a smile on her face. Her only anxiety was to get done, and to afford me every comfort in my affliction that she could. For three years and two months now have I been confined to my bed, and for two years and a half of that time I have not left it, even to breathe the fresh open air. Almost all that period I have been suffering intense and continued pain from the formation of abscesses in my thigh previous to the sloughing away of the decayed bones. I have taken out of the sores at least two hundred pieces, some as small as needles and some not less than an inch and a half long, which required to be pulled out with tweezers from the wound. Often when I was getting a bit better and able to go about in the cart you see there outside with the gravel in it, I made that on this bed here, so as to be able to move about on it. The two front wheels I made myself, and the two back were old ones that I repaired here. I made the whole of the body, and my daughter planed up the boards for me. Well, often when I could just get along in that, have I gone about with a large piece of decayed bone projecting through my thigh, in hopes that the jolting would force it through the wound. The pain before the bone came away was often intense especially when it had to work its way through the thick of the muscle. Night after night have I laid awake here. I didn't wish, of course, to distress the minds of my family any more than I could help. It would not have been fair. So I bore all with patience, and since I have been here, I have got through a great deal of work in my little way. In bed, as I sit with my little bench, I do my share of eight dozen of these penny traps a day. Last August, I made a thaumatrope, for a young man that I had known since a lad of twelve years of age. He got off work and couldn't find anything to turn his hand to, so I advised him to get up an exhibition. Anything was better than starving. He had a wife and two children, and I can't bear to see anyone want, let alone the young ones. And so, crippled as I was, I set to work here in my bed and made him a large set of magic circles. I painted all the figures myself in this place, though I had never handled a brush before, and that has kept him in bread up to this time. I did it to cause him to exert himself, but now he has got a situation and is doing middling to what he has been. There's one thing, though. A little money, with care, will go farther than a great deal without it. I shall never be able to get about as I used, for, you see, the knee is set stiff and the thigh bone is arched with the hip so that the one leg is three inches shorter than the other. The bone broke spontaneously, like a bit of rotten wood, the other day, while I was rubbing my hand down my thigh, and, in growing together again, it got out of straight. I am just able to stir about now with a crutch and stick. I can sometimes treat myself to a walk about the house and yard, but that is not often. And last Saturday night I did make a struggle to get out in the Bethnal Green Road, and there, as I was coming along, my stick tripped against a stone, and I fell. If it hadn't been for my crutch throwing me forward, I might have fallen on my new bone and broken it again. But as it was, the crutch threw me forward and saved me. The doctor tells me my new bone would bear a blow, 
but I shouldn't like to try after all I have gone through. I shall not be about again till I get my carriage done, and that I intend to construct so as to drive it with one hand, by means of a new ratchet lever motion. The daughter of the toy maker with whom I spoke afterwards, and who was rather good-looking in the literal sense of the word than beautiful, said that she could not describe how it was that she had learnt to plane and gouge the boards. It seemed to come to her all of a sudden, quite natural-like, she told me, though, she added, it was most likely her affection for her poor father that made her take to it so quick. I felt it deeply, she said, to see him take to his bed, and knew that I alone could save him from the workhouse. No, I never felt tired over the work she continued, in answer to my questions, because I know that it is to make him comfortable. I should add that I was first taken to this man by the surgeon who attended him during his long suffering, and that gentleman not only fully corroborated all I heard from his ingenious and heroic patient, but spoke in the highest possible terms of both father and daughter. End of section 4 Section 5 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Destroyers of Vermin, Part 5. Flies. These winged tormentors are not, like most of our actors' enemies, calculated to excite disgust and nausea when we see or speak of them nor do they usually steal upon us during the silent hours of repose, though the gnat or mosquito must be here accepted. But are many of them very beautiful, and boldly make their attack upon us in open day, when we are best able to defend ourselves. The active fly, so frequently an unbidden guest at your table, note Muffet, page 56, end note, whose delicate palate selects your choicest viands, at one time extending his proboscis to the margin of a drop of wine, and then gaily flying to take a more solid repast from a pear or a peach, now gambling with his comrades in the air, now gracefully carrying his furled wings with his taper feet, was but the other day a disgusting grub, without wings, without legs, without eyes, wallowing, well pleased, in the midst of a mass of excrement. The common house fly, says Kirby, is, with us, sufficiently annoying at the close of summer, so as to have led the celebrated Italian, Hugo Foscolo, when residing here, to call it one of the three miseries of life. But we know nothing of it as a tormentor, compared with the inhabitants of southern Europe. I met, says Arthur Young, in his interesting travels through France, between Pradel and Touritz, mulberries and flies at the same time. By the term flies, I mean those myriads of them which form the most disagreeable circumstances of the southern climates. They are the first torments in Spain, Italy, and the olive district of France. It is not that they bite, sting, or hurt, but they buzz, tease, and worry. Your mouth, eyes, ears, and nose are full of them. They swarm on every eatable, fruit, sugar, everything is attacked by them in such myriads that if they are not incessantly driven away by a person who has nothing else to do, to eat a meal is impossible. They are, however, caught on prepared paper and other contrivances with so much ease and in such quantities that were it not for negligence, they could not abound in such incredible quantities. If I farmed in these countries, I should manure four or five acres every year with dead flies. I have been much surprised that the learned Mr. Harmer should think it odd to find, by writers who treated of southern climates, that driving away flies was of importance. Had he been with me in Spain and at Languedoc in July and August, he would have been very far from thinking there was anything odd in it. Young's Travels in France, Volume 1, page 298 It is a remarkable and as yet unexplained fact that if nets of thread or string 
with meshes a full inch square, be stretched over the open windows of a room in summer or autumn, when flies are the greatest nuisance, not a single one will venture to enter from without, so that by this simple plan a house may be kept free from these pests, while the adjoining ones, which have not had nets applied to their windows, will swarm with them. In order, however, that the protection should be efficient, it is necessary that the rooms to which it is applied should have the light enter by one side only, for in those which have a through light, the flies, strange to say, pass through the meshes without scruple. For a fuller account of these singular facts, the reader is referred to a paper by W. Spence in Transactions of the Entomological Society of London, Volume 1, Page 1, and also to one in the same work by the Reverend E. Stanley, late Lord Bishop of Norwich, who, having made some of the experiments suggested by Mr. Spence, found that by extending over the outside of his windows nets of a very fine pack thread with meshes one inch and a quarter to the square, so fine and comparatively invisible that there was no apparent diminution either of light or the distant view, he was enabled for the remainder of the summer and autumn to enjoy the fresh air with open windows without the annoyance he had previously experienced from the intrusion of flies, often so troublesome that he was obliged on the hottest days to forego the luxury of admitting the air by even partially raising the sashes. But no sooner, he observes, had I set my nets than I was relieved from my disagreeable visitors. I could perceive and hear them hovering on the other side of my barriers, but though they now and then settled on the meshes, I do not recollect a single instance of one venturing to cross the boundary. The number of house flies, he adds, might be greatly lessened in large towns if the stable dung in which their larvae are chiefly supposed to feed were kept in pits closed by trapdoors, so that the females could not deposit their eggs in it. At Venice, where no horses are kept, it is said there are no house flies a statement which I regret not having heard before being there, that I might have inquired as to its truth. Kirby and Spence's Entomology, Volume 1, pages 102 and 103. This short account of flies would be incomplete without a description of their mode of proceeding when they regale themselves upon a piece of loaf sugar, and an account of the apparatus with which the creator has furnished them in order to enable them to walk on bodies possessing smooth surfaces and in any position. Quote, it is a remark which will be found to hold good both in animals and vegetables that no important motion or feeling can take place without the presence of moisture. In man, the part of the eye which is the seat of vision is always bedewed with moisture, the skin is softened with a delicate oil. The sensitive part of the ear is filled with a liquid. But moisture is still more abundant in our organs of taste and smell than in any of the other senses. In the case of taste, moisture is supplied to our mouth and tongue from several reservoirs, glands, in their neighbourhood, whence pipes are laid and run to the mouth. The whole surface, indeed, of the mouth and tongue as well as the other internal parts of our body, give out more or less moisture. But besides this, the mouth, as we have just mentioned, has a number of fountains expressly for its own use. The largest of these fountains lies as far off as the ear on each side, and is formed of a great number of round, soft bodies about the size of garden peas, from each of which a pipe goes out, and all of these uniting together, form a common channel on each side. This runs across the cheek, nearly in a line with the lap of the ear and the corner of the mouth, and enters the mouth opposite to the second or third of the double teeth, molaris, by a hole into which a hog's bristle can be introduced. There are besides several other pairs of fountains in different parts adjacent for a similar purpose. We have been thus particular in our description in order to illustrate an analogous structure in insects, for they also seem to be furnished with salivary fountains for moistening their organs of taste. One of the circumstances that first awakened our curiosity with regard to insects was the manner in which a fly contrives to suck up through its narrow sucker 
hostellum, a bit of dry lump sugar, for the small crystals are not only unfitted to pass from their angularity, but adhere too firmly together to be separated by any force the insect can exert. Eager to solve the difficulty, for there could be no doubt of the flies sucking the dry sugar, we watched its proceedings with no little attention, but it was not till we fell upon the device of placing some sugar on the outside of a window while we looked through a magnifying glass on the inside that we had the satisfaction of repeatedly witnessing a fly let fall a drop of fluid upon the sugar in order to melt it, and thereby render it fit to be sucked up. On precisely the same principle that we moisten with saliva in the process of mastication, a mouthful of dry bread, to fit it for being swallowed, the action of the jaws, by a beautiful contrivance of providence, preparing the moisture along the channels at the time it is most wanted. Readers who may be disposed to think the circumstance of the fly thus moistening a bit of sugar fanciful may readily verify the fact themselves in the way we have described. At the time when we made this little experiment, we were not aware that several naturalists of high authority had actually discovered by dissection the vessels which supply the saliva in more than one species of insect. In the case of their drinking fluids, like water, Saliva is not wanted, and it may be remarked, when we drink cold water, it actually astringes and shuts up the openings of the salivary pipes. Hence it is that drinking does not quench thirst when the saliva is rendered viscid and scanty by heat, by fatigue, or by the use of stimulant food and liquor, and sometimes a draught of cold water by carrying off all the saliva from the mouth and at the same time astringing the orifices of the ducts, may actually produce thirst. Ices produce this effect on many persons. It is, no doubt, in consequence of their laborious exertions, as well as of the hot nature of their acid fluids producing similar effects, that ants are so fond of water. We have seen one quaff a drop of dew almost as large as its whole body, and when we present those in our glass formicaries with water, they seem quite insatiable in drinking it. End quote. Insect Miscellanies, page 38. Rennie, in his Insect Miscellanies, after describing the pedestrian contrivances with which various insects are furnished, says, quote, The most perfect contrivance of this kind, however, occurs in the domestic fly, Musca domestica, and its congeners, as well as in several other insects. Few can have failed to remark that flies walk with the utmost ease along the ceiling of a room, and no less so upon a perpendicular looking glass. And though this were turned downwards, the flies would not fall off, but could maintain their position undisturbed with their backs hanging downwards. The conjectures devised by naturalists to account for this singular circumstance previous to the ascertaining of the actual facts, are not a little amusing. Some suppose, says the Abbé de la Pluche, that when the fly marches over any polished body, on which neither its claws nor its points can fasten, it sometimes compresses her sponge and causes it to evacuate a fluid, which fixes it in such a manner as prevents its falling, without diminishing the facility of its progress but it is much more probable that the sponges correspond with the fleshy balls which accompany the claws of dogs and cats, and that they enable the fly to proceed with a softer pace and contribute to the preservation of the claws, whose pointed extremities would soon be impaired without this prevention. Spectacle de la nature, or nature displayed, being discourses on such particulars of natural history as were thought most proper to excite the curiosity and form the minds of youth. Volume 1, page 116. Its ability to walk on glass, says S. Shaw, proceeds partly from some little ruggedness thereon, but chiefly from a tarnish or dirty smoking substance adhering to the surface, so that though the sharp points on the sponges cannot penetrate the surface of the glass, it may easily catch hold of the tarnish. Nature Displayed, Volume 3, page 98, London, 1823. But, adds Rennie, 
It is singular that none of these fanciers ever took the trouble to ascertain the existence of either a gluten squeezed out by the fly, or of the smoky tarnish on glass. Even the shrewd Riomur could not give a satisfactory explanation of the circumstance. The earliest correct notion on this curious subject was entertained by Derham, who, in mentioning the provision made for insects that hang on smooth surfaces, says, I might here name diverse flies and other insects, who, besides their sharp-hooked nails, have also skinny palms to their feet, to enable them to stick to glass and other smooth bodies by means of the pressure of the atmosphere, after the manner as I have seen boys carry heavy stones with only a wet piece of leather clapped on the top of the stone. Physical Theology, Volume 2, page 194, Note B, 11th edition. The justly celebrated Mr. White of Selborne, apparently without the aid of microscopial investigation, adopted Derham's opinion, adding the interesting illustration that, in the decline of the year, when the flies crowd to windows and become sluggish and torpid, they are scarcely able to lift their legs, which seem glued to the glass, where many actually stick till they die. Whereas they are during warm weather so brisk and alert that they easily overcome the pressure of the atmosphere. Natural History of Selborne, Volume 2, page 274. This singular mechanism, however, continues Rennie, is not peculiar to flies, for some animals a hundred times as large can walk upon glass by the same means. St. Pierre mentions, quote, a very small lizard, about a finger's length, which climbs along the walls and even along glass, in pursuit of flies and other insects. End quote. Voyage to the Isle of France, page 73. And Sir Joseph Banks noticed another lizard, named the Gecke, Lacerta Gesha, Linnaeus, which could walk against gravity, and which made him desirous of having the subject thoroughly investigated. On mentioning it to Sir Everard Holm, he and Mr. Bower commenced a series of researches by which they proved incontrovertibly that in climbing upon glass and walking along the ceilings with the back downwards, a vacuum is produced by a particular apparatus in the feet, sufficient to cause atmospheric pressure upon the exterior surface. The apparatus in the feet of the fly consists of two or three membranous suckers connected with the last joint of the foot by a narrow neck of a funnel shape, immediately under the base of each jaw, and movable in all directions. These suckers are convex above and hollow below, the edges being margined with minute serratures, and the hollow portion covered with down. In order to produce the vacuum and the pressure, these membranes are separated and expanded, and when the fly is about to lift its foot, it brings them together and folds them up, as it were, between the two claws. By means of a common microscope, these interesting movements may be observed when a fly is confined in a wine glass. End quote. Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society for 1816, page 325. It must have attracted the attention of the most incurious to see, during the summer, swarms of flies crowding about the droppings of cattle, so as almost to conceal the nuisance, and presenting instead a display of their shining corslets and twinkling wings. The object of all this busy bustle is to deposit their eggs where their progeny may find abundant food, and the final cause is obviously both to remove the nuisance and to provide abundant food for birds and other animals which prey upon flies or their larvae. The same remarks apply with no less force to the blowflies, which deposit their eggs, and in some cases their young, upon carcasses. The common house fly, the female of which generally lays 144 eggs, belongs to the first division, the natural food of its larvae being horse dung. Consequently, it is always most abundant in houses in the vicinity of stables, cucumber beds, and so on, to which, when its numbers become annoying, attention should be primarily directed, rather than having recourse to fly-waters. End quote. Rennie's Insect Miscellany, page 265. Besides the common housefly and the other genera of the dipterous order of insects, there is another not unfrequent intruding visitor of the fly kind, which we must not omit to mention, 
commonly known as the blue bottle, Musca vomitoria, Linnaeus. The disgust with which these insects are generally viewed will perhaps be diminished when our readers are informed that they are destined to perform a very important part in the economy of nature, amongst a number of the insect tribe whose office it is to remove nuisances the most disgusting to the eye and the most offensive to the smell. The varieties of the blue bottle fly belong to the most useful. Quote, when the dead carcasses of animals begin to grow putrid, everyone knows what dreadful miasmata exhale from them and taint the air we breathe. But no sooner does life depart from the body of any creature, at least from any which from its size is likely to become a nuisance, than myriads of different sorts of insects attack it, and in various ways. First come the histers and pierce the skin. Next follow the flesh flies, covering it with millions of eggs, whence in a day or two proceed innumerable devourers. An idea of the dispatch made by these gourmands may be gained from the combined consideration of their numbers, veracity and rapid development. The larvae of many flesh flies, as ready ascertained, will in 24 hours devour so much food and gnaw so quickly as to increase their weight 200-fold. In five days after being hatched, they arrive at their full growth and size, which is a remarkable instance of the care of Providence in fitting them for the part they are destined to act. For if a longer time was required for their growth, their food would not be a fit aliment for them or they would be too long in removing the nuisance it is given them to dissipate. Thus we see there was some ground for Linnaeus's assertion under Musca vomitoria that three of these flies will devour a dead horse as quickly as would a lion, end quote. Kirby and Spence, Volume 1. The following extraordinary fact given by Kirby and Spence concerning the veracity of the larvae of the blowfly, or blue bottle, Musca vomitoria, is worthwhile appending. Quote, On Thursday, June 25th, died at Aspernby, Lincolnshire, John Page, a pauper belonging to Silk Willoughby, under circumstances truly singular. He being of a restless disposition and not choosing to stay in the parish workhouse, was in the habit of strolling about the neighbouring villages, subsisting on the pittance obtained from door to door. The support he usually received from the benevolent was bread and meat, and after satisfying the cravings of nature, it was his custom to deposit the surplus provision, particularly the meat, between his shirt and skin. Having a considerable portion of this provision in store, so deposited, he was taken rather unwell and laid himself down in a field in the parish of Streddington, when, from the heat of the season at that time, the meat speedily became putrid and was, of course, struck by the flies. These not only proceeded to devour the inanimate pieces of flesh, but also literally to prey upon the living substance. And when the wretched man was accidentally found by some of the inhabitants, he was so eaten by the maggots that his death seemed inevitable. After clearing away as well as they were able, these shocking vermin, those who found Page conveyed him to Aspornby, and a surgeon was immediately procured, who declared that his body was in such a state that dressing it must be little short of instantaneous death, and in fact the man did survive the operation but for a few hours. When first found, and again when examined by the surgeon, he presented a sight loathsome in the extreme. White maggots of enormous size were crawling in and upon his body, which they had most shockingly mangled, and the removal of the external ones served only to render the sight more horrid. Kirby adds, In passing through this parish last spring, I inquired of the male coachman whether he had heard this story, and he said the fact was well known. End quote. One species of fly infests our houses, Stomoxus calcitrans, which so nearly resembles the common house fly, Musca domestica, that the difference is not easily detected except by an entomologist. Indeed, the resemblance is so close as to have led to the vulgar error that the common housefly occasionally indulges itself by a feast upon our blood, 
after it has fed to satiety upon the delicacies which it picks from our tables. It is even a greater torment than the housefly. This little pest, says Kirby, referring to the stomoxis, I speak feelingly, incessantly interrupts our studies and comfort in showery weather, making us even stamp like the cattle by its attacks on our legs, and if we drive it away ever so often, returning again and again to the charge. End quote. In Canada, they are infinitely worse. I have sat down to write, says Lambert, who, though he calls it the housefly, is evidently speaking of the stomoxis, and have been obliged to throw away my pen in consequence of their irritating bite, which has obliged me every moment to raise my hand to my eyes, nose, mouth and ears in constant succession. When I could no longer write, I began to read and was always obliged to keep one hand constantly on the move towards my head. Sometimes, in the course of a few minutes, I would take half a dozen of my tormentors from my lips, between which I caught them just as they perched. End quote. Travels and so on, volume 1, page 126. But of all the insect tormentors of man, none are so loudly and universally complained of as the species of the genus Culex, Linnaeus, whether known by the name of gnats or mosquitoes. It has been generally supposed by naturalists that the mosquitoes of America belong to the Linnaean genus Culex, but Humboldt asserts that the term mosquito, signifying a little fly, is applied there to a senicillium, la trait, senicilia, mygen, and that the culices, which are equally numerous and annoying, are called sancudos, which means long legs. The former, he says, are what the French call moustique, and the latter maranglin. Note from Personal Narrative, E.T., Volume 5, page 93. Humboldt's remark, however, refers only to South America. Mr. Westwood informs us that mosquito is certainly applied to a species of culex in the United States, the inhabitants giving the name of black fly to a small senicillium. Pliny, after Aristotle, distinguishes well between Hymenoptera and Diptera, when he says the former have their sting in the tail and the latter in the mouth, and that to the one this instrument is given as the instrument of vengeance, and to the other of avidity. But the instrument of avidity in the genus of which I am speaking is even more terrible than that of vengeance in most insects that are armed with it. It instills into its wound a poison, as appears from the consequent inflammation and tumour, the principal use of which is to render the blood more fluid and fitter for suction. This weapon, which is more complex than the sting of hymenopterous insects, consists of five pieces besides the exterior sheath, some of which seem simply lancets, while others are barbed like the spiculae of a bee's sting is at once calculated for piercing the flesh and forming a siphon adapted to imbibe the blood. There are several species of this genus whose bite is severe, but none is to be compared to the common gnat, Culex pipiens, Linnaeus, if, as has been generally affirmed, it be synonymous with the mosquito, though in all probability several species are confounded under both names. In this country they are justly regarded as no trifling evil, for they follow us to all our haunts, intrude into our most secret retirements, assail us in the city and in the country, in our houses and in our fields, in the sun and in the shade. Nay, they pursue us to our pillows and keep us awake by the ceaseless hum of their rapid wings, which, according to the Baron C. de la Tour, are vibrated three thousand times per minute and their incessant endeavours to fix themselves upon our face, or some uncovered part of our body, whilst, if in spite of them we fall asleep, they awaken us by the acute pain which attends the insertion of their oral stings, attacking with most avidity the softer sex, and trying their temper by disfiguring their beauty. In Marshland, in Norfolk, the inhabitants are said to be so annoyed by the gnats that the better sort of them, as in many hot climates, have recourse to a gauze covering for their beds to keep them off during the night.
End of section 5。section 6 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3 by Henry Mayhew。this librivox recording is in the public domain。recording by Gillian Hendry。The Destroyers of Vermin, Part Six. Catch 'em alive, sailors! I discovered a colony of catch 'em alive boys residing in Pheasant Court, Gray's Inn Lane. From the pleasing title given to this alley, one might almost be led to imagine it was a very delightful spot, though it is only necessary to look down the little bricken archway that marks its entrance and see the houses, dirty as the sides of a dustbin. And with the patched counterpanes and yellow sheets hanging from the windows, to feel assured that it is one of the most squalid of the many wretched courts that branch out from Gray's Inn Lane. I found the lads playing at pitch and toss in the middle of the paved yard. They were all willing enough to give me their statements. Indeed, the only difficulty I had was in making my choice among the youths. Please, sir, I've been at it longer than him. Cried one with teeth ribbed like celery. Please, sir, he ain't been out this year with the papers," said another, who was hiding a handful of buttons behind his back. "He's been at shoe blacking, sir. I'm the only regular fly boy," shouted a third, eating a piece of bread as dirty as London snow. A big lad with a dirty face and hair like hemp was the first of the catch 'em alive boys who gave me his account of the trade. He was a swarthy-featured boy with a broad nose like a negro's, and on his temple was a big half-healed scar, which he accounted for by saying that he had been runned over by a cab, though judging from the blackness of one eye, it seemed to have been the result of some street fight. He said, quote, "I'm an Irish boy, a near turn sixteen, and I've been selling fly papers for between eight and nine year. I must have begun to sell 'em when they first come out." Another boy first told me of them, and he's been selling them about three weeks before me. He used to buy them off a party as lives in a back room near Drury Lane, what buys paper and makes the catch 'em alive himself. When they first came out, they used to charge sixpence a dozen for 'em, but now they've got 'em to tuppence halfpenny. When I first took to selling them, there was a tidy lot of boys at the business, but not so many as now, for all the boys seem at it. In our court alone, I should think there was above twenty boys selling the things. At first, when there was a good time, we used to buy three or four gross together, but now we don't do more than half a gross. As we go along the streets, we call out different cries. Some of us says, "Fly papers, fly papers, catch 'em all alive." Others make a kind of song of it, singing out, "Fly paper, catch 'em all alive, the nasty flies tormenting the baby's eyes." Who'd be fly blowed by all the nasty blue bottles, beetles, and flies? People likes to buy if a boy as sings out well, 'cause it makes 'em laugh. I don't think I sell so many in town as I do in the borders of the country about Highbury, Croydon, and Brentford. I've got some regular customers in town about the city prison and the Caledonian Road, and after I've served them and the town custom begins to fall off, then I goes to the country. We goes two of us together. And we takes about three gross. We keep on selling before us all the way, and we comes back the same road. Last year we sold very well in Croydon, and it was the best place for getting a price for them. They'd give a penny a piece for 'em there, for they didn't know nothing about them. I went off one day at ten o'clock and didn't come home till two in the morning. I sold eighteen dozen out in that direction the other day and got rid of them before I had got half way. But flies are very scarce at Croydon this year, and we haven't done so well. There ain't half as many flies this summer as last. Some people say the papers draws more flies than they catches, and that when one gets in, there's twenty others will come to see 'em. It's according to the weather as the flies is about. If we have a fine day, it fetches them out, but a cold day kills more than our papers. We sells the most papers to little cook shops and sweetmeat shops. We don't sell so many at private houses. The public houses is pretty good customers, 'cause the beer draws the flies. I sold nine dozen at one house, a school at Highgate the other day. I sold 'em two for three halfpence. That was a good hit. But then t'other days we loses. If we can make a halfpenny each, we thinks we does well. Those that sells their papers at three a penny buys 'em at St Giles's and pays only three halfpence a dozen for 'em. 
but they aren't half as big and good as those we pays tuppence halfpenny a dozen for. Barnet is a good place for fly papers. There's a good lot of flies down there. There used to be a man at Barnet as made them, but I can't say if he do now. There's another at Brentford, so it ain't much good going that way. In cold weather, the paper keeps pretty well, and will last for months with just a little warming at the fire, for they tears on opening when they are dry. You see, we always carry them with the sticky sides doubled up together, like a sheet of writing paper. In hot weather, if you keep them folded up, they lasts very well, but if you open them, they dry up. It's easy opening them in hot weather, for they comes apart as easy as peeling a orange. We generally carries the paper in a bundle on our arm, and we tie the paper as is loaded with flies round our cap, just to show the people the way to catch them. We get a loaded paper given to us at a shop. When the papers come out first, we used to do very well with fly papers, but now it's hard work to make our own money for them. Some days we used to make six shillings a day regular. But then we usn't to go out every day, but take a rest at home. If we do well one day, then we might stop idle another day, resting. You see, we had to do our twenty or thirty miles sillin' them to get that money, and then the next day we was tired. The sillin' of papers is gradual fallin' off. I could go out and sell twenty dozen once, where I couldn't sell one now. I think I does a very grand day's work if I yearns a shilling. Perhaps some days I may lose by them. You see, if it's a very hot day, the papers gets dusty. And beside, the stuff gets melted and oozes out. Though that don't do much harm, cause we gets a bit of whitening and rubs them over. Four years ago we might make ten shillings a day at the papers. But now, taking from one end of the fly paper season to the other, which is about three months, I think we makes about one shilling a day out of papers. Though even that ain't quite certain. I never goes out without getting rid of mine somehow or another, but then I am obliged to walk quick and look about me. When it's a bad time for selling the papers, such as a wet cowl day, then most of the fly paper boys goes out with brushes cleaning boots. Most of the boys is now out hopping. They goes regular every year after the season is give over for flies. The stuff as they puts on the paper is made out of boiled oil and turpentine and resin. It's seldom as a fly lives more than five minutes after it gets on the paper, and then it's as dead as a house. The blue bottles is tougher, but they don't last long, though they keeps on fizzing as if they was trying to make a hole in the paper. The stuff is only poisonous for flies, though I never heard of anybody as ever eat a fly paper. The second lad I chose from among the group of applicants was of a middle age, and although the noisiest when among his companions, had no sooner entered the room with me than his whole manner changed. He sat himself down, bent up like a monkey, and scarcely ever turned his eyes from me. He seemed as nervous as if in a witness box, and kept playing with his grubby fingers till he had almost made them white. He calls me Curly. I come from Ireland too. I'm about fourteen year and have been in this line now, sir, about five year. I goes about the borders of the country. We general takes up the line about the beginning of June, that is, when we gets a good summer. When we gets a good close dull day like this, we does pretty well. But when we has first one day hot and then another rainy and cold, of course we don't get on so well. The most I sold was one day when I went to Uxbridge, and then I sold a gross and a half. I paid half a crown a gross for them. I was living with mother then, and she gave me the money to buy em, but I had to bring her back again all as I took. I always give her all I makes, except sixpence as I wants for my dinner, which is a couple of pennorth of bread and cheese and a pint of beer. I sold that gross and a half I spoke on at a halfpenny each, and I took nine shillings, so that I made five and sixpence. But then I had to leave London at three or four o'clock in the morning, and to stop out till twelve o'clock at night. I used to live out at Hammersmith then, and come up to St Giles every morning and buy the papers. I had to rise by half past two in the morning, and I'd get back again to Hammersmith by about six o'clock. I couldn't sell none on the road, cause the shops wasn't open. The flies is getting bad every summer. 
This year they aren't half so good as they was last year or the year before. I'm sure I don't know why there ain't so many, but they ain't so plentiful like. The best year was three year ago. I know that by the quantity as my customers bought off me, and in three days the papers was swarmed with flies. I've got regular customers where I calls two or three times a week to them. If I was to walk my rounds over, I could at the lowest sell from six to eight dozen at halfpenny each at once. If it was nice weather like today, so that it wouldn't come wet on me, I should make ten shillings a week regular. But it depends on the weather. If I was to put my profits by, I'm sure I should find I make more than six shillings a week and nearer eight. But the season is only for three months at most, and then we takes to boot cleaning. Near all the poor boys about here is fly paper sillin in the hot weather and boot cleaners at other times. Shops by the most of us in London. In Barnet, I sell sometimes as much as six or seven dozen to some of the grocers as buys to sell again, but I don't let them have them only when I can't get rid of them to other customers. Butchers is very fond of the papers to catch the blue bottles as gets in their meat, though there is a few butchers as have said to me, "Oh, go away! They draws the flies more than they catches 'em." Clothes shops again is very fond of 'em. I can't tell why they is fond of 'em, but I suppose cause the flies spots the goods. There's lots of boys going sellin' catch 'em alive os from Golden Lane and Whitechapel and the Borough. There's lots too comes out of Grey's Inn Lane and St Giles's. Near every boy who has nothing to do goes out with fly papers. Perhaps it ain't that the flies is fallen off that we don't sell so many papers now, but because there's so many boys at it. The most intelligent and the most gentle in his demeanour was a little boy who was scarcely tall enough to look on the table at which I was writing. If his face had been washed, he would have been a pretty-looking lad. For despite the black marks made by his knuckles during his last fit of crying, he had large, expressive eyes, and his features were round and plump, as though he were accustomed to more food than his companions. Whilst taking his statement, I was interrupted by the entrance of a woman whose fears had been aroused by the idea that I belonged to the ragged school and had come to look after the scholars. It's no good you're coming here for him. He's off hopping tomorrow with his mother, as has asked me to look after him, and it's only your sixpence he's wanting. It was with great difficulty that I could get rid of this lady's company, and indeed so great appeared to be the fear in the court that the object of my visit was to prevent the young gentlemen from making their harvest trip into the country, that a murmuring crowd began to assemble round the house where I was, determined to oppose me by force. Should I leave the premises accompanied by any of the youths? I've been longer at it than that last boy, though I'm only getting on for thirteen, and he's older than I'm, 'cause I'm little and he's big, getting a man. But I can sell them quite as well as he can, and sometimes better, for I can holler out just as loud, and I've got regular places to go to. I was a very little fellow when I first went out with them, but I could sell them pretty well then. Sometimes three or four dozen a day. I've got one place in a stable where I can sell a dozen at a time to country people. I calls out in the streets and I goes into the shops too and calls out, "Catch 'em alive! Catch 'em alive! Catch all the nasty black beetles, blue bottles, and flies! Catch 'em for teasing the babies' eyes!" That's what most of us boys cries out. Some boys who is stupid only says, "Catch 'em alive!" But people don't buy so well from them. Up in St Giles's there is a lot of fly boys, but they're a bad set and will fling mud at gentlemen, and some prigs the gentlemen's pockets. Sometimes, if I sells more than a big boy, he'll get mad and hit me. He'll tell me to give him a halfpenny and he won't touch me, and that if I don't, he'll kill me. Some of the boys takes an open fly paper and makes me look another way, and then they sticks the catch 'em alive on my face. The stuff won't come off without soap and hot water, and it goes black and looks like mud. One day a boy had a broken fly paper, and I was taking a drink of water, and he come behind me and slapped it up in my face. A gentleman as saw him give him a crack with a stick and me tuppence. 
It takes your breath away until a man comes and takes it off. It all stick to my hair, and I couldn't rack, note, comb, end note, right for some time. When we are selling papers, we have to walk a long way. Some boys go as far as Croydon and all about the country, but I don't go much further than Copenhagen Fields and straight down that way. I don't like going along with other boys. They take your customers away, for perhaps they'll sell them at three a penny to them and spoil the customers for you. I won't go with the big boy you saw, cause he's such a blackguard. When he's in the country, he'll go up to a lady and say, Want a fly paper, ma'am? And if she says no, he'll perhaps job his head in her face, butt at her like. When there's no flies and the catch em alives is out, then I goes tumbling. I can turn a carton wheel over on one hand. I'm going tomorrow to the country, harvesting and hopping, for as we says, go out hopping, come in jumping. We start at three o'clock tomorrow, and we shall get about twelve o'clock at night at Dead Man's Barn. It was left for poor people to sleep in, and the man there was buried in a corner. The man had got six farms of hops, and if his son hadn't buried him there, he wouldn't have had none of the riches. The greatest number of fly papers I've sold in a day is about eight dozen. I never sell no more than that. I wish I could. People won't buy em now. When I'm at it, I makes, taking one day with another, about ten shilling a week. You see, if I sold eight dozen, I'd make four shillings. I sell them at a penny each, and two for three halfpence and three for tuppence. When they get stale, I sells them at three a penny. I always begin by asking a penny each, and perhaps they'll say, Give me two for three halfpence. I'll say, Can't, ma'am. And then they pulls out a purse full of money and gives a penny. The police is very kind to us and don't interfere with us. If they sees another boy hitting us, they'll take off their belts and hit him. Sometimes I've sold a catch him alive to a policeman. He'll fold it up and put it in his pocket to take home with him. Perhaps he's got a kid and the flies teases its eyes. Some ladies like to buy fly cages better than catch em alives, because sometimes when they're putting em up, they falls in their faces, and then they screams. The Fly Paper Maker In a small attic room, in a house near Drury Lane, I found the catch em alive manufacturer and his family busy at their trade. Directly I entered the house where I had been told he lodged, I knew that I had come to the right address, for the staircase smelt of turpentine, as if it had been newly painted, the odour growing more and more powerful as I ascended. The little room where the man and his family worked was as hot as an oven, for although it was in the heat of summer, still his occupation forced him to have a fire burning for the purpose of melting and keeping fluid the different ingredients he spread upon his papers. When I opened the door of his room, I was at first puzzled to know how I should enter the apartment, for the ceiling was completely hidden by the papers which had been hung up to dry from the many strings stretched across the place, so that it resembled a washerwoman's backyard, with some thousands of red pocket handkerchiefs suspended in the air. I could see the legs of the manufacturer walking about at the further end, but the other part of his body was hidden from me. On his crying, Come in! I had to duck my head down and creep under the forest of paper strips rustling above us. The most curious characteristic of the apartment was the red colour with which everything was stained. The walls, floor and tables were all smeared with ochre, like the pockets of a drover. The papers that were drying were as red as the pages of a gold-leaf book. This curious appearance was owing to part of the process of catch em alive making, consisting in first covering the paper with coloured size to prevent the sticky solution from soaking into it. The room was so poorly furnished that it was evident the trade was not a lucrative one. An old Dutch clock with a pendulum as long as a walking stick was the only thing in the dwelling which was not indispensable to the calling. The chimney piece, that test of well-to-do in the houses of the poorer classes, had not a single ornament upon it. The long board on which the family worked served likewise as the table for the family meals 
and the food they ate had to be laid upon the red-smeared surface. There was but one chair, and that the wife occupied, and when the father or son wished to sit down, a tub of size was drawn out, with its trembling contents, from under the work-table, and on this they rested themselves. "'We are called in the trade,' said the father, "'fly-paper-makers. They used to put a nice name to the things once, and call them Egyptian fly-papers, but now they use merely the word fly-papers, or fly-destroyers, or fly-catchers, or catch em alive oh. I never made any calculation about flies, and how often they breeds. You see, it depends upon so many things how they are produced. For instance, if I was to put my papers on a dung heap, I might catch some thousands. And if I was to put a paper in an ice well, I don't suppose I should catch one. I know the flies produce some thousands each, because if you look at a paper well studied over with flies, you'll see, that is, if you look very carefully, where each fly has blown, as we call it, there'll be some millions on a paper, small grubs or little mites like. For a while struggling, the fly shoots forth the blows, and eventually these blows would turn into flies. I have been at flycatcher making for the last nine years. It's almost impossible to make any calculation as to the number of papers I make during the season, and this is the season. If it's fine weather, then flies is plentiful and the lads who sell the papers in the streets keep me busy. But if it's at all bad weather, then they turn their attention to blacking boots. It's quite a speculation, my business is, for all depends upon the lads coming to me to buy, and there's no certainty beyond. I every season expect that these lads who bought papers off me last year will come back and deal with me again. First of all, these lads will come for a dozen, or a couple of dozen, of papers, and so it goes on till perhaps they are able to sell half a gross a day, and then from that they will, if the weather is fine, get up to ten dozen, or perhaps a gross, but seldom or never over that. In the very busiest and hottest time as is, I have, for about two or three weeks, made as many as thirty-six gross of papers in a week. We generally begins about the end of June, or the beginning of July, and then for five or six weeks we goes on very busy, after that it dies out, and people gets tired of laying out their money. It's almost impossible to get at any calculation of the quantity I make. You see, today I haven't sold a gross, and yesterday I didn't sell more than a gross, and the last three days I haven't sold a single paper, it's been so wet. But last week I sold more than five gross a day, it varies so. Oh yes, I sell more than a hundred gross during the season. You may say that, for a month, I make about five gross a day, and that, taking six days to the week and thirty days to the month, makes a hundred and thirty gross, and then for another month I do about three gross a day, and that, at the same calculation, makes seventy-eight gross, or altogether one hundred and ninety-eight gross, or twenty-eight thousand five hundred and twelve single papers, and that is as near as I can tell you. Sometimes our season lasts more than two months. You may reckon it from the latter end of June to the end of August, or, if the weather is very hot, then we begins early in June and runs it into September. The prime time is when the flies get heavy and stings. That's when the papers sells most. There's others in the business besides myself. They lives up in St Giles's, and they sells them rather cheaper. At one time the shopkeepers used to make the papers, when they first commenced, they was sold at tuppence and threepence and fourpence apiece, but now they're down to three a penny in the streets, or a halfpenny for a single one. The boys, when they've got back the money they paid me for their stock, will sell what papers they have left at anything they'll fetch, because the papers gets dusty and spiles with the dust. I use the very best Times paper for my catch em alives. I gets them kept for me at stationers' shops and libraries and such like. I pays threepence a pound, or twenty-eight shillings the hundredweight. That's a long price, but you must have good paper if you want to make a good article. I could get paper at twopence a pound, but then it's only the cheap Sunday papers, and they're too slight. The morning papers are the best, and will stand the pulling and opening the papers, for we always fold the destroyers with the sticky sides together when finished. The composition I use is very stiff, 
If the paper is bad, they tear when you force them open for use. Some in the trade cut up their newspapers into twelve for the full sheet, but I cut mine up into only eight. The process is this. First of all, the paper is sized and coloured. We colour them by putting a little red lead into the size, because if the sticky side is not made apparent, the people won't buy them, because they might spoil the furniture by putting the composition side downwards. After sizing the papers, they are hung up to dry, and then the composition is laid on. This composition is a secret, and I'm obligated to keep it so, for of course all the boys who come here would be trying to make them, and not only would it injure me, but I'd warrant they'd injure themselves as well, by setting the house on fire. You may say that my composition is made from a mixture of resinous substances. Everything in making it depends upon using the proper proportions. There's some men who deal with me who know the substances to make the composition from, but because they haven't got the exact proportions of the quantities, they can't make it right. The great difficulty in making them is drying the papers after they are sized. Some days when it's fine, they'll dry as fast as you can hang them up almost, and other days they won't dry at all, in damp weather especially. There is some makers who sizes and colours their papers in the winter and then puts them to dry. And when the summer comes, then they has only to put on the composition. I'm a very quick hand in the trade, if you can call it one, for it only lasts three months at most, and is a very uncertain one too. Indeed, I don't know what you can style our business. It ain't a profession, and it ain't a trade. I suppose it's a calling. I'm a quick hand, I say, at spreading the composition, and I can, taking the day through, do about two gross an hour. That is, if the papers were sized ready for me. But as it is, having to size them first, I can't do more than three gross a day myself. But with my wife helping me, we can do such a thing as five gross a day. It's most important that the size should dry. Now those papers, note, producing some covered with a dead red coating of the size preparation, end note, have been done four days, and yet they're not dry, although to you they appear so but I can tell that they feel tough and not crisp as they ought to. When the size is damp, it makes them adhere to one another when I am laying the stuff on, and it sweats through and makes them heavy, and then they tears when I opens them. When I'm working, I first size the entire sheet. We put it on the table, and then we have a big brush and plaster it over. Then I gives it to my wife, and she hangs it up on a line. We can hang up a gross at a time here, and then the room is pretty full, and must seem strange to anybody coming in, though to us it's ordinary enough. The man was about to exhibit to us his method of proceeding, when his attention was drawn off by a smell which the moving of the different pots had caused. How strong this size smells, Charlotte, he said to his wife. It's the damp and heat of the room, does it? the wife replied, and then the narrative went on. Before putting on the composition, I cut up the papers into slips as fast as possible. That don't take long. We can cut them in first style, interrupted the wife. I can cut up four gross an hour, said a boy who was present. I don't think you could, Johnny, said the man. Two gross is nearer the mark to cut them evenly. It's only seventy sheets, remonstrated the lad, and that's only a little more than one a minute. A pile of entire newspapers was here brought out, and all of them coloured red on one side, like the leaves of the books in which gold leaf is kept. Judging from the trial at cutting which followed, we should conclude that the lad was correct in his calculation. When we put on the composition, continued the catch em alive maker, we has the cut slips piled up in a tall mound like, and then we have a big brush and dips it in the pot of stuff and rubs it in. We folds each catcher up as we does it, like a thin slice of bread and butter, and put it down. As I said before, at merely putting on the composition, I could do about two gross an hour. My price to the boys is tuppence halfpenny a dozen, or two and sixpence a gross, and out of that I don't get more than ninepence profit, for the paper, the resin, and the firing for melting the size and composition all takes off the profit. This season nearly all my customers have been boys. Last season I had a few men who dealt with me. The principal of those who buys of me is Irish. A boy will sometimes sell his papers for a halfpenny each, 
but the usual price is three a penny. Many of the blacking boys deal with me. If it's a fine day, it don't suit them at boot cleaning, and then they'll run out with my papers, and so they have two trades to their backs, one for fine and the other for wet weather. The first man, as was the inventor of these fly papers, kept a barber's shop in St. Andrew's Street, Seven Dials, of the name of Greenwood or Greenfinch, I forget which. I expect he discovered it by accident, using varnish and stuff, for stale varnish has nearly the same effect as our composition. He made them and sold them at first at threepence and fourpence apiece, and then it got down to a penny. He sold the receipt to some other parties, and then it got out through their having to employ men to help him. I worked for a party as made them, and then I set to work making them for myself, and afterwards hawking them. They was a greater novelty then than they are now, and sold pretty well. The men in the streets who had nothing to do used to ask me where I bought them, and then I used to give them my own address, and they'd come and find me. End of section six. Section 7 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Destroyers of Vermin, Part 7, of Bugs and Fleas. A numerous family of a large order of insects is but too well known, both in gardens and houses, under the general name of Bugs. Note, semicidae, end note. Most, if not all, of the species being distinguished by an exceedingly disagreeable smell, particularly when pressed or bruised. The sucking instrument of these insects has been so admirably dissected and delineated by Monsieur Savigny in his Theory of the Mouth of Six-Legged, note, hexapod, end note, insects, footnote, Memoire sur les animaux sans vertèbres, Volume 1, page 36, and footnote, that we cannot do better than follow so excellent a guide. The sucker is contained in a sheath, and this sheath is composed of four pieces, which, according to Savigny's theory, represent an under lip much prolonged. The edges bend downwards and form a canal, receiving the four bristles, which he supposes to correspond with the two mandibles and the two lower jaws. It is probable that the two middle of these bristles act as piercers, while the other two, being curved at the extremity, though not at all times naturally so, assist in the process of suction. The plant bugs are all furnished with wings and membranous wing cases, many of them being of considerable size and decked in showy colours. These differ in all those points from their congener, the bed bug. Note. Cimex lectoralius, end note, which is small, without wings, and of a dull, uniform brown. The name is of Welsh origin, being derived from the same root as bugbear, and hence the passage in the Psalms, quote, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, end quote. Footnote, Psalm 91, verse 5, end footnote, is rendered in Matthew's Bible, quote, Thou shalt not need to be afraid of any bugs by night. End quote. In earlier times, this insect was looked upon with no little fear, no doubt because it was not so abundant as at present. In the year 1503, says Muffet, Dr. Penny was called in great haste to a little village called Mortlake, near the Thames, to visit two noblemen who were much frightened by the appearance of bug bites and were in fear of I know not what contagion. But when the matter was known, and the insects caught, he laughed them out of all fear. Footnote. Theatre of Insects. Page 270. End footnote. This fact, of course, disproves the statement of Southall that bugs were not known in England before 1670. Linnaeus was of opinion, however, that the bug was not originally a native of Europe, but had been imported from America. Be this as it may, it seems to thrive but too well in our climate, though it multiplies less in Britain than in the warmer regions of the continent, where it is also said to grow to a larger size and to bite more keenly. This insect, it is said, is never seen in Ireland. Footnote, J.R. End footnote. Reader's Note 
J.R. refers to works by, or the person of, John Ray, Fellow of the Royal Society, 1627 to 1705. End reader's note. Commerce, says a learned entomologist, with many good things, has also introduced amongst us many great evils, of which noxious insects form no small part. And one of her worst presents was, doubtless, the disgusting animals called bugs. They seem, indeed, he adds, to have been productive of greater alarm at first than mischief, at least if we may judge from the change of name which took place upon their becoming common. Their original English name was chinche, or wall-louse, and the term bug, which is a Celtic word, signifying a ghost or goblin, was applied to them after Ray's time, most probably because they were considered as terrors by night. Hence our English word bugbear. The word in this sense often occurs in Shakespeare, Winter's Tale, Act 3, Scenes 2 and 3, Henry the Sixth, Act 5, Scene 2, Hamlet, Act 5, Scene 2. See Duce's Illustrations of Shakespeare, Volume 1, page 329. Even in our own island, these obtrusive insects often banish sleep. The night, says Goldsmith in his Animated Nature, is usually the season when the wretched have rest from their labour, but this seems the only season when the bug issues from its retreats to make its depredations. By day it lurks like a robber in the most secret parts of the bed, takes the advantage of every chink and cranny to make a secure lodgment, and contrives its habitation with so much art that it is no easy matter to discover its retreat. It seems to avoid the light with great cunning, and even if candles be kept burning, this formidable insect will not issue from its hiding place. But when darkness promises security, it then issues from every corner of the bed, drops from the tester, crawls from behind the arras, and travels with great assiduity to the unhappy patient who vainly wishes for rest. It is generally vain to destroy one only, as there are hundreds more to revenge their companion's fate, so that the person who thus is subject to be bitten, some individuals are exempt, remains the whole night like a sentinel upon duty, rather watching the approach of fresh invaders than inviting the pleasing approaches of sleep. Footnote. Goldsmith's Animated Nature, Volume 4, page 198. End footnote. Muffet assures us that against these enemies of our rest in the night, our merciful God hath furnished us with remedies, which we may fetch out of old and new writers, either to drive them away or kill them. Footnote. Theatre of Insects. End footnote. The following is given as the best poison for bugs by Mr. Brand of the Royal Institution. Reduce an ounce of corrosive sublimate, note, perchloride of mercury, end note, and one ounce of white arsenic to a fine powder. Mix with it one ounce of muriate of ammonia in powder, two ounces each of oil of turpentine and yellow wax, and eight ounces of olive oil. Put all these into a pipkin placed in a pan of boiling water, and when the wax is melted, stir the whole till cold in a mortar. Footnote. Materia Medica. Index. End footnote. A strong solution of corrosive sublimate, indeed, applied as a wash, is a most efficacious bug poison. Though most people dislike this insect, others have been known to regard it with protecting care. One gentleman would never suffer the bugs to be disturbed in his house, or his bedsteads removed, till, in the end, they swarmed to an incredible degree, crawling up even the walls of his drawing-room, and after his death millions were found in his bed and chamber furniture. Footnote. Nicholson's Journal, Volume 17, page 40. End footnote. In the Banyan Hospital, at Surat, the overseers are said frequently to hire beggars from the streets at a stipulated sum to pass the night among bugs and other vermin on the express condition of suffering them to enjoy their feast without molestation. Footnote. Forbes Oriental Memoirs, Volume 1. End footnote. The bedbug is not the only one of its congeners which preys upon man. 
St. Pierre mentions a bug found in the Mauritius, the bite of which is more venomous than the sting of a scorpion, being succeeded by a swelling as big as the egg of a pigeon, which continues for four or five days. Footnote. Voyage to the Isle of France. End footnote. Ray tells us that his friend Willoughby had suffered severe temporary pain in the same way from a water bug. Note. Notonecta glauca, Linnaeus. End note. Footnote. History of Insects, page 58. End footnote. The winged insects of the order to which the bedbug belongs often inflict very painful wounds, and it is even stated upon good authority that an insect of the order commonly known in the West Indies by the name of the wheel bug can communicate an electric shock to the person whose flesh it touches. The late Major General Davis, R.A., note, well known as a most accurate observer of nature and an indefatigable collector of her treasures, as well as a most admirable painter of them, end note. Having taken up this animal and placed it upon his hand, assures us that it gave him, with its legs, a considerable shock, as if from an electric jar, which he felt as high as his shoulders, and then dropping the creature, he observed six marks upon his hand where the six feet had stood. Bugs are very voracious and seem to bite most furiously in the autumn, as if determined to feast themselves before they retire to their winter quarters. There is another pernicious bed insect, the flea, note, Pulex irritans, Linnaeus, end note, which, being without wings, some of our readers may suppose to be nearly allied to the bed bug, though it does not belong even to the same order, but to a new one, note, Aphaniptera, Kirby, end note established on the principle that the wings are obsolescent or inconspicuous. Fleas, it may be worth remarking, are not all of one species, those which infest animals and birds, differing in many particulars from the common bed flea, note, Pulex irritans, end note. As many as twelve distinct sorts of fleas have been found in Britain alone. Footnote. Insect Transformations, page 393, end footnote. The most annoying species, however, is fortunately not indigenous, being a native of the tropical latitudes, and variously named in the West Indies, Chigo, Jigger, Nigua, Tungua, and Peak. Note, Pulex penetrans, Linnaeus. End note. According to Stedman, quote, This is a kind of small sand flea which gets in between the skin and the flesh without being felt, and generally under the nails of the toes, where, while it feeds, it keeps growing till it becomes the size of a pea, causing no further pain than a disagreeable itching. In process of time, its operation appears in the form of a small bladder, in which are deposited thousands of eggs, or nits, and which, if it breaks, produce so many young chigos, which in course of time create running ulcers, often a very dangerous consequence to the patient. So much so, indeed, that I knew a soldier, the soles of whose feet were obliged to be cut away before he could recover. And some men have lost their limbs by amputation, nay, even their lives, by having neglected in time to root out these abominable vermin. End quote. Walton mentions that a Capuchin friar, in order to study the history of the Chigo, permitted a colony of them to establish themselves in his feet. But before he could accomplish his object, his feet mortified and had to be amputated. Footnote. Walton's Hispaniola. End footnote. No wonder that Cardan calls the insect a very shrewd plague. Footnote. Subtilia, volume 9. End footnote. Several extraordinary feats of strength have been recorded of fleas by various authors. Footnote. Insect Transformations, page 180. End footnote and we shall here give our own testimony to a similar fact. At the fair of Charlton in Kent, 1830, we saw a man exhibit three fleas harnessed to a carriage in the form of an omnibus, at least 50 times their own bulk, which they pulled along with great ease. Another pair drew a chariot. The exhibitor showed the whole, first through a magnifying glass, and then to the naked eye, so that we were satisfied there was no deception. From the fleas being of large size, they were evidently all females. Footnote. Introduction, Volume 1, page 
page 102, J.R. End footnote. It is rarely, however, that we meet with fleas in the way of amusement, unless we are of the singular humour of the old lady mentioned by Kirby and Spence, who had a liking to them, because, said she, I think they are the prettiest little merry things in the world. I never saw a dull flea in all my life. When Ray and Willoughby were travelling, they found, quote, at Venice and Augsburg, fleas for sale, and at a small price too, decorated with steel or silver collars round their necks. When fleas are kept in a box amongst wool or cloth, in a warm place, and fed once a day, they will live a long time. When these insects begin to suck, they erect themselves almost perpendicularly, thrusting their sucker, which originates in the middle of the forehead, into the skin. The itching is not felt immediately, but a little afterwards. As soon as they are full of blood, they begin to void a portion of it, and thus, if permitted, they will continue for many hours sucking and voiding. After the first itching, no uneasiness is subsequently felt. Willoughby had a flea that lived for three months, sucking in this manner the blood of his hand. It was at length killed by the cold of winter. End quote. Footnote. J.R. End footnote. According to Muffet's account of the sucker of the flea, quote, the point of his nib is somewhat hard, that he may make it enter the better, and it must necessarily be hollow, that he may suck out the blood and carry it in. End quote. Footnote. Theatre of Insects, page 1102. End footnote. Modern authors, particularly Strauss and Kirby, show that Roussel was mistaken in supposing this sucker to consist of two pieces, as it is really made up of seven. First, there is a pair of triangular instruments, somewhat resembling the beak of a bird, inserted on each side of the mouth, under the parts which are generally regarded as the antennae. Next, a pair of long, sharp piercers, note, scalpula, Kirby, end note, which emerge from the head below the preceding instruments, whilst a pair of feelers, note, palpi, end note, consisting of four joints, is attached to these near their base. In fine, there is a long slender tongue, like a bristle, in the middle of these several pieces. Muffet says, quote, the lesser, leaner, and younger the fleas are, the sharper they bite, the fat ones being more inclined to tickle and play. They molest men that are sleeping, he adds, and trouble wounded and sick persons, from whom they escape by skipping. For as soon as they find they are arraigned to die, and feel the finger coming, on a sudden they are gone, and leap here and there, and so escape the danger. But so soon as day breaks, they forsake the bed. They then creep into the rough blankets, or hide themselves in rushes and dust, lying in ambush for pigeons, hens, and other birds, also for men and dogs, moles and mice, and vex such as pass by. Our hunters report that foxes are full of them, and they tell a pretty story how they get quit of them. The fox, say they, gathers some handfuls of wool from thorns and briars, and wrapping it up, holds it fast in his mouth. Then he goes by degrees into a cold river and dips himself down by little and little. When he finds that all the fleas are crept so high as his head for fear of drowning, and ultimately for shelter crept into the wool, he barks and spits out the wool, full of fleas, and thus, very frolically, being delivered from their molestations, he swims to land. End quote. Footnote. Theatre of Insects, page 1102. End footnote. This is a little more doubtful even than the story told of Christina, Queen of Sweden, who is reported to have fired at the fleas that troubled her with a piece of artillery, still exhibited in the Royal Arsenal at Stockholm. Footnote. Linnaeus, Lachesis Lapan. Volume 2, page 32, note. End footnote. Nor are fleas confined to the old continent, for Lewis and Clark found them exceedingly harassing on the banks of the Missouri, where it is said the native Indians are sometimes compelled to shift their quarters to escape their annoyance. They are not acquainted, it would therefore seem, with the device of the shepherds of Hungary, who grease their clothes with hog's lard to deter the fleas. Footnote Travels, 
and footnote, nor with the old English preventative, quote, while wormwood hath seed, get a handful or twain, to save against march, to make fleas refrain, where chamber is swept, and wormwood is strown, ne'er flea for his life dare abide to be known, end quote. Footnote. Tusser, points of good husbandry. End footnote. Linnaeus was in error in stating that the domestic cat, note, Felis maniculatus, timink, end note, is not infested with fleas, for on kittens in particular they abound as numerously as upon dogs. Footnote. J.R. End footnote. Her Majesty's Bug Destroyer. The vending of bug poison in the London streets is seldom followed as a regular source of living. We have met with persons who remember to have seen men selling penny packets of vermin poison, but to find out the vendors themselves was next to an impossibility. The men seem merely to take to the business as a living when all other sources have failed. All, however, agree in acknowledging that there is such a street trade but that the living it affords is so precarious that few men stop at it longer than two or three weeks. Perhaps the most eminent firm of the bug destroyers in London is that of Messrs. Tiffin and Son, but they have pursued their calling in the streets and rejoice in the title of Bug Destroyers to Her Majesty and the Royal Family. Mr. Tiffin, the senior partner in this house, most kindly obliged me with the following statement. It may be as well to say that Mr. Tiffin appears to have paid much attention to the subject of bugs, and has studied with much earnestness the natural history of this vermin. We can trace our business back, he said, as far as 1695, when one of our ancestors first turned his attention to the destruction of bugs. He was a lady's staymaker. Men used to make them in those days, though as far as that is concerned, it was a man that made my mother's dresses. This ancestor found some bugs in his house, a young colony of them, that had introduced themselves without his permission, and he didn't like their company, so he tried to turn them out of doors again, I have heard it said, in various ways. It is in history, and it has been handed down in my own family as well, that bugs were first introduced into England after the fire of London, in the timber that was brought for rebuilding the city thirty years after the fire. And it was about that time that my ancestor first discovered the colony of bugs in his house. I can't say whether he studied the subject of bug destroying, or whether he found out his stuff by accident, but he certainly did invent a compound which completely destroyed the bugs, and having been so successful in his own house, he named it to some of his customers who were similarly plagued, and that was the commencement of the present connection, which has continued up to this time. At the time of the illumination for the piece, I thought I must have something over my shop that would be both suitable for the event and to my business. So I had a transparency done and stretched on a big frame and lit up by gas, on which was written, May the destroyers of peace be destroyed by us, Tiffin and Son, bug destroyers to Her Majesty. Our business was formerly carried on in the Strand, where both my father and myself were born. In fact, I may say I was born to the bug business. I remember my father as well as possible. Indeed, I worked with him for ten or eleven years. He used, when I was a boy, to go out to his work killing bugs at his customers' houses with a sword by his side and a cocked hat and bag wig on his head. In fact, dressed up like a regular dandy. I remember my grandmother, too, when she was in the business, going to the different houses and seating herself in a chair and telling the men what they were to do, to clean the furniture and wash the woodwork. I have customers in our books for whom our house has worked these 150 years. That is, my father and self have worked for them and their fathers. We do the work by contract, examining the house every year. It's a precaution to keep the place comfortable. You see, servants are apt to bring bugs in their boxes, and though there may be only two or three bugs, perhaps, hidden in the woodwork and the clothes, yet they soon breed if left alone. We generally go in the spring before the bugs lay their eggs, or if that time passes, it ought to be done before June, before their eggs are hatched, though it's never too late to get rid of a nuisance. I mostly find the bugs in the bedsteads. 
but if they are left unmolested, they get numerous and climb to the tops of the rooms and about the corners of the ceilings. They colonise anywhere they can, though they are very high-minded and prefer lofty places. Where iron bedsteads are used, the bugs are more in the rooms, and that's why such things are bad. They don't keep a bug away from the person sleeping. Bugs will come if they're thirty yards off. I knew a case where a bug who used to come every night about thirty or forty feet, it was an immense large room, from a corner of the room to visit an old lady. There was only one bug, and he'd been there for a long time. I was sent for to find him out. It took me a long time to catch him. In that instance, I had to examine every part of the room, and when I got him, I gave him an extra nip to serve him out. The reason why I was so bothered was the bug had hidden itself near the window, the last place I should have thought of looking for him, for a bug never by choice faces the light. But when I came to inquire about it, I found that this old lady never rose till three o'clock in the day, and the window curtains were always drawn, so that there was no light like. Lord, yes, I am often sent for to catch a single bug. I've had to go many, many miles, even one hundred or two hundred, into the country, and perhaps catch only half a dozen bugs after all. But then, that's all that are there, so it answers our employer's purpose as well as if they were swarming. I work for the upper classes only, that is, for carriage company and such like approaching it, you know. I have noblemen's names, the first in England, on my books. My work is more method, and I may call it a scientific treating of the bugs rather than wholesale murder. We don't care about the thousands, it's the last bug we look for, whilst your carpenters and upholsters leave as many behind them, perhaps, as they manage to catch. The bite of the bug is very curious. They bite all persons the same. But the difference of effect lays in the constitution of the parties. I've never noticed that a different kind of skin makes any difference in being bitten. Whether the skin is moist or dry, it don't matter. Wherever bugs are, the person sleeping in the bed is sure to be fed on, whether they are marked or not. And as a proof, when nobody has slept in the bed for some time, the bugs become quite flat. And on the contrary, when the bed is always occupied, they are round as a ladybird. The flat bug is more ravenous, though even he will allow you time to go to sleep before he begins with you, or at least until he thinks you ought to be asleep. When they find all quiet, not even a light in the room will prevent their biting. But they are seldom or ever found under the bedclothes. They like a clear ground to get off and generally bite round the edges of the nightcap or the nightdress. When they are found in the bed, it's because the parties have been tossing about and have curled the sheets round the bugs. The finest and the fattest bugs I ever saw were those I found in a black man's bed. He was the favourite servant of an Indian general. He didn't want his bed done by me. He didn't want it touched. His bed was full of them. No beehive was ever fuller. The walls and all were the same. There wasn't a patch that wasn't crammed with them. He must have taken them all over the house wherever he went. I've known persons to be laid up for months through bug bites. There was a very handsome fair young lady I knew once, and she was much bitten about the arms and neck and face, so that her eyes were so swelled up she couldn't see. The spots rose up like blisters, the same as if stung with a nettle, only on a very large scale. The bites were very much inflamed, and after a time, they had the appearance of boils. Some people fancy, and it is historically recorded, that the bug smells because it has no vent. But that is fabulous, for they have a vent. It is not the human blood neither that makes them smell, because a young bug who has never touched a drop will smell. They breathe, I believe, through their sides, but I can't answer for that, though it's not through the head. They haven't got a mouth, but they insert into the skin the point of a tube which is quite as fine as a hair, through which they draw up the blood. I have many a time put a bug on the back of my hand to see how they bite, though I never felt the bite but once, and then I suppose the bug had pitched upon a very tender part, for it was a sharp prick, something like that of a leech bite. I once had a case of lice killing, for my process will answer as well for them as for bugs, though it's a thing I should never follow by choice. 
Lice seem to harbour pretty much the same as bugs do. I found them in the furniture. It was a nurse that brought them into the house, though she was as nice and clean a looking woman as ever I saw. I should almost imagine the lice must have been in her, for they say there is a disease of that kind, and if the ticks breed in sheep, why should not lice breed in us? For we're but live matter too. I didn't like myself at all for two or three days after that lice-killing job, I can assure you. It's the only case of the kind I ever had, and I can promise you it shall be the last. I was once at work on the Princess Charlotte's own bedstead. I was in the room, and she asked me if I had found anything, and I told her no. But just at that minute I did happen to catch one, and upon that she sprang up on the bed and put her hand on my shoulder to look at it. She had been tormented by the creature, because I was ordered to come directly, and that was the only one I found. When the princess saw it, she said, Oh, the nasty thing! That's what tormented me last night! Don't let him escape! I think he looked all the better for having tasted royal blood. I also profess to kill beetles, though you can never destroy them so effectually as you can bugs. For you see, beetles run from one house to another, and you can never perfectly get rid of them. You can only keep them under. Beetles will scrape their way and make their road round a fireplace. But how they manage to go from one house to another, I can't say, but they do. I never had patience enough to try and kill fleas by my process. It would be too much of a chivy to please me. I never heard of any but one man who seriously went to work selling bug poison in the streets. I was told by some persons that he was selling a first-rate thing, and I spent several days to find him out. But after all, his secret proved to be nothing at all. It was train oil, linseed and hempseed, crushed up all together, and the bugs were to eat it till they burst. After all, secrets for bug poisons ain't worth much, for all depends upon the application of them. For instance, it is often the case that I am sent for to find out one bug in a room large enough for a school. I discovered it when the creature had been three or four months there, as I could tell by his having changed his jacket so often, for bugs shed their skins, you know. No, there was no reason that he should have bred. It might have been a single gentleman or an old maid. A married couple of bugs will lay from forty to fifty eggs at one laying. The eggs are oval and are each as large as the thirty-second part of an inch, and when together are in the shape of a caraway comfit and of a bluish white colour. They'll lay this quantity of eggs three times in a season. The young ones are hatched direct from the egg, and like young partridges will often carry the broken eggs about with them, clinging to their back. They get their four quarters out and then they run about before the other legs are completely cleared. As soon as the bugs are born, they are of a cream colour and will take to blood directly. Indeed, if they don't get it in two or three days, they die. But after one feed, they will live a considerable time without a second meal. I have known old bugs to be frozen over in a horse pond when the furniture has been thrown in the water, and there they have remained for a good three weeks. Still, after they have got a little bit warm in the sun's rays, they have returned to life again. I have myself kept bugs for five years and a half without food, and a housekeeper at Lord H's informed me that an old bedstead that I was then moving from a storeroom was taken down forty-five years ago and had not been used since, but the bugs in it were still numerous, though as thin as living skeletons. They couldn't have lived upon the sap of the wood, it being worm-eaten and dry as a bone. A bug will live for a number of years, and we find that when bugs are put away in old furniture without food, they don't increase in number, so that, according to my belief, the bugs I just mentioned must have existed 45 years. Besides, they were large ones and very dark coloured, which is another proof of age. It is a dangerous time for bugs when they are shedding their skins, which they do about four times in the course of a year. Then they throw off their hard shell and have a soft coat, so that the least touch will kill them, whereas at other times they will take a strong pressure. I have plenty of bug skins, which I keep by me as curiosities, of all sizes and colours, and sometimes I have found the young bugs collected inside the old ones' skins for warmth, as if they had put on their father's greatcoat. 
There are white bugs, albinos you may call them, freaks of nature like. End of section 7 Section 8 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Destroyers of Vermin, Part 8. Black Beetles. Cockroaches are even more voracious than crickets. A small species, note, Blata laponica, Linnaeus, end note, occasionally met with about London, is said to swarm numerously in the huts of the Laplanders, and will sometimes, in conjunction with a carrion beetle, note Silpha laponica, Linnaeus, end note, devour, we are told, in a single day, their whole store of dried fish. In London, and many other parts of the country, cockroaches, originally introduced from abroad, have multiplied so prodigiously as to be a great nuisance. They are often so numerous in kitchens and lower rooms in the metropolis as literally to cover the floor and render it impossible for them to move except over each other's bodies. This indeed only happens after dark, for they are strictly night insects, and the instant a candle is intruded upon the assembly, they rush towards their hiding places, so that in a few seconds not one of the countless multitude is to be seen. In consequence of their numbers, independently of their carnivorous propensities, they are driven to eat anything that comes in their way, and besides devouring every species of kitchen stuff, they gnaw clothes, leather, and books. They likewise pollute everything they crawl over with an unpleasant, nauseous smell. These black beetles, however, as they are commonly called, are harmless when compared with the foreign species, the giant cockroach, note Blata gigantea, end note, which is not content with devouring the stores of the larder, but will attack human bodies, and even gnaw the extremities of the dead and dying. Note Drury's Illustrations of Natural History, Volume 3, Preface, end note. Cockroaches, at least the kind that is most abundant in Britain, hate the light and never come forth from their hiding places till the lights are removed or extinguished. Note the Blata Germanica, however, which abounds in some houses, is bolder, making its appearance in the day and running up the walls and over the tables to the great annoyance of the inhabitants. End note. In the London houses, especially on the ground floor, they are most abundant and consume everything they can find, flour, bread, meat, clothes, and even shoes. As soon as light, natural or artificial, appears, they all scamper off as fast as they can and vanish in an instant. These pests are not indigenous to this country and perhaps nowhere in Europe, but are one of the evils which commerce has imported. In Captain Cook's last voyage, the ships, while at Hushain, were infested with incredible numbers of these creatures, which it was found impossible by any means to destroy. Every kind of food, when exposed only for a few minutes, was covered with them, and pierced so full of holes that it resembled a honeycomb. They were so fond of ink that they ate out the writing on labels. Captain Cook's cockroaches were of two kinds, the Blata orientalis and Germanica. Note Encyclopedia Britannica, end note. The following fact we give from Mr. Douglas's World of Insects. Quote, Everybody has heard of a haunted house. Nearly every house in and about London is haunted. Let the doubters, if they have the courage, go stealthily down to the kitchen at midnight armed with a light and whatever other weapon they like, and they will see that beings of which Tam O'Shanter never dreamed, whose presence at daylight was only a myth, have here a local habitation and a name. Scared from their nocturnal revels, the creatures run and scamper in all directions, 
until, in a short time, the stage is clear, and, as in some legend of Diablerie, nothing remains but a most peculiar odour. These were no spirits, had nothing even of the fairy about them, but were veritable cockroaches, or black beetles, as they are more commonly but erroneously termed, for they are not beetles at all. They have prodigious powers of increase, and are a corresponding nuisance. Kill as many as you will, except perhaps by poison, and you cannot extirpate them. The cry is, still they come. One of the best ways to be rid of them is to keep a hedgehog, to which creature they are a favourite food, and his nocturnal habits make him awake to theirs. I have known cats eat cockroaches, but they do not thrive upon them, end quote. One article of their food would hardly have been suspected, says Mr. Newman, in a note communicated to the Entomological Society at the meeting in February 1855. There is nothing new under the sun, so says the proverb. I believed until a few days back that I possessed the knowledge of a fact in the dietary economy of the cockroach of which entomologists were not cognizant. But I find myself forestalled. The fact is as old as the hills. It is that the cockroach seeks with diligence and devours with great gusto the common bedbug. I will not mention names, but I am so confident of the veracity of the narrator that I willingly take the entire responsibility of the following narrative. Poverty makes one acquainted with strange bedfellows, and my informant bears willing testimony to the truth of the adage. He had not been prosperous and had sought shelter in a London boarding house. Every night he saw cockroaches ascending his bed curtains. Every morning he complained to his very respectable landlady and invariably received the comforting assurance that there was not a black beetle in the house. Still he pursued his nocturnal investigations, and he not only saw cockroaches running along the tester of the bed, but to his great astonishment he positively observed one of them seize a bug, and he therefore concluded, and not without some show of reason, that the cockroach ascended the curtains with this especial object, and that the more odoriferous insect is a favourite food of the major one. The following extract from Mr. Webster's narrative of Foster's voyage corroborates this recent observation and illustrates the proverb which I have taken as my text. Quote, Cockroaches, those nuisances of ships, are plentiful at St. Helena, and yet, bad as they are, they are more endurable than bugs. Previous to our arrival here in the Chanticleer, we had suffered great inconvenience from the latter. But the cockroaches no sooner made their appearance than the bugs entirely disappeared. The fact is, the cockroach preys upon them and leaves no sign or vestige of where they have been. So far, the latter is a most valuable insect. End quote. So great is the annoyance and discomfort arising from these insects in cockney households that the author of a paper in the Daily News discusses the best means of effecting their extirpation. The writer of the article referred to avows his conviction that the ingenious individual who shall devise the means of effectually ridding our houses of these insect pests will deserve to be ranked amongst the benefactors of mankind. The writer details the various expedients resorted to hedgehogs, cucumber peel, red wafers, phosphoric paste, glazed basins or pie dishes filled with beer, or a syrup of beer and sugar, with bits of wood set up from the floor to the edge for the creatures to run up by and then be precipitated into the fatal lake. But believes that none of these methods are fundamental enough for the evil, which, so far as he is yet aware, can only be effectually cured by heating our houses by steam. Beetle Destroyers A firm which has been established in London seven years and which manufactures exclusively 
poison known to the trade as the phosphor paste for the destruction of black beetles, cockroaches, rats, mice, and so on, were kind enough to give me the following information. Quote, we have now sold this vermin poison for seven years, but we have never had an application for our composition from any street seller. We have seen a year or two since a man about London who used to sell beetle wafers, but as we knew that kind of article to be entirely useless, we were not surprised to find that he did not succeed in making a living. We have not heard of him for some time, and have no doubt he is dead or has taken up some other line of employment. It is a strange fact, perhaps, but we do not know anything, or scarcely anything, as to the kind of people and tradesmen who purchase our poison. To speak the truth, we do not like to make too many inquiries of our customers. Sometimes, when they have used more than their customary quantity, we have asked casually how it was and to what kind of business people they disposed of it, and we have always been met with an evasive sort of answer. You see, tradesmen don't like to divulge too much, for it must be a poor kind of profession or calling that there are no secrets in. And again, they fancy we want to know what description of trades use the most of our composition so that we might supply them direct from ourselves. From this cause, we have made it a rule not to inquire curiously into the matters of our customers. We are quite content to dispose of the quantity we do, for we employ six travellers to call on chemists and oilmen for the town trade and four for the country. The other day, an elderly lady from High Street, Camden Town, called upon us. She stated that she was overrun with black beetles and wished to buy some of our paste from ourselves, for she said she always found things better if you purchased them off the maker as you were sure to get them stronger, and by that means avoided the adulteration of the shopkeepers. But, as we have said, we would not supply a single box to anyone, not wishing to give our agents any cause for complaint. We were obliged to refuse to sell to the old lady. We don't care to say how many boxes we sell in the year, but we can tell you, sir, that we sell more for beetle poisoning in the summer than in the winter as a matter of course. When we find that a particular district uses almost an equal quantity all the year round, we make sure that that is a rat district, for where there is not the heat of summer to breed beetles, it must follow that the people wish to get rid of rats. Brixton, Hackney, Balls Pond and Lower Road, Islington are the places that use most of our paste, those districts lying low and being consequently damp. Camden Town, though it is in a high situation, is very much infested with beetles. It is a clay soil, you understand, which retains moisture and will not allow it to filter through like gravel. This is why in some very low districts, where the houses are built on gravel, we sell scarcely any of our paste. As the farmers say, a good fruit year is a good fly year. So we say a good dull, wet summer is a good beetle summer, and this has been a very fertile year, and we only hope it will be as good next year. We don't believe in rat destroyers. They profess to kill with weasels and a lot of things, and sometimes even say they can charm them away. Captains of vessels, when they arrive in the docks, will employ these people, and, as we say, they generally use our composition. But as long as their vessels are cleared of the vermin, they don't care to know how it is done. A man who drives about in a cart and does a great business in this way, we have reason to believe, uses a great quantity of our phosphor paste. He comes from somewhere down the East End or Whitechapel way. Our prices are too high for the street sellers. Your street seller can only afford to sell an article made by a person in but a very little better position than himself. Even our small boxes cost at the trade price two shillings a dozen, and when sold will only produce three shillings. So you can imagine the profit is not enough for the itinerant vendor. Bakers don't use much of our paste, for they seem to think it no use to destroy the vermin. Beetles and bakers' shops generally go together.
End quote. Crickets. The house cricket may perhaps be deemed a still more annoying insect than the common cockroach, adding an incessant noise to its ravages. Though it may not be unpleasant to hear for a short time the cricket chirrup in the hearth, so constant a din every evening must greatly interrupt comfort and conversation. These garrulous animals, which live in a kind of artificial torrid zone, are very thirsty souls and are frequently found drowned in pans of water, milk, broth and the like. Whatever is moist, even stockings or linen hung out to dry, is to them a bonne bouche. They will eat the skimmings of pots, yeast, crumbs of bread and even salt or anything within their reach. Sometimes they are so abundant in houses as to become absolute pests flying into the candles and even into people's faces. Note Kirby and Spence's Entomology, Volume 1, pages 206 and 207. End note. The house cricket, note, Acheta domestica, end note, is well known for its habit of picking out the mortar of ovens and fireplaces, where it not only enjoys warmth, but can procure abundance of food. It is usually supposed that it feeds on bread, Monsieur Latre says it only eats insects, and it certainly thrives well in houses infested by the cockroach, but we have also known it eat and destroy lamb's wool stockings and other woolen stuffs hung near a fire to dry. Although the food of crickets consists chiefly of vegetable substances, they exhibit a propensity to carnivorous habits. The house cricket thrives best in the vicinity of a baker's oven, where there are plenty of breadcrumbs. Muffet marvels at its extreme lankness, inasmuch as there is not, quote, found in the belly any superfluity at all, although it feed on the moisture of flesh and fat of broth, to which, either poured out or reserved, it runs in the night. Yet, although it feed on bread, yet is the belly always lank and void of superfluity. End quote. Note, Theatre of Insects, page 96. End note. White of Selborne again says, quote, As one would suppose, from the burning atmosphere which they inhabit, they are a thirsty race, and show a great propensity for liquids, being frequently found dead in pans of water, milk, broth, or the like. Whatever is moist, they are fond of and therefore they often gnaw holes in wet woolen stockings and aprons that are hung to the fire. These crickets are not only very thirsty, but very voracious, for they will eat the scummings of pots, yeast, bread, and kitchen offal, or sweepings of almost every description. End quote. Note. Natural History of Selborne. End note. The cricket is evidently not fond of hard labour, but prefers those places where the mortar is already loosened, or at least is new, soft, and easily scooped out, and in this way it will dig covert channels from room to room. In summer, crickets often make excursions from the house to the neighbouring fields and dwell in the crevices of rubbish, or the cracks made in the ground by dry weather, where they chirp as merrily as in the snuggest chimney corner. Whether they ever dig retreats in such circumstances we have not ascertained, though it is not improbable they may do so for the purpose of making nests. Those, says Mr. Guff of Manchester, who have attended to the manners of the hearth cricket, know that it passes the hottest part of the summer in sunny situations, concealed in the crevices of walls and heaps of rubbish. It quits its summer abode about the end of August, and fixes its residence by the fireside of kitchens or cottages where it multiplies its species and is as merry at Christmas as other insects in the dog days. Thus do the comforts of a warm hearth afford the cricket a safe refuge, not from death, but from temporary torpidity, though it can support this for a long time when deprived by accident of artificial warmth. I came to a knowledge of this fact continues Mr. Guff, by planting a colony of these insects in a kitchen where a constant fire was kept through the summer, but which is discontinued from November till June, with the exception of a day once in six or eight weeks. 
The crickets were brought from a distance and let go in this room in the beginning of September 1806. Here they increased considerably in the course of two months, but were not heard or seen after the fire was removed. Their disappearance led me to conclude that the cold had killed them, but in this I was mistaken, for a brisk fire being kept up for a whole day in the winter, the warmth of it invited my colony from their hiding place, but not before the evening, after which they continued to skip about and chirp the greater part of the following day, when they again disappeared, being compelled by the returning cold to take refuge in their former retreats. They left the chimney corner on the 25th of May, 1807, after a fit of very hot weather, and revisited their winter residence on the 31st of August. Here they spent the summer merely, and at present, note January 1808, end note, lie torpid in the crevices of the chimney, with the exception of those days on which they are recalled to a temporary existence by the comforts of the fire, end quote. Note, Reeve, Essay on the Turpidity of Animals, page 84, end note. Monsieur Bory de Saint-Vincent tells us that the Spaniards are so fond of crickets that they keep them in cages like singing birds. Note, Dictionnaire classique d'histoire naturelle Lyon, Rennie's Insect Architecture, 4th edition, page 242, end note. Associated as is the chirping song of the cricket family of insects with the snug chimney corner or the sunshine of summer, it affords a pleasure which certainly does not arise from the intrinsic quality of its music. Sounds, says White, do not always give us pleasure according to their sweetness and melody, nor do harsh sounds always displease. Thus the shrilling of the field cricket, note, Acheta campestris, End note. Though sharp and stridulous, yet marvellously delights some hearers, filling their minds with a train of summer ideas of everything that is rural, verdurous, and joyous. Note. Natural History of Selborne, Volume 2, page 73. End note. Quote. Sounds inharmonious in themselves and harsh, yet heard in scenes where peace forever reigns, and only there... Please highly for their sake. End quote. Cooper, Task, Book One. This circumstance, no doubt, causes the Spaniards to keep them in cages as we do singing birds. White tells us that if supplied with moistened leaves, they will sing as merrily and loud in a paper cage as in the fields. But he did not succeed in planting a colony of them in the terrace of his garden, though he bored holes for them in the turf to save them the labour of digging. The hearth cricket, again, though we hear it occasionally in the hedge banks in summer, prefers the warmth of an oven or a good fire, and thence, residing as it were always in the torrid zone, is ever alert and merry, a good Christmas fire being to it what the heat of the dog days is to others. Though crickets are frequently heard by day, yet their natural time of motion is only in the night, as soon as darkness prevails, the chirping increases, whilst the hearth crickets come running forth, and are often to be seen in great numbers, from the size of a flea to that of their full stature. Like the field cricket, the hearth crickets are sometimes kept for their music, and the learned Scaliger took so great a fancy to their song that he was accustomed to keep them in a box in his study. It is reported that in some parts of Africa they are kept and fed in a kind of iron oven and sold to the natives who like their chirp and think it is a good soporific. Note, Muffet, Theatre of Insects, page 136. End note. Milton, too, chose for his contemplative pleasures a spot where crickets resorted. Quote, where glowing embers through the room teach light to counterfeit a gloom, far from all resort of mirth, see the cricket on the hearth. End quote. Note. Il penseroso. End note. Rennie, in his Insect Miscellanies, says, quote, We have been as unsuccessful in transplanting the hearth cricket as White was with the field crickets. In two different houses we have repeatedly introduced crickets, 
but could not prevail on them to stay. One of our trials, indeed, was made in summer, with insects brought from a garden wall, and it is probable they thought the kitchen fireside too hot at that season. End quote. Note, page 82. End note. The so-called chirp of the cricket is a vulgar error. The instrument, for so it may be styled, upon which the male cricket plays, note, the female is mute, end note, consists of strong nervures or rough strings in the wing cases, by the friction of which, against each other, a sound is produced and communicated to the membranes stretched between them, in the same manner as the vibrations caused by the friction of the finger upon the tambourine are diffused over its surface. It is erroneously stated in a popular work that, quote, the organ is a membrane which, in contracting, by means of a muscle and tendon placed under the wings of the insect, folds down somewhat like a fan, end quote, and this being, quote, always dry, yields by its motion a sharp piercing sound, end quote. Note, Bingley, Animal Biography, Volume 4, 6th edition. Rennie's Insect Miscellanies, page 62. End note. End of section 8. Section 9 of London Labour and the London Poor, volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Our Street Folk. 1. Street Exhibitors. Punch. The performer of Punch that I saw was a short, dark, pleasant-looking man, dressed in a very greasy and very shiny green shooting jacket. This was fastened together by one button in front, all the other buttonholes having been burst through. Protruding from his bosom, a corner of the Pandean pipes was just visible, and as he told me the story of his adventures, he kept playing with the band of his very limp and very rusty old beaver hat. He had formerly been a gentleman's servant and was especially civil in his manners. He came to me with his hair tidily brushed for the occasion, but apologised for his appearance on entering the room. He was very communicative and took great delight in talking like punch with his call in his mouth while some young children were in the room and who, hearing the well-known sound of punch's voice, looked all about for the figure. Not seeing the show, they fancied the man had the figure in his pocket, and that the sounds came from it. The change from Punch's voice to the man's natural tone was managed without an effort, and instantaneously. It had a very peculiar effect. "'I am the proprietor of a Punch's show,' he said. "'I goes about with it myself, and performs inside the frame behind the green bays. "'I have a partner what plays the music, the pipes and drum.' "'Him as you seed with me. "'I have been five and twenty year now at the business. "'I wish I'd never seen it, though it's been a money-making business. "'Indeed, the best of all the street exhibitions, I may say. "'I'm fifty years old. "'I took to it for money gains. "'That was what I done it for. "'I formerly lived in service, was a footman in a gentleman's family. "'When I first took to it, I could make two and three pounds a day. "'I could so.' You see, the way in which I took first to the business was this here. There was a party used to come and cheer for us at my master's house, and her son, having a exhibition of his own, and being in want of a partner, asked me if so be I'd go out, which was a thing that I degraded at the time. He gave me information as to what the money-taking was, and it seemed to me that good that it would pay me better nor service. I had twenty pounds a year in my place, and my board and lodging, and two suits of clothes. But the young man told me as how I could make a pound a day at the punch and duty business, after a little practice. I took a deal of persuasion, though, before I join him. It was beneath my dignity to fall from a footman to a showman. But, you see, the French gentleman, as I lived with, he were a merchant in the city, and had fourteen clerks working for him, went back to his own country to reside, and left me with a written character. But that was no use to me, though I'd find recommendations at the back of it, no one would look at it. So I was five months out of employment, knocking about, 
living first on my wages and then on my clothes, till all was gone but the few rags on my back. So I began to think that the punch and duty business was better than starving, after all. Yes, I should think anything was better than that, though it's a business that, after you've once took to, you never can get out of. People fancies you know too much and won't have nothing to say to you. If I got a situation at a tradesman's, why, the boys would be sure to recognise me behind the counter and begin a shouting into the shop. They must shout, you know. Oh, there's Punch and Judy. There's Punch a-sarving out the customers. Ah, it's a great annoyance being a public character, I can assure you, sir. Go where you will, it's Punchy, Punchy. As for the boys, they'll never leave me alone till I die, I know. And I suppose in my old age I shall have to take to the parish broom. All our forefathers died in the workhouse. I don't know a Punchy's showman that hasn't. One of my partners was buried by the workhouse. And even old Pike, the most noted showman as ever was, died in the workhouse. Pike and Porcini. Porcini was the first original street punch, and Pike was his apprentice. Their names is handed down to posterity among the noblemen and footmen of the land. They both died in the workhouse, and in course I shall do the same. Something else might turn up, to be sure. We can't say what this luck of the world is. I'm obliged to strive very hard. Very hard indeed, sir, now, to get a living, and then not to get it after all, at times, compelled to go short, often. Punch, you know, sir, is a dramatic performance in two acts. It's a play, you may say. I don't think it can be called a tragedy, exactly. A drama is what we names it. There is tragic parts, and comic and sentimental parts, too. Some families where I performs will have it most sentimental, in the original style. Them families is generally sentimental theirselves. Others is all for the comic, and then I has to kick up all the games I can. To the sentimental folk, I am obliged to perform wary steady and wary slow, and leave out all comic words in business. They won't have no ghost, no coffin, and no devil, and that's what I call spiling the performance entirely. It's the march of intellect what's a doing all this, it is, sir. But I was a-going to tell you about my first shining the business. Well, you see, after a good deal of persuading, and being drew to it, I may say, I consented to go out with the young man as I were a-speaking about. He was to give me twelve shillings a week, and my keep, for two years certain, till I could get my own show things together, and for that I was to carry the show and go round and collect. Collecting, you know, sounds better than begging. The pronunciation's better like. Sometimes the people says, when they sees us a-coming round, Oh, here they comes a-begging. But it can't be begging, you know, when you're a-exerting yourselves. I couldn't play the drum and pipes, so the young man used to do that himself, to call the people together before he got into the show. I used to stand outside and patter to the figures. The first time that ever I went out with Punch was in the beginning of August 1825. I did all I could to avoid being seen. My dignity was hurt at being obligated to take to the streets for a living. At first I fought shy and used to feel queer somehow, you don't know how like, whenever the people used to look at me. I remember very well the first street as ever I performed in. It was off Gray's Inn, one of them quiet, genteel streets, and when the mob began to gather round, I felt all overish and I turned my head to the frame instead of the people. We hadn't had no rehearsals aforehand, and I did the patter quite promiscuous. There was not much talk, to be sure, required then, and what little there was consisted merely in calling out the names of the figures as they came up, and these my master prompted me with from inside the frame. But little as there was for me to do, I know I never could have done it if it hadn't been for the spirits, the false spirits, you see, Note, a little drop of gin, end note, as my master gave me in the morning. The first time as ever I made my appearance in public, I collected as much as eight shillings, and my master said, after the performance was over, you'll do. You see, I was partly in livery, and looked a little bit decent-like. After this was over, I kept on going out with my master for two years, as I had agreed, and at the end of that time I had saved enough to start a show of my own 
I bought the show off old Persini, the man as first brought punch into the streets of England. To be sure, there was a woman over here with it before then. Her name was... I can't think of it just now, but she never performed in the streets. So we consider Persini as our real forefather. It isn't much more nor seventy years since Persini, he was a wary old man when he died and blind, showed the exhibition in the streets of London. I've heard tell that old Persini used to take very often as much as ten pounds a day, and he used to sit down to his fowls and wine, and the very best of everything, like the first gentleman in the land. Indeed, he made enough money at the business to be quite a tip-top gentleman, that he did. But he never took care of a halfpenny he got. He was that independent that if he was wanted to perform, sir, he'd come at his time, not yearn. At last he reduced himself to want and died in St. Giles's workhouse. Ah, poor fellow, he oughtn't to have been allowed to die where he did, after amusing the public for so many years. Everyone in London knowed him. Lords, dukes, princes, squires, and wagabonds, all used to stop to laugh at his performance, and a funny, clever old fellow he was. He was past performing when I bought my show of him, and very poor. He was living in a coal-yard, Drury Lane, and had scarcely a bit of food to eat. He had spent all he had got in drink, and in treating friends. I, anyone, no matter who. He didn't study the world, nor himself neither. As fast as the money came, it went, and when it was gone, why, he'd go to work and get more. His show was a very inferior one, though it were the first. Nothing at all like them about now, nothing near as good. If you only had four sticks then, it was quite enough to make plenty of money out of, so long as it was punch. I gave him thirty-five shillings for the stand, figures and all. I bought it cheap, you see, for it was thrown on one side, and was of no use to anyone but such as myself. There was twelve figures, and the other apparatus, such as the gallows, ladder, horse, bell, and stuffed dog. The characters was Punch, Judy, Child, Beadle, Scaramouche, Nobody, Jack Ketch, the Grand Seneur, the Doctor, the Devil, there was no ghost used then, Mary Andrew, and the Blind Man. These last two characters are quite done with now. The heads of the characters was all carved in wood and dressed in the proper costume of the country. There was at that time, and is now, a real carver for the punch business. He was dear but very good and excellent. His punchy's head was the best as I ever seed. The nose and chin used to meet quite close together. A set of new figures, dressed and all, would come to about fifteen pounds. Each head costs five shillings for the bare carving alone, and every figure that we has takes at least a yard of cloth to dress him, besides ornaments and things that comes very expensive. A good show at the present time will cost three pounds odd for the stand alone. That's including bays, the frontispiece, the back scene, the cottage, and the letter cloth, or what is called the drop scene at the theatres. In the old ancient style, the back scene used to pull up and change into a jail scene, but that's all altered now. We've got more upon the comic business now, and tries to do more with Toby than with the prison scene. The prison is what we calls the sentimental style. Formerly, Toby was only a stuffed figure. It was Pike who first hit upon introducing a live dog, and a great hit it were. It made a grand alteration in the exhibition. For now the performance is called Punch and Toby as well. There is one punch about the streets at present that tries it on with three dogs, but that ain't much of a go, too much of a good thing I calls it. Punch, as I said before, is a drama in two hats. We don't drop the scene at the end of the first. The drum and pipes strikes up instead. The first act we consider to end with Punch being taken to prison for the murder of his wife and child. The great difficulty in performing punch consists in the speaking, which is done by a call or whistle in the mouth, such as this here. Note, he then produced the call from his waistcoat pocket. It was a small flat instrument made of two curved pieces of metal about the size of a knee buckle, bound together with black thread. Between these was a plate of some substance, apparently silk, which he said was a secret. The call, he told me, was tuned to a musical instrument and took a considerable time to learn. 
He afterwards took from his pocket two of the small metallic plates unbound. He said the composition they were made of was also one of the secrets of the profession. They were not tin nor zinc because... Both of them metals were poisons in the mouth and injurious to the constitution. End note. These calls, he continued, we often sell to gentlemen for a sovereign apiece, and for that we give them a receipt how to use them. They ain't whistles but calls, or unknown tongues, as we sometimes name them, because with them in the mouth we can pronounce each word as plain as any parson. We have two or three kinds one for out-of-doors, one for indoors, one for speaking and for singing, and another for selling. I've sold many a one to gentlemen going along, so I generally keeps a hextra one with me. Porcini brought the calls into this country with him from Italy, and we who are now in the profession have all learned how to make and use them, either from him or those as he had taught them to. I learned the use of mine from Porcini himself. My master, whom I went out with at first, would never teach me, and was very particular in keeping it all secret from me. Persini taught me the call at the time I bought his show of him. I was six months in perfecting myself in the use of it. I kept practising away night and morning with it, until I got it quite perfect. It was no use trying at home, because it sounds quite different in the hope and hair. Often when I've made him at home... I'm obliged to take the calls to pieces after trying them out in the streets. They've been made upon too weak a scale. When I was practising, I used to go into the parks and fields and out of the way places, so as to get to know how to use it in the hope and hair. Now I'm reckoned one of the best speakers in the whole profession. When I made my first appearance as a regular performer of punch on my own account, I did feel uncommon nervous, to be sure. Though I knowed the people couldn't see me behind the bays, still I felt as if all the eyes of the country were upon me. It was as much as ever I could do to get the words out and keep the figures from shaking. When I struck up the first song, my voice trembled so as I thought I never should be able to get to the end of the first act. I soon, however, got over that there, and at present I play before the whole bench of bishops as cool as a cowcumber. We always have a partner now to play the drum and pipes and collect the money. This, however, is only a recent dodge. In older times we used to go about with a trumpet. That was Porcini's ancient style. But now that's stopped. Only Her Majesty's males may blow trumpets in the streets at present. The first person who went out with me was my wife. She used to stand outside and keep the boys from peeping through the bays, whilst I was performing behind it and she used to collect the money afterwards as well. I carried the show and trumpet, and she the box. She's been dead these five years now. Take one week with another, all through the year, I should say I made then five pounds regular. I have taken as much as two pounds ten shillings in one day in the streets, and I used to think it a bad day's business at that time if I took only one pound. You can see Punch has been good work, a money-making business, and beat all mechanics right out. If I could take as much as I did when I first began, what must my forefathers have done when the business was five times as good as ever it were in my time? Why, I leave you to judge what old Porcini and Pike must have made. Twenty years ago, I have often and often got seven shillings and eight shillings for one exhibition in the streets. Two shillings and three shillings I used to think low to get at one collection, and many times I'd perform eight or ten times in a day. We didn't care much about work then, for we could get money fast enough, but now I often show twenty times in the day and get scarcely a bare living at it after all. That shows the times, you know, sir, what times was and is now. After performing in the streets of a day, we used to attend private parties in the evening, and get sometimes as much as two pounds for the exhibition. This used to be at the juvenile parties of the nobility, and the performance lasted about an hour and a half. For a short performance of half an hour at a gentleman's house, we never had less than one pound. A performance outside the house was two shillings and sixpence, but we often got as much as ten shillings for it. I have performed for almost all the nobility, Lord Blank was particular partial to us, and one of our greatest patronisers. 
At the time of the police bill, I met him in Cheltenham on my travels, and he told me as he had saved Punch's neck once more, and it's through him principally that we are allowed to exhibit in the streets. Punch is exempt from the Police Act. If you read the Act throughout, you won't find Punch mentioned in it. But all I've been telling you is about the business as it was. What it is, is a very different concern. A good day for us now seldom gets beyond five shillings, and that's between myself and my partner, who plays the drum and pipes. Often we are out all day and get a mere nothing. Many days we have been out and taken nothing at all. That's very common when we dwell upon hoarders. By dwelling on hoarders, I means looking out for gentlemen what wants us to play in front of their houses. When we strike up in the Hopin Street, we take upon a haverage, only threepence a show. In course we may do more, but that's about the sum, take one street performance with another. Them kind of performances is what we calls short showing. We gets the halfpence and hooks it. A long pitch is the name we gives to performances that lasts about half an hour or more. Them long pitches we confine solely to street corners in public thoroughfares, and then we take about a shilling upon a haverage, and more if it's to be got. We never turns away nothing. Boys, look up your fardens, says the outside man. It ain't half over yet. We'll show it all through. The short shows we do only in private by streets, and of them we can get through about twenty in the day. That's as much as we can tackle. Ten in the morning and ten in the afternoon. Of the long pitches we can only do eight in the day. We start on our rounds at nine in the morning and remain out till dark at night. We gets a snack at the publics on our road. The best hours for punch are in the morning from nine till ten, because then the children are at home. After that, you know, they goes out with the maids for a walk. From twelve till three is good again, and then from six till nine. That's because the children are mostly at home at them hours. We make much more by hoarders for performance outside the gentlemen's houses than we do by performing in public in the Hopin streets. Monday is the best day for street business. Friday is no day at all because then the poor people has spent all their money. If we was to pitch on a Friday, we shouldn't take a halfpenny in the streets. So we in general on that day goes round for hoarders. Wednesday, Thursday and Friday is the best days for us with hoarders at gentlemen's houses. We do much better in the spring than at any other time in the year, excepting holiday time, at midsummer and Christmas. That's what we call punches season. We do most at evening parties in the holiday time, and if there's a pin to choose between them, I should say Christmas holidays was the best. For attending evening parties now, we generally get one pound, and our refreshments, as much more as they like to give us. But the business gets slacker and slacker every season. Where I went to ten parties twenty years ago, I don't go to two now. People isn't getting tired of our performances, but stingier, that's it. Everybody looks at their money now afore they parts with it, and gentlefolks haggles and cheapens us down to shillings and sixpences, as if they was guineas in the holding time. Our business is very much like hackney coachwork. We do best in wet weather. It looks like rain this evening, and I'm uncommon glad on it, to be sure. You see, the vet keeps the children indoors all day, and then they want something to quiet them a bit, and the mothers and fathers, to pacify the dears, gives us a hoarder to perform. It mustn't rain cats and dogs, that's as bad as no rain at all. What we likes is a regular, good, steady Scotch mist, for then we takes double what we takes on other days. In summer we does little or nothing, the children are out all day enjoying themselves in the parks. The best pitch of all in London is Leicester Square. There's all sorts of classes you see passing there. Then comes Regent Street. The corner of Burlington Street is uncommon good, and there's a good public in there besides. Bond Street ain't no good now. Oxford Street up by Old Cavendish Street, or Oxford Market, or Well Street, are all favourite pitches for punch. We don't do much in the city, People has their heads all full of business there, and them as is greedy after the money ain't no friend of Punch's. 
Tottenham Court Road, the New Road, and all the environs of London is pretty good. Hampstead, though, ain't no good. They've got too poor there. I'd sooner not go at all than to Hampstead. Belgrave Square and all about that part is uncommon good. But when there's many chapels, punch won't do at all. I did once, though, strike up opposition to a street preacher what was a holding forth in the new road, and did uncommon well. All his flock, as he called them, left him, and come over to look at me. Punch and preaching is two different creeds, opposition parties, I may say. We, in generally, walks from twelve to twenty mile every day, and carries the show, which weighs a good half hundred, at the least. After great exertion, our voice very often fails us, for speaking all day through the call is very tiring, especially when we are chirruping up so as to bring the children to the vendors. The boys is the greatest nuisances we has to contend with. Wherever we goes, we are sure of plenty of boys for a hindrance. But they've got no money, bother em, and they'll follow us for miles, so that we're often compelled to go miles to avoid them. Many parts is swarming with boys, such as Bite Chapel, Spitalfields. That's the worst place for boys I ever come a near. They're like flies in summer there, only much more thicker. I never shows my face within miles of them parts. Chelsea, again, has an uncommon lot of boys, and wherever we know the children swarm, there's the spots we makes a point of avoiding. Why, the boys is such a obstruction to our performance that often we are obliged to drop the curtain for em. They'll throw one another's caps into the frame while I'm inside on it. And do what we will, we can't keep em from poking their fingers through the baize and making holes to peep through. Then they will keep tapping the drum. But the worst of all is, the most of em ain't got a farthing to bless themselves with, and they will shove into the best places. Soldiers again we don't like, they've got no money. No, not even so much as pockets, sir. Nusses ain't no good. Even if the mothers of the dear little children has given em a penny to spend, why, the nusses takes it from em and keeps it for ribbons. Sometimes we can coax a penny out of the children, but the nusses knows too much to be gammoned by us. Indeed, servants in general don't do the thing what's right to us. Some is good to us, but the most of em will have poundage out of what we get. About sixpence out of every half-crown is what the footman takes from us. We in generally goes into the country in the summer time for two or three months. Watering places is very good in July and August. Punch mostly goes down to the seaside with the quality. Brighton, though, ain't no account. The pavilion's done up with, and therefore Punch has discontinued his visits. We don't put up at the trampers' houses in our travels, but in generally inns is where we stays because we considered ourselves to be above the other showmen and mendicants. At one lodging house as I stopped at once in Warwick, there was as many as fifty staying there, what got their living by street performances. The greater part were Italian boys and girls. There are altogether as many as sixteen Punch and Judy frames in England. Eight of these is at work in London, and the other eight in the country. And to each of these frames there are two men, we are all acquainted with one another, are all sociable together, and know where each other is and what they are doing on. When one comes home, another goes out. That's the way we proceed through life. It wouldn't do for two to go to the same place. If two of us happen to meet at one town, we join and shift partners and share the money. One goes one way and one another, and we meet at night and reckon up over a sociable pint or a glass. We shift partners so as each may know how much the other has taken. It's the common practice for the man what performs punch to share with the one what plays the drum and pipes. Each has half what is collected. But if the partner can't play the drum and pipes, and only carries the frame and collects, then his share is but a third of what is taken, till he learns how to perform himself. The street performers of London lives mostly in little rooms of their own. They has generally wives and one or two children who are brought up to the business. 
Some lives about the Westminster Road and St. George's East. A great many are in Locks Fields. They are all the old school that way. Then some, or rather the principal part of the showmen, are to be found about Lisson Grove. In this neighbourhood there is a house of call, where they all assembles in the evening. There are very few in Brick Lane, Spitalfields now. That is mostly deserted by showmen. The West End is the great resort of all, for it's there the money lays, and there the showmen abound. We all know one another, and can tell in what part of the country the others are. We have intelligence by letters from all parts. There's a punch I knows on now, is either in the Isle of Man or on his way to it. End of section 9Section 10 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Street Exhibitors, Part 2. Punch, Part 2. Punch Talk. Bona parlare means language, name of patter. Uite manjare, no food. Uite lente, no bed. Yete bivare, no drink. I've yete manjare and yete bivare. And what's worse, yete lente. This is better than the coster's talk, because that ain't no slang at all. And this is a broken Italian, and much higher than the coster's lingo. We know what o'clock it is besides. Scene with two punchmen. How are you getting on? I might say to another punchman. Ultra cattiva, he'd say. If I was doing a little, I'd say, Bonner, let us have a shantabivari, pot of beer. If we has a good pitch, we never tell one another, for business is business. If they know we've a bonner pitch, they'll oppose, which makes it bad. Co and co is our term for partner, or questa questa as well. Ultra cattiva, no bona. Slamaris, figures, frames, scenes, properties. Slum, call or unknown tongue. Ultra cativa slum, not a good call. Tambora, drum, that's Italian. Pipares, pipes. Questo homa, avarding the slum. Scaparit, orderly. There's someone a looking at the slum, be off quickly. Fielia is a child. Homa is a man. Donna, a female. Charfering Homa, talking man, policeman. Policeman can't interfere with us, we are sanctioned. Punch is exempt out of the police act. Some's very good men, and some of them are tyrants. But generally speaking, they're all very kind to us, and allows us every privilege. That's a flattery, you know, because you'd better not meddle with them. Civility always gains its esteem. The man here took a large clasp knife out of his breeches pocket. This here knife is part of Punchy's tools or materials, of great utility, for it cannot be done without. The knife serves for a hammer to draw nails and drive them in again, and is very handy on a country road to cut a beef steak. Not a mistake. Well, you cannot cut a mistake, can you? And is a real poor man's friend to a certainty. This here is the needle that completes our tools. Note, takes out a needle from inside his waistcoat collar. End note. And is used to sew up our cativa stumps. That is, Punch's breeches and Judy's petticoats and his master's old clothes when they're in holes. I likes to have everything tidy and respectable, not knowing where I'm going to perform to, for every day is a new day that we never see afore and shall never see again. We do not know the produce of this world, being luxuriant, that's moral, being humane, kind and generous to all our society of life. We men's our cativa and slums when they gets teary. If you was to show that to some of our line, they'd be horrified. They can't talk so affluent, you know, in all kinds of black slums. Under the hijaris, and we're no care, vardaras questa. Questa is a shirt, 
pronunciation for questra homa. Once too, when I was scarpering with my culling in the monkey, I went to Mandari the Katila slums in a churchyard and sat down under the tombs to stitch him up a bit, thinking no one would varder us there. But Mr. Cruikshank took us off there as we was a-sitting. I know I'm the same party, cause Joe seen the print, you know, and drawed quite natural, as now in print, with the slomaris a-laying about on all the tombstones round us. The Punchman at the Theatre I often used when a youth to be very fond of plays and romances, and frequently went to theatres to learn knowledge, of which I think there is a great deal of knowledge to be learnt from those places. That gives the theatres a touch, helps them on a bit. I was very partial and fond of seeing Romo and Juliet, Othello, and the Knights of St. John, and the pretty gal of Peerless Pool, Macbeth and the Three Dancing Witches. Don Gurvarni pleased me best of all, though. What took me uncommon were the funeral processions of Juliet. It affects the heart and brings us to our natural feelings. I took my ghost from Romo and Juliet. The ghost comes from the grave, and it's beautiful. I used to like Keen, the principal performer. Oh, admirable, most admirable he were, and especially in Othello. For then he was like my Jim Crow here, and was always a great friend and supporter of his old friend Punch. Othello murders his wife, you know, like Punch does. Othello kills her, cause the green-eyed monster has got into his art, and he being so extremely fond on her. But Punch kills hisn by accident, though he did not intend to do it, for the act of Parliament against husbands beating wives was not known in his time. A most excellent law that there, for it causes husbands and wives to be kind and natural one with the other, all through the society of life. Judy irritates her husband Punch, for to strike the fatal blow, which at the same time fifth no intention to commit it, not knowing at the same time, being rather out of his mind, what he was about. I hope this here will be a good example both to men and wives, always to be kind and obliging to each other, and that will help them through the mainder with peace and happiness, and will rest in peace with all mankind, that's moral. It must be well worded, you know, that's my beauty. Mr. Punch's Refreshment Always Mr. Punch, when he performs to any nobleman's juvenile parties, he requires a little refreshment and spirits before commencing, because the performance will go far superior. But where teetotalers is, he plays very mournful, and they don't have the best parts of the dramatical performance, cause pump vatter gives a person no heart to exhibit his performance, where if any spirits is given to him, he would be sure to give the best of satisfaction. I likes where I goes to perform for the gentleman, to ring the bell, and say to the butler to bring this here party up whatever he chooses. But Punch is always moderate. He likes one eye wetted, then the t'other after. But he likes the best, not particular to brandy, for fear of his nose of fading, and afeard of his losing the colour. All theatrical people, and even the great Edmund Keane, used to take a drop before commencing performance, and Punch must do the same, for it enlivens his spirits cheers his heart up, and enables him to give the best of satisfaction imaginable. The History of Punch There are hopperas and romances. A romance is far different to a hoppera, you know, for one is interesting, and the other is dull and void of apprehension. The romance is the interesting one, and of the two I likes it the best. But let every one speak as they find, that's moral. Jack Shepherd, you know, is a romance, and a fine one, but Punch is a hoppera, a hoproar we calls it, and the most pleasing and most interesting of all as was ever produced. Punch never was beat and never will, being the oldest performance for many hundred years, and now handed down to prosperity. There's a fine moral in it too. The history or origination of Punch Never put yourself out of your way for me. I'm one of the happiest men in existence and gives no trouble. Is taken from Italy and brought over to England by Persini and exhibited in the streets of London for the first time from 60 to 70 years ago. 
though he was not the first man who exhibited, for there was a female here before him, but not to perform at all in public. Name unknown, but handed down to prosperity. She brought the figures and frame over with her, but never showed them, keeping it an unknown secret. Borsini came from Italy and landed in England, and exhibited his performance in the streets of London, and realised an immense sum of money. Borsini always carried a rum bottle in his pocket, "'cause Punch is a rum fellow, you see, and he's very fond of rum, "'and drank out of this unbeknown behind the bays, "'afore he went into the frame, "'so that it should lay in his power "'to give the audience a most excellent performance. "'He was a man as gave the greatest satisfaction, "'and he was the first man that brought a street organ "'into England from Italy. "'His name is handed down to prosperity "'among all classes of society in life.' At first, the performance was quite different then to what it is now. It was all sentimental then, and very touching to the feelings, and full of good morals. The first part was only made up of the killing of his wife and Babby, and the second with the execution of the hangman and killing of the devil. That was the original drama of Punch, handed down to prosperity for 800 years. The killing of the devil makes it one of the most moral plays as is, for it stops Satan's career of life, and then we can all do as we likes afterwards. Borsini lived like the first nobleman in the land, and realised an immense deal of money during his lifetime. We all considered him to be our forefather. He was a very old man when he died. I've heard tell he used to take very often as much as ten pounds a day, and now it's come down to little more than ten pence and he used to sit down to his fowls and wine, and the very best of luxuriousness, like the first nobleman in the world, such as a bottle of wine, and etc. At last he reduced himself to want, and died in the workhouse. Ah, poor fellow, he didn't ought to have been let die where he did. But misfortunes will happen to all, that's moral. Everyone in London knowed him, lords, dukes, squires, princes, and wagabonds, all used to stop and laugh at his pleasing and very interesting performance. And a funny old fellow he was, and so fond of his snuff. His name is writ in the annals of history, and handed down as long as grass grows and water runs. For when grass ceases to grow, you know, and water ceases to run, this world will be no utility. That's moral. Pike, the second noted street performer of Punch, was Prosini's apprentice and he succeeded him after his career. He is handed down as a most clever exhibitor of punch and showman, because he used to go about the country with wagons too. He exhibited the performance for many years, and at last came to decay, and died in the workhouse. He was the first inventor of the live dog called Toby, and a great invention it was, being a great undertaking of a new and excellent addition to Punch's performance. That's well worded. We must place the words in a superior manner to please the public. Then if, as you see, all our forefathers went to decay and died in the workhouse, what prospect have we to look forward to before us, at the present time, but to share the same fate, unless we meet with sufficient encouragement in this life? But hoping it will not be so, knowing that there is a new generation and a new exhibition, we hope the public at large will help and assist, and help us to keep our head above water, so that we shall never float down the River Thames, to be picked up, carried in a shell, coroner's inquest held, taken to the workhouse, popped into the pit hole. And there's an end to another poor old punch. That's moral. A footman is far superior to a showman, cause a showman is held to be of low degrade, and are thought as such, and so circumstantiated as to be looked upon as a mendicant. But still we are not, for collecting ain't begging, it's only soliciting. Cause Parsons, you know, I gives them a rub here, preaches a sermon, and collects at the doors. So I puts myself on the same footing as they. That's moral, and it's optional, you know. If I takes a hat round, they has a plate and they get sovereigns where we has only browns. But we are thankful for all, and always look for encouragement, 
and hopes kind support from all classes of society in life. Punch has two kinds of performances, short shows and long ones, according to Denari. Short shows are for Kativa Denari and long pitches for the Bona Denari. At the short shows we get the Hapens and Steps It, Scafari as we say, and at the long pitches we keeps it up for half an hour or an hour maybe, not particular, if the Browns tumble in well, for we never leave off while there's a major soldi, that's a halfpenny, or even a quarterin, that's a farden, to be made. The long pitches we fixes at the principal street corners of London. We never turn away nothing. Boys, look up your fardens, says the outside man. It ain't half over yet, and we'll show it all through. Punch is like the income tax gatherer, takes all we can get, and never turns away nothing. That is our moral. Punch is like the rest of the world. He has got bad morals, but very few of them. The showman inside the frame says, while he's a-working the figures, Cully, how are you a-getting on? Very inferior indeed, I'm sorry to say, master. The company, though very respectable, seems to have no pence among em. What quanta denari have you chaffered, I say? Soldi major quarterin, that means three halfpence, three fardens. That is all I have accumulated amongst this most respectable and numerous company. Never mind, master, the showman will go on. Try the generosity of the public once again. Well, I think it's of very little utility to collect round again, for I've met with that poor encouragement. Never mind, master, show away. I'll go round again and chance my luck. The ladies and gentlemen have not seen sufficient, I think. Well, master, I've got tres major, that is, three halfpence, more, and now it's all over this time. Boys, go home and say your prayers, we says, and steps it. Such scenes of life we see, no person would hardly credit what we go through. We travel often, yueti manjari, note, no food, end note, and oftentimes we are in fluence, according as luck runs. We now principally dwells on orders at noblemen's houses. The suburbs of London pays us far better than the busy town of London. When we are dwelling on orders, we goes along the streets, chirruping, Rutuerovi, oe, oe, oerovi. That means, any more wanted? That's the pronunciation of the call in the old Italian style, Turove, turu, 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 turui. That we does when we are dwelling for orders mostly at noblemen's houses. It brings the juveniles to the window and causes the greatest of attractions to the children of noblemen's families, both rich and poor, lords, dukes, earls and squires and gentlefolks. Call hunting, that's another term for dwelling on orders, pays better than pitching. But orders is very casual and pitching is a certainty. We are sure of a brown or two in the streets, and noblemen's work don't come often. We must have it authentic, for we travels many days and don't succeed in getting one. At other times we are more fluent, but when both combine together, it's merely a living, after all said and done, by great exertion and hard perseverance and acidity. For the business gets slacker and slacker every year and I expect at last it will come to the dogs, not Toby, because he is dead and gone. People isn't getting tired with our performances. They are more delighted than ever. But they're stingier. Everybody looks twice at their money afore they parts with it. That's a rub at the mean ones, and they wants it uncommon bad. And then sometimes the blinds is all drawed down on account of the sun, and that cooks our goose or it's too hot for people to stop and varder, that means see. In the cold days, when we pitch, people stops a few minutes, drops their browns, and goes away about their business to make room for more. The spring of the year is the best of the four seasons for us. A sailor, and a last half seas over, we like best of all. He will tip his mag. We always insure a few pence, and sometimes a shilling, of them. We are fond of sweeps too, they're a sure brown, if they've got one, 
and they'll give before many a gentleman. But what we can't abide no how is the shabby genteel, them ultra cativa, and no mistake. For they'll stand with their mouths wide open like a nutcracker, and is never satisfied, and is too grand even to laugh. It's too much trouble to carry halfpence, and they've never no change, or else they'd give us some. In fact, they've no money at all. They want it all for, and so on. Mr. Punch's figures. This is Punch. This his wife Judy. They never was married, not for this eight hundred years in the original drama. It is a drama in two acts. Is Punch. There was a Miss Polly. And she was Punch's mistress, and dressed in silks and satins. Judy catches Punch with her, and that there causes all the disturbance. Ah, it's a beautiful history. There's a deal of morals with it, and there's a large volume wrote about it. It's to be got now. This here is Judy, their only child. She's three years old, come tomorrow, and heir to all his estate, which is only a saucepan without a handle. Well, then I brings out the beadle. Punch's nose is the ornament to his face. It's a great value, and the hump on his back is never to be got rid on, being born with him, and never to be done without. Punch was silly and out of his mind, which is in the drama, and the cause of his throwing his child out of winder, which he did. Judy went out and left him to nurse the child, and the child gets so terrible cross he gets out of patience. And tries to sing a song to it, and ends by chucking it into the street. Punch is cunning and up to all kinds of antics if he ain't out of his mind, artful like. My opinion of Punch is he's very eccentric, with good and bad morals attached. Very good he was in regard to benevolence, because you see, in the olden style there was a blind man, and he used to come and ask charity of him. And Punch used to pity him and give him a trifle, you know. This is in the olden style, from Persini, you know. The carving on his face is a great art, and there's only one man as does it regular. His nose and chin, by meeting together, we thinks the great beauty. Oh, he's admirable. He was very fond of himself when he was alive. His name was Punchinello, and we calls him Punch. That's partly for short and partly on account of the boys. For they calls it punch in hell. -o. Oh, there's punch in hell. They'd say, and gentle folks don't like to hear them words. Punch has very small legs and small arms. It's quite out of portion, on course, but still it's nature. For folks with big bellies generally has thin pins of their own. His dress has never been altered. The use of his high hat is to show his half foolish head. And the other parts is after the best olden fashion. Judy, you see, is very ugly. She represents Punch, cause you see, if the two comes together, it generally happens that they're summat alike. And you see, it's because his wife were so ugly that he had a mistress. You see, a head like that there wouldn't please most people. The mistress Polly dances with Punch just like a lady in a drawing room. There ain't no grievance between him and Judy on account of Miss Polly, as she's called. That's the olden style of all, 'cause Judy don't know nothing about it. Miss Polly was left out because it wasn't exactly moral. Opinions has changed. We ain't better, I fancy. Such things goes on, but people don't like to let it be seen now. That's the difference. Judy's dress, you see, is far different, bless you, than Miss Polly's. Judy's, you see, is bed furniture stuff. And Polly's all silk and satin. Yes, that's the way of the world. The wife comes off second best. The baby's like his father. He's his pet all over, and the pride of his heart. Wouldn't take all the world for it, you know. Though he does throw him out of the window. He's got his father's nose, and is his daddy all over, from the top of his head to the tip of his toe. He never was weaned. Punch, you know, is so red through drink. He'd look nothing if his nose were not deep scarlet. Punch used to drink hard one time, and so he does now if he can get it. His babby is red all the same to correspond. 
This is the beadle of the parish, which tries to quell all disturbances, but finds it impossible to do it. The beadle has got a very reddish nose. He is a very severe, harsh man, but Punch conquers him. You see, he's dressed in the olden style, a brown coat with gold lace and cocked hat and all. He has to take Punch up for killing his wife and Babby, but Punch beats the beadle, for every time he comes up, he knocks him down. This next one is the merry clown, what tries his rig with Punch up and down. That's a rhyme, you see. This is the merry clown that tries his tricks all round. This here's the new style, for we dwells more on the comical now. In the olden time we used to have a scaramouche with a chalk head. He used to torment Punch and dodge him about, till at last Punch used to give him a crack on the head and smash it all to pieces, and then cry out, Oh dear, oh dear, I didn't go to do it. It was an accident done on purpose. But now we do with Clown and the Sausages. Scaramouche never talked, only did the valley business, dumb motions. But the clown speaks theatrical, comic business and sentimental. Punch being silly and out of his mind, the clown persuades Punch that he wants something to eat. The clown gets into the public house to try what he can steal. He pokes his head out of the window and says, Here you are, here you are. And then he asks Punch to give him a helping hand and so makes Punch steal the sausages. They are the very best pork wadding sausages, made six years ago and warranted fresh, and will keep forever. This here's the poker, about which the clown says, Would you like something hot? Punch says, Yes. And then the clown burns Punch's nose, and sits down on it himself and burns his breeches. Oh, it's a jolly lark when I shows it. Clown says to Punch, Don't make a noise, you'll wake the landlord up. The landlord, you see, pretends to be asleep. Clown says, You mustn't holler. No, says Punch, I won't. And still he hollers all the louder. This is Jim Crow. You see, he's got a chain, but he's lost his watch. He let it fall on Fish Street Hill the other day and broke it all to pieces. He's a nigger. He says, Me like everybody. Not every, but every, cause that nigger. Instead of Jim Crow, we used formerly to show the Grand Turk of Sinoa, called Shalabala. Sinoa is nowhere, for he's only a substance, you know. I can't find Sinoa, although I've tried, and thinks it's at the bottom of the sea, where the black fish lays. Jim Crow sprung from rice, from America. He brought it over here. Then, you see, being a novelty, all classes of society is pleased. Everybody liked to hear Jim Crow sung, and so we had to do it. The people used to stand round, and I used to take some good money with it too, sir, on Hay Hill. Everybody's funny nowadays, and they like comic business. They won't listen to anything sensible or sentimental, but they want foolishness. The bigger fool gets the most money. Many people says... What a fool you must look. At that I put my head back. Come on. I shan't. I shall stop a little longer. This is the ghost that appears to Punch for destroying his wife and child. She's the ghost of the two together, or else by rights there ought to be a little ghost as well, but we should have such a lot to carry about. But Punch, being surprised at the ghost, falls into hysterics, represented as such. Punch is really terrified, for he trembles like a haspen leaf, cause he never killed his wife. He's got no eyes and no teeth, and can't see out of his mouth, or cannot, rather. Them can't words ain't grammatical. When Punch sees the ghost, he lays down and kicks the bucket, and represents he's dead. The ghost is very effective, when it comes up very solemn and mournful like in Romo and Juliet. I took it from that, you know. There's a ghost in that when she comes out of the grave. Punch sits down on his seat and sings his merry song of olden times and don't see the ghost till he gets a tap on the cheek and then he thinks it's somebody else. Instead of that, when he turns round, he's most terrible alarmed, putting his arms up and out. The drum goes very shaky when the ghost comes up. A little bit of The Dead March in Saul or 
Home sweet home. Anything like that. Slow. We none on us likes to be hurried to the grave. I now takes up the doctor. This is the doctor that cures all sick mates and says, Taste of my drugs before you die. You'll say they are well made. The doctor always wears a white ermine wig. Rabbit skin wouldn't do. We can't go so common as that. It's most costly because it was made for him. After the ghost has appeared, Punch falls down and calls loudly for the doctor and offers fifty thousand pounds for one. Then the doctor feels his pulse and says, Very unfortunate misfortune. I have forgot my spectacles, cause I never had none. I can see all through it. The man's not dead. The doctor gives Punch physic. That's stick licorice, what he subscribes for him. But Punch don't like it, though it's a capital subscription for a cure for the headache. I dare say, Mr. Mayhew, sir, you thinks me a very funny fellow. Punch tries to pay the doctor back with his own physic, but he misses him every time. Doctors don't like to take their own stuff anyhow. This is the publican, as Punch steals the sausages from. He used to be the Grand Turk of Sonoa, or Shalabala, afore the fashion changed. For a new world always wants new things. The people are like babies, they must have a fresh toy, you know, and every day is a new day that we never seed before. There's a moral for you. It'll make a beautiful book when you comes to have the morals explained. You see, you might still fancy Punch was the Grand Turk, for he's got his moustaches still. But they're getting so fashionable that even the publicans wear them, so it don't matter. This tall figure is the hangman and finisher of the law, as does the business in the twinkling of a bedpost. He's like the income tax gatherer. He takes all in and lets none out, for a guilty conscience needs no accusing. Punch being condemned to suffer by the laws of his country makes a mistake for once in his life, and always did, and always will, keep a-doing it. Therefore, by cunningness and artfulness, Punch persuades Jack Ketch to show him the way, which he very willingly doeth, to slip his head into the noose, when Punch takes the opportunity to pull the rope after he has shown him the way, and is exempt for once more, and quite free. Now, this is the coffin, and this is the pall. Punch is in a great way, after he's hung the man, for assistance, when he calls his favourite friend, Joey Grimaldi, the clown, to aid and assist him, because he's afeard that he'll be taken for the crime what he's committed. Then the body is placed in the coffin, but as the undertaker ain't made it long enough, they'll have to double him up. The undertaker requests permission to get it altered. You see, it's a royal coffin with gold and silver and copper nails, with no plates and scarlet cloth, because that's royalty. The undertakers forgot the lid of the coffin, you see. We don't use lids, because it makes them lighter to carry. This is the pall that covers him over, to keep the flies from biting him. We call it St. Paul's. Don't you see? Paul's and Paul's is the same word, with an S to it, is comic. That'd make a beautiful play, that would. Then we take out the figures, as I am doing now, from the box, and they exaunt with a dance. Here's somebody a-coming, make haste, the clown says, and then they exaunt, you know, or go off. This here is the scaramouche that dances without a head, and yet has got a head that'll reach from here to St. Paul's, but it's scarcely ever to be seen, cause his father was my mother, don't you see? Punch says that it's a beautiful figure. I've only made it lately. Instead of him, we used to have a nobody. The figure is to be worked with four heads. That's to say, one coming out of each arm, one from the body, and one from the neck. Note, he touches each part as he speaks. End note. Scaramouche is old-fashioned, newly revived. He comes up for a finish, you know. This figure's all for dancing, the same as the ghost is, and don't say nothing. Punch, being surprised to see such a thing, don't know what to make on it. He bolts away, for you see, 
not whispering and putting up two hands first, and then using the other as if working scaramouche, end note. I want my two hands to work him. After Punch goes away, the figure dances to amuse the public, then he exonts, and Punch comes up again for to finish the remainder part of his performance. He sings as if he'd forgot all that's gone before, and wishes only to amuse the public at large. That's to show his silliness and simplicity. He sings comic or sentimental, such as God Save the Queen, that's sentimental, or Getting Upstairs and Playing on the Fiddle, or Dusty Bob, or Rory O'More with the chill off. Them's all comic, but the Queen's sentimental. This here is Satan. We might say the devil, but that ain't right, and general folk don't like such words. He is now commonly called Spring-Heeled Jack, or the Russian Bear. That's since the war. You see, he's chained up forever. For if you read, it says somewhere in the scripture that he's bound down for two thousand years. I used to read it myself once, and the figure shows you that he's chained up never to be let loose no more. He comes up at the last and shows himself to punch, but it ain't continued long, you know, the figure being too frightful for people to see without being frightened. Unless we are on comic business and showing him as Spring-Heeled Jack or the Russian Bear, for then we keeps him up a long time. Punch kills him, puts him on the top of his stick and cries, Hooray, the devil's dead, and we can all do as we like. Goodbye, farewell, and it's all over. But the curtain don't come down, cause we haven't got none. This here's the bell. Stop a minute, I forgot. This is Punch's comic music, commonly called a piano sixty, not piano forty, cause Punch wants something out of the common way, and it plays fifty tunes all at once. This is the bell which he uses to rattle in the publican's ears when he's asleep and wakes his children all up after the nuss has put him to bed. All this is to show his foolishness and simplicity, for it's one of his foolish tricks and frolics for to amuse himself. But he's a chap as won't stand much nonsense from other people, because his morals are true, just, right, and sound. Although he does kill his wife and baby, knock down the beadle, Jack Ketch, and the Grand Seigneur, and puts an end to the very devil himself. End of section 10 Section 11 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry Street Exhibitors, Part 3 Punch, Part 3 Description of Frame and Proscenium Ladies and gents, the man says outside the show afore striking up, I'm now going to exhibit a performance worthy of your notice and far superior to anything you ever had a opportunity of witnessing of before. I'm a doing it now, sir, as if I was addressing a company of ladies and gentlemen, he added by way of parenthesis. This is the original performance of Punch, ladies and gents, and it will always gain esteem. I am going to introduce a performance worthy of your notice, which is the dramatical performance of the original and old established performance of Punch, experienced many year. I merely call your attention, ladies and gents, to the novel attraction, which I am now going to introduce to you. I only merely place this happy ratus up to inform you what I am about to perform to you. The performance will continue for upwards of one hour, provising as we meet with sufficient encouragement. That's business, you know, Master. Just to give him to understand that we want a little assistance afore we begins. It will surpass anything you've had the opportunity of witnessing of before in all the annuals of history. I hope, ladies and gents, I am not talking too grammatical for some of you. That there is the address, sir, he continued. 
what I always gives to the audience outside before I begins to perform, just to let the respectable company know that I am a-working for to get my living by honest industry. Those ladies and gents, he then went on, as if addressing an imaginary crowd, what are a-standing round a-looking at the performance will, I hope, be as willing to give as they is to see. There's many a lady and gent now at the present moment standing around me, perhaps, whose hearts might be good, though not in their power. This is Punchy's patter, you know, outside, and when you has to say all that yourself, you want the affluency of a Methodist parson to do the talk, I can tell you. Now, boys, look up your hapens. Who's got a farden or a hapenny? And I'll be the first brown towards it. I ain't particular if it's a half crown. Now, my lads, feel in your pocket and see if you've got an odd copper. Here's one. And who'll be the next to make it even? We means to show it all through. Provising we meet with sufficient encouragement. I always stick to them words, sufficient encouragement. You'll have the pleasure of seeing spring Hill Jack, or the Russian Bear, and the comical scene with Joy the Clown, and the frying pan of sausages. That's a kind of gaggery. I'll now just explain to you, sir, the different parts of the frame. This here's the letter cloth, which shows you all what we performs. Sometimes we has wrote on it, The Dominion of Fancy, or Punch's Opera. That fills up a letter cloth. And Punch is a fancy for every person you know, whoever may fancy it. I stands inside here on this footboard, and if there's anyone up at the windows in the street, I puts my foot long ways, so as to keep my knob out of sight. This here is the stage front, or proceedings, note proscenium, end note, and is painted over with flags and banners, or any different things. Sometimes there's George and the Dragging, and the Royal Queen's Arms. We can have them up when we like, cause we are sanctioned, and I've played afore the Royal Princes. But anything for freshness. People's tired of looking at the Royal Arms, and want something new to cause attraction, and so on. This here's the playboard, where sits Punch. The scenes behind are representing a garden scene, and the side scenes is a house and a cottage, therefore the exons, you know, just for convenience. The back scene draws up and shows the prison, with the windows all cut out, and the bars showing, the same as there is to a jail. Though I never was in one in my life, and I'll take good care I never shall be. Our speaking instrument is an unknown secret, because it's an unknown tongue, that's known to none except those in our own profession. It's a instrument like this which I has in my hand, and it's tuned to music. We has two or three kinds, one for outdoors, one for indoors, one for speaking, one for singing, and one that's good for nothing except selling on the cheap. They ain't whistles, but calls, or unknown tongues. And with them in the mouth, we can pronounce each word as plain as a parson, and with as much affluency. The great difficulty in performing punch consists in speaking with this call in the mouth, cause it's produced from the lungs. It's all done from there, and is a great strain and requires suction, and that's brandy and water, or summit to moisten the whistle with. We're bound not to drink water by our profession, when we can get anything stronger. It weakens the nerves, but we always like to keep in the bounds of propriety, respectability, and decency. I drinks my beer with my call in my mouth and never takes it out, cause it exposes it and the boys hang em is so inquisitive. They runs after us and looks up in our face to see how we speaks, but we drives them away with civility. Punch is a dramatical performance, sir, in two acts, patronised by the nobility and gentry at large. We don't drop the scene at the end of the first act. The drum and pipe strikes up instead. The first act we consider to end with Punch being took to prison for the murder of his wife and baby. You can pick out a good many Punch performers without getting one so well versed as I am in it. They in general make such a muffing concern of it. 
a drama or dramatical performance, we calls it, of the original performance of Punch. It ain't a tragedy. It's both comic and sentimental, in which way we think proper to perform it. There's comic parts, as with The Clown and Jim Crow, etc. That's including a deal more, you know. It's a pretty play, Punches, when performed well, and one of the greatest novelties in the world, and most ancient, handed down too for many hundred years. The prison scene and the baby is what we calls the sentimental touches. Some folks where I performs will have it most sentimental, in the original style. Them families is generally sentimental themselves. To these sentimental folks, I'm obliged to perform very steady and very slow. They won't have no ghost, no coffin, and no devil. And that's what I call spiling the performance entirely. Ha <laughs> ha, he added with a deep sigh. It's the march of intellect that's a doing all this, it is, sir. Other folks is all for the comic, especially the street people. And then we has to dwell on the bell scene and the nursing the baby and the frying pan and the sausages and Jim Crow. A few years ago, Toby was all the go. Formerly, the dog was only a stuffed figure and it was Mr. Pike what first hit upon introducing a live animal and a great hit it were. It made a surprising alteration in the exhibition for till lately the performance was called Punch and Toby as well. We used to go about the streets with three dogs, and that was admirable, and it did uncommon well as a new novelty at first. But we can't get three dogs to do it now. The mother of them dogs, you see, was a singer, and had two pups what was singers too. Toby was wanted to sing and smoke a pipe as well, shake hands as well as seize Punch by the nose. When Toby was quiet, you see, sir, it was the timidation of Punch's stick, for directly he put it down, he flew at him knowing at the same time that Punch was not his master. Punch commences with a song. He does Rooturui and sings The Lass of Gowrie down below, and then he comes up saying, Rui! Oh, yes, I'm coming! How do you do, ladies and gents? Ladies always first. And then he bows many times. I'm so happy to see you, he says. You're most obedient, most humble and dutiful servant, Mr. Punch. You see, I can talk as affluent as can be with the call in my mouth. Hooey! I wishes you all well, Tommy! Then Punch says to the drum and pipes man, as he puts his hand out, How do you do, master? Play up! Play up the hornpipe! I'm a most excellent dancer! And then Punch dances. Then you see him a-dancing the hornpipe, and after that Punch says to the pipes, Master, I shall call my wife up and have a dance. So he sings out, Judy, Judy, my pretty creature, come upstairs, my darling, I want to speak to you. And he knocks on the playboard, Judy, here she comes, bless her little heart. Enter Judy. Punch. What a sweet creature! What a handsome nose and chin! He pats her on the face very gently. Judy, slapping him. Keep quiet, do! Punch. Don't be cross, my dear, but give me a kiss! Judy. Oh, to be sure, my love. They kiss. Punch. Bless your sweet lips! Hugging her. This is melting moments! I'm very fond of my wife! We must have a dance! Judy. Agreed! They both dance. Punch. Get out of the way! You don't dance well enough for me! He hits her on the nose. Go and fetch the baby! And mind and take care of it! And not hurt it! Judy exons. Judy returning back with baby. Take care of the baby while I go and cook the dumplings. Punch, striking Judy with his right hand. Get out of the way! I'll take care of the baby! Judy exults. Punch sits down and sings to the baby. Hush my baby up on the treetop Where the wind blows the cradle will rock Where the door breaks the cradle will fall Down comes the baby and cradle and all Baby cries. Punch shaking it. What a cross! 
Let's spy! He lays it down on the playboard and rolls it backwards and forwards to rock it to sleep and sings again. Punch continues rocking the child. It still cries, and he takes it up in his arms, saying, What a cross child! I can't bear cross children! Then he vehemently shakes it and knocks its head up against the side of the proceedings several times, representing to kill it, and he then throws it out of the window. Enter Judy. Judy, where's the baby? Punch, in a lemon-colly tone, Lamentation of Judy for the loss of her dear child. She goes into asterisks, and then excites, and fetches a cudgel, and commences beating Punch over the head. Punch. Don't be cross, my dear. I didn't go to do it. Judy. I'll pay her for throwing the child out of the window. She keeps on giving him knocks off the head, but Punch snatches the stick away and commences an attack upon his wife, and beats her severely. Judy, I'll go to the constable and have you locked up. Punch, go to the devil! I don't care where you go! Get out of the way! Judy exults, and Punch then sings, Cherry Ripe, or Cheer Boys Cheer. All before is sentimental. Now this here's comic. Punch goes through his rututurui, and then the beetle comes up. Beetle. Hi, hello, my boy. Punch. Hello, my boy. He gives him a wipe over the head with his stick, which knocks him down, but he gets up again. Beetle. Do you know, sir, that I've a special order in my pocket to take you up? Punch. I know I have a special order to knock you down. He knocks him down with simplicity, but not with brutality for the juvenile branches don't like to see severity practised. Beetle, coming up again. Do you know, my boy, that I've an order to take you up? Punch. I know I've an order, I tell you, to knock you down. He sticks him. Punch is a tyrant to the beetle, you know, and if he was took up, he wouldn't go through his rambles, so in course he isn't. Beetle. I've a warrant for you, my boy. Punch, striking him. The beetle's a determined man, you know, and resolved to go to the ends of justice as far as possible in his power by special authority, so a quarrel ensues between them. Beetle. You are a blackguard. Punch. So are you. The beetle hits Punch on the nose and takes the law in his own hands. Punch takes it up momentary, strikes the beetle, and a fight ensues. The beetle, faint and exhausted, gets up once more. Then he strikes Punch over the nose, which is returned pro and con. Beetle. That's a good un. Punch. That's a better. Beetle. That's a topper. He hits him jolly hard. Punch with his cudgel. That's a whooper. He knocks him out of his senses, and the beetle exults. Enter Merry Clown. Punch sings, getting upstairs, in quick time, while the clown is coming up. Clown dances round Punch in all directions, and Punch, with his cudgel, is determined to catch him if possible. Clown. No, bon, no, allez tout de suite, monsieur. Look out the sharp. Make haste. Catch him alive. Here we are. How are you? Good morning. Don't you wish you may get it? Ah, coward. Strike a white man. Clown keeps bobbing up and down and Punch trying to hit all the time, till Punch is exhausted nearly. The clown, you see, sir, is the best friend to Punch. He carries him through all his tricks, and he's a great favourite of Punch's. He's too cunning for him, though, and knows too much for him, so they both shake hands and make it up. Clown. Now it's all fair, ain't it, Punch? Punch. Yes. Clown. 
Now I can begin again. You see, sir, the clown gets over Punch altogether by his artful ways, and then he begins the same tricks over again. That is, if we want a long performance. If not, we cuts it off at the other pint. But I'm telling you the real original style, sir. Clown. Good, you can't catch me. Punch gives him one whack of the head, and Clown exons, or goes off. Enter Jim Crow. Jim sings Buffalo Gals while coming up, and on entering, Punch hits him a whack of the nose backhanded and almost breaks it. Jim, what for you do that? Me nigger, me like the white man. Him did break my nose. Punch, humbly beg your pardon. I did not go to help it. For, as it had been done, you know, it wasn't likely he could help it after he'd done it. He couldn't take it away from him again, could he? Jim, me beg you the pardon. For you see, sir, he thinks he's offended, Punch. Never mind, Punch. Come and sit down and we'll have a song. Jim Crow prepares to sing. Punch, bravo, Jimmy! Sing away, my boy. Give us a stunner while you're at it. Jim sings. I'm an owner on the fiddle down in the old Virginia. And I plays it scientific like Master Paganini. Punch, tapping him on the head. Bravo! Well done, Jimmy! Give us another bit of a song. Jim, yes, me will. Sings again. Oh, lovely Rosa, Sambo come. Don't you hear the banjo? Tum, tum, tum. Jim hits Punch with his head over the nose, as if butting at him. While he repeats, tum, 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 Punch, offended, beats him with the stick and sings, Let play roses, humble come, don't you hear the banjo, tum, tum, tum. Jim, rising, Oh, me, what for you strike a nigger? Holding up his leg, Me will poke your eye out. Ready, shoot, bang, fire. Shoves his leg into Punch's eye. Punch, He's poked my eye. Jim Crow excites, or exonts. Exont, we call it in our profession, sir. That's going away, you know. He's done his part, you know, and ain't to appear again. Judy has died through Punch's ill usage after going for the beadle, for if she'd done so before, she couldn't have fetched the constable, you know. Certainly not. The beholders only believe her to be dead, though, for she comes to life again afterwards, because if she was dead... It would do away with Punch's wife altogether, for Punch is dotingly fond of her, though it's only his fun after all said and done. The ghost, you see, is only a representation, as a timidation to soften his bad morals, so that he shouldn't do the like again. The ghost, to be sure, shows that she's really dead for a time, but it's not in the imitation, for if it was, Judy's ghost, the figure, would be made like her. The babby's lost altogether. It's killed. It is supposed to be destroyed entirely, but taken care of for the next time when called upon to perform, as if it were in the next world, you know. That's moral. Enter Ghost. Punch sings, meanwhile, Home Sweet Home. This is original. The ghost represents the ghost of Judy, because he's killed his wife, don't you see? The ghost making her appearance. But Punch don't know it at the moment. Still, he sits down tired and sings in the corner of the frame the song of Home Sweet Home while the spirit appears to him. Punch turns round, sees the ghost, and is most terribly intimidated. He begins to shiver and shake in great fear, bringing his guilty conscience to his mind of what he's been guilty of doing. And at last he falls down in a fit of frenzy, kicking, screeching, hollering, and shouting, Fifty! for a doctor. Then he turns on his side and draws himself double with the scrumatics in his gills. Ghost excites. Enter doctor. Punch is represented to be dead. This is the dying speech of Punch. Doctor. Dear me, bless my heart, here have I been running as fast as ever I could walk and very near tumbled over a straw. I heard somebody call most lustily for a doctor. Dear me, looking at Punch in all directions 
and examining his body. This is my particular friend, Mr. Punch. Poor man, how pale he looks. I'll feel his pulse. Count his pulse. One, two, fourteen, nine, eleven. Hi, Punch, Punch, are you dead? Are you dead? Are you dead? Punch, hitting him with his right hand over the nose and knocking him back. Yes! Doctor, rubbing his nose with his hand. I never heard a dead man speak before. Punch, you are not dead. Punch, oh yes I am. Doctor, how long have you been dead? Punch, about six weeks. Doctor, oh you're not dead. You're only poorly. I must fetch you a little reviving medicine, such as some stick licorice and balsam and extract of shalala. Punch, rising. Make haste. He gives the doctor a wipe on the nose. Make haste and fetch it. Doctor, excellent. Punch. The doctor going to get me some physic. I'm very fond of brandy and water and rum punch. I want my physic. The doctor never brought me no physic at all. I wasn't ill. It was only my fun. Doctor reappears with the physic stick and he whacks Punch over the head, no harder than he is able, and cries, There's physic, 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 pills, balsam, stick licorice. Punch, rising and rubbing his head against the wing. Yes, it is stick licorice. Ah, it's a pretty play, sir, when it's showed well, that it is. It's delightful to read the morals. I am very fond of reading the morals, I am. Punch, taking the stick from the doctor. Now I'll give you physic! 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 He strikes at the doctor, but misses him every time. The doctor don't like his own stuff! Punch, presenting his stick, gun fashion, at doctor's head. I'll shoot him! One, two, three! Doctor, closing with Punch. Come to jail along with me! He saves his own life by closing with Punch. He's a desperate character, is Punch, though he means no harm, you know. A struggle ensues, and the doctor calls for help, Punch being too powerful for him. Doctor, come to jail. You shall repent for all your past misdeeds. Help! Assistance! Help! In the Queen's name! He's acting as a constable, the doctor is, though he's no business to do it, but he's acting in self-defence. He didn't know Punch, but he'd heard of his transactions, and when he came to examine him, he found it was the man. The doctor is a very sedate kind of person, and wishes to do good to all classes of the community at large, especially with his physic, which he gives gratis for nothing at all. The physic is called headache cologne, or a sure cure for the headache. Re-enter Beedle, Punch and the doctor still struggling together. Beedle, closing with them. Hi, hi, this is him. Behold, the head of a traitor. Come along, come to jail. Punch, a kicking. I will not go. Beedle, shouting. More help, more help, more help, help, help. Come along to jail, come along, come along. More help, more help. Oh, it's a good lark just here, sir, but tremendous hard work. For well, there's so many figures to work, and all struggling too, and you have to work them all at once. This is comic, this is. Beedle. More help! Be quick! Be quick! Re-enter Jim Crow. Jim Crow. Come de long! Come de long! Come de long! Me nigger, and you beat a me! Excellent all. Punch still singing out. I'll not go! End of first act. Change of scene for second act. Scene draws up and discovers the exterior of a prison, with Punch peeping through the bars and singing a merry song of the merry bells of England, all of the olden time. That's an olden song, you know. It's old ancient, and it's a moral. A moral song, you know, to show that Punch is repenting, but pleased, and yet don't care nothing at all about it, for he's frolicsome, and on the height of his frolic and amusement to all the juveniles, old and young, rich and poor. We must put all classes together. 
Enter hangman Jack Ketch, or Mr. Grabble. That's Jack Ketch's name, you know. He takes all when they gets in his clutches. We mustn't blame him, for he must do his duty, for the sheriffs is so close to him. Preparation commences for the execution of Punch. Punch is still looking through the bars of Newgate. The last scene as I had was Temple Bar scene. It was a prison once, you know. That's the old ancient, you know. But I never let the others see it, cause it shouldn't become too public. But I think Newgate is better in the new edition. Though the prison is suspended, it being rather too terrific for the beholder. It was the old ancient style. The sentence is passed upon him, but by whom not known. He's not tried by one person, cause nobody can't. Jack Ketch. Now, Mr. Punch, you are going to be executed by the British and foreign laws of this and other countries, and you are to be hung up by the neck until you are dead, dead, dead. Punch. What? Am I to die three times? Jack. No, no, you're only to die once. Punch. How is that? You said I was to be hung up by the neck till I was dead, dead, dead. You can't die three times. Jack. Oh, no, only once. Punch. Why, you said dead, dead, dead. Jack. Yes, and when you are dead, 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 you will be quite dead. Punch. Oh, I never knew that before. Jack. Now prepare yourself for execution. Punch. What for? Jack. For killing your wife throwing your poor dear little innocent baby out of the window and striking the beetle unmercifully over the head with a mop stick. Come on. Excellent hangman behind scene and re-enter leading Punch slowly forth to the foot of the gallows. Punch comes most willingly, having no sense. Jack. Now, my boy, here is the corfin, here is the gibbet, and here is the pall. Punch. There's the coffee shop, there's giblets, and there's... Balls. Jack, get out, young foolish. Now then, place your head in here. Punch, what? Up here? Jack, no, a little lower down. There's quick business in this, you know. This is comic, a little comic business this is. Punch, dodging the noose. What, here? Jack, no, no, in there. Showing the noose again. Punch, this way? Jack, no, a little more this way, in there. Punch falls down and pretends he's dead. Jack, get up, you're not dead. Punch, oh yes I am. Jack, but I say no. Punch, please sir. Bowing to the hangman. Here he's an hypocrite, he wants to exempt himself. Do you show me the way, for I never was hung before, and I don't know the way. Please, sir, to show me the way, and I'll feel extremely obliged to you, and return you my most sincere thanks. Now that's well worded, sir. It's well put together. That's my beauty, that is. I am obliged to study my language, and not have anything vulgar whatsoever, all in simplicity, so that the young children may not be taught anything wrong. There aren't nothing to be learnt from it, because of its simplicity. Jack. Very well, as you are so kind and condescending, I will certainly oblige you by showing you the way. Here, my boy, now place your head in here, like this. Hangman putting his head in noose. This is the right and the proper way. Now you see the rope is placed under my chin. I'll take my head out and I will place yours in. That's a rhyme. And when your head is in the rope... You must turn round to the ladies and gentlemen and say, Goodbye, fare you well. Very slowly then, a stop between each of the words, for that's not driving the people out of the world in quick haste without giving him time for repentance. That's another moral, you see. Oh, I like all the morals to it. Punch, quickly pulling the rope. Goodbye, fare you well. Hangs the hangman. What a hypocrite he is again, you see, for directly he's done it, he says, Now I'm free again, for frolic and fun, calls Joey the clown, his old friend, 
because they're both full of tricks and antics. Joey! Here's a man for myself! That's his hypocrisy again, you see, for he tries to get exempt after he's done it himself. Enter Clown in quick haste, bobbing up against the gallows. Clown. Dear me, I've run against a milk post. Why, dear Mr. Punch, you've hung a man. Do take him down. I came you to do it. Punch. He got one through, and I hung him up to dry. Clown. Dear me, why, you've hung him up till he's dried quite dead. Punch. Poor fellow, then he won't catch cold with the wet. Let's put him in this stuff box. Pointing to Coffin. Joey takes the figure down and gives it to Punch to hold, so as the body do not run away, and then proceeds to remove the gallows. In doing so, he by accident hits Punch on the nose. Punch. Mind what you are about. For Punch is game, you know, right through to the backbone. Clown. Make haste, Punch. Here's somebody a-coming. They hustle his legs and feet in, but they can't get his head in, the undertaker not having made the coffin large enough. Punch. We'd better double him up, place the pall on, and take the man to the brave. Not the grave, but the brave. Cause he's been a brave man in his time, maybe. Sings the song of Bobbing Around while with the coffin he bobs Joey on the head and exeunt. Re-enter Punch. Punch. That was a jolly lark, wasn't it? Sings. I'd be a butterfly born in a flower, making apple dumplings without any flower. All this wit must have been born in me, or nearly so, but I got a good lot of it from Persini and Pike, and gleanings, you know. Punch disappears and re-enters with Bell. Punch. This is my PR 60. It plays 50 tunes all at one time. Goes to the landlord of the public house, painted on the side scene or cottage, represented as a tavern or hotel. The children of the publican are all abed. Punch plays up a tune and solicits for money. Landlord wakes up in a passion through the terrible noise pokes his head out of window and tells him to go away. There's a little window and a little door to this side scene. If they was to play it all through, as you are writing, it had open Drury Lane Theatre. Punch. Go away! Yes, play away! Oh, you means o'er the hills and far away! He misunderstands him, willfully, the hypocrite. Punch keeps on ringing his bell violently. Publican, in a violent passion, opens the door and pushes him away, saying, Be off with you! Punch. I will not! Hits him over the head with the bell. You're no judge of music! Plays away. Publican exalts to fetch Cudgel to pay him out. Punch no sooner sees Cudgel than he exalts, taking his musical instrument with him. It's far superior to anything of the kind you did ever see, except seldom. You know it's silver, and that's what we says, seldom. Silver, you know, is seldom, because it's seldom you sees it. Publican comes out of his house with his cudgel to catch old Punch on the grand hop. Must have a little comic. Punch returns again with his bell, while Publican is hiding secretly for to catch him. Publican pretends, as he stands in a corner, to be fast asleep, but keeps his eyes wide awake all the while, and says... If he comes up here, I'll be one upon his tibby. Punch comes out from behind the opposite side and rings his bell violently. Publican makes a blow at him with his cudgel and misses, saying, How dare you intrude upon my premises with that nasty, noisy bell? Punch, while Publican is watching at this side scene, appears over at the other with a heartful dodge, and again rings his bell loudly, and again the Publican misses him. And while Publican is watching at this side scene, Punch re-enters and draws up to him very slowly and rests his piano sixty on the board while he slowly advances to him and gives him a whack on the head with his fist. Punch then disappears, leaving his bell behind and the landlord in possession of his music. Landlord collaring the bell. Smuggings! 
Possession is nine points of the law, so this bell is mine. Guarding over it with a stick. Smuggings, this is mine, and when he comes up to take this bell away, I shall have him. Smuggings, it's mine. Punch re-enters very slowly behind the publican as he is watching the bell, and snatching up the bell, cries out, That's mine! and exons with it. Publican. Dear me! Never mind. I look after him. I shall catch him some day or other. Hits his nose up against the post as he is going away. That's comic. Oh, my nose! Never mind. I'll have him again some time. Excite Publican. Clown re-enters with Punch. Clown. Oh, Punch, how are you? Punch. I'm very glad to see you. Oh, Joey, my friend, how do you do? Clown. Here, Punch, are you a mind for a lark? Peeping in at the cottage window, represented as a public house. Are you hungry, Punch? Would you like something to eat? Punch. Yes. Clown. What would you like? Punch. Not peculiar. Not particular, he means, you know. That's a slip word. Clown. I'll go up into the landlord and see if he's got anything to eat. Exeunt into cottage and poking his head out of the window. Here, Punch. Here's the landlord fast asleep in the kitchen cellar. Here's a lot of sausages hanging up here. Joey's a thieving, don't you see? He's a-robbing the landlord now. Would you like some for supper, eh, Punch? Punch. Yes, to be sure. Clown. Don't make a noise. You'll wake the landlord. Punch, whispering as loud as he can bawl through the window. Hand him out here. Punch pulls them out of the window. Clown. What are we to fry them in? I'll go and see if I can find a frying pan. Exeunt from window and reappears with frying pan, which he hands out of window for Punch to cook sausages in, and then disappears for a moment, after which he returns and says, with his head out of window, Would you like something hot, Punch? Punch. Yes, to be sure. Punch is up to everything. He's a helping him to rob the publican. One's as much in the mud as the other is in the mire. Clown, thrusting a red-hot poker out of window. Here, lay hold. Here's a lark. Make haste. Here's the landlord a-coming. Rubs Punch with it over the nose. Punch. Oh, my nose! That is a hot un. Takes poker. Clown re-enters and calls in at window. Landlord! Here's a fellow store your sausages and frying pan. Wakes up landlord and exunts. Landlord appears at window. Here's somebody been in my house and actually stole my sausages, frying pan and red hot poker. Clown exunts when he has blamed it all to Punch. Joey stole him and Punch took him. And the receiver is always worse than the thief. For if there was never no receivers, there wouldn't never be no thieves. Landlord seizing the sausages in Punch's hand, says, How did you get these here? Punch. Joey stole them, and I took them. Landlord. Then you're both jolly thieves, and I must have my property. A scuffle ensues. Punch hollers out, Joey! Joey! Here's the landlord is stealing the sausages! So you see, Punch wants to make the landlord a thief, so as to exempt himself. He's a hypocrite there again, you see again. All through the piece, he's the masterpiece. Oh, a most clever man is Punch, and such a hypocrite. Punch, seizing the frying pan, which has been on the playboard, knocks it on the publican's head, when, there being a false bottom to it, the head goes through it, and the sausages gets about the publican's neck, and Punch pulls at the pan and the sausages with vehemence, till the landlord is exhausted and exonts with his own property back again. So there is no harm done, only merely for the lark to return to those people what belongs to him. What you take away from a person always give to them again. Re-enter Clown. Clown. Well, Mr. Punch, I shall wish you a pleasant good morning. Punch hits him with his cudgel. Good morning to you, Joey. 
Excellent, Joey. Punch sits down by the side of the poker, and Scaramouche appears without a head. Punch looks and beholds, and he's frightened, and exents with the poker. Scaramouche does a comic dance, with his long neck shooting up and down with the actions of his body, after which he exents. Punch re-enters again with the poker, and places it beside of him, and takes his cudgel in his hand for protection, while he is singing the national anthem of God save the Queen and all the royal family. Satan then appears as a dream, and it is all a dream after all, and dressed up as the Russian bear, leave politics alone as much as you can, for Punch belongs to nobody. Punch has a dreadful struggle with Satan, who seizes the red-hot poker and wants to take Punch away, for all his past misdeeds and frolic and fun, to the bottomless pit. By struggling with Satan, Punch overpowers him, and he drops the poker, and Punch kills him with his cudgel and shouts, Bravo! Hooray! Satan is dead! He cries, We must have a good conclusion. We can now all do as we like! That's the moral, you see. in France, but far different to the English punch. They're exhibiting their figures in a different way by performing them with sticks, the same as Scaramouche has done. The has a performing punch situated at the boulevards in Paris, where he has a certain piece of ground allotted for him, with seats attached, being his own freehold property. The passers-by, if they wish to see the performance, they take their seat with the juveniles, sits down, and he performs to them for what they think proper to give him. I never was over in France, but I've heard talk of him a deal from foreigners who has given us inflammation about it, which they was so kind to do. They show us the difference between English and French, you know. End of section 11 Section 12 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Street Exhibitors, Part 4. The Fantuccini Man. Everyone who has resided for any time in London must have noticed in the streets a large, roomy show upon wheels about four times as capacious as those used for the performances of Punch and Judy. The proprietor of one of these perambulating exhibitions was a person of some fifty-six years of age, with a sprightly, half-military manner, but he is seldom seen by the public on account of his habit of passing the greater part of the day concealed within his theatre for the purpose of managing the figures. When he paid me a visit, his peculiar erect bearing struck me as he entered. He walked without bending his knees, stamped with his heels, and often rubbed his hands together as if washing them with an invisible soap. He wore his hair with the curls arranged in a brutus a la George IV, and his chin was forced up into the air by a high black stock, as though he wished to increase his stature. He wore a frock coat, buttoned at waist, and open on his expanded chest, so as to show off the entire length of his shirt front. I could not help asking him if he had ever served in the army. He, however, objected to gratify my curiosity on that point, though it was impossible from his reply not to infer that he had been in Her Majesty's service. There was a mystery about his origin and parentage, which he desired should remain undisturbed. His relations were all of them so respectable, he said, that he did not wish to disgrace them by any revelations he might make, thus implying that he considered his present occupation a downfall in life. 
I followed it as my propensity, he proceeded, and though I have run through three fortunes, I follow it still. I never knew the value of money, and when I have it in my pocket, I cannot keep it there. I have spent forty-five pounds in three days. He seemed to be not a little fond of exhibiting his dolls, and considered himself to be the only person living who knew anything of the art. He said orders were sent to him from all parts of the country to make the figures, and indeed some of them were so intricate that he alone had the secret of their construction. He hardly seemed to like the marionettes, and evidently looked upon them as an interference with the real original character of the exhibition. The only explanation he could give of the difference between the marionettes and the fantagini was that the one had a French title and referred to dolls in modern costume, whilst the other was an Italian word and applied to dolls in fancy dresses. He gave me the following interesting statement. The fantagini, he said, is the proper title of the exhibition of dancing dolls, though it has lately been changed to that of the marionettes, owing to the exhibition under that name at the Adelaide Gallery. That exhibition at the Adelaide Gallery was very good in its way, but it was nothing to be compared to the exhibition that was once given at the Argyle Rooms in Regent Street. That's the old place that was burned down. It was called Le Petit Théâtre Mathieu, and in my opinion, it was the best one that ever came into London, because they was well managed. They did little pieces, heavy and light. They did Shakespeare's tragedies and farces, and singing as well. Indeed, it was the real stage, only with dolls for actors, and parties to speak for em, and work their arms and legs behind the scenes. I've known one of these parties take three parts. Look at that for clever work. First he did an old man, then an old woman, and afterwards the young man. I assisted at that performance, and I should say it was full twenty years ago, to the best of my recollection. After the marionettes were moved to the Western Institution, Leicester Square, I assisted at them also. It was a passable exhibition, but nothing out of the way. The figures were only modelled, not carved, as they ought to be. I was only engaged to exhibit one figure, a sailor of my own making. It was a capital one, and stood as high as a table. They wanted it for the piece called The Manager in Distress, where one of the performers is a sailor. Mine would dance a hornpipe and whip its hat off in a minute. When I had finished performing it, I took good care to whip it into a bag, so that they should not see how I arranged the strings, for they was very backwards in their knowledge. When we worked the figures, it was very difficult, because you had to be up so high, like on the top of the ceiling, and to keep looking down all the time to manage the strings. There was a platform arranged, with a place to rest against, the first to introduce the Fantuccini into London, that is, into London streets, mind you, going about, was Gray, a Scotchman. He was a very clever fellow, very good, and there was nothing but what was good that belonged to it. Scenery, dresses, theatre, and all. He had a frame then, no longer than the punch frame now, only he had a labouring man to carry it for him and he took with him a box no larger than a haberdasher's box, which contained the figures, for they were not more than nine inches high. Now, my figures are two feet high, though they don't look it, but my theatre is ten feet high by six foot wide, and the opening is four feet high. This grey was engaged at all the theatres to exhibit his figures at the masquerades, Nothing went down but Mr. Gray, and he put poor Punch up altogether. When he performed at the theatres, he used to do it as a wind-up to the entertainment after the dancing was over, and they would clear the stage on purpose for him, and then let down a scene with an opening in it the size of his theatre. 
On these occasions his figures were longer, about two feet, and very perfect. There was juggling, and slack and tight rope dancing, and punches and everything, and the performance was never less than one hour, and then it was done as quick as lightning every morning, and no feet longer than two or three minutes. It didn't do to have silly persons there. This Gray performed at Vauxhall, when Bish, the lottery man in Cornhill, had it, and he went down wonderful. He also performed before George the Fourth. I've heard say that he got ten pounds a week when he performed at Vauxhall, for they snatched him out of the streets and wouldn't let him play there. It's impossible to say what he made in the streets, for he was a Scotchman and uncommon close. If he took a hatful, he'd say, I've only got a few. But he did so well, he could sport his diamond rings on his fingers. First rate, splendid. Gray was the first to exhibit gratis in the streets of London, but he was not the first to work Fantuccini figures. They had always been exhibited at theatres before that. Old Porcini knowed nothing about them. It was out of his business altogether, for he was punch and nothing more. Gray killed Porcini and his punch. Regular shut him up. A man of the name of Flockton from Birmingham was, to the best of my knowledge, the first that ever had a Fantuccini exhibition in England. But he was only for theatres. At this time I had been playing in the orchestra with some travelling comedians, and Mr. Seward, the master, used, among other things, to exhibit the dancing figures. He had a proscenium fitted up so that he could open a twenty-foot theatre, almost large enough for living persons. He had the splendidest figures ever introduced into this country. He was an artist as well, splendid scene and transparent painter. Indeed, he's worked for some of the first noblemen in Cheltenham, doing up their drawing rooms. His figures worked their eyes and mouths by mechanism, according to what they had to say. They looked and moved their eyes and mouths according. And females, if they was singing, heaved their bosoms like Christians, the same as life. He had a Turk who did the tightrope without anybody being seen. He always performed different pieces and had a regular wardrobe with him, beautiful dresses, and he'd dress them up to their parts and then paint their faces up with distemper, which dries in an hour. Somebody came and told me that Gray was in London performing in the streets, and that's what brought me out. I had helped Mr. Seawood to manage the figures, and I knew something about them. They told me Gray had a frame, and I said, Well, it's a bit of genius, and is a fortune. The only figures they told me he had, and it was true, was a sailor, and a Turk, and a clown, and what we calls a polander. That's a man that tosses the pole. I left Seawood directly, and I went to my father, and got some money, and began instantly making my frame and figures. Mine was about sixteen inches high, and I had five of them. I began very strong. My fifth figure was a juggler. I was the second that ever came out in the streets of London. It was at the time that George the Fourth went to Scotland, and Gray went after him to try his luck, following the royal family. As the king went out of London, I came in. I first of all put up at Peckham, just to lay to a bit and look about me. I'll tell you the reason. I had no one to play, and I couldn't manage the figures and do the music as well. Consequently, I had to seek after someone to do the Pandean pipes. I didn't like to make my first performance in London without music. At last I met a party that used to play the pipes at Vauxhall. I met him one day, and he says, What are you up to now? So I told him I had the Fantuccini figures. He was a beautiful pipe player, and I've never heard anyone like him before or since. He wouldn't believe I had the figures. They was such a novelty. I told him where I was staying, and he and his partner came over to see me, and I performed the figures and then we went on shares. He had worked for Gray, and he knew all his houses where he used to perform, and I knew nothing about these things. 
When Great came back, he found me performing before one of his houses in Harley Street, where he always had five shillings. They was a tremendous success. Wonderful. If we had a call at a house, our general price was two and sixpence, and the performance was, for a good one, twenty minutes. Then there was the crowd for the collection, but they was principally halfpence, and we didn't care about them much, though we have taken four shillings. We never pitched only to houses, only stopping when we had an order, and we hadn't occasion to walk far, for as soon as the tune was heard, up would come the servants to tell us to come. I've had three at me at once. I've known myself to be in Devonshire Place, when I was performing there, to be there for three hours and upwards, going from house to house. I could tell you how much we took a day. It was, after taking expenses, from four to five pounds a day. Besides, there was a labourer to whom we paid a guinea a week to carry a frame, and he had his keep into the bargain. Where Punch took a shilling, we've taken a pound. I recollect going down with the show to Brighton, and they actually announced our arrival in the papers, saying that, among other public amusements, they had the Fantuccini figures from London. That's a fact. That was in the paper. We did well in Brighton. We have, I can assure you, taken eighteen shillings and sixpence in half an hour, corner pitching, as we call it, that is, at the corner of a street where there is a lot of people passing. We had such success that the magistrates sent the head constable round with us to clear away the mob. If we performed before any gentleman's place, there was this constable to keep the place clear. A nasty busy fellow he was, too. All the time we was at Brighton, we made twenty pounds a week clear, for we then took only shillings and sixpences, and there was no fourpenny pieces or threepenny bits in them times. We had gentlemen come up many a time and offer to buy the whole concern clear. What an idea, wasn't it? But we didn't want to sell it. They couldn't have given us our price. The crowd was always a great annoyance to us. They'd follow us for miles, and the moment we pitched up, they'd come and gather about and almost choke us. What was their halfpence to us when we was taking our half-crowns? Actually, in London, we walked three and four miles to get rid of the mob. But bless you, we couldn't get rid of them, for they was like flies after honey. We used to do a great business with evening parties. At Christmas we have had to go three and four times in the same evening to different parties. We never had less than a guinea, and I have had as much as five pounds, but the usual price was two pounds ten shillings, and all refreshments found you. I had the honour of performing before the Queen when she was Princess Victoria. It was at Gloucester House, Park Lane, and we was engaged by the Royal Household. A nice berth I had of it, for it was in May, and they put us on the landing of the drawing-room, where the folding doors opened, and there was some place close by where hot air was admitted to warm the apartments, and what with the heat of the weather and this year ventilation, with the heat coming up the grating places, and my anxiety performing before a princess, I was near baked, and the perspiration quite run off me for I was packed up above, standing up and hidden to manage the figures. There was the maids of honour coming down the stairs like so many nuns, dressed all in white, and the princess was standing on a sofa, with the Duke of Kent behind her. She was apparently very much amused, like others who had seen them. I can't recollect what we was paid, but it was very handsome and so forth. I've also performed before the Baroness Rothschilds, next the Duke of Wellington's, and likewise the Baron himself, in Grosvenor Place, and Sir Watkin W. Wynne, and half the nobility in England. We've been in the very first of drawing rooms. I shall never forget being at Sir Watkin Wynne's, for we was very handsomely treated, and had the best of everything. It was in St. James's Square, and the best of mansions. It was a juvenile party night, and there was a juggler, and a punch and judy, 
and our Fantuccini. One of the footmen comes up and says he, Would any of you men like a jelly? I told him I didn't care for none, but the Punch and Judy man says, My missus is very partial to them. So the footman asks, How will you carry it home? I suggested he should put it in his hat, and the foolish fellow, half silly with horns of ale, actually did, and wrapped it up in his pocket handkerchief. There was a large tumbler full. By and by he cries, Lord, how I sweat! And there was the stuff running down his hair, like so much size. We did laugh, I can assure you. Fantuccini has fallen off now. It's quite different to what it was. I don't think the people's tired of it, but it ain't such a novelty. I could stop up a whole street if I liked, so that nothing could get along. And that shows the people ain't tired of it. I think it's the people that gave the half-crowns are tired of it, but those with the halfpence are as fond of it as ever. As times go, the performance is worth two pounds a week to me, and if it wasn't, I couldn't afford to stop with it, for I'm very clever on the violin, and I could earn more than thirty shillings a week playing in bands. We still attend evening parties, only it isn't to princesses, but gentry. We depend more upon evening parties. It isn't street work, only if we didn't go round, they'd think I was dead. We go to more than thirty parties a year. We always play according to price, whether it's fifteen shillings or ten shillings or a guinea. We don't get many five guinea orders now. The last one was six months ago, to go twenty-eight miles into Kent to a gentleman's house. When we go to parties, we take with us a handsome, portable, fold-up frame. The front is beautiful, and by a first-rate artist. The gentleman who done it is at the head of the carriage department at a railway, and there's the Royal Arms, all in gold, and it stands above ten feet high, and has wings and all, so that the music and everything is invisible. It shuts up like a portfolio. The figures are first-rate ones, and every one dressed according to the country, whatever it may be she is supposed to represent. They are in the best of material, with satin and lace, and all that's good. When we perform in the streets, we generally go through this programme. We begins with a female hornpipe dancer. Then there is a set of quadrilles by some marionette figures, four females and no gentlemen. If we did the men, we should want assistance, for four is as much as I can hold at once. It would require two men, and the street won't pay for it. After this, we introduces a representation of Mr. Grimaldi, the clown, who does tumbling and posturing, and a comic dance and so forth, such as trying to catch a butterfly. Then comes the enchanted Turk. He comes on in the costume of a Turk and he throws off his right and left arm, and then his legs, and they each change into different figures, the arms and legs into two boys and girls, a clergyman the head, and an old lady the body. That figure was my own invention, and I could, if I like, turn him into a dozen. Indeed, I've got one at home which turns into a parson in the pulpit, and a clerk under him, and a lot of little charity children with a form to sit down upon. They are all carved figures, every one of them, and my own make. The next performance is the old lady, and her arms drop off and turn into two figures, and the body becomes a complete balloon and car in a minute, and not a flat thing, but round. And the figures get into the car and up they go. Then there's the tightrope dance, and next, the Indian juggler, Ramo Sami, a representation, who chucks the balls about under his feet and under his arms, and catches them on the back of his head, the same as Ramo Sami did. Then there's the sailor's hornpipe, Italian scaramouche. He's the old style. This one has a long neck, and it shoots up to the top of the theatre. This is the original trick, and a very good one. Then comes the polander, who balances a pole and two chairs, and stands on his head and jumps over his pole. 
He dresses like a Spaniard and in the old style. It takes a quarter of an hour to do that figure well and make him do all his tricks. Then comes the skeletons. They're a regular first class, of course. This one also was my invention, and I was the first to make them, and I'm the only one that can make them. They are made of a particular kind of wood. I'm a first-rate carver and can make my three guineas any day for a skull. Indeed, I've sold many to dentists to put in their windows. It's very difficult to carve this figure and takes a deal of time. It takes two full months to make these skeletons. I've been offered ten pounds ten shillings for a pair, if I'd make them correct according to the human frame. Those I make for exhibiting in the streets, I charge two pounds each for. They're good, and all the joints is correct, and you may put them into what attitudes you like, and they walk like a human being. These figures in my show come up through a trap door and perform attitudes, and shiver, and lie down, and do imitations of the pictures. It's a tragic sort of concern, and many ladies won't have them at evening parties, because it frightens the children. Then there's Judy Callaghan, and that livens up after the skeletons. Then six figures jump out of her pockets, and she knocks them about. It's a sort of comic business. Then the next is a countryman who can't get his donkey to go, and it kicks at him and throws him off, and all manner of comic antics, after Billy Button's style. Then I do the skeleton that falls to pieces, and then becomes whole again. Then there's another out-of-the-way comic figure that falls to pieces similar to the skeleton. He catches hold of his head and chucks it from one hand to the other. We call him the nondescript. We wind up with a scene in Tom and Jerry. The curtain winds up, and there's a watchman prowling the streets, and some of those lurking gentlemen comes on and pitch into him. He looks round, and he can't see anybody. Presently another comes in and gives him another knock, and then there's a scuffle, and off they go over the watch box, and down comes the scene. That makes the juveniles laugh and finishes up the whole performance merry-like. I forgot one figure now. I knowed there was another, and that's the Scotchman who dances the Highland Fling. He's before the Watchman. He's in the regular national costume, everything correct and everything, and the music plays according to the performance. It's a beautiful figure when well handled, and the dresses cost something, I can tell you. All the joints are countersunk, then figures that shows above the knee. There's no joints to be seen, all works hidden like, something like Madame Vestris in Don Juan. All my figures have got shoes and stockings on. They have indeed. If it wasn't my work, they'd cost a deal of money. One of them is more expensive than all those in Punch and Judy put together. Talk of Punch knocking the Fantuccini down. Mine's all show. Punch is nothing, and cheap as dirt. I've also forgot the flower girl that comes in and dances with a garland. That's a very pretty figure in a fairy's dress, in a nice white skirt with naked carved arms, nice modelled, and the legs just the same. And the trunks come above the knee, the same as them ballet girls. She shows all the opera attitudes. The performance, to go through the whole of it, takes an hour and a half, and then you mustn't stand looking at it, but as soon as one thing goes off, the music changes and another comes on. That ain't one-third, nor a quarter, of what I can do. When I'm performing, I'm standing behind, looking down upon the stage. All the figures is hanging round on hooks, with all their strings ready for use. It makes your arms ache to work them, and especially across the loins. All the strength you have, you must do and chuck it out too, for those four figures which I uses at evening parties, which dance the polka, weighs six pounds, and that's to be kept dangling for twenty minutes together. They are two feet high, and their skirts take three quarters of a yard, and are covered with spangles, which gives them great weight. 
There are only two of us going about now with Fantuccini shows. Several have tried it, but they had to knock under very soon. They soon lost their money and time. In the first place, they must be musicians to make the figures keep time in the dances, and again they must be carvers, for it won't pay to put the figures out to be done. I had ten pounds the other day only to carve six figures, and the wood only come to three shillings. That'll give you some idea of what the carving costs. Formerly I used to make the round of the watering places, but I've got quite enough to do in London now, and travelling's very expensive, for the eating and drinking is so very expensive. Now, at Ramsgate, I've had to pay half a guinea for a bed, and that, to a man in my position, is more than I like. I always pays the man who goes along with me to play the music, because I don't go out every day, only when it suits me. He gets as good as his 23 shillings a week, according to how business is, and that's on an average as good as 4 shillings a day. If I'm very lucky, I makes it better for him, for a man can't be expected to go and blow his life away into Pandean pipes, unless he's well paid for it. End of section 12section 13 of london labor and the london poor volume 3 by henry mayhew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry street exhibitors part 5 guy foxes until within the last 10 or 12 years the exhibition of guys in the public thoroughfares every 5th of november was a privilege enjoyed exclusively by boys of from 10 to 15 years of age, and the money arising therefrom was supposed to be invested at night in a small pyrotechnic display of squibs, crackers and catherine wheels. At schools and at many young gentlemen's houses, for at least a week before the fifth arrived, the bonfires were prepared and guys built up. At night one might see rockets ascending in the air from many of the suburbs of London, and the little back gardens in such places as the Hampstead Road and Kennington, and after dusk, suddenly illuminated with the blaze of the tar barrel, and one might hear in the streets even banging of crackers mingled with the laughter and shouts of boys enjoying the sport. In those days the street guys were of a very humble character, the grandest of them generally consisting of old clothes stuffed up with straw and carried in state upon a kitchen chair. The arrival of a guy before a window was announced by a juvenile chorus of Please to remember the 5th of November! So diminutive, too, were some of the guys that I have even seen dolls carried about as the representatives of the late Mr. Fox. In fact, none of these effigies were hardly ever made of larger proportions than Tom Thumb, or than would admit of being carried through the garden gates of any suburban villa. Of late years, however, the character of Guy Fawkes Day has entirely changed. It seems now to partake rather of the nature of a London May Day. The figures have grown to be of gigantic stature, and whilst clowns, musicians and dancers have got to accompany them in their travels through the streets. The traitor fox seems to have been almost laid aside, and the festive occasion taken advantage of for the expression of any political feeling, the guy being made to represent any celebrity of the day who has for the moment offended against the opinions of the people. The kitchen chair has been changed to the costermonger's donkey truck, or even vans drawn by pairs of horses. The bonfires and fireworks are seldom indulged in, the money given to the exhibitors being shared among the projectors at night, the same as if the day's work had been occupied with acrobating or nigger singing. The first guy of any celebrity that made its appearance in the London streets was about the year 1844, when an enormous figure was paraded about on horseback. This had a tall extinguisher hat with a broad red brim and a pointed Van Dyke collar that hung down over a smock frock. 
which was stuffed out with straw to the dimensions of a water butt. The figure was attended by a body of some half-dozen costermongers, mounting many coloured cockades and armed with formidable bludgeons. The novelty of the exhibition ensured its success, and the coppers poured in in such quantities that on the following year gigantic guys were to be found in every quarter of the metropolis. But the gigantic movement did not attain its zenith till the no popery cry was raised upon the division of England into papal bishoprics. Then it was no longer Fox, but Cardinal Wiseman and the Pope of Rome, who were paraded as guys through the London thoroughfares. The figures were built up of enormous proportions, the red hat of the cardinal having a brim as large as a loo table, and his scarlet cape being as long as a tent. Guy Fox, seated upon a barrel marked gunpowder, usually accompanied his holiness and the cardinal, but his diminutive size showed that Guy now played but a secondary part in the exhibition, although the lantern and the matches were tied as usual to his radishy and gouty fingers. According to the newspapers, one of these shows was paraded on the Royal Exchange, the merchants approving of the exhibition to such an extent that sixpences, shillings and half-crowns were showered into the hats of the lucky costers who had made the speculation. So excited was the public mind that, at night, after business was over, processions were formed by tradespeople and respectable mechanics, who, with bands of music playing and banners flying, on which were inscribed anti-papal mottos and devices, marched through the streets with flaming torches, and after parading their monster popes and cardinals until about nine o'clock at night, eventually adjourned to some open space, like Peckham Rye or Blackheath, where the guy was burned amid the most boisterous applauses. Cardinal Wiseman and the Pope reappeared for several years in succession, till at length the Russian war breaking out, the Guy Fox constructors had a fresh model to work upon. The Emperor of Russia accordingly came out in the streets, in all forms and shapes, sometimes as the veritable Nicholas, in jackboots and leather breeches, with his unmistakable moustache, and often as old Nick, with a pair of horns and a lengthy appendage in the form of a tail, with an arrow-headed termination. And not unfrequently, he was represented as a huge bear crouching beneath some rude symbol of the English and French alliance. On the 5th of November, 1856, the guys were more of a political than a religious character. The unfortunate Pope of Rome had in some instances been changed for Bomba, though the Tsar, His Holiness, and his British representative, the Cardinal, were not altogether neglected. The want of any political agitation was the cause why the guys were of so uninteresting a character. I must not, however, forget to mention a singular innovation that was then made in the recognised fashion of guy-building, one of the groups of figures exhibited being, strange to say, of a complementary nature. It consisted of Miss Nightingale, standing between an English grenadier and a French foot-soldier, while at her feet lay the guy between two barrels marked gunpowder and so equivocally attired that he might be taken for either the Emperor of Russia or the Pope of Rome. At Billingsgate, a guy was promenaded round the market as early as five o'clock in the morning by a party of charity boys who appeared by their looks to have been sitting up all night. It is well known to the boys in the neighbourhood of the great fish market that the guy which is first in the field reaps the richest harvest of halfpence from the salesman and indeed till within the last three or four years one fish factor was in the habit of giving the bearers of the first effigy he saw a half-crown piece. Hence there were usually two or three different guy parties in attendance soon after four o'clock, awaiting his coming into the market. For manufacturing a cheap guy, such as that seen at Billingsgate, a pair of old trousers and Wellington boots form the most expensive item. The shoulders of the guy are generally decorated with a paper cape adorned with different coloured rosettes and gilt stars. A fourpenny mask makes the face, and a proper cocked hat, embellished in the same style as the cape, surrounds the rag head. 
The general characteristics of all guys consists in a limpness and roundness of limb, which give the form a puddingy appearance. All the extremities have a kind of paralytic feebleness, so that the head leans on one side, like that of a dead bird, and the feet have an unnatural propensity for placing themselves in every position but the right one, sometimes turning their toes in, as if their legs had been put on the wrong way, or keeping their toes turned out, as if they had been struck so, while taking their first dancing lesson. Their fingers radiate like a bunch of carrots, and the arms are as shapeless and bowed as the monster sausage in a cookshop window. The face is always composed of a mask, painted in the state of the most florid health, and singularly disagreeing with the frightful debility of the body. Through the holes for the eyes, bits of rag and straw generally protrude, as though birds had built in the socket. A pipe is mostly forced into the mouth, where it remains with the bowl downwards, and in the hands it is customary to tie a lantern and matches. Whilst the guy is carried along, you can hear the straw in his interior rustling and crackling, like moving a workhouse mattress. As a general rule, it may be added that guys have a helpless, drunken look. When, however, the monster guy foxes came into fashion, considerably greater expense was gone to in getting up the figures. Then the feet were always fastened in their proper position, and although the arrangement of the hands was never perfectly mastered, yet the fingers were brought a little more closely together, and approached the digital dexterity of the dummies at the cheap cloth marts. For carrying the guys about, chairs, wheelbarrows, trucks, carts and vans are employed. Chairs and wheelbarrows are patronised by the juvenile population, but the other vehicles belong to the gigantic speculations. On the Surrey side, a guy was exhibited in 1856, whose straw body was encased in a coachman's old greatcoat, covered with different colours, as various as the waistcoat patterns on a tailor's show book. He was wheeled about on a truck by three or four young men, whose hoarse voices, when shouting, Please to remember the guy, showed their regular occupation to be street selling for they had the same husky sound as the Ate a groat fresh herons in the Saturday night street markets. In the neighbourhood of Walworth, men dressed up as guys were dragged about on trucks. One of them was seated upon a barrel marked gunpowder, his face being painted green and ornamented with an immense false nose of a bright scarlet colour. I could not understand what this guy was meant to represent, for he wore a sugar-loaf hat with an ostrich feather in it, and had on a soldier's red coat decorated with paper rosettes as big as cabbages. His legs, too, were covered with his own corduroy trousers, but adorned with paper streamers and bows. In front of him marched a couple of men carrying broomsticks, and musicians playing upon a tambourine and a penny tin whistle. The most remarkable of the stuffed figures of 1856 was one dressed in a sheet, intended to represent the Reverend Mr. Spurgeon in a surplice. It was carried about on a wooden stage by boys, and took very well with the mob, for no sooner did the lads cry out, Remember, remember, the 5th of November, old Spurgeon's treason and plot, than a shout of laughter burst from the crowd, and the halfpence began to pour in. Without this alteration in the November rhyme, Nobody would have been able to have traced the slightest resemblance between the guy and the reverend gentleman whose effigy it was stated to be. Further, it should be added that the guy exhibitors have of late introduced a new system of composing special rhymes for the occasion, which are delivered after the well-known Remember, Remember. Those with the figures of the Pope, for instance, sing... A penworth of cheese to feed the Pope, a tuppenny loaf to choke him, a pint of beer to wash it down, and a good large faggot to smoke him. I heard a party of costermongers who had the image of His Imperial Majesty the Emperor of all the Russias wobbling on their truck, sing in chorus this home manufactured verse Poking in in his eye, a squib shove up his nose, sirs, then roast him till he's done quite brown, and Nick to old Nick goes, sirs. 
With the larger guys, little is usually said or done beyond exhibiting them. In the crowded thoroughfares, the proprietors mostly occupy themselves only with collecting the money, and never let the procession stop for a moment. On coming to the squares, however, a different course is pursued, for then they stop before every window where a head is visible, and sing the usual Remember, Remember, winding up with a vociferous Hurrah! as they hold out their hats for the halfpence. At the West End, one of the largest guys of 1856 was drawn by a horse in a cart. This could not have been less than 14 feet high. Its face, which was as big as a shield, was so flat and good-humoured in expression that I at once recognised it as a pantomime mask, or one used to hang outside some masquerade costumier's shop door. The coat was off the Charles II's cut, and composed of a lightish coloured paper, ornamented with a profusion of Dutch metal. There was a sash across the right shoulder, and the legs were almost as long as the funnel to a penny steamer, and ended in brown paper cavalier boots. As the costermongers led it along, it shook like a load of straw. If it had not been for the bull's-eye lantern and lath matches, nobody would have recognised in the dandy figure the effigy of the wretched fox. By far the handsomest turnout of the day at this time was a group of three figures which promenaded Whitechapel and Bethnal Green. They stood erect in a van drawn by a blind horse and accompanied by a band of one performer on the drum and pandean pipes. Four clowns in full costume made faces while they jumped about among the spectators and collected donations. All the guys were about ten feet high. The centre one, intended for Fox himself, was attired in a flowing cloak of crimson glazed calico, and his black hat was a broad-rimmed sugar loaf, the pointed crown of which was like a model of Langham Place church steeple, and it had a profusion of black hair streaming about the face. The figures on either side of this were intended for Lords Suffolk and Monteagle, in the act of arresting the traitor, and accordingly appeared to be gently tapping Mr. Fox on either shoulder. The bodies of their lordships were encased in gold scale armour, and their legs in silver ditto, whilst their heads were covered with three-cornered cocked hats, surmounted by white feathers. In the front of the van were two white banners, with the following inscriptions in letters of gold. Apprehension of Guy Fox on the 5th of November in the year 1605 and the discovery of the gunpowder plot on the 5th of November, 1605. At the back of the van flaunted two flags of all nations. In addition to the four clowns, there were several other attendants. One in particular had the appearance of half a man and half a beast, his body being clad in a green frock coat, whilst his legs and feet were shaggy and made to imitate a bear's. The most remarkable part of this exhibition was the expression upon the countenances of the figures. They were ordinary masks, and consequently greatly out of proportion for the height of the figures. There was a strong family resemblance between the traitor and his arresters. Neither did Fox's countenance exhibit any look of rage, astonishment, or disappointment at finding his designs frustrated. Nor did their lordships appear to be angry, disgusted, or thunderstruck, at the conspirators' bold attempt. In the neighbourhood of Bond Street, the guys partook of a political character as if to please the various members of Parliament who might be strolling to their clubs. In one barrow was the effigy of the Emperor of the French, holding in his hands, instead of the lantern and matches, a copy of the Times newspaper torn in half. I was informed that another figure I saw was intended to represent the form of Bomba. In the neighbourhood of Lambeth Palace, the guys were of an ecclesiastical kind, and such as it was imagined would be likely to flatter the Archbishop of Canterbury into giving at least a half-crown. One of these was drawn by two donkeys and accompanied by drums and pipes. It represented Cardinal Wiseman in the company of four members of the Holy Inquisition. The Cardinal was dressed in the usual scarlet costume, while the inquisitors were robed in black, with green veils over their faces. In front of the cart was a bottle labelled Holy Water, which was continually turned round, 
so that the people might discover that on the other side was printed whisky. The practice of burning guys and lighting bonfires and letting off fireworks is now generally discontinued, and particularly as regards the public exhibitions at Blackheath and Peckham Rye. The greatest display of fireworks, we are inclined to believe, took place in the public streets of the metropolis, for up to twelve o'clock at night one might occasionally hear reports of penny cannons and the jerky explosions of crackers. End of section 13 Section 14 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Street Exhibitors, Part 6. Guy Fox, Man. I'm in the crockery line, going about with a basket and changing jugs and glass and things, for clothes and that. But for the last eight years I have, every 5th of November, gone out with a guy. It's a good job for the time, for what little we lay out on the guy we don't miss, and the money comes in all of a lump at the last. While it lasts, there's money to be made by it. I used always to take the guy about for two days, but this last year I took him about for three. I was nineteen year old when I first went out with a guy. It was seeing others about with him, and being out of work at the time, and having nothing to sell. I and another chap, we knocked up one between us, and we found it go on pretty well, so we kept on at it. The first one I took out was a very first rater, for we'd got it up as well as we could to draw people's attention. I said, it ain't no good doing as the others do, we must have a tip-topper. It represented Guy Fox in black velvet. It was about nine feet high, and he was standing upright, with matches in one hand and lantern in the other. I showed this one round Clerkenwell and Islington. It was the first big un as was ever brought out. There had been paper ones as big, but ne'er a one dressed up in the style mine was. I had a donkey and cart, and we placed it against some cross rails, and some bits of wood to keep him steady. He stood firm because he had two poles up his legs and being lashed round the body, holding him firm to the posts, like a rock. We done better the first time we went out than we do lately. The guy must have cost a sovereign. He had a trunk hose and white legs, which we made out of a pair of white drawers, for fleshings and yellow boots, which I bought in Petticoat Lane. We took over three pounds with him, which was pretty fair, and just put us on again, for November is a bad time for most street trades, and getting a few shillings all at once makes it all right till Christmas. A pal of mine, of the name of Smith, was the first as ever brought out a big one. His wasn't a regular dressed-up one, but only with a paper apron to hang down the front, and bows and such like. He put it on a chair, and had four boys to carry it on their shoulders. He was the first, too, as introduced clowns to dance about. I see him do well, and that's why I took mine in hand. The year there was chalking no popery all about the walls, I had one dressed up in a long black garment with a red cross on his bosom. I'm sure I don't know what it meant, but they told me it would be popular. I had only one figure with nine bows, and that situated all about him. As we went along, everybody shouted out, No popery! Everybody did. He had a large brimmed hat with a low crown in, and a wax mask. I always had wax ones. I've got one at home now I've had for five year. It cost two and sixpence. It's a very good-looking face, but rather sly, with a great horsehair beard. Most of the boys make their in devils, and as ugly as they can. But that wouldn't do for Christians like, as I represent mine to be. One year I had Nicholas and his adviser, that was the Emperor of Russia, in big top boots and white breeches, and a green coat on. I gave him a good bit of mustachios, a little extra. He had a Russian helmet hat on, with a pair of eagles on the top. It was one I bought. I bought it cheap, for I only gave a shilling for it. I was offered five or six for it afterwards. But I found it answer my purpose to keep. I had it dressed up this year. The other figure was a devil. I made him of green tinsel paper cut out like scale armour, and pasted on to his legs to make it stick tight. He had a devil's mask on, and I made him a pair of horns out of his head. 
Over them was a banner. I was told what to do to make the banner, for I had the letters writ out first, and then I cut them out of tinsel paper and stuck them on to glazed calico. On this banner was these words. What shall I do next? Why, blow your brains out. That took immensely, for the people said, That is very well. It was the time the war was on. I dare say I took between three pounds and four pounds that time. There was three of us rode in with it, so we got a few shillings apiece. The best one I ever had was the trial of Guy Fox. There was four figures, and they was drawn about in a horse and cart. There was Guy Fox, and two soldiers had hold of him, and there was the king sitting in a chair in front. The king was in a scarlet velvet cloak, sitting in an old armchair, papered over to make it look decent. There was green and blue paper hanging over the arms to hide the ragged parts of it. The king's cloak cost sevenpence a yard, and there was seven of these yards. He had a gilt paper crown and a long black wig made out of some rope. His trunks was black and crimson, and he had blue stockings and red boots. I made him up out of my own head, and not from pictures. It was just as I thought would be the best way to get it up out of my own head. I've seed the picture of Guy Fox because I've got the book of it at home. I never was no scholar, not in the least. The soldiers had a breastplate of white steel paper and baggy knee breeches and top boots. They had a big pipe each with a top cut out of tin. Their helmets was the same as in the pictures of steel paper and a kind of dish cover shape with a peak in front and behind. Guy was dressed the same kind as he was this year with a black velvet dress and red cloak, and red boots turning over at top, with lace sewed on. I never made any of the figures frightful. I get em as near as I can to the lifelike. I reckon that show was the best as I ever had about. I done very well with it. They said it was a very good sight and well got up. I dare say it cost me, with one thing and another, pretty nigh four pounds to get up. There was two of us to shove, me and my brother. I know I had a sovereign to myself when it was over, besides a little bit of merrymaking. This year I had the apprehension of Guy Fox by Lord Suffolk and Monteagle. I followed up the history as close as I can. Next year I shall have him being burnt with a lot of faggots and things about him. This year the figures cost about three pounds getting up. Fox was dressed in his old costume of black velvet and red boots. I bought some black velvet breeches in Petticoat Lane and I gave one shilling ninepence for the two pair. They was old theatrical breeches. Their lordships was dressed in gold scale armour like, of cut out paper pasted on, and their legs imitated steel. They had three corner cocked hats with white feathers in. I always buy fierce looking masks with frowns, but one of them this year was a smiling, Lord Monteagle, I think. I took the figures as near as I can form from a picture I saw of Guy Fawkes being apprehended. I placed them figures in a horse and cart and piled them up on apple chests to the level of the cart, so they showed all, their feet and all. I bind the chests with a piece of table cover cloth. The first day we went out we took two pounds seven shillings, and the second we took one pound seventeen shillings, and the last day we took two pounds one shilling. We did so well the third day because we went into the country, about Tottenham and Edmonton. They never witnessed such a thing down them parts. The drummer what I had with me was a blind man, and well known down there. They call him Friday, because he goes there every Friday. So what they usually gave him, we had. Our horse was blind, so we was obliged to have one to lead him in front, and another to lead the blind drummer behind. We paid the drummer sixteen shillings for the three days. We paid for two days ten shillings. And the third one, most of it came in. And we all went shares. It was a pony more than a horse. I think we got about a pound apiece clear when we was done on the Friday night. It took me six weeks getting up in my leisure time. There was the Russian bear in front. He wore a monkey dress, the same as in the pantomimes, and that did just as well for a bear. I painted his face as near as I could get it to make it look frightful. When I'm building up a guy, we first get some bags and things and cut them to the shape of the legs and things and then sew it up. We sew the body and arms and all round together in one. We put two poles down for the legs and then a cross piece at the belly and another cross piece at the shoulder and that holds them firm. We fill the legs with sawdust and stuff it down with our hands to make it tight. 
It takes two sacks of sawdust for three figures, but I generally have it give to me, for I know a young feller as works at the wood chopping. We stand them up in the room against the wall while we are dressing them. We have lots of chaps come to see us working at the guys. Some will sit there for many hours looking at us. We stuff the body with shavings and paper and any sort of rubbish. I sew whatever is wanted myself, and in fact my fingers is sore now with the thimble, for I don't know how to use a thimble, and I feel awkward with it. I design everything and cut out all the clothes and the painting and all. They allow me five shillings for the building. This last group took me six weeks. Not constant, you know, but only lazy time of a night. I lost one or two days over it, that's all. I think there was more Guy Foxes out this year than ever was out before. There was one had Guy Fox and Punch and a Clown in a cart, and another was Miss Nightingale and two soldiers. It was meant to be complimentary to that lady, but for myself I think it insulting to bring out a lady like that as a guy, when she's done good to all. They always reckon me to be about the first hand in London at building a guy. I never see none like them, nor no one else, I don't think. It took us two choir of gold paper and one choir of silver paper to do the armour and the banner and other things. The gold paper is sixpence a sheet and the silver is a penny a sheet. It wouldn't look so noble if we didn't use the gold paper. This year we had three clowns with us and we paid them three shillings a day each. I was dressed up as a clown too. We had to dance about and joke and say what we thought would be funny to the people. I had a child in my arms made of a doll stuffed with shavings and made to represent a little boy. It was just to make a laugh. Everyone I went up to, I told the doll to ask their uncle or their aunt for a copper. I had another move, too, of calling for Bill Bowers in the crowd, and if I got into any row or anything, I used to call to him to protect me. We had no time to say much, for we kept on moving, and it loses time to talk. We took the guy round Goswell Road and Pentonville the first day, and on the second we was round Bethnal Greenway, among the weavers. We went that way for safety the second day, for the police won't interrupt you there. The private houses give the most. They very seldom give more than a penny. I don't suppose we got more than three shillings or four shillings in silver all the three days. Sometimes we have rough work with the Irish going about with guys. The no popery year there was several rows. I was up at Islington Gate there, in the lower road, and there's loads of Irish live up there, and a rough lot they are. They came out with sticks and bricks, and cut after us. We bolted with the guy. If our guy hadn't been very firm, it would have been jolted to bits. We always nailed straps round the feet, and supported on rails at the waist, and lashed to the sides. We bolted from this Irish mob over Islington Green and down John Street into Clerkenwell. My mate got a nick with a stone just on the head. It just gave him a slight hurt and drawed the blood from him. We jumped up in the donkey cart and drove off. There was one guy was pulled out of the cart this year down by Old Gravel Lane in Ratcliffe Highway. They pulled Miss Nightingale out of the cart and ran away with her and regular destroyed the two soldiers that was on each side of her. Sometimes the cabmen lash at the guys with their whips. We never say anything to them for fear we might get stopped by the police for making a row. You stand a chance of having a feather knocked off or such like, as is attached to them. There's a lot of boys goes about on the fifth with sticks and make a regular business of knocking guys to pieces. They're called guy smashers. They don't come to us, we're too strong for that, but they only manage the little ones as they can take advantage of. They do this, some of them, to take the money the boys have collected. I have had regular prigs following my show to pick the pockets of those looking on but as sure as I see them, I start them off by putting a policeman onto them. When we're showing, I don't take no trouble to invent new rhymes, but stick to the old poetry. There's some do new songs. I usually sing out, Gentlefolks pray, remember this day, tis with kind notice we bring, the figure of sly and villainous guy who wanted to murder the king. By powder and store he bitterly swore, as he skulked on the walls to repair, the Parliament, too, by him and his crew, should all be blowed up in the air. But James, very wise, did the papists surprise as they plotted the cruelty great. They know their intent, so Suffolk he sent, to save both kingdom and state. Guy Fox he was found with a lantern underground, and soon was the traitor bound fast. 
and they swore he should die, so they hung him up high and burnt him to ashes at last. So we once a year come round without fear to keep up remembrance of this day, while assistance from you may bring a review of Guy Fox a blazing away. So hollow boys, hollow boys, shout unto Za. So hollow boys, hollow boys, keep up this day. So hollow boys, hollow boys, and make the bells ring. Down with the Pope, and God save the Queen. It used to be King, but we say Queen now, and though it don't rhyme, it's more correct. It's very seldom that the police say anything to us, so long as we don't stop too long in the gangway, not to create any mob. They join in the fun and laugh like the rest. Wherever we go, there is a great crowd from morning to night. We have dinner on Guy Fawkes days between one and two. We go to any place where it's convenient for us to stop at, generally at some public house. We go inside and leave some of the lads to look after the guy outside. We always keep near the window where we can look out into the street, and we keep ourselves ready to pop out in a minute if anybody should attack the guy. We generally go into some byway where there ain't much traffic. We never was interrupted much whilst we was at dinner, only by boys chucking stones and flinging things at it, and they run off as soon as we come out. There's one party that goes out with a guy that sells it afterwards. They stop in London for the first two days, and then they work their way into the country, as far as Sheerness, and then they sell the guy to form part of the procession on Lord Mayor's Day. It's the watermen and ferrymen mostly buy it, and they carry it about in a kind of merriment among themselves, and at night they burn it and let off fireworks. They don't make no charge for coming to see it burnt, but it's open to the air and free to the public. None of the good guys taken about on the 5th are burnt at night, unless some gentlemen buy them. I used to sell mine at one time to the Albert Saloon. Sometimes they'd give me 15 shillings for it, and sometimes less, according to what kind of a one I had. Three years, I think, I sold it to them. They used to burn it at first in the gardens at the back, but after they found the gardens full very well without it, so they wouldn't have any more. I always take the sawdust and shavings out of my guise and save the clothes for another year. The clothes are left in my possession to be taken care of. I make a kind of private bonfire in our yard with the sawdust and shavings, and the neighbours come there and have a kind of a spree, and shove one another into the fire and kick it about the yard and one thing and another. When I am building the guy, I begin about six weeks before 5th of November comes, and then we subscribe a shilling or two each and buy such things as we want. Then, when we want more, I goes to my pals who live close by, and we subscribe another shilling or sixpence each, according to how we gets on in the day. Nearly all those that take out guys are mostly street traders. The heaviest expense for any guy I've built was four pounds for one of four figures. Guy Fox, Boy I always go out with a Guy Fox every year. I'm 17 years old and I've been out with a guy ever since I can remember, except last year. I didn't then because I was in Middlesex Hospital with an abscess, brought on by the rheumatic fever. I was in the hospital a month. My father was an undertaker. He's been dead four months. Mother carries on the trade. He didn't like my going out with guys, but I always would. He didn't like it at all. He used to say it was a disgrace. Mother didn't much fancy my doing it this year. When I was a very little un, I was carried about for a guy. I couldn't have been more than seven years old when I first begun. They put paper hangings round my legs. They got it from Baldwin's in the Tottenham Court Road. Sometimes they bought and sometimes got it give them, but they give a rare lot for a penny or tuppence. After that they put me on an apron made of the same sort of paper, showy you know. Then they put a lot of tinsel bows, and at the corners they cut a sort of tail like there is to farrier's aprons, and it looks stunning. Then they put on my chest a tinsel heart and rosettes. They was green and red because it shows off. All up my arms I had bows and things to make a show off. Then I put on a black mask with a little red on the cheek to make me look like a devil. It had horns too. Always pick out a devil's mask with horns. It looks fine and frightens the people almost. The boy that dressed me was a very clever chap and made a guy to rights. Why, he made me a little guy about a foot high to carry in my lap. It was piecings of quilting like, a sort of patchwork all sewn together. And then he filled it with sawdust and made a head of shavings. 
He picked the shavings small and then sewed them up in a little bag, and then he painted a face, and it looked very well. And he made it a little tinsel bobtail coat and a tinsel cap with two feathers on the top. It was made to sit in a chair, and there was a piece of string tied to each of the legs and the arms, and a string come behind, and I used to pull it, and the legs and arms jumped up. I was put in a chair, and two old broom handles was put through the rails, and then a boy got in front, and another behind, and carried me off round Holborn Way in the streets and squares. Every now and then they put me down before a window, then one of em used to say the speech, and I used all the time to keep pulling the string of my little guy. And it amused the children at the windows. After they'd said the speech, we all shouted, Hooray! And then some of them went and knocked at the door, and asked, Please to remember the guy! And the little children brought us halfpence and pence. And sometimes the ladies and gentlemen chucked us some money out of the window. At last they carried me into Russell Square. They put me down before a gentleman's house and began saying the speech. While they was saying it, up comes a lot of boys with sticks in their hands. One of our chaps knowed what they was after and took the little guy out of my hand and went on saying the speech. I kept all on sitting still. After a bit, one of these here boys says, Oh, it's a dead guy. Let's have a lark with it. But then one of them gives me a punch in the eye with his fist and then snatched the mask off my face. And when he'd pulled it off, he says, Oh, Bill, it's a live one. We was afraid we should get the worst of it, so we run away round the square. The biggest one of our lot carried the chair. After we'd run a little way, they caught us again and says, Now then, give us all your money. With that, some ladies and gentlemen that see it all came up to them and says, If you don't go, we'll lock you up. And so they let us go away. And so we went to another place, where they sold masks, and we bought another. Then they asked me to be the guy again, but I wouldn't, for I got a black eye through it already. So they got another to finish out the day. When we got home at night, we shared two shillings apiece. There was five of us all together, but I think they chiselled me. I know they got a deal more than that, for they'd had a good many sixpences and shillings. People usen't to think much of a shilling that time of day, because there wasn't any but little guys about then. But I don't know but what the people now encourage little guys most, because they say that the chaps with the big ones ought to go to work. Next year, I was out with the stuffed guy. They wanted me to be guy again, because I wasn't frightened easy, and I was lightish. But I told them, no, I have had enough of being guy. I don't be guy any more. Besides, I had such fine money for getting a whack in the eye. We got on pretty well that year. But it gets worse and worse every year. We got hardly anything this year. And next, I don't suppose we shall get anything at all. These chaps that go about pitching into guys, we call guy smashers. But they don't do it only for the lark of smashing the guys. They do it for the purpose of taking the boys' money away, and sometimes the clothes. If one of them has a hole in his boots and he sees a guy with a good pair on, he pretty soon pulls them off the guy and takes it off with him. After I'd been out with guys for three or four years, I got big enough to go to work, and I used to go along with my brother and help him at a coal shed, carrying out coals. I was there ten months, and then one night, a bitter cold night, it was freezing hard, we had a naphtha lamp to light in the shop, and as me and my brother was doing it, either a piece of the match dropped in, or else he poured it over, I can't say which, but all at once it exploded, and blowed me across the road, and knocked him in the shop, all afire. And I was all afire too. See how it's burnt my face, and the hand I held the lucifer in? A woman ran out of the next shop with some wet sacks, and throwed them upon me, but it flared up higher then. Water don't put it out, unless it's a mass of water like an engine. Then a milkman ran up, and pulled off his cape, and throwed it over me, and that put it out. Then he set me up, and I run home, though I don't know how I got there. And for two days after, I didn't know anybody. Another man ran into the shop and pulled out my brother, and we was both taken to the university hospital. Two or three people touched me, and the skin came off on their hands. And at nine o'clock the next morning, my brother died. When they took me to the hospital, they had no bed for me, and so they sent me home again, and I was seven months before I got well. But I've never been to say well since and I shall never be fit for hard work any more. 
The next year I went out with a guy again, and I got on pretty well, and so I've done every year since, except the last. I've had several little places since I got burnt, but they haven't lasted long. This year I made a stunning guy. First of all, I got a pair of my own breeches, blackens, and stuffed them full of shavings. I tied the bottoms with a bit of string. Then I got a black coat that belonged to another boy, and sewed it all round to the trousers. Then we filled that with shavings, and give him a good corporation. Then we got a block, such as the milliners have, and shoved that right in the neck of the coat, and then we shoved some more shavings all round to make it stick in tight, and when that was done, it looked just like a dead man. I know something about dead men, because my father was always in that line. Then we got some horse hair and some glue, and plastered the head all round with glue, and stuck the horse hair on to imitate the hair of a man. Then we put the mask on. It was a tuppenny one. They're a great deal cheaper than they used to be. You can get a very good one now for a penny. It had a great big nose, and it had two red horns, black eyebrows, and red cheeks. I like devils. They're so ugly. I bought a good-looking one two or three years ago, and we didn't get hardly anything. The people said, Ah, it's too good-looking. It don't frighten us at all. Well then, after we put on his mask, we got two gloves. One was a woolen one, and the other a kitten, and stuffed them full of shavings, and tied them down to the chair. We didn't have no lantern, because it keeps on falling out of his hands. After that, we put on an old pair of lace-up boots. We tied them on to the legs of the breeches. The feet mostly twists round, but we stopped that. We shoved a stick up the leg of his breeches, and the other end into the boot, and tied it, and then it couldn't twist round very easy. After that, we put a paper hanging cap on his head. It was silk velvet kind of paper, and decorated all over with tinsel bows. His coat we pasted all over with blue and green tinsel bows and pictures. They was painted theatrical characters, what we buy at the shop, a halfpenny a sheet plain, and penny a sheet coloured. We bought them plain and coloured them ourselves. Atop of his hat we put a hornament. We got some red paper and cut it into narrow strips, and curled it with the blade of the scissors, and stuck it on like a feather. We made him a fine apron of hanging paper, and cut that in slips up to his knees, and curled it with the scissors, the same as his feather, and decorated it with stars and bows and things, made out of paper, all manner of colours, and pieces of tinsel. After we'd finished the guy, we made ourselves cocked hats, all alike, and then we tied him in a chair, and wrote on his breast, Villainous Guy! Then we put two broomsticks under the chair and carried him out. There was four of us, and the two that wasn't carrying, they had a long bow of a tree each, with a knob at the end, to protect the guy. We started off at once and got into the squares, and put him in front of the gentlemen's houses, and said this speech. Pray, gentlefolks, pray, remember this day, at which kind notice we bring. This figure of sly, old villainous guy, he wanted to murder the king. With powder in store, he bitterly swore, by him in the vaults to compare. By him and his crew, and Parliament too, should all be blowed up in the air. So please to remember the 5th of November, the gunpowder treason and plot. I see no reason why gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. So hello boys, hello boys, shout out the day. Hello boys, hello boys, hello, hooray! After we'd finished our speech in one of the squares and hollowed hooray, the beadle come out and said he'd give us the stick about our backs and the guy too if we didn't go away. So we went away and got into Russell Square and Bedford Square, but there was such a lot of small guys out that we did worse than ever we'd done before. When we was in Southampton Street, Holborn, I finished the speech with Down with the Pope and God save the Queen. So four shoe black boys come up and says, says they, What do you say down with the Pope and God save the Queen for? And I says, I didn't mean no harm of it. With that, they makes use of some bad language and told me they'd smash my head and the guys too. And they was going to do it when up comes a boy that I knew. And I says to him, They're going to knock me about. So he says, No, they won't. So then the boys made their reply and said they would. So I told them they was very fast about fighting. I'd fight one of them. So with that, they all got ready to pitch upon me. 
but when they see this other boy stuck to me, they went off and never struck a blow. When we got home, I opened the money box and shared the money. One had five pence, and two had four pence halfpenny each, and I had seven pence because I said the speech. At night we pulled him all to pieces and burnt his stuffing, and let off some squibs and crackers. I always used to spend the money I got, gang, on myself. I used to buy sometimes fowls because I could sell the eggs. There is some boys that takes out guys as do it for the sake of getting a bit of bread and butter, but not many as I knows of. It don't cost much to make a guy. The clothes we never burns, they're generally too good. They're our own clothes, what we wears at other times. And when people burn a guy, they always pull off any of the things that's of use first. But mostly the guy gets pulled all to pieces and only the shavings get burnt. End of section 14 Section 15 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Street Exhibitors, Part 7. An Old Street Showman. A short, thick-set man with small, puckered-up eyes and dressed in an old brown velveteen shooting jacket gave me an account of some bygone exhibitions of the Galantee show. My father was a soldier, he said, and was away in foreign parts, and I and a sister lived with my mother in St. Martin's workhouse. I was fifty-five last New Year's Day. My uncle, a bookmaker in St. Martin's Lane, took my mother out of the workhouse that she might do a little washing and pick up a living for herself and we children went to live with my grandfather, a tailor. After his death, and after many changes, we had a lodging in the Dials, and there, blank, the sweep, coaxed me with pudding one day, and encouraged me so well that I didn't like to go back to my mother, and at last I was apprenticed to him from Hatton Garden on a month's trial, and I liked chimney sweeping for that month. But it was quite different when I was regularly indentured, I was cruelly treated then, and poorly fed, and had to turn out barefooted between three and four, many a morning, in frost and snow. In first climbing the chimneys, a man stood beneath me and pushed me up, telling me how to use my elbows and knees, and if I slipped, he was beneath me and catched me and shoved me up again. The skin came off my knees and elbows. Here's the marks now, you see. I suffered a great deal, as well as Dan Duff, a fellow sweep, a boy that died. I've been to Mrs. Montague's dinner in the square on the 1st of May when I was a boy sweep. It was a dinner in honour of her son having been stolen away by a sweep. Note the man's own words. End note. I suppose there were more than 300 of us sweeps there in a large green at the back of her house. I run away from my master once but was carried back and was rather better used. My master then got me knee and ankle pads and bathed my limbs in salt and water and I managed to drag on seven sorrowful years with him. I was glad to be my own man at last, and I cut the sweep trade, bought Pandean pipes, and started with an organ man as his mate. I saved money with the organ man, and then bought a drum. He gave me five shillings a week, and my whittles and drink, washing and lodging. But there wasn't so much music afloat then. I left the music man and went out with Michael, the Italy bear. Michael was the man's name that brought over the bear from somewhere abroad. He was a Italy man, and he used to beat the bear and manage her. They called her Jenny, but Michael was not to say roughish to her, unless she was obstreperous. If she were, he showed her the large mop stick and beat her with it, hard sometimes, especially when she wouldn't let the monkey get a top on her head, for that was a part of the performance. The monkey was dressed the same as a soldier, but the bear had no dress but her muzzle and chain. The monkey, a clever fellow he was, and could jump over sticks like a Christian, was called Billy. He jumped up and down the bear too, and on his master's shoulders, where he sat as Michael walked up and down the streets. The bear had been taught to roll and tumble. She rolled right over her head, all round a stick, and then she danced round about it. She did it at the word of command. Michael said to her, Round and round again. We fed her on bread. 
a quartern loaf every night after her work in half a pail of water, the same every morning, never any meat, nothing but bread, boiled potatoes, or raw carrots. Meat would have made her savage. The monkey was fed upon nuts, apples, gingerbread, or anything. Besides them, we had two dancing dogs. The bear didn't like them, and they were kept on one side in performing. The dogs jumped through hoops and danced on their hind legs. They're easyish enough trained. Sometimes the butchers set bulldogs, two or three at a time, at Jenny, and Michael and me had to beat them off, as well as the two other men that we had with us. Those two men collected the money, and I played the pipes and drum, and Michael minded the bear and the dogs and monkey. In London we did very well. The West End was the best. Whitechapel was crowded for us, but only with halfpence. I don't know what Michael made, but I had seven shillings a week with my whittles and lodging. Michael done well. We generally had twenty to thirty shillings every night in halfpence, and used to give twenty-one shillings of it for a one-pound note, for they was in then. When we've travelled in the country, we've sometimes had trouble to get lodgings for the bear. We've had to sleep in outhouses with her, and have sometimes frightened people that didn't know as we was there. But nothing serious. Bears is well behaved enough if they ain't aggravated. Perhaps no one but me is left in England now what properly understands a dancing bear. Jenny wasn't ever baited, but offers was made for it by sporting characters. The country was better than London when the weather allowed, but in Gloucester, Cheltenham, and a good many places we weren't let in the high streets. The gentlefolk in the balconies, both in town and country. Where they had a good sight, were our best friends. It's more than thirty years ago. Yes, a good bit more now. At Chester races one year, we were all taken and put into prison. Bear and dogs and musicianer and all, every one, because we played a day after the races. That was Saturday. We were all in quad until Monday morning. I don't know how the authorities fed the bear. We were each in a separate cell, and I had bread and cheese and gruel. On Monday morning we were discharged, and the bear was shot by the magistrate's orders. They wanted to hang poor Jenny at first, but she was shot and sold to the hairdressers. I couldn't stay to see her shot, and had to go into an alehouse on the road. I don't know what her carcass sold for; it wasn't very fat. Michael and me then parted at Chester, and he went home rich to Italy, taking his monkey and dogs with him. I believe he lived very careful. Chiefly on rice and cabbage, and a very little meat with it, which he called manesta. He was a very old man. I had manesta sometimes, but I didn't like it much. I drummed and piped my way from Chester to London, and there took up with another foreigner named Green, in the clockwork figure line. The figures were a Turk called Bluebeard, a sailor, a lady called Lady Caterina, and Neptune's car, which we called Nelson's car as well. But it was Neptune's car by rights. The figures danced on a table when taken out of a box. Each had its own dance when wound up. First came my lady Caterina. She and the others of them were full two feet high. She had a cork body and a very handsome silk dress or muslin, according to the fashion or the season. Black in Lent, according to what the nobility wore. Lady Caterina, when wound up, danced a reel for seven minutes. The sailor a hornpipe, and Bluebeard shook his head, rolled his eyes, and moved his sword, just as natural as life. Neptune's car went either straight or round the table as it was set. We often showed our performances in the houses of the nobility, and would get ten or twelve shillings at a good house when there were children. I had a third share, and in town and country we cleared fifty shillings a week at least every week among the three of us. After all, our keep and expenses were paid. At Doncaster races, we have taken three pounds in a day and four pounds at Lincoln races. Country in summer is better than town. There's now no such exhibition, barring the one I have, but that's pledged. It cost twenty pounds at Mister Blank's for the four figures without dress. I saved money, which went in an illness of rheumatic gout. There's no bears at all allowed now. Times are changed, and all for the worser. I stuck to the clockwork concern sixteen years, 
and knows all parts of the country, Ireland, Scotland, Guernsey, Jersey, and the Isle of Wight. A month before Christmas, we used to put the figures by, for the weather didn't suit, and then we went with a guarantee show of a magic lantern. We showed it on a white sheet, or on the ceiling, big or little, in the houses of the gentlefolk, and the schools where there was a breaking up. It was shown by way of a treat to the scholars. There was Harlequin and Billy Button and such like. We had ten and sixpence and fifteen shillings for each performance and did very well indeed. I have that guarantee show now, but it brings in very little. Green's dead and all in the line's dead but me. The guarantee show don't answer because magic lanterns are so cheap in the shops. When we started, magic lanterns wasn't so common. But we can't keep hold of a good thing in these times. It was a regular thing for Christmas once, the guarantee shows. I can make, in a holiday time, 20 shillings a week, but that's only at holiday times, and is just a mere casualty a few times a year. I do other jobs when I can get them. At other times, I delivers bills, carries boards, and helps at funerals. The Chinese Shades The proper name of my exhibition said a showman of this class to me, is Les Hombres, or The Shades. That's the proper name for it, for Baron Rothschild told me so when I performed before him. We calls it the Chinese Guarantee Show. It was invented over there with the Chinese, and some travellers went over there and see them doing it, and they come over here and tell us about it. They didn't do it as we do, you know. As for doing pieces, we lick them out of the field. Them only did the shadows. We do a piece with them. I should say, sir, let me calculate. It is about twenty-six years since the hombres first came out. Reduce it if you like, but that's the time. Thomas Paris was the first as come out with them. Then Jim Macklin and Paul Herring, the celebrated clown, and the best showman of punch in the world for pantomime tricks. Comic business, you know, but not for showing in a gentleman's house, was the next that ever came out in the streets with the Chinese guarantee show. I think it was his own ingenuity that first gave him the notion. It was thoughts of mind, you know. You form the opinion in your own mind, you know, by taking it from the Chinese. They met a friend of theirs who had come from China, and he told them of the shadows. One word is as good as fifty, if it's a little grammatical. Sound judgment. When it first come out, he began with the scene called Mr. Jobson the Cobbler, and that scene has continued to be popular to the present day, and the best scene out. He did it just equally the same as they do it now, in a punch and duty frame, with a piece of calico stretched in front, and a light behind, to throw the shadows on the sheet. Paul Herring did excellent with it, nothing less than thirty shillings or two pounds a night. He didn't stop long at it because he is a stage clown and had other business to attend to. I saw him the first time he performed. It was in the Waterloo Road, and the next night I were out with one of my own. I only require to see a thing once to be able to do it. But you must have ingenuity, or it's no use whatsoever. Everyone who had a punch and duty frame took to it, doing the regular business in the day and at night turning to the shadows. In less than a week there were two others out, and then Paul Herring cut it. He only done it for a lark. He was hard up for money and got it. I was the first that ever had a regular piece acted in his show. I believe there's nobody else as did, but only them that's copied me. They come and follow me, you understand, and copied me. I am the author of Cobbler Jobson and Kitty Biling the Pot, or The Woodchopper's Frolic. There's Billy Button's Journey to Brentford on horseback, and his favourite servant, Jeremiah Stitchum, in want of a situation. I'm the author of that, too. It's adapted from the equestrian piece brought out at Astley's. I don't know who composed The Broken Bridge, it's too far gone by to trace who the first author is, but it was adapted from the piece brought out formerly at Drury Lane Theatre. Old ancient gentleman has told me so who saw it when it was first brought out, 
and they're old enough to be my grandfather. I've new revised it. We in general goes out about seven o'clock, because we gets away from the noisy children. They place them to bed, and we gets respectable audiences. We choose our places for pitching. Leicester Square is a very good place, and so is Islington, but Regent Street is about the principal. There's only two of us about now, for it's dying away. When I've a mind to show, I can show, and no mistake, for I'm better now than I was twenty years ago. Kitty Biling the Pot, or the Woodchopper's Frolic, is this. The shadow of the fireplace is seen with the fire alight, and the smoke is made to go up by mechanism. The woodchopper comes in very hungry and wants his supper. He calls his wife to ask if the leg of mutton is done. He speaks in a gruff voice. He says, My wife is very lazy, and I don't think my supper's done. I've been chopping wood all the days of my life, and I want a bullock's head and a sack of potatoes. The wife comes to him and speaks in a squeaking voice, and she tells him to go and chop some more wood, and in half an hour it will be ready. Excellent. Then the wife calls the daughter Kitty and tells her to see that the pot don't boil over, and above all, to be sure and see that the cat don't steal the mutton out of the pot. Kitty says, Yes, mother, I'll take particular care that the mutton don't steal the cat out of the pot. Cross questions, you see. Comic business. Then mother says, Kitty, bring up the broom and sweep up the room. And Kitty replies, Yes, Mummy, I'll bring up the room to sweep up the broom. Excellent again. It's a regular stage business and cross questions. She brings up the broom and the cat's introduced whilst she is sweeping. The cat goes, Meow, meow, meow. And Kitty gives it a crack with the broom. Then Kitty gets the bellows and blows up the fire. It's a beautiful representation, for you see her working the bellows, and the fire get up, and the sparks fly up the chimney. She says, If I don't make haste, the mutton will be sure to steal the cat out of the pot. She blows the fire right out and says, Why, the fire's blowed the bellows out, but I don't mind. I shall go and play at shuttlecock. Childlike, you see. Then the cat comes in again and says, Meow, meow, and then gets up and steals the mutton. You see her drag it out by the claw, and she burns herself and goes, Spit, spit. Then the mother comes in and sees the fire out and says, Where's my daughter? Here's the fire out, and my husband's coming home, and there isn't a bit of mutton to eat. She calls, Kitty, Kitty, and when she comes, asks where she's been. I've been playing at shuttlecock. The mother asks, Are you sure the cat hasn't stolen the mutton? Oh, no, no, mother. And excellent again. Then the mother goes to the pot. She's represented with a squint, so she has one eye up the chimney and another in the pot. She calls out, Where's the mutton? It must be down at the bottom, or it has boiled away. Then the child comes in and says, Oh, mother, mother, here's a great he-she tomcat been and gone off with the mutton. Then the mother falls down and calls out, I shall faint, I shall faint. Oh, bring me a pail of gin. Then she revives and goes and looks in the pot again. It's regular stage business, and if it was only done on a large scale, would be wonderful. Then comes the correction scene. Kitty comes to her, and her mother says, where have you been? And Kitty says, Playing at shuttlecock, mummy. And then the mother says, I'll give you some shuttlecock with the gridiron. And excellent. And comes back with the gridiron. And then you see her with the child on her knee, correcting of her. Then the woodchopper comes in and wants his supper, after chopping wood all the days of his life. Where's supper? Oh, a nasty big he-she tomcat has been and stole the mutton out of the pot. What? Passionate directly, you see. Then she says, You must put up with bread and cheese. He answers, That don't suit some people. And then comes a fight. Then spring Jack is introduced, and he carries off the fireplace and pot and all. Excellent. 
That's the end of the piece, and a very good one it was. I took it from Paris and improved on it. Paris had no workable figures. It was very inferior. He had no fire. It's a dangerous concern, the fire is, for it's done with a little bit of the snuff of a candle, and if you don't mind, you go alight. It's a beautiful performance. Our exhibition generally begins with a sailor doing a hornpipe, and then the tightrope dancing, and after that the Scotch hornpipe dancing. The little figures regularly move their legs as if dancing, the same as on the stage, only it's more cleverer, for they're made to do it by ingenuity. Then comes the piece called Cobbler Jobson. We call it The Laughable, Comic and Interesting Scene of Old Father Jobson, the London Cobbler, or The Old Lady Disappointed of Her Slipper. I am in front doing the speaking and playing the music on the Pandanian pipe. That's the real word for the pipe from the Romans when they first invaded England. That's the first music ever introduced into England when the Romans first invaded it. I have to do the dialogue in four different voices. There is the child, the woman, the countryman, and myself. And there's not many as can do it besides me and another. The piece called Cobbler Jobson is this. It opens with the shadow of a cottage on one side of the sheet and a cobbler's stall on the other. There are boots and shoes hanging up in the windows of the cobbler's stall. Cobbler Jobson is supposed at work inside and heard singing. An old cobbler I am, and live in my stall. It serves me for our house, parlour, kitchen, and all. No coin in my pocket, no care in my pate. I sit down at my ease and get drunk when I please. Hi down, hi dairy down. Then he sings again. Last night I took a wife, and when I first did woo her, I vowed I'd stick through life like cobbler's wax unto her. Hi down, derry down, down, down. Then the figure of a little girl comes in and raps at the door. Mr. Jobson, is my mamma's slipper done? No, miss, it's not done, but if you'll call in half an hour, it shall be well done for I've taken the soles off and put the upper leathers in a pail to soak. What? In a pail? Yes, my dear, without fail. Then you won't disappoint. No, my dear, I'd sooner a pot than a pint. Then I may depend? Yes, and you won't have it. He says this aside, so the girl don't hear him. Then Jobson begins to sing again. He comes in front and works. You see his lapstone and the hammer going. He begins to sing. To the morning for breakfast, a bacon and spinach. Says I to my wife, I'm going to Greenwich. Says she, Dicky Hall, then I'll go too. Says I, Mrs. Hall, I'll be dished if you do. I down, I dirty down. Then the little girl comes in again to know if the slipper is done. And as it isn't, it's, my dear, you must go without it. Then she gets impertinent and says, I shan't go with it. You nasty old waxy, 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 waxy. Oh, you nasty old ball of bristles and bunch of wax. Then he tries to hit her and she runs into the house. And as soon as he's at work, she comes out again. Ah, you nasty cobbler. Who's got a lump of wax on his breeches? Who sold his wife's shirt to buy a haperth of gin? Then the cobbler is regularly vexed, and he tries to coax her into the stall to larrup her. Here, my dear, here's a lump of puddin' and a farden. Oh, yes, you nasty old cobbler, you only want to give me a lump of puddin' on my back. Here's a penny, my dear, if you'll fetch it. Chuck it here and I'll fetch it. At last she goes into the stall, and she gets a hiding with the hammer. She cries out, you nasty old cobbler, waxy, waxy, waxy. I'll go and tell my mother all about it. That's what we call the aggravating scene. And next comes the passionate scene. He begins singing one of his songs. He thinks he's all right now he's got rid of the girl. Then comes in the old lady, shaking with rage. How dare you strike my child in this here kind of a manner? 
Come out of the stall, or I'll pull you out, neck and crop. Then Jobson is in a funk and expects a hiding. Oh, Mum, I'm very sorry, but your child said I skinned a cat for ninepence and called me Cobbler Waxy Waxy Waxy. I won't believe a word of it, Mr. Jobson. Yes, Mum, your child's very insulting. How dare you strike the chick, you nasty old villain. I'll tear the eyes out of you. A fight then commences between them, and the old lady gets the worst of it. Then they make it up, and they'll have some gin. I'll be a penny to your threepence, says the cobbler, and the old lady says, Oh, I can always treat myself. Then there's another fight, for there's two fights in it. The old lady gets the worst of it, and runs into the cottage, and then old Jobson cries, I'd better be off, stall and all for fear she should come back with the kitchen poker. That finishes up the scene, don't you see, for he carries off the stall with him. Cobbler Jobson is up to the door, I think. It's first rate. It only wants elaborating. Billy Button is a very laughable thing, and equally up to the door. There's another piece called Billy Waters, the celebrated London beggar, and that's a great hit. There's the bull-baiting, that's all the scenes I know of. I believe I am the only man that knows the words all through. Kitty Biling the Pot is one of the most beautifulest scenes in the world. It wants expounding, you know, for you could open it the whole length of the theatre. I wanted to take Ramsgate Theatre and do it there, but they wanted two pounds a night, and that was too much for me. I should have put a sheet up and acted it with real figures as large as life. When I was down at Brighton, Acting with the Chinese Galantee Show, I was forced to drop performing of them. Oh dear, oh dear, don't mention it. You'd have thought the town was on fire. You never saw such an uproar as it made. Put the town in such an agitation that the town authorities forced me to desist. I filled the whole of North Street, and the people was pressing upon me so that I was obliged to run away. I was lodging at the Clarence Hotel in North Street at the time. I ran off down a side street. The next day the police come up to me and tell me that I mustn't exhibit that performance again. I shall calculate it at five shillings a night when I exhibit with the ombres. We don't go out every night, for it's according to the weather, but when we do the calculation is five shillings every night. Sometimes it is ten shillings, or it may be only two shillings sixpence, but five shillings is a fair balance. Take it all the year round, it would come to nine shillings a week taking the good weather in the bad. It's no use to exaggerate, for the shoe is sure to pinch somewhere if you do. We go out two men together, one to play the pipes and speak the parts, and the other to work the figures. I always do the speaking and the music, for that's what is the most particular. When we do a full performance, such as at juvenile parties, it takes one about one hour and a quarter. For attending parties, we generally get a pound, and perhaps we may get three or four during the Christmas holiday time, or perhaps a dozen. For it's according to the recommendation from one to another. If you goes to a gentleman's house, it's according to whether you behave yourself in a superior sort of a manner. But if you have any vulgarity about you, you must exunt, and there's no recommendation. Tom Paris, the first man that brought out the ombres in the street, was a short, stout man, and very old. He kept at it for four or five years, I believe, and he made a very comfortable living at it, but he died poor. What became of him, I do not know. Jim Macklin, I am very little knowledge of. He was a stage performer, but I am not aware what he did do. I don't know when he died, but he's dead and gone. All the old school is dead and gone all the old ancient performers. Paul Herring is the only one that's alive now, and he does the clown. He's a capital clown for tricks. He works his own tricks, that's the beauty of him. When we are performing of an evening, the boys and children will annoy us awful. They follow us so that we are obliged to go miles to get away from them. They will have the best places. They give each other raps on the head if they don't get out of each other's way. I'm obliged to get fighting myself, and give it them, with the drumsticks. 
They'll throw a stone or two, and then you have to run after them and swear you're going to kill them. There's the most boys down at Spitalfields and St. Luke's and at Islington. That's where there's the worst boys and the most audaciousest. I dare not go into St. Luke's. They spoil their own amusement by making a noise and disturbance. Quietness is everything. They haven't the sense to know that. If they give us any money, it's very trifling. Only perhaps a farden or a halfpenny, And then it's only one out of a fifty or a hundred. The great business is to keep them quiet. No, girls ain't better behaved than boys. They was much wuss. I'd sooner have fifty boys round me than four girls. The impertinence of them is above bearing. They come carrying babies and pushing and crowding and tearing one another to pieces. You're for me. I was fast. No, you wasn't. Yes, I was. And that's the way they go on. If a big man comes in front, I'm obliged to ask him to go backwards to let the little children to see. If they're drunk, perhaps they won't. And then there's a row. And all the children will join in. Oh, it's dreadful irksome. I was once performing on Islington Green and some drunken people, whilst I was collecting my money, knocked over the concern from wanton mischief. They said to me, We haven't seen nothing, master. I said, I can see you, and haven't you got a brown? Then they began laughing, and I turned round, and there was the show in a blaze, and my mate inside a kicking. I think it was two or three drunken men did it, to injure a poor man from gaining his livelihood from the sweat of his brow. That's eighteen years ago. I was up at Islington last week, and I was really obliged to give over on account of the children. The moment I put it down, there was thousands round me. They were sassy and impertinent. There was a good collection of people too, but on account of the theatrical business, we want quiet, and they're so noisy, there's no being heard. It's morals is everything. It's shameful how parents let their children run about the streets. As soon as they fill their bellies, off they are, till they are hungry again. The higher class of society is those who gives us the most money. The working man is good for his penny or halfpenny, but the higher class supports the exhibition. The swells in Regent Street ain't very good. They comes and looks on for a moment and then goes on, or sometimes they exempt themselves with, I'm sorry, but I've got no pence. The best is the gentleman. I can tell them in a minute by their appearance. When we are out performing, we in generally burn three candles at once behind the curtain. One is of no utility, for it wants expansion, don't you see? I don't like naphtha or oil lamps, because we are confined there, and it's very unhealthy. It's very warm as it is, and you must have an eye like a hawk to watch it, or it won't throw the shadows. A brilliant light and a clean sheet is a great attraction, and it's the attraction is everything. In the course of the evening, we'll burn six penny candles. We generally use the patent one, because it throws a clear light. We cut them in half. When we use the others, I have to keep a lookout and tell my mate to snuff the candles when the shadows get dim. I usually say, snuff the candles, out loud, because that's a word for the outside and the inside too, because it let the company know it isn't all over and leads them to expect another scene or two. End of section 15section 16 of london labor and the london poor volume 3 by henry mayhew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry street exhibitors part 8 exhibitor of mechanical figures i am the only man in london and in england i think who is exhibiting the vigor of mechanique that is to say, little figures that move their limbs by wheels and springs as if they were delivering creatures. I am a native of Parma, in Italy, where I was born. That is, you understand, I was born in the Duchy of Parma, not in the town of Parma, in the Campagna, where my father is a farmer. Not a large farmer, but a little farmer, with just enough land for living. I used to work for my father in his fields. I was married when I have twenty years of age, 
and I have a child aged ten years. I am only thirty years of age, though I have the air of forty. Pardon, monsieur, all my friends say I have the air of forty, and you say that to make me pleasure. When I am with my father, I save up all the money that I can, for there is very little business to be done in the Campagna of Parma, and I determine myself to come to Londres, where there is a fair to be done. I like Londres much better than the Campagna of Parma, because there is so much affairs to be done. I save up all my money. I become very economic. I live of very little, and when I have a little money, I say adieu to my father, and I commence my voyages. At Paris, I buy a box of music. They are made of Genève, these box of music. When I come to Londres, I go to the public house, the Palais de Gin, you understand, and there I show my box of music. Yes, musical box, you call it. And when I get some money, I live very economic. And then, when it becomes more money, I buy another machine, which I buy in Paris. It was a box of music, and on the top it had little figures, which do move their eyes and their limbs when I mount the spring with the key. And then there is music inside the box at the same time. I have three little figures to this box. One was Judith cutting the head of the infidel chief, what do you call him, Holiferones. She lift her arm with the sword, and she roll her eyes, and then the other hand is on his head, which it lifts. It does this all the time the music play, until I put on another figure of the soldat, which mounts the guard, yes, which is on duty. The soldat goes to sleep, and his head falls on his bosom. Then he wake again, and lift his lance, and roll his eyes. Then he goes to sleep again. So long until I put on the other figure of the lady with the plate in the hand, and she make salutation to the company for to ask some money. And she continue to do this so long as anybody give her money. All the time the music in the box continues to play. I take a great quantity of money with these figures, three shillings a day, and I live very economic until I put aside a sum large enough to buy the figures which I exhibit now. My most aged child is at Parma, with my father in the Campagna, but my wife and my other child, which has only eighteen months of age, are with me in Londres. It is two months since I have my new figures. I did have them sent from Germany to me. They have cost a great deal of money to me, as much as thirty-five pounds without duty. They have been made in Germany, and are very clever figures. I will show them to you. They perform on the round table, which must be level, or they will not turn round. This is the Imperatrice of the French, Eugenie. At least I call her so, for it is not like her, because her chevalure is not arranged in the style of the Imperatrice. The infants like better to say the Imperatrice than a common lady. That is why I call her the Imperatrice. She holds one arm in the air, and you will see she turns round like a person waltzing. The noise you hear is from the wheels of the mechanic, which is under her petticoats. You shall notice her eyes do move as she waltz. The next figure is the carriage of the Emperor of the French, with the Queen and Prince Albert and the King de Sardaigne inside. It will run round the table, and the horses will move as if they gallop. It is a very clever mechanic. I attach this wire from the front wheel to the centre of the table, or it would not make the round of the table, but it would run off the side and break itself. My most clever mechanic is the elephant. It does move its trunk and its tail and its leg as if walking, and all the time it roll its eyes from side to side like a real elephant. It is the cleverest elephant of mechanic in the world. The little Indian on the neck, who is the driver, lift his arm, and in the pavilion on the back, the chieftain of the Indians lift his bow and arrow to take aim and put it down again. 
That mechanic cost me very much money. The elephant is worth much more than the Imperatrice of the French. I could buy two, three Imperatrice for my elephant. I would like sooner lose the Imperatrice than any malheur arrive to my elephant. There are plenty more Imperatrice, but the elephant is very rare. I have also a figure of Tyrolese peasant. She go round the table a short distance and then turn like a dancer. I must get her repaired. She is so weak in her wheels and springs, which wind up under her petticoats, like the Imperatrice. She has been cleaned twice, and yet her mechanic is very bad. Oh, I have oiled her, but it is no good. She must be taken to pieces. When I sent to Germany to get these mechanic made for me, I told the mechanician what I desired, and he made them for me. I invented the figures out of my own head, and he did the mechanic. I have voyaged in Holland, and there I see some mechanic, and I noticed them, and then I gave the order to do so and so. My elephant is the best of my little figures. There is more complication. I first come to England eighteen years ago, before I was married, and I stop here seven years. Then I go back again to Parma, and then I come back again to England four years ago, and here I stop ever since. I exhibit my little figures in the street. The little children like to see my figures mechanique dance around the table, and the carriage with the horses which gallop. But overall, they like my elephant, with the trunk which curls up in front, like those in the Jardin de Plantes, or what you call it, uh, zoological gardens. When I am in the street, I have two men beside myself. One plays the organ, and the other carry the box with the mechanic figures inside, and I carry the table. The box with the mechanic is in weight about 80 pounds English, and there are straps at the back for the arms to go through. It is as large as a chest of drawers, for the little figures are 18 inches high, and each has a compartment to itself. I pay my men one pound a month, besides lodge, clean, and grub him. The organ for the music is mine. I have another organ with a horse to draw it, which I want to sell, for the horse and the two men to play it destroy all my profits. When I make my figures to play in the street, I must make the table level, for they will not mount up a hill, because the mechanic is not sufficiently strong for that. I go to the West End to show my little figures to the gentlemen and ladies and their families, and I go to the East End to the families of the work people. I also go to Brixton and Oxton, where they are severe for religion. They like my figures because they are moral, and their children can see them without sinning. But everywhere my figures have much success. Of all the places, I prefer rather Regent Street, and there I go to the little streets in the corners close by the big street. If I calculate how much money I receive for all the year, but I have only had them two months, it is six shillings by day regularly. Sometimes I take ten shillings, and sometimes four shillings but it settles itself to six shillings a day. After paying for my men and to clean, lodge, and grub them, I have three shillings for myself. In wet weather, when it may rain, or where there is fog, I cannot quit my house to show my figures, for the humidity attack the springs and wheels of the mechanic. Besides, when it falls rain, the dresses of my figures are spoiled, and the robes of the Imperatrice and the Tyrolese peasant are of silk and velvet bodies, with spangles, and they soon spoil. They cost me much money to repair their springs, never less than eight shillings for each time. My peasant has been arranged twice in her springs. It was a watchmaker who arranged her, and he had to take all her inside out, and you know what those kind of people charge for their time. Sometimes, when I am out with my figures, the ladies ask me to perform my figures before their windows to show them to their families. The little children look through the window, and then they cannot hear the movement of the mechanic, and the figures look like living. 
When the organ player vaults to the Imperatrice, he has to turn the handle quick at the commencement. When the spring is strong in the mechanic, and she turn quick, and to make the music slow, when she turn less often, when the springs get weak at the end. This makes it have the look of being true to one living, as if she danced to the music, although the organ play to her dancing. I always mount the figures with the key myself. I have never performed to a school of young scholars, but I have visited evening parties of children with my mechanic. For that they give me sometimes eight shillings, sometimes ten shillings, just as they are generous. My mechanic require nearly one hour to see them to perfection. The imperatrice of the French is what they admire more than the paysan of Tyrol. The dress of the imperatrice has a long white veil behind her hairs, but her costume is not so soigné as the peasants, for she has no spangles. But they like to see the imperatrice of the French, and they excuse her toilet because she is noble. My elephant is the greatest delight for them, because it is more complicated in its mechanic. I have always to mount with the key the springs in its inside at least three times before they are fatigued with admiring it. I never perform in the streets during the night, because the air is damp, and it causes injuries to my mechanic. Besides, I must have lights to show off the costume of my figures, and my table is not large enough. It is not only the little children that admire my mechanic, but persons of a ripe age. I often have gentlemen and ladies stand round my table and they say, Very clever, to see the lady figures waltz. But above all, when my elephant lift his trunk, the little children will follow me a long way to see my figures, for they know we cannot carry the box far without exhibiting, on account of its weight. But my table is too high for them, unless they are at a distance to see the figures perform. If my table was not high, the little children would want to take hold of my figures. I always carry a small stick with me, and when the little children, who are being carried by other little children, put their hand to my figures, I touch them with stick. Not for to hurt them, but to make them take their hand away and prevent them from doing hurt to my mechanic. When the costume of my imperatrice is destroyed by time and wear, my wife makes new clothes for her. Yes, as you say, she is the dressmaker of the imperatrice of the French. But it is not the emperor who pays the bill, but myself. The imperatrice, the one I have, not that of the emperor, does not want more than half a yard of silk for a petticoat. In the present style of fashion, I make her petticoat very large and full, not for the style, but to hide the mechanic in her inside. The Telescope Exhibitor It must be about eight years since I first exhibited the telescope. I have three telescopes now, and their powers vary from about 36 to 300. The instruments of the higher power are seldom used in the streets, because the velocity of the planets is so great that they almost escape the eye before it can fix it. The opening is so very small that, though I can pass my eye on a star in a minute, an ordinary observer would have the orb pass away before he could accustom his eye to the instrument. High power is all very well for separating stars and so forth, but I'm like Dr. Kitchener. I prefer a low power for street purposes. A street passer likes to see plenty of margin round a star. If it fills up the opening, he don't like it. My business is a tailor. I follow that business now. The exhibiting don't interfere with my trade. I work by day at tailoring, and then, at this time of the year, note, 26th of October, 1856, end note, I go out with the instrument about six o'clock. You see, I can, with a low power, see Jupiter rise. It is visible at about half past five, but it gets above the horizon, out of the smoke, about a quarter past six. Saturn rises about ten. From a boy, I was fond of philosophical instruments. 
I was left an orphan when I was ten years of age. Indeed, I haven't a relation in the world that I'm aware of, only excepting my wife's family. My mother died the same year as the Princess Charlotte. Note, 1818, end note. For I can remember her being in mourning for her. My name is a very peculiar one. It is Tregent. This will show you that it is. I some time ago advertised an instrument for sale, and I had a letter from a gentleman living in Liverpool. He said that he was sitting down to lunch, and he took up the paper and cried out, Good God, here's my name! He sent for paper and pens and wrote off at once. He asked whether I was a relation of Tregent, the great chronometer maker. He said he always thought he was the only Tregent in England. He said he was a bachelor and hoped I was too. Perhaps he wanted the name to die out. His father, he told me, kept a paper mill. We corresponded a long time till I was tired, and then one day a friend of mine said, Let me write to him, and I'll tell him that if he wants any more information, he must pay your expenses down to Liverpool, and you'll pay him a visit. This letter was sent, and by and by comes an answer, telling me that I was no gentleman to make such a proposition, and then the matter dropped. When I was six years old, I was brought up to tailoring. I was kept very close to work, always on the board working. I even took my meals there. I don't consider it was hard, for it was done for my own benefit. If there was no work going on, I used to be made to learn verses out of the Bible. I highly respected my master, for I consider this was done for my benefit. He died in the country, and I was sorry for it, for if I had known it, I would have gone anywhere to see him buried, aye, even if it had been a hundred miles off. I stopped with this party till I was ten years old. The next party I was with, I was prenticed to, but he failed when I had been with him three or four years, and then I had more the keeping of him than he of me. I had that resolve in me even at that young age. After I finished my prentice articles, I went with my society card on the tramp. I went all through Yorkshire, going to the tailors' houses of call, where the clubs are held, and a certain sum of money subscribed weekly to relieve what are called tramps. In some towns I worked for months, such as Leeds. What is called a tramp by tailors means a man searching for work about the country. After I got back to London, I went to my trade again, and I was particularly fortunate in getting good situations. Whenever I was out of work, I'd start off to the country again. I was three years in Brighton doing well, and I had six men under me. It's about eight years ago that I first exhibited in the streets. It was through a friend of mine that I did this. Me and my wife was at Greenwich Hill one Sunday. I was looking through a pocket telescope of mine, and he says, Look through mine. I did so, and it was a very good one. And then he says, Ah, you should see one I've got at home. It's an astronomical one, and this is terrestrial. I did so, and went and saw it. The first planet I saw was Venus. She was in her horns then, like the moon. She exhibits the same phases as the moon, as does also Mercury. Sometimes horns, sometimes half a sphere, and so on. But they're the only two planets that's known that does so. When I saw this, I said, well, I must have something of this sort. I went to a telescope maker up at Islington, and I made a bargain with him, and he was to make me a day and night telescope for five suits of clothes. Well, I bought the cloth and raised all the money to complete my part of the contract, and then when the telescope was finished, it wasn't worth a D blank. You might as well have looked through a blacking bottle. When I told him of it, he said he couldn't help it. It was worth something to look at, but not to look through. I pawned it for fifteen pounds and sold the ticket for five pounds. The gentleman who bought it was highly satisfied with it, till he found it out. I took this one out in the streets to exhibit with, but it was quite useless and showed nothing. You could see the planetary bodies, but it defined nothing. The stars was all manner of colours and forks. The bodies look just like a drawing in chalk smudged out. The people who looked through complained and wouldn't come and look again, and that's why I got rid of it. The next telescope I had made 
was by the manufacturer who made the one my friend first showed me. That maker has taken some hundred of pounds off me since then. Indeed, I've had eleven, five or six feet telescopes of him, and his name is Mr. Mull, of 13 Albion Place, Clerkenwell, and the value of each of the object glasses was, on the average, thirty pounds, though he charged me only trade price, so I got them for less. The first telescope that was of any good that I exhibited with in the streets was worth to me twenty-five pounds. If he was to go to Dolland, he would have charged a hundred and five pounds on a common tripod stand. I had it done under my own direction, and by working myself at it, I got it very cheap. It wasn't good enough for me, so I got rid of it. I've got so nice about object glasses and their distinct vision, and the power they bear, that I have never rested content until I have a telescope that would suit the first astronomer. I've got one now that will bear a magnifying power three hundred times, and has an object glass four and a quarter inches diameter, with a focal length of five feet six inches. The stand is made of about two hundred and fifty pieces of brasswork, and has ratchet action, with vertical and horizontal movement. It cost me eighty pounds and Ross, Featherstone Buildings, would charge £250 for it. I'm so initiated into the sort of thing that I generally get all my patterns made, and then I get the castings made, and then have them polished. The price of the object glass is £30. I'm going to take that one out next week. It will weigh about one and a half hundred weight. My present one is a very fine instrument indeed. I've nothing but what is excellent. You can see Jupiter and his satellites, and Saturn and his belt. This is a test for it. Supposing I want to see Polaris, that's the small star that revolves once in 180 years round the pole. It isn't the pole star. It isn't visible to the naked eye. It's one of the tests for a telescope. My instrument gives it as small as a pin's point. There's no magnifying power with a telescope upon stars. Of course, they make them more brilliant and give some that are not visible to the naked eye, for hundreds and thousands will pass through the field in about an hour. They also separate double stars and penetrate into space, nebula, and so on. But they don't increase the size of stars, for the distance is too great. I've worked about five years with this last one that I've now. It weighs with the stand about a hundredweight, and I have to get somebody to help me along with it. One of my boys, in general, goes along with me. It depends greatly upon the weather as to what business I do. I've known the moon for a month not to be visible for twenty days out of the lunation. I've known that for three moons together. The atmosphere is so bad in London. When I do get a good night, I have taken thirty-five shillings. But then I've taken out two instruments, and my boy has minded one. I only charge a penny a peep. Saturdays and Mondays and Sundays are the best nights in my neighbourhood, and then I can mostly reckon on taking twenty shillings. The other nights it may be seven shillings or eight shillings, or even only two shillings and sixpence. Sometimes I put up the instrument when it's very fine, and then it'll come cloudy, and I have to take it down again and go home. Taking the year round, I should think I make a hundred and twenty-five pounds a year by the telescope. You see, my business as a tailor keeps me in of a day, or I might go out in the day and show the sun. Now today the sun was very fine, and the spots showed remarkably well, and if I'd been out I might have done well. I sold an instrument of mine once to a fireman who had nothing to do in the day, and thought he could make some money exhibiting the telescope. He made eight shillings or ten shillings of an afternoon on Blackfriars Bridge, showing the Dome of St. Paul's at the time they were repairing it. When the instrument is equatorially mounted and set to time, you can pick out the stars in the daytime, and they look like black specks. I could show them. People can't stop looking through the telescope for long at a time, because the object is soon out of the field, because of the velocity of the Earth's motion, and the rapidity at which the planets travel round the Sun. Jupiter, for instance, 26,000 miles an hour, and Saturn, 29,000, soon removes them from the field of the telescope. 
I have to adjust the telescope before each person looks through. It has, I fancy, hurt my eyes very much. My eyesight has got very weak through looking at the moon. For on a brilliant night, it's like a plate of silver and dazzles. It makes a great impression on the retina of the eye. I've seen, when looking through the telescope, a black speck, just as if you had dropped a blot of ink on a piece of paper. I've often had dancing lights before my eyes too, very often. I find a homeopathic globule of belladonna very excellent for that. When I exhibit, I in general give a short lecture whilst they are looking through. When I am not busy, I make them give me a description. For this reason, others are listening, and they would sooner take the word of the observer than mine. Suppose I'm exhibiting Jupiter, and I want to draw customers. I'll say, how many moons do you see? They'll answer, three on the right and one on the left, as they may be at that time. Perhaps a rough standing by will say, three moons, that's a lie. There's only one, everybody knows. Then, when they hear the observer state what he sees, they'll want to have a peep. When I'm busy, I do a lecture like this. We'll suppose I'm exhibiting Saturn. Perhaps we had better begin with Jupiter, for the orbit of Saturn satellites is so extensive that you can never see them all without shifting the glass. Indeed, it's only in very fine climates, such as Cincinnati, where the eight might be observed, and indeed up to a late period it was believed there were only seven. When the observer sees Jupiter, I begin, Do you see the planet, sir? Yes. I introduce to you Jupiter with all his four satellites. It is distant six hundred millions of miles from the sun, and its diameter is about seven thousand nine hundred miles. It travels round the sun at about twenty-seven thousand miles an hour, and its orbit is over four years, and of course its seasons are four times the length of ours, the summer lasting for a year instead of three months. One night, an Irishman, who was quite the gentleman, came to me rather groggy, and he says, Old oh boy, what are you looking at? Jupiter, says I. What's that? says he. A planet, you may call it, sir, says I, and the price is one penny. He paid me and had a look, and then he cries out, What a deception is this? By J blank. It's a moon, and you call it a star. There are four moons, said I. You're another, said he. There's a moon and four stars. You ought to be took up for deception. After a time, he had another look, and then he was very pleased, and would bring out gin from a neighbouring public house. And if he brought one, he brought seven. Another time a man was looking through, and I had a tripod stand then, and one of the legs was out, and he pushed the tube, and down it came, right in his eye. He gave a scream and shouted out, My God, there's a star hit me slap in the eye! Another night, an old woman came up to me and she says, God bless you, sir. I'm so glad to see you. I've been looking for you ever such a time. You charge a penny, don't you? I'm a charwoman, sir, and would you believe it, I've never had a penny to spare. What are you looking at? The moon? Well, I must see it. I told her she should see it for nothing. And up she mounted the steps. She was a heavy, lusty woman and I had to shove her up with my shoulder to get up the steps. When she saw the moon, she kept on saying, Oh, that's beautiful! Well, it is beautiful! And that's the moon, is it? Now do tell me all about it. I told her all about Mount Tycho, and about the light of the sun being seen on the mountain tops, and so on. When she looked for a time, she said, Well, your instrument is a finer one than my master's but it don't show so much as his, for he says he can see the men fighting in it. This made me laugh so I very nearly let her tumble by taking my shoulder away from under her. But when she came down the steps, she said something quite moved me. She threw her hands up and cried, If this moon is so beautiful and wonderful, what must that God be like who made it? And off she went. It was very fine, wasn't it?
Sometimes when I'm exhibiting, there is quite a crowd collects. I've seen them sitting down on the curb, smoking and drinking, whilst they are waiting for their turns to have a peep. They'll send to the public house for beer, and then they'll stop for hours. Indeed, I've had my business quite interfered with by the mob, for they don't go away after having their look. I seldom stop out after twelve o'clock at night. Sometimes when I have been exhibiting, the parties have said it was all nonsense and a deception, for the stars was painted on the glass. If the party has been anything agreeable, I have taken the trouble to persuade him. I, for instance, place the star on the very edge of the glass, and then they've seen it travel right across the field, and as I've told them, if it was painted, it couldn't move and disappear from the lens. Most of the spectators go away quite surprised and impressed with what they have seen. Some will thank me a dozen times over. Some will say, Well, my penny is well laid out. I shouldn't have credited it with my own eyes. Others, but there are very few of them, won't believe when they have looked. Some, when I can see the moon on their eye as they look in, swear they don't see it. Those I let go on and don't take their money, for the penny is no object. When I tell the people what the wonders of the heavens are and how each of the planets is a world, they go away wonderfully grateful and impressed. I went down to Portsmouth with my telescope at the time the fleet sailed under St. Charles Napier and the Queen led them out in her yacht. I took a great deal of money there. I didn't exhibit in the daytime. I didn't trouble myself. I took two guineas showing the yacht the day she sailed and at night with the moon. The other nights, with the moon and planets only, I took from twelve shillings to fourteen shillings. I refused fifteen shillings for one hour for this reason. A lady sent her servant to ask me to go to her house, and my price is one guinea for to go out, whether for an hour or two or three. But she first offered me ten shillings, and then the next night fifteen shillings. Then I found I should have to carry my instrument, weighing one hundred weight, two miles into the country, and up hill all the way. So, as I was sure of taking more than ten shillings where I was, I wouldn't, for an extra shilling, give myself the labour. I took twelve shillings sixpence as it was. At Portsmouth a couple of sailors came up, and one had a look, and the other said, What is there to see? I told him the moon, and he asked the price. When I said, one penny, he says, I ain't got a penny, but here's three halfpence, if that's the same to you. And he gives it, and when I expected he was about to peep, he turns round and says, I'll be smothered if I'm going to look down that gallows long chimney. You've got your money, and that's all your business. So you see, there are some people who are quite indifferent to scientific exhibitions. There are, to the best of my knowledge, about four men besides myself go about with telescopes. I don't know of any more. Of these, there are only one of any account. I've seen through them all, so I may safely say it. I consider mine the best in London exhibiting. Mine is a very expensive instrument. Everything depends upon the object glass. There's glasses on some which have been thrown aside as valueless and may have been bought for two or three pounds. The capital required to start a telescope in the streets all depends upon the quantity of the object glass, from three pounds to fifty pounds for the object glass alone. Nobody who is not acquainted with telescopes knows the value of object glasses. I have known this offer to be made, that the object glass should be placed in one scale and gold in the other to weigh it down, and then they wouldn't. The rough glass from Birmingham, before it is worked, only 12 inches in diameter, will cost £96. Chance at Birmingham is the principal maker of the crown and flint for optical purposes. The Swiss used formerly to be the only makers of optical metal of any account, and now Birmingham has knocked them out of the field. Indeed, they have got the Swiss working for them at chances. You may take a couple of plates of rough glass to persons ignorant of their value, and they are only twelve inches in diameter, and he would think one shilling dear for them, for they only look like the bits you see in the streets to let light through the pavement. 
These glasses are half flint and half crown, the flint for the concave and the crown for the convex side. Their beauty consists in their being pure metal and quite transparent, and not stringy. Under the high magnifying power we use, you see this directly, and it makes the object smudgy and distorts the vision. After getting the rough metal, it takes years to finish the object glass. They polish it with satin and putty. The convex has to be done so correctly that if the lens is the one hundredth part of an inch out, its value is destroyed. The well-known object glass which was shown in the Great Exhibition of 1851 was in Mr. Rossi's hands. Note of Featherstone Buildings, Holborn. End note for four years before it was finished. It was very good, and done him great credit. He is supposed to have lost by the job, for the price is all eat up by wages pretty near. The observatory on Wandsworth Common is a complete failure, owing to the object glass being a bad one. It belongs to the Reverend Mr. Cragg. The tube is 72 feet long, I believe, and shaped like a cigar, bulging at the sides. He wanted to have a new object glass put in, and what do you think they asked him at Birmingham for the rough metal alone? Two thousand pounds. It is twenty-four inches in diameter. Mr. Ross asks six thousand pounds, I was told, to make a new one finished for him. The making of object glasses is dreadful and tedious labour. Men have been known to go and throw their heads under wagon wheels and have them smashed from being regularly worn out with working an object glass and not being able to get the convex right. I was told by a party that one object glass was in hand for 14 years. The night of the eclipse of the moon, note, the 13th of October, 1856, end note, when it was so well seen in London, I took one pound and a penny, at a penny each. I might as well have took two pounds by charging tuppence. But being so well known then, I didn't make no extra charge. They were forty deep, for everybody wished to see. I had to put two lads under the stand to prevent their being trod to death. They had to stay there for two hours before they could get a peep, and so indeed had many others to do the same. A friend of mine didn't look at all, for I couldn't get him near. They kept calling to the one looking through the tube, Now then, make haste, you there! They nearly fought for their turns. They got pushing and fighting, one crying, I was first, and now it's my turn. I was glad when it was over, I can assure you. The buttons to my braces were dragged off my back by the pressure behind, and I had to hold up my breeches with my hand. The eclipse lasted from 21 minutes past nine to 25 minutes past 12, and in that time 247 persons had a peep. The police were there to keep order, but they didn't interfere with me. They are generally very good to me, and they seem to think that my exhibition improves the minds of the public, and so protect me. When I went to Portsmouth, I applied to Mr. Myers the goldsmith, a very opulent and rich man there, and chairman of the Esplanade Committee at South Sea, and he instantly gave me permission to place my stand there. Likewise the mayor and magistrates of Portsmouth to exhibit in the streets. End of section 16 Section 17 Of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry Street Exhibitors, Part 9 Exhibitor of the Microscope I exhibit with a microscope that I wouldn't take fifty guineas for, because it suits my purpose, and it is of the finest quality. I earn my living with it. If I were to sell it, I wouldn't fetch more than fifteen pounds. It was presented to me by my dear sister who went to America and died there. I'll show you that it is a valuable instrument. I'll tell you that one of the best lens makers in the trade looked through it, and so he said, I think I can improve it for you. 
and he made me a present of a lens of extreme high power and the largest aperture of magnifying power that has ever been exhibited. I didn't know him at the time. He did it by kindness. He said, after looking through, It's very good for what it professes, but I'll make you a present of a lens made out of the best Swiss metal. And he did so from the interest he felt in seeing such kinds of exhibitions in the streets. With the glass he gave me, I can see cheese mites as distinctly as possible, with their eight legs and transparent bodies, and heads shaped like a hedgehog's. I see their jaw moving as they eat their food, and can see them lay their eggs, which are as perfect as any fowl's, but of a bright blue colour. And I can also see them perform the duties of nature. I can also see them carry their young on their back, showing that they have affection for their offspring. They lay their eggs through their ribs, and you can tell when they are going to lay, for there is a bulging out just by the hips. They don't sit on their eggs, but they roll them about in action till they bring forth their object. A million of these mites can walk across a flea's back, for, by Lardner's micrometer, the surface of a flea's back measures 24 inches from the proboscis to the posterior. The micrometer is an instrument used for determining microscopic power, and it is all graduated to a scale. By Lardner's micrometer, the mite looks about the size of a large black beetle, and then it is magnified 100,000 times. This will give you some idea of the power and value of my instrument. 300 gentlemen have viewed through it in one week, and each one delighted, so much so that many have given double the money I have asked, which was a penny. Such was the satisfaction my instrument gave. My father was a minister and local preacher in the Wesleyan Methodists. He died, poor fellow, at 27 years of age, therefore I never had an opportunity of knowing him. He was a boot and shoemaker. Such was the talent which he possessed that, had it not been for his being lamed of one foot from a fall of a horse, he would have been made a travelling minister. He was a wonderful clever man, and began preaching when he was twenty-one. He was the minister who preached on the occasion of laying the foundation stone of Hoxton Chapel, and he drew thousands of people. I was only two years old when he died, and my mother was left with five of us to bring up. She was a visitor of the sick and the dying for the Strangers' Benevolent Fund, and much respected for her labours. After my father's death, she was enabled to support her family of one son and four daughters by shoe-binding. She was married twice after my father's death, but she married persons of quite opposite principles and opinions to her own, and she was not comfortable with them, but left them, and always found shelter under her son's roof, where she died triumphantly happy. I was apprenticed when I was thirteen years of age to a shoemaker, who was a profound philosopher and very fond of making experiments and of lecturing on various branches of science. I could produce bills, I have them at home, such as that at the Friars Mount Sunday School some six or seven years ago, where it states that William Nock, minister and lecturer, will lecture on zoology and natural history. He's about seventy now. Electricity is his favourite science. When I was his apprentice, he had an observatory built at the top of his house in Underwood Street, Spitalfields, for the purpose of taking astronomical observations. My being in his house and seeing him so busy with his instruments gave me a great taste for science. I was his assistant when he went lecturing. I was apprenticed with him for five years. He was a kind and good master and very affectionate. He encouraged me in my scientific studies, and gave me access to his library, which was immense, and consisted of three thousand volumes. Amongst other employment, I used to copy out sermons for him, and he gave me a penny each, which by saving up enabled me to buy a watch of him for five pounds five shillings. He was a shoemaker and manufacturer of ladies' and children's boots and shoes, so that he might have made from his two pounds to three pounds a week, for he was not a journeyman, but an employer. After I was out of my time, I went to Mr. Children, a bootmaker of Bethnal Green Road, well known in that locality. 
my master had not sufficient employment for me. One night this Mr. Children went to hear a lecture on astronomy by Dr. Bird, and when he came home he was so delighted with what he had seen that he began telling his wife all about it. He said, I cannot better explain to you the solar system than with a mop, and he took the mop and dipped it into a pail of water and began to twirl it round in the air till the wet flew off it. Then he said, This mop is the sun, and the spiral motion of the water gives the revolutions of the planets in their orbits. Then after a time he cried out, If this Dr. Bird can do this, why shouldn't I? He threw over his business directly to carry out the grand object of his mind. He was making from three pounds to four pounds a week, and his wife said, Robert, you are mad! He asked me if I knew anything of astronomy, and I said, Sir, my old master was an astronomer and philosopher. Then I got books for him, and I taught him all I knew of the science of astronomy. Then he got a magic lantern with astronomical slides. The bull's eye was six inches in diameter, so they were very large, so that they gave a figure of twelve feet. For the signs of the zodiac, he had twelve separate small lanterns, with a large one in the centre, to show the diverging rays of the sun's light. He began with many difficulties in his way, for he was a very illiterate man, and had a vast deal to contend with, but he succeeded through all. He wrote to his father and got five hundred pounds, which was his share of the property which would have been left him on his parents' death. At his first lecture he made many mistakes, such as, Now, gentlemen, I shall present to your notice the consternations, at which expression the company cried, Hear, hear, and one said, We are all in a consternation here, for your lamp wants oil. Yet he faced all this out. I was his assistant. I taught him everything. When I told him of his mistake, he'd say, Never mind, I'll overcome all that. He accumulated the vast sum of six thousand pounds by lecturing and became a most popular man. He educated himself and became qualified. When he went into the country, he had archbishops and bishops and the highest of the clergy to give their sanction and become patrons of his lectures. He's now in America and become a great farmer. After I left Mr. Children, I connected myself with a young men's improvement meeting. Previous to that, I had founded a Sunday school in the New Kent Road. Deverill Street Sabbath schools were founded by me, and I was for 14 years manager of it, as well as performer of the funeral service in that place, for there was a chapel and burying ground and vaults attached to the schools and I became the officiating minister for the funeral service. Three thousand children have been educated at these schools, and for fourteen years I lecture to them every Sunday on religious subjects. With the tutors and the eldest scholars, I formed a young men's improvement meeting. I became the president of that meeting, and their lecturer. I lectured on the following subjects, natural history, electricity, astronomy, and phrenology. At this time I was a master shoemaker and doing a business of fifty guineas a week, of which ten were profit. I built large workshops at the back of my house, which cost me three hundred pounds. Unfortunately, I lent my name to a friend for a very large amount and became involved in his difficulties, and then necessity compelled me to have recourse to street exhibitions for a living. When I was in affluent circumstances, I had a library of 300 volumes, on scientific subjects mostly, and from them I have gleaned sufficient information to qualify me for street exhibition, and thereby enable me to earn more money than most individuals in such circumstances. I began my street life with exhibiting a telescope, and here is the origin of my doing so. I had a sister living at the west end of the town who was a professed cook, and I used to visit her three times a week. One night I saw a man in the Regent Circus exhibiting a telescope. I went up to him and I said, Sir, what is the object tonight? And he told me it was Jupiter. I was very much interested with looking at Jupiter, and I stopped with that man for two hours, conversing with him, and I saw exactly how much he took. Then I thought, why shouldn't I do this? 
So I wrote to my brother-in-law, and I told him this man was taking at the rate of a penny per minute, and I offered, if he would provide me with a telescope, that I should be very happy and contented to take half of the receipts as my share, and give him the other for the use of his instrument. He did so, and bought a telescope, which cost him fourteen pounds. I took up my stand on London Bridge, and did very well, taking on the average six shillings a night. I gave up the telescope for this reason. My brother-in-law was going to America and was anxious to call in all his money. The telescope was sold, and my sister, the professed cook, fearing that I should be left without a means of living, bought for me a microscope out of her own earnings, which cost her five pounds. She said to me, The microscope is better than the telescope, for the nights are so uncertain. She was quite right for when the telescopes have been idle for three months at a time, I can exhibit my microscope day and night. She gave it to me as a mark of her respect. She died in America just after she arrived. That instrument has enabled me to support an afflicted and aged mother and to bury her comfortably when she died. My microscope contains six objects, which are placed on a wheel at the back, which I turn round in succession. The objects are in cell boxes of glass. The objects are all of them familiar to the public and are as follows. 1. The flea. 2. The human hair, or the hair of the head. 3. A section of the old oak tree. 4. The animalculae in water. 5. Cheese mites. And 6. The transverse section of cane used by schoolmasters for the correction of boys. I always take up my stand in the daytime in Whitechapel, facing the London Hospital, being a large open space, and favourable for the solar rays, for I light up the instrument by the direct rays of the sun. At night time I am mostly to be found on Westminster Bridge, and then I light up with the best sperm oil there is. I am never interfered with by the police. On the contrary, they come and have a look, and admire and recommend. Such is the interest excited. The first I exhibit is the flea, and I commence a short lecture as follows. Gentlemen, I says, the first object I have to present to your notice is that of a flea. I wish to direct your attention especially to the head of this object. Here you may distinctly perceive its proboscis, or dart. It is that which perforates the cuticle, or human skin, after which the blood ascends by suction, from our body into that of the flea. Thousands of persons in London have seen a flea, have felt a flea, but have never yet been able, by the human eye, to discover that instrument which made them sensible of the flea about their person, although they could not catch the old gentleman. This flea gentleman, by Dr. Lardner's micrometer, measures accurate 24 inches in length and 11 across the back. My instrument, mark you, being of high magnifying power, will not show you the whole of the object at once. Mark you, gentlemen, this is not the flea of the dog or the cat, but the human flea, for each differ in their formation, as clearly proved by this powerful instrument, for they all differ in their form and shape, and will only feed upon the animal on which they are bred. Having shown you the head and shoulders with its dart, I shall now proceed to show you the posterior view of this object, in which you may clearly discover every artery, vein, muscle, and nerve, exact like a lobster in shape, and quite as large as one at two shilling sixpence. That pleases them, you know, and sometimes I add, to amuse them, an object of that size would make an excellent supper for half a dozen persons. That pleases them. One Irish woman, after seeing the flea, threw up her arms and screamed out, Oh, Jay Blank, and I've had hundreds of them in my bed at once. She got me a great many customers from her exclamations. You see, my lecture entices those listening to have a look. Many listeners say, Ain't that true and philosophical and correct? I've had many give me sixpence and say, Never mind the change, your lecture is alone worth the money. I'll now proceed to number two. 
The next object I have to present to your notice, gentlemen, is that of the hair of the human head. You perceive that it is nearly as large as yonder scaffolding poles of the House of Lords. I say this when I am on Westminster Bridge, because it refers to the locality, and is a striking figure, and excites the listeners. But mark you, it is not, like them, solid matter, through which no ray of light can pass. That's where I please the gentlemen, you know, for they say, how philosophical. You can readily perceive, mark you, that they are all tubes, like tubes of glass, a proof of which fact you have before you, from the light of the lamp, shining direct through the body of the object, and that light direct portrayed in the lens of your eye, called the retina, on which all external objects are painted. Beautiful, says a gentleman. Now, if the hair of the head be a hollow tube, as you perceive it is, then what caution you ought to exercise when you place your head in the hands of the hairdresser by keeping your hat on, or else you may be susceptible to catch cold. For that which we breathe, the atmosphere passing down these tubes suddenly shuts to the doors, if I may be allowed such an expression, or in other words, closes the pores of the skin and thereby checks the insensible perspiration and colds are the result. Powdering the head is quite out of date now, but if a little was used on those occasions referred to, cold in the head would not be so frequent. What do you think of that? I never had an individual complain of my lecture yet. Now comes number three. This gentleman is the brave old oak, a section of it not larger than the head of a pin. Looking at it through this powerful instrument, you may accurately perceive millions of perforations, or pores, through which the moisture of the earth rises in order to aid its growth. Of all the trees in the forest, none is so splendid as the brave old oak. This is the tree that braves the battle and the breeze, and is said to be in its perfection at one hundred years. Who that looks at it would not exclaim, in the language of the song, Woodman, spare that tree, and cut it not down. Such is the analogy existing between vegetable and animal physiology that a small portion of the cuticle, or human skin, would present the same appearance, for there are millions of pores in the human skin, which a grain of sand is said to cover. And here are millions of perforations through which the moisture of the earth is said to rise to aid the growth of the tree. See the similitude between the vegetable and animal physiology. Here is the exhibition of nature. See how it surpasses that of art. See the ladies at the great exhibition admiring the shawls that came from India, yet they, though truly deserving, could not compare with this bit of bark from the brave old oak. Here is a pattern richer and more deserving than any on any shawl, however wonderful. Where is the linen draper in this locality that can produce anything so beautiful as that on this bit of bark? Such are the works of art as compared with those of nature. Number four is the animalculae in water. Gentlemen, the object now before you is a drop of water that may be suspended on a needle's point, teeming with millions of living objects. This one drop of water contains more inhabitants than the globe on which I stand. See the velocity of their motion, the action of their stomachs. The vertebrae is elegantly marked, like the boa constrictor in the zoological gardens. They are all moving with perfect ease in this one drop, like the mighty monsters of the vast deep. On one occasion... A gentleman from St. Thomas's Hospital disputed my statement about its being only one drop of water. So I said to the gent, If you will accompany me to some coffee house, the drop of water shall be removed, and perhaps what you see you may believe. Which he did, and he paid me one shilling for my experiment. He told me he was a doctor, and I told him I was surprised that he was not better acquainted with the instrument. For, said I, how can you tell the effects of inoculation on the cuticle, or the disease called the itch, unless you are acquainted with such an instrument? He was quite ashamed, as he paid me for my trouble. 
I tell this anecdote on the bridge, and I always conclude with, Now, gentlemen, whilst I was paid one shilling by the faculty for showing one object alone, I am only charging you a penny for the whole six. Then I address myself to the person looking into the microscope and say, What do you think of this one drop of water, sir? And he says, Splendid! Then I add, Few persons would pass and repass this instrument without having a glance into it, if they knew the wonders I exhibit. And the one looking says, That's true, very true. The next object is the cheese mite, number five. I always begin in this way. Those who are unacquainted with the study of entomology declare that these mites are beetles and not mites. But could I procure a beetle with eight legs, I should present it to the British Museum as a curiosity. This is the way I clench up the mouths of those sceptics who would try to ridicule me by showing that I am philosophic. Just look at them. Notice, for instance, their head, how it represents the form of a hedgehog. The body presents that of the beetle shape. They have eight legs and eight joints. They have four legs forward and four legs back. And they can move with the same velocity forwards as they can back. Such is their construction. They are said to be moving with the velocity of 500 steps in one minute. Read Blair's Perceptor, where you may see a drawing of the mite accurately given, as well as read the description just given. A cheesemonger in Whitechapel brought me a few of these objects for me to place in my microscope. He invited his friends, which were taking supper with him, to come out and have a glance at the same objects. He gave me sixpence for exhibiting them to him and was highly gratified at the sight of them. I asked him how he could have the impudence to sell them for a lady's supper at tenpence a pound. The answer he gave me was, What the eye cannot see, the heart never grieves. Then I go on. Whilst this lady is extending her hand to the poor and doing all the relief in her power, she is slaying more living creatures with her jawbone than ever Samson did with his. If it's a boy looking through, I say, Now, Jack, when you are eating bread and cheese, don't let it be said that you slay the mites with the jawbone of an ass. Cultivate the intellectual and moral powers superior to the passions, and then you will rise superior to that animal in intellect. Good, says a gentleman. Good, here's sixpence for you. And another says, here's tuppence for you, and I'm blessed if I want to see anything after hearing your lecture. Then I continue to point out the affection of the mite for its young. You see fathers looking after their daughters, and mothers after their sons, when they are taking their walks. And such is their love for their young, that when the young ones are fatigued with their journey, the parents take them up on their backs. Do you not see it? And then some will say, I'll give a penny to see that. And I've had four pennies put in my hand at once to see it. Excitement is everything in this world, sir. Next comes the cane, number six. The object before you, gentlemen, is a transverse section of cane, common cane. Such mark you as is used by schoolmasters for the correction of boys who neglect their tasks or play the wag. I make it comic, you know. This I call the tree of knowledge, for it has done more for to learn us the rules of arithmetic than all the vegetable kingdom combined. To it we may attribute the rule of three from its influence on the mind. That always causes a smile. Just look at it for one moment. Notice in the first place its perforations, where the human hand has failed to construct a micrometer for microscopic or telescopic purposes, the spider has lent its web in one case and the cane in the other. Through the instrumentality of its perforations, we may accurately infer the magnifying power of other objects, showing the law of analogy. The perforations of this cane, apart from this instrument, would hardly admit a needle's point, but seem now large enough for your arm to enter. This cane somewhat represents a telescopic view of the moon at the full, when in conjunction with the sun, for instance. Here I could represent inverted rocks and mountains. 
You may perceive them yourself, just as they would be represented in the moon's disk through a powerful telescope of 250 times, such as I have exhibited to a thousand persons in St. Paul's churchyard. On the right of this piece of cane, if you are acquainted with the science of astronomy, you may depicture very accurately Mount Tycho, for instance, representing a beautiful burning mountain, like Mount Vesuvius or Etony, near the fields of Naples. You might discover accurately all the diverging streaks of light emanating from the crater. Further on to the right, you may perceive Mount St. Catherine, like the blaze of a candle rushing through the atmosphere. On the left, you may discover Mount Ptolemy. Such is a similar appearance of the moon's mountainous aspect. I ask you if the schoolboy had but an opportunity of glancing at so splendid an object as the cane, should he ever be seen to shed a tear at its weight? This shows that I am scientific and no astronomy. The last part makes them laugh. This is the mode in which I exhibit my instrument, and such is the interest being excited in the public mind, that though a penny is the small change which I make, that amount has been doubled and trebled by gentlemen who have viewed the instrument. And on one occasion a clergyman in the commercial road presented me with half a sovereign, for the interest he felt at my description, as well as the objects presented to his view. It has given universal satisfaction. I don't go out every night with my instrument. I always go on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Saturday, for those are the nights when I take most money, especially on the Monday and Saturday. The Monday and Saturday are generally six shillings, Tuesdays about five shillings, and Wednesdays about two shillings sixpence. Then the Thursday averages one shilling eightpence, and the Fridays in some localities, where the men are paid on that night, are equal to Saturday. Such are the benefits arising from night exhibition. In the day, it comes to rather more. I've been to Greenwich, and on the One Tree Hill, I've done more with the sunlight than the night light. Taking the changes of weather, such as rain and cold bleak nights, and such weather as isn't suitable to such an exhibition, I may say safely that my income amounts to £80 a year. The capital required for such a business amounts to from £10 to £20. My instrument only costs £5, but it was parted with to raise money, and I wouldn't take £50 for it. It was my sister's son-in-law who sold it. It was a gift more than a sale. You can buy a very good microscope for £10, but a great deal of course is required in choosing it, for you may buy a thing not worth 20 shillings. You'd have an achromatic microscope for £20. It cost me about fourpence a week for oil, the best sperm, at one shilling fourpence the pint, and a quarter of a pint will last me the week. I get my specimens in London. I prepare them all myself, and always keep a stock by me. For the sake of any gentleman who may have any microscope and wish to procure excellent living specimens of mites and animalculae in water, may do so in this way. This is a secret which I give from a desire which I feel to afford pleasure to gentlemen of a scientific mind. Get mites from a cheesemonger. Mites differ in their shape and form according to the cheese they are taken from. The Stilton cheese differs from the Dutch cheese mite, and so does that of the aristocratic Cheshire, as I call it. In order to rise them clear and transparent, Take a wooden box of two and a half inches deep and two and a half inches in diameter with a thick screw lid and let the lid take off halfway down. Place the dust in the bottom of the box, damp the thread of the screw lid to make it airtight. The mites will ascend to the lid of the box. Four or five hours afterwards, unscrew the lid gently and, removing it, let it fall gently on a piece of writing paper. The mites crawl up to the lid, and by this way you get them free from dust and clean. To make the animalculae water, I draw from the bottom of a water tub a small quantity of water, and I put about a handful of new hay in that water. I expose it to the influence of the solar light, or some gentle heat, for three or four hours. Skim off its surface, 
After washing your hands, take your finger and let one drop of the hay water fall on the glass, and then add to it another drop of pure water to make it more transparent. This information took me some years of experience to discover. I never read it or learnt it from anyone, but found it out myself. But all liberal scientific men like to share their information. It's impossible for me to say how many people have looked through my instrument, but they must be counted by tens of thousands. I have had 160 looking through in one night, or 13 shillings fourpence worth. This was on a peculiar occasion. They average about six shillings worth. If I could get out every night, I should do well. As it is, I am obliged to work at my trade of shoemaking to keep myself, for you must take it into consideration that there are some nights when I cannot show my exhibition. Very often I have a shilling or sixpence given to me as a present by my admirers. Many a half crown I've had as well. One night I was showing over at the Elephant and Castle, and I saw a Quaker gentleman coming along, and he said to me, What art thee showing tonight, friend? So I told him, and he says, And what doth thee charge, friend? I answered, To the working man, sir, I am determined to charge no more than a penny, but to a gentleman I always leave it to their liberality. So he said, Well, I like that, friend. I'll give thee all I have. And he put his hand into his pocket, and he pulled out five penny pieces. You see, that is what I always do, and it meets with its reward. End of section 17section 18 of london labor and the london poor volume 3 by henry mayhew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry street exhibitors part 10 peep shows concerning these i received the subjoined narrative from a man of considerable experience in the profession being a cripple I am obliged to exhibit a small peep show. I lost the use of this arm ever since I was three months old. My mother died when I was ten years old, and after that my father took up with an Irish woman and turned me and my youngest sister, she was two years younger than me, out into the streets. My father had originally been a dyer, but was working at the fiddle-string business then. My youngest sister got employment at my father's trade, but I couldn't get no work because of my crippled arms. I walked about till I fell down in the streets for want. At last a man who had a sweetmeat shop took pity on me. His wife made the sweetmeats and minded the shop while he went out a juggling in the streets in the Ramosami line. He told me as how, if I would go round the country with him and sell prints while he was a juggling in the public houses, he'd find me in Whittles and pay my lodging. I joined him and stopped with him two or three year. After that, I went to work for a very large waste paper dealer. He used to buy up all the old back numbers of the cheap periodicals and penny publications and send me out with them to sell at a farden apiece. He used to give me fourpence out of every shilling, and I done very well with that till the periodicals came so low and so many on them that they wouldn't sell at all. Sometimes I could make fifteen shillings on a Saturday night and a Sunday morning a selling the odd numbers of periodicals, such as Tales of the Wars, Lives of the Pirates, Lives of the Highwaymen, and so on. I've often sold as many as two thousand numbers on a Saturday night in the new cut, and the most of them was works about thieves and highwaymen and pirates. Besides me, there was three others at the same business. Altogether, I dare say, my master alone used to get rid of 10,000 copies of such works on a Saturday night and Sunday morning. Our principal customers was young men. My master made a good bit of money at it. He had been about 18 years in the business and had begun with two shillings sixpence. I was with him 15 year on and off, and at the best time I used to earn my 30 shillings a week full at that time. But then I was foolish and didn't take care of my money. When I was at the odd number business, I bought a peep show. I gave two pounds ten shillings for it. I had it second hand. 
I was persuaded to buy it. A person as has got only one hand, you see, isn't like other folks, and the people said it would always bring me a meal of victuals and keep me from starving. The peep shows was a doing very well then, that's about five or six years back, when the theatres was all a shilling to go into them whole price. But now there's many at threepence or tuppence, and a good lot at a penny. Before the theatres lowered, a peep showman could make three shillings or four shillings a day at the least in fine weather, and on a Saturday night about double that money. At a fair, he could take his fifteen shillings to a pound a day. Then there was about nine or ten peep shows in London. These were all back shows. There are two kinds of peep shows, which we call back shows and caravan shows. The caravan shows are much larger than the others and are drawn by a horse or a donkey. They have a green baize curtain at the back, which shuts out them as don't pay. The showmen usually lives in these caravans with their families. Often there will be a man, his wife, and three or four children living in one of these shows. These caravans mostly go into the country, and very seldom are seen in town. They exhibit principally at fairs and feasts, or wakes, in country villages. They generally go out of London between March and April, because some fairs begin at that time, but many wait for the fairs at May. Then they work their way right round from village to town. They tell one another what part they are going to, and they never interfere with one another's rounds. If a new hand comes into the business, they are very civil and tells him what places to work. The caravans comes to London about October, after the fairs is over. The scenes of them caravan shows is mostly upon recent battles and murders. Anything in that way of late occurrence suits them. Theatrical plays ain't no good for country towns, cause they don't understand such things there. People is very fond of the battles in the country, but a murder what is well known is worth more than all the fights. There was more took with Rush's murder than there has been even by the Battle of Waterloo itself. Some of the caravan shows does very well. Their average taking is 30 shillings a week for the summer months. At some fairs they'll take five pounds in the three days. They have been about town as long as we can recollect. I should say there is full 50 of these caravan shows throughout the country. Some never comes into London at all. There is about a dozen that comes to London regular every winter. The business in general goes from family to family. The cost of a caravan show second hand is £40. That's without the glasses. And them runs from 10 shillings to a pound apiece because they're large. Why, I've knowed the front of a peep show with the glasses cost £60. The front was mahogany and had 36 glasses with gilt carved mouldings round each on them. The scenes will cost about £6 if done by the best artist and £3 if done by a common hand. The back shows are peep shows that stand upon trussels and are so small as to admit of being carried on the back. The scenery is about 18 inches to 2 foot in length and about 15 inches high. They have been introduced about 15 or 16 years ago. The man as first brought him up was named Billy T. Blank. He was lame of one leg and used to exhibit little automaton figures in the new cut. On their first coming out, the oldest back showman as I know on told me they could take 15 shillings a day. But now we can't do more than seven shillings a week, run Saturday and all the other days together. And that's through the theatres being so low. It's a regular starving life now. We have to put up with the insults of people so. The back shows generally exhibits plays of different kind what's been performed at the theatres lately. I've got many different plays to my show. I only exhibit one at a time. There's Halonzer the Brave and the Fair Himogen. The Dog of Montargis and the Forest of Bondi, Hyder Halley or the Lions of Mysore, The Forty Thieves, that never done no good to me, The Devil and Dr Faustus, and at Christmas time we exhibit pantomimes. I have some other scenes as well. I've Napoleon's Return from Helba, Napoleon at Waterloo, The Death of Lord Nelson, and also The Queen Embarking to Start for Scotland from the dockyard at Woolwich. We takes more from children than grown people in London, 
and more from grown people than children in the country. You see, grown people has such remarks made upon them when they are peeping through in London as to make it bad for us here. Lately I have been hardly able to get a living, you may say. Some days I've taken sixpence, others eightpence, and sometimes a shilling. That's what I call a good day for any of the weekdays. On a Saturday it runs from two shillings to two shillings sixpence. Of the weekdays, Monday or Tuesday is the best. If there's a fair on near London, such as Greenwich, we can go and take three shillings and four shillings, or five shillings a day, so long as it lasts. But after that we comes back to the old business, and that's bad enough. For after you've paid one shilling sixpence a week rent, and sixpence a week stand for your peep show, and come to buy a bit of coal, why, all one can get is a bit of bread and a cup of tea to live upon. As for meat, we don't see it from one month's end to the other. My old woman, when she is at work, only gets five fardens a pair for making a pair of drawers to send out for the convicts, and three halfpence for a shirt, and out of that she has to find her own thread. There are from six to eight scenes in each of the plays that I shows, and if the scenes are a bit short, why, I puts in a couple of battle scenes, or I makes up a panorama for em. The children will have so much for their money now. I charge a halfpenny for the active performance. There is characters and all, and I explains what they are supposed to be a-talking about. There's about six back shows in London. I don't think there's more. It don't pay now to get up a new play. We works the old ones over and over again, and sometimes we buys a fresh one off another showman, if we can rise the money. The price is two shillings and two shillings sixpence. I've been obligated to get rid on about twelve of my plays to get a bit of victuals at home. Formerly we used to give a hartist one shilling to go in the pit and sketch off the scenes and figures of any new play that was a-doing well and we thought it'd take, and after that we used to give him from one shilling sixpence to two shillings for drawing and painting each scene, and a penny and a penny halfpenny each for the figures, according to the size. Each play costs us from fifteen shillings to a pound for the inside scenes and figures, and the outside painting as well. The outside painting in general consists of the most attractive part of the performance. The new cut is no good at all now on a Saturday night. That's through the cheap penny exhibitions there. Tottenham Court Road ain't much account either. The street markets is the best of a Saturday night. I'm often obliged to take bottles instead of money, and they don't fetch more than threepence a dozen. Sometimes I take four dozen of bottles in a day. I let them see a play for a bottle, and often too want to see for one large bottle. The children is dreadful for cheatening things down. In the summer I goes out of London for a month at a stretch. In the country I works my battle pieces. They are most pleased there with my Lord Nelson's death at the Battle of Trafalgar. That there is, I tell them, a fine painting, representing Lord Nelson at the Battle of Trafalgar. In the centre is Lord Nelson in his last dying moments, supported by Captain Hardy and the chaplain. On the left is the explosion of one of the enemy's ships by fire. That represents a fine painting, representing the death of Lord Nelson at the Battle of Trafalgar, what was fought on the 12th of October 1805. I've got five glasses, they cost about five shillings apiece when new, and is about three and a half inches across, with a three-foot focus. Acrobat or Street Posturer A man who, as he said, had all his life been engaged in the profession of acrobat, volunteered to give me some details of the life led and the earnings made by this class of street performer. He at the present moment belongs to a school of five, who are dressed up in fanciful and tight-fitting costumes of white calico with blue or red trimmings and who are often seen in the quiet by-streets going through their gymnastic performances, mounted on each other's shoulders, or throwing somersaults in the air. He was a short, wiry-built man with a broad chest, which somehow or another seemed unnatural, for the bones appeared to have been forced forward and dislocated. His general build did not betoken the great muscular strength which must be necessary for the various feats which he has to perform and his walk was rather slovenly and loutish, 
than brisk and springy, as one would have expected. He wore the same brown Chesterfield coat which we have all seen him slip over his professional dress in the street when moving off after an exhibition. His yellow hair reached nearly to his shoulders, and not being confined by the ribbon he usually wears across his forehead in the public thoroughfare, it kept straggling into his eyes, and he had to toss it back with a jerk, after the fashion of a horse with his nose-bag. He was a simple, good-natured fellow, and told his story in a straightforward manner, which was the more extraordinary as he prefaced his statement with a remark that all in his school, note the professional term for a gang or troop, end note, were terribly against his coming, but that as all he was going to say was nothing but the truth, he didn't care a fig for any of them. It is a singular fact that this man spoke fluently both the French and German languages, and, as will be seen in his statement, he has passed many years of his life abroad, performing in several circuses, or pitching, note, exhibiting in the streets, end note, in the various large towns of Sweden, Denmark, Prussia, Switzerland, and France. The following is the history of his life, from his earliest remembrance, from two years old indeed, down to his present age, thirty-six. I am what is known as a street posture or acrobat. I belong to a school of five, and we go about the streets doing pyramids, bending, juggling, and la perche. I have been at acrobatting for these thirty-five years, in London and all parts of England, as well as on the continent, in France and Germany, as well as in Denmark and Sweden, but only in the principal towns, such as Copenhagen and Stockholm. But only a little for we come back by sea almost directly. My father was a tumbler, and in his days very great, and used to be at the theatres and in Richardson's show. He's acted along with Joe Grimaldi. I don't remember the play it was in, but I know he's acted along with him at Sadler's Wells Theatre. At the time there was real water there. I have heard him talk about it. He brought me regular up to the profession, and when I first came out, I wasn't above two years old, and father used to dance me on my hands in Risley's style, but not like Risley. I can just recollect being danced in his hands, but I can't remember much about it, only he used to throw me a somersault with his hand. The first time I ever come out by myself was in a piece called Snowball, when I was introduced in a snowball, and I had to do the splits and strides. When father first trained me, it hurt my back awfully. He used to take my legs and stretch them, and work them round in their sockets, and put them up straight by my side. That is what they call being cricked. And it's in general done before you eat anything in the morning. Oh yes, I can remember being cricked, and it hurt me terrible. He put my breast to his breast, and then pulled my legs up to my head, and knocked him against my head and cheeks about a dozen times. It seems like as if your body was broken in two, and all your muscles being pulled out like India rubber. I worked for my father till I was twelve years of age. Then I was sold for two years to a man of the name of Tag, another showman, who took me to France. He had to pay father five pounds a year and keep me respectable. I used to do the same business with him as with father, splits and such like, and we acted in a piece that was wrote for us in Paris called Les Deux Clowns Anglais, which was produced at the Porte Saint-Antoine. That must have been about the year 1836. We were dressed up like two English clowns, with our faces painted and all, and we were very successful, and had plenty of flowers thrown to us. There was one Barnet Burns, who was showing in the boulevard, and called the New Zealand Chief who was tattooed all over his body. He was very kind to me, and made me a good many presents, and some of the ladies were kind to me. I knew this Barnet Burns pretty well, because my master was drunk all day pretty well, and he was the only Englishman I had to speak to, for I didn't know French. I ran away from Tag in Paris, and I went with the Frères de Boucher, rope dancers, two brothers who were so called, and I had to clown to the rope. I stopped with them three years, and we went through Belgium and Holland, and done very well with them. They was my masters, and had a large booth of their own, 
and would engage paraders to stand outside the show to draw the people. But they did all the performances themselves, and it was mostly at the fairs. From them, I came to England and began pitching in the street. I didn't much like it, after being a regular performer. I looked upon it as a drop. I travelled right down by myself to Glasgow Fair. I kept company with one Wells show, only working for myself. You see, they used to stop in the towns and draw plenty of people, and then I'd begin pitching to the crowd. I wasn't lonely because I knew plenty of the wild beast chaps, and besides, I'd done pretty well, taking two or three shillings a day, and on a Saturday and Monday, generally five or six. I had a suit of tights and a pair of twacks with a few spangles on, and as soon as the people came round me, I began to work. At Glasgow, I got a pound a day, for I went with Mr Mumford, who had some dancing dolls showing at the bottom of the stone buildings. The fair is a week, and after that, one of our chaps wrote to me that there was a job for me if I liked to go over to Ireland and join Mr Batty, who had a circus there. They used to build wooden circuses in them days, and hadn't tents as now. I stopped a twelve-month with him, and we only went to four towns, and the troupe did wonders. Mr Hughes was the manager for Mr Batty. There was Herr Hengler, the great rope dancer among the troupe, and his brother Alfred, the great rider, as is dead now, for a horse kicked him at Bristol and broke his arm, and he wouldn't have it cut off, and it mortified, and he died. When I left Ireland, I went back to Glasgow, and Mr David Miller gave the school I had joined an engagement for three months. We had six pounds a week between four of us, besides a benefit, which brought us two pounds each more. Miller had a large penny booth and had taken about twelve pounds or fourteen pounds a night. There was acting and our performances. Alexander, the lessee of the Theatre Royal, prevented him for having acted, as he also did Anderson, the Wizard of the North, who had the circus and acted as well, and Mumford. But they won the day. I left Glasgow with another chap, and we went first to Edinburgh and then to Hamburgh and then we played at the Tivoli Gardens. I stopped abroad for 14 years, performing at different places through France and Switzerland, either along with regular companies or else by ourselves, for there was four of us in schools. After Hamburg, we went to Copenhagen, and then we joined the Brother Prices, or, as they call them there, priests. We only did tumbling and jumping up on each other's shoulders and dancing the pole on our feet, what is called in French, tronc. From there we joined the brothers Lehman, both Russians they was, who was very clever and used to do the Pierrot, the French clown, dress all in white, for their clown is not like our clown. And they danced the rope and all. The troupe was called the Russian Pantomimists. Then we met her Hengler again, as well as Dulon, the dancer, who was dancing at the Eagle and at the theatres as Harlequin and Anderson, who was one of the first clowns of the day, and a good comic singer, and an excellent companion, for he could make puns and make poems on everybody in the room. He did, you may recollect, some years ago, throw himself out of window, and killed himself. I read it in the newspapers, and a mate of mine afterwards told me he was crazy, and thought he was performing, and said, Hello, old feller, I'm coming, and threw himself out the same as if he'd been on the stage. In Paris and all over Switzerland, we performed at the fairs when we had no engagements at the regular theatres or we'd pitch in the streets, just according. In Paris, we was regular stars. There was only me and R blank and we was engaged for three months with Monsieur Le Comte at his theatre in the Passage Soiseau. It's all children that acts there and he trains young actors. He's called the Physician to the King. Indeed, he is the King's Conjurer. I'm very fond of France. Indeed, I first went to school there when I was along with Tag. You see, I never had no schooling in London, for I was so busy that I had no time for learning. I also married in France. My wife was a great bender. Used to throw herself backwards on her hands and make the body in a harch. I think she killed herself at it. Indeed, as the doctors tell me, it was nothing else but that. 
she would keep on doing it when she was in the family way. I've many a time ordered her to give over, but she wouldn't. She was so fond of it, for she took a deal of money. She died in childbed at Saint-Malo, poor thing. In France we take a deal more money than in England. You see, they all give. Even a child will give its might. And another thing, anybody on a Sunday may take as much money as will keep him all the week, if they like to work. The most money I ever took in all my life was at Cali, the first Sunday cavalcade after Lent. That is, the Sunday after Mardi Gras. They go out in a cavalcade, dressed up in carnival costume, and beg for the poor. There was me, Dick S. Blank, and Jim C. Blank, and his wife, as danced the Highland Fling, and a chap they calls Polka, who did it when it first came up. We pitched about the streets, and we took 700 francs, all in halfpence, that is, 28 pounds, on one Sunday, and you mustn't work till after 12 o'clock, that is, grand mass. There were liah and centime and half sou and all kinds of copper money, but very little silver, for the Frenchman can't afford it. But all copper money change into five franc pieces, and it's the same to me. The other chaps didn't like the liah, so I bought them all up. They're like buttonheads and such like, and they said they wouldn't have that bad money, so I got more than my share. For after we had shared, I bought the heap of liah and gave ten francs for the heap. And I think it brought me in sixty francs. But then I had to run about to all the little shops to get five francs pieces. You see, I was the only chap that spoke French. So you see, I'm worth a double share. I always tell the chaps when they come to me that I don't want nothing but my share. But then I says, you're single men and I'm married and I must support my children. And so I get a little out of the hotel expenses for I charges them a shilling threepence a day. And at the second-rate hotels, I can keep them for a shilling. There's three or four schools now want me to take them over to France. They calls me Frenchy because I can talk French and German fluently. That's the name I goes by. I used to go to all the fêtes in Paris along with my troupe. We have been four and we have been five in one troupe, but our general number is four, for we don't want any more than four for we can do the three high and the spread, and that's the principal thing. Our music is generally the drum and pipes. We don't take them over with us, but gets Italians to do it. Sometimes we gets a German band of five to come for a share, for you see they can't take money as we can, for our performance will cause children to give, and with them they don't think about it, not being so partial to music. Posturing to this day is called in France le dislocation anglais. And indeed, the English fellows is the best in the world at posturing. We can lick them all. I think they eat too much bread. For though meat's so cheap in the south of France, tuppens a pound, yet they don't eat it. They don't eat much potatoes either. And in the south, they gives them to the pigs, which used to make me grumble. I'm so fond of them. Chickens too is sevenpence the pair. And you may drink wine at a penny the horn. At saint Cloud fête, we were called Les Quatre Frères Anglais, and we used to pitch near the Cascade, which was a good place for us. We have shared our thirty shillings each a day, then easy, and a great deal of English money we got then, for the English is more generous out of England. There was the Fête Saint-Germain, and Saint-Denis, and at Versailles too, and we've done pretty well at each, as well as at the Champs-Élysées on the 1st of May, as used to be the Fête Louis-Philippe. On that fit, we were paid by the king, and we had fifty francs a man, and plenty to eat and drink on that day, and every poor man in Paris has two pounds of sausages, and two pounds of bread, and two bottles of wine. But we were different from that, you know. We had a déjeuner, with fish, flesh, and fowl, and a dinner fit for a king, both brought to us in the Champs-Élysées, and as much as ever we liked to drink all day long, the best of wine. We had to perform every alternate half hour. I was in Paris when Mr. McCready come to Paris. I was engaged with my troupe at the Porte Saint-Martin, where we was called the Bedouin Arabs, and had to brown our faces. I went to see him, for I knew one of his actors. He was very good, and a beautiful house there was, splendid. All my other partners they paid. The price was half a guinea to the lowest place. 
The French people said he was very good, but he was mostly supported by the English that was there. An engagement at the Porte Saint-Martin was a thousand francs a week for five of us, but of course we had to leave the streets alone during the four weeks we was at the theatre. I was in Paris too at the Revolution in 1848, when Louis-Philippe had to run off. I was in bed about two o'clock in the morning when those that began the revolution was coming round, men armed, and they come into everybody's bedroom and said, you must get up, you're wanted. I told them I was English and they said, it don't matter, you get your living here and you must fight the same as we fight for our liberty. They took us, four English, as was in the same gang as I was with, to the Barrière du Tron and made us pick up paving stones. I had to carry them, and we formed four barricades right up to the Faubourg Saint-Antoine, close to the Bastille. We had sometimes a bit of bread and a glass of wine, or brandy, and we was four nights and three days working. There was a great deal of chaff going on, and they called me le petit supplier, posture, you know, but they was of all countries. We was put in the background and didn't fire much, for we was ordered not to fire unless attacked and we had only to keep our ground, and, if anything come, to give warning. But we had to supply them with the powder and ammunition of one sort and another. There was one woman, a very clever woman, from Normandy, who used to bring us brandy round. She died on the barricade, and there's a song about her now. I was present when part of the throne was burned. After that, I went for a tour in Lorraine, and then I was confined in Tours, for thirty-four days, for the Republicans passed a bill that all foreigners were to be sent home to their own countries, and indeed several manufactories where English worked had to stop, for the workman was sent home. I came back to England in 1852, and I've been pitching in the streets ever since. I've changed gangs two or three times since then, but there's five in our gang now. There's three high for pyramids, and the Arabs hang down, that is, one atop of his shoulders and one hanging down from his neck, and the spread, that's one on the shoulders, and one hanging from each hand, and the Hercules, that is, one on the ground supporting himself on his hands and feet, whilst one stands on his knees, another on his shoulders, and the other one atop of them too, on their shoulders. There's loads of tricks like them that we do. That would almost fill up your paper to put down. There's one of our gang dances, an Englishman, whilst the fifth plays the drum and pipes. The dances are mostly comic dances, or, as we call them, comic hops. He throws his legs about and makes faces, and he dresses as a clown. When it's not too windy, we do the perch. We carry a long fur pole about with us, 24 feet long, and Jim the strong man, as they calls me, that is, I, holds the pole up at the bottom. The one that runs up is called the sprite. It's the bottom man that holds the pole that has the dangerous work in La Perche. He's got all to look to. Anybody who has got any courage can run up the pole, but I have to guide and balance it, and the pole weighs some twenty pounds, and the man about eight stone. When it's windy, it's very awkward, and I have to walk about to keep him steady and balance him. But I'm never frightened. I know it so well. The man who runs up it does such feats as these, for instance, the bottle position, that is, only holding by his feet, with his two arms extended, and then the hanging down by one toe, with only one foot on the top of the pole, and hanging down with his arms out, swimming on the top of his belly, and the horizontal, as it is called, or supporting the body out sideways by the strength of the arms, and such like winding up with coming down head first. The pole is fixed very tightly in a socket in my waistband, and it takes two men to pull it out, for it gets jammed in, with his force on atop of it. The danger is more with the bottom one than the one atop, though few people would think so. You see, if he falls off, he is sure to light on his feet like a cat, for we are taught to this trick and a man can jump off a place thirty feet high without hurting himself easy. Now, if the people was to go frontwards, it would be all up with me, because with the leverage and its being fixed so tight to my stomach, there's no help for it, 
for it would be sure to rip me up and tear out my entrails. I have to keep my eyes about me, for if it goes too far, I could never regain the balance again. But it's easy enough when you're accustomed to it. The one that goes up the pole can always see into the drawing rooms, and he'll tell us where it's good to go and get any money, for he can see the people peeping behind the curtains, and they generally give when they find they are discovered. It's part of his work to glance his eyes about him, and then he calls out whilst he is up, to the right or the left, as it may be, and although the crowd don't understand him, we do. Our gang generally prefer performing in the West End, because there's more calls there. Gentlemen looking out of windows see us, and call to us to stop and perform. But we don't trust to them even, but make a collection when the performance is half over. And if it's good, we continue and make two or three collections during the exhibition. What we consider a good collection is seven shillings or eight shillings. And for that, we do the whole performance. And besides, we get what we call ringings afterwards. That's halfpence that are thrown into the ring. Sometimes we get ten shillings altogether, and sometimes more, and sometimes less. Though it's a very poor pitch if it's not up to five shillings. I'm talking of a big pitch when we go through all our slang, as we say. But then we have our little pitches, which don't last more than a quarter of an hour. Our flying pitches, as we call them, and for them five shillings is an out and outer. And we are well contented if we get half a crown. We usually reckon about twenty pitches a day. That's eight before dinner and twelve after. It depends greatly upon the holidays as to what we makes in the days. If there's any fairs or feasts going on, we do better. There's two days in the week we reckon nothing. That's Friday and Saturday. Friday's little good all day long. And Saturday is only good after six o'clock when wages have been paid. My share may, on the average, come to this: Monday about seven shillings or eight shillings, and the same for Tuesday. Then Wednesday and Thursday it falls off again, perhaps three shillings or four shillings. And Friday ain't worth much. No more is Saturday. We used to go to Sydenham on Saturdays, and we would find the gents there. But now it's getting too late, and the price to the palace is only two shillings sixpence, when it used to be five shillings, and that makes a wonderful difference to us. And yet we like the poor people better than the rich, for it's the halfpence that tells up best. Perhaps we might take a half sovereign, but it's very rare, and since 1853 I don't remember taking more than twenty of them. There was a princess. I am sure I've forgotten her name. But she was German, and she used to live in Grosvenor Square. She used to give us half a sovereign every Monday during three months she was in London. The servants was ordered to tell us to come every Monday at three o'clock, and we always did. And even though there was nobody looking, we used to play all the same. And as soon as the drum ceased playing, there was the money brought out to us. We continued playing to her till we was told she had gone away. We have also had sovereign calls. When my gang was in the Isle of Wight, Lord Y blank has often given us a sovereign and plenty to eat and drink as well. I can't say but what it's as good as a hundred a year to me, but I can't say it's the same with all postures. For you see, I can talk French, and if there's any foreigners in the crowd, I can talk to them, and they are sure to give me something. But most postures make a good living, and if they look out for it, there are few but make thirty shillings a week. Posturing, as it is called, some people call it contortionists. That's a new name, a Chinese nondescript. That's the first name it came out as. Although what we calls posturing is a man as can sit upon nothing, as for instance when he's on the back of two chairs and does a split with his legs stretched out and sitting on nothing like. Posturing is reckoned the healthiest life there is, because we never get the rheumatics. And another thing. We always eat hearty. We often put on wet dresses, such as at a fair, when they've been washed out clean, and we put them on before they're dry, and that's what gives the rheumatism. But we are always in such a perspiration that it never affects us. It's very violent exercise, and at night we feels it in our thighs more than anywhere, 
so that if it's damp or cold weather, it hurts us to sit down. If it's wet weather or showery, we usually get up stiff in the morning, and then we have to crick each other before we go out, and practice in our bedrooms. On the Sunday, we also go out and practice, either in a field or at the tan in Bermondsey. We used to go to the hops in Maiden Lane, but that's done away with now. When we go out performing, we always take our dresses out with us, and we have our regular houses appointed according to what part of the town we play in, if in London. And we have one pint of beer a man, and put on our costume and leave our clothes behind us. Every morning we put on a clean dress, so we are obliged to have two of them, and whilst we are wearing one, the other is being washed. Some of our men is married, and their wives wash for them, but them as isn't give the dress to anybody who wants a job. Accidents are very rare with posturers. We often put our hip bone out, but that's soon put right again, and we are at work in a week. All our bones are loose like, and we can pull one another in without having no pulleys. One of my gang broke his leg at Chatham Racecourse, through the grass being slippery, and he was pitched down from three high. But we paid him his share just the same as if he was out with us. It wouldn't do if we didn't, as a person wouldn't mount in bad weather. That man is getting on nicely. He walks with a crutch, though. But he'll be right in another month, and then he'll only be put to light work till he's strong. He ought not to be walking out yet, but he's so daring there's no restraining him. I too once broke my arm. I am a hand jumper, that is, I almost always light on my hands when I jump. I was on a chair on the top of a table, and I had to get into the chair and do what we call the frog, and jump off it, coming down on my hands. Everything depends upon how you hold your arms, and I was careless and didn't pay attention, and my arm snapped just below the elbow. I couldn't work for three months. I was at Beauvais in France at the time but the circus I was with supported me. My father's very near 76, and he has been a tumbler for 50 years. My children are staying with him, and he's angry that I won't bring them up to it. But I want them to be some trade or another, because I don't like the life for them. There's so much suffering before they begin tumbling, and then there's great temptation to drink and such like. I'd sooner send them to school than let them get their living out of the streets. I've one boy and two girls. They're always at it at home indeed. Father and my sister-in-law say they can't keep them from it. The boy's very nimble. In the winter time, we generally goes to the theatres. We are almost always engaged for the pantomimes to do the sprites. We always reckon it a good 13 weeks job, but in the country it's only a month. If we don't apply for the job, they come after us. The sprites in a pantomime is quite a new style, and we are the only chaps that can do it, the posturers and tumblers. In some theatres, they find the dresses. Last winter I was at Liverpool and wore a green dress, spangled all over, which belonged to Mr Copeland, the manager. We never speak in the play, but just merely rush on and throw somersaults and frogs and such like, and then rush off again. Little Wheeler, the greatest tumbler of the day, was a posturer in the streets, and now he's in France doing his ten pounds a week, engaged for three years. End of section 18 Section 19 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Street Exhibitors, Part 11 The Street Risley There is but one person in London who goes about the street doing what is termed the Risley performance, and even he is rarely to be met with. Of all the street professionals whom I have seen, this man certainly bears off the palm for respectability of attire. He wore, when he came to me, a brown Chesterfield coat and black continuations, and but for the length of his hair, the immense size of his limbs, and the peculiar neatness of his movements, it would have been impossible to have recognised in him any of those characteristics which usually distinguish the street performer. He had a chest which, when he chose, 
he could force out, almost like a pouter pigeon. The upper part of his body was broad and weighty-looking. He asked me to feel the muscle of his arm, and, doubling it up, a huge lump rose, almost as if he had a coconut under his sleeve. In fact, it seemed as fully developed as the gilt arms placed in signs over the gold-beaters' shops. Like most of the street professionals, he volunteered to exhibit before me some of his feats of strength and agility. He threw his head back, his long hair tossing about like an Indian fly-whisk, until his head touched his heels, and there he stood bent backward and nearly double, like a strip of whalebone. Then he promenaded round the room, walking on his hands, his coat-tails falling about his shoulders, and making a rare jingle of halfpence the while, and his legs dangling in front of him as limp as the lash of a cart-whip. I refused to allow him to experiment upon me, and politely declined his obliging offer to raise me from the ground, and hold me at arm's length like a babby. When he spoke of his parents, and the brothers who performed with him, he did so in most affectionate terms, and his descriptions of the struggles he had gone through in his fixed determination to be a tumbler, and how he had worked to gain his parents' consent, had a peculiarly sorrowful touch about them, as if he still blamed himself for the pain he had caused them. Farther, whenever he mentioned his little brothers, he always stopped for two or three minutes to explain to me that they were the cleverest lads in London, and as true and kind-hearted as they were talented. He was more minute in his account of himself than my space will permit him to be, for, as he said, he had a wonderful rememoriation and could recollect anything. With the omission of a few interesting details, the following is the account of the poor fellow's life. My professional name is Signor Nelsonio, but my real one is Nelson, and my companions know me as Lou, which is short for Lewis. I can do plenty of things beside the Risley business, for it forms only one part of my entertainment. I am a strong man, and a fire king, and a stonebreaker by the fist, as well as being sprite, and posturer, and doing la perche. Last Christmas, note, 1855, end note, I was, along with my two brothers, engaged at the Theatre Royal, Cheltenham, to do the sprites in the pantomime. I have brought the bill of the performances with me to show it to you. Here you see the pantomime is called The Imp of the North, or The Golden Basin, and Harlequin and the Miller's Daughter. In the pantomimical transformations it says Sprites by the Nelson family. That's me and my two brothers. The reason why I took to the Risley business was this. When I was a boy of seven, I went to school, and my father and mother would make me go. But, unfortunately, I was stubborn, and would not. I said I wanted to do some work. Well, said they, you shan't do any work, not yet, till you're thirteen years old, and you shall go to school. Says I, I will do work. Well, I wouldn't, so I plays the truant. Then I goes to amuse myself, and I goes to Haggerston Fields, in the Hackney Road, and then I see some boys learning to tumble on some dung there, so I began to do it too, and I very soon picked up two or three tricks. There was a man who was in the profession as tumbler and acrobat who came there to practice his feats, and he see me tumbling, and says he, My lad, will you come along with me and do the Risley business, and I'll buy you your clothes and give you a shilling a week besides? I told him that perhaps mother and father wouldn't let me go. But, says he, oh, yes, they will. So he comes to our house and says, Mother, what do you want along with my boy? And he says, I want to make a tumbler of him. But she wouldn't. My father is a tailor, but my uncle and all the family was good singers. My uncle was leader of the Drury Lane Band, and Miss Nelson, who came out there, is my cousin. 
They are out in Australia now, doing very well, giving concerts day and night, and clearing by both performances one hundred and fifty pounds, day and night, and sooner, more than less, as advertised in the paper which they sent to us. One day, instead of going to school, I went along with this man into the streets, and then he did the Risley business, throwing me about on his hands and feet. I was about thirteen years old then. Mother asked me at night where I had been, and when I said I had been at school, she went and asked the master and found me out. Then I brought home some dresses once, and she tore them up, so I was forced to drop going out in the streets. I made some more dresses, and she tore those up. Then I got chucking about, a la Risley, my little brother, who was about seven years old, and says, Mother, let that boy alone, you'll break his neck. No, I shan't, say I, and I kept on doing till I had learnt him the tricks. One Saturday night, father and mother and my eldest brother went to a concert room. I had no money, so I couldn't go. I asked my little brother to go along with me round some tap rooms, exhibiting with me. So I smuggled him out, telling him I'd give him lots of cakes. And away we went, and we got about seven shillings and sixpence. I got home before father and mother come home. When they returned, father says, Where have you been? Then I showed the money we had got. He was regular astonished, and says he, How is this? You can do nothing. You ain't clever. I says, Oh, ain't I? And it's all my own learning. So then he told me that, since he couldn't do nothing else with me, I should take to it as my profession, and stick to it. Soon after, I met my old friend the Swallower again, in Ratcliffe Highway. I was along with my little brother, and both dressed up in tights and spangled trunks. Says he, Oh, you will take to tumbling, will you? Well then, come along with me, and we'll go in the country. Then he took us down to Norwich. Note to Yarmouth. End note. Then he beat me, and would give me no clothes or money, for he spent it to go and get drunk. We not sending any money home, mother began to wonder what had become of me. So one night, when this man was out with a lot of girls getting drunk, I slipped away, and walked thirty miles that night, and then I began performing at different public houses, and so worked my way till I got back to London again. My little brother was along with me, but I carried him on my shoulders. One day it came on to rain awful, and we had run away in our dresses, and then we was dripping. I was frightened to see little Johnny so wet, and thought he'd be ill. There was no shed or barn or nothing, and only the country road. So I tore on till we came to a roadside inn, and then I wrung his clothes out, and I only had fourpence in my pocket, and I ordered some rum and water hot, and made him drink. Drink it, it'll keep the cold out of you. When we got out, he was quite giddy, and kept saying, Oh, I'm so wet. With all these misfortunes, I walked, carrying the little chap across my shoulders. One day, I only had a halfpenny, and Johnny was crying for hunger. So I goes to a fellow in an orchard, and say I, Can you make me a halfpenny of apples? He would take the money, but he gave a capful of fallings. I've walked thirty-eight miles in one day carrying him, and I was awfully tired. On that same day, when we got to Colchester, we put up at the Blue Anchor, and I put Johnny into bed, and I went out myself, and went the round of the public houses. My feet was blistered, but I had my light tumbling slippers on, and I went to work and got sixteen pence halfpenny. This got us bread and cheese for supper and breakfast, and paid threepence each for the bed. And the next day we went and performed in a village, and got three shillings. Then at Chelmsford we got eight shillings. I bought Johnny some clothes, for he had only his tights and little trunks, and though it was summer he was cold, especially after rain. The nearer we got to London, the better we got off, for they gave us then plenty to eat and drink, and we did pretty well for money. After I passed Chelmsford, I never was hungry again. When we got to Romford, 
I waited two days till it was market day, when we performed before the country people, and got plenty of money and beer, but I never cared for the beer. We took four shillings and sixpence. I wouldn't let Johnny take any beer, for I'm fond of him, and he's eleven now, and the cleverest little fellow in England, and I learnt him everything he knows out of my own head, for he never had no master. We took the train to London from Romford, one shilling and sixpence each, and then we went home. When we got back, mother and father said they knew how it would be, and laughed at us. They wanted to keep us at home, but I wouldn't, and they was forced to give way. In London I stopped still for a long time, at last got an engagement at two shillings a night at a penny gaff in Shoreditch. It was Sambo, a black man, who went about the streets along with the demon brothers, acrobats, that got me the engagement. One night father and mother came to see me, and they was frightened to see me chucking my brother about, and she calls out, Oh, don't do that! You'll break his back! The people kept hollering out, Turn that woman out! But she answers, They're my sons! Stop em! When I bent myself backwards, she calls out, Lord, mind your bones! After this, I noticed that my other brother, Sam, was a capital hand at jumping over the chairs and tables. He was as active as a monkey. Indeed, he plays monkeys now at the different ballets that comes out at the chief theatres. It struck me he would make a good tumbler, and sure enough, he is a good one. I asked him, and he said he should, and then he see me perform, and he declared he would be one. He was at my uncle's then as a carver and gilder. When I told father, says he, let em do as they like, they'll get on. I said to him one day, Sam, let's see what you're like. So I stuck him up in his chair, and stuck his legs behind his head, and kept him like that for five minutes. His limbs bent beautiful, and he didn't want no crooking. I should tell you that before that, he done this here. You've heard of Baker, the red man as was performing at the City of London Theatre. Well, Sam see the cut of him sitting in a chair with his legs folded, just like you fold your arms. So Sam pulls down one of the bills with the drawing on it, and he says, I can do that. And he goes home and practices from the engraving till he was perfect. Then he showed me, and says I, That's the style. It's beautiful. You'll do. Then we had two days' practice together, and we worked the double tricks together. Then I learned him style and grace, what I knowed myself, such as coming before an audience and making the obedience. And by and by, says I to him, we'll come out at a theatre and make a good bit of money. Well, we went to another exhibition, and we came out all three together, and our salary was twenty-five shillings a week and we was very successful. Then we got outside Peter's Theatre at Stepney Fair, the last as ever was, for it's done away with now. We did very well then. They gave us twelve shillings a day between us for three days. We did the acrobatting and drizzly business outside the parade, and inside as well. Sam got on wonderful, for his mind was up to it, and he liked the work. I and my brothers can do as well as anyone in this business. I don't care who comes before us. I can do upwards of 121 different tricks in tumbling when I'm along with those little fellows. We can do the hoops and glasses, putting a glass of beer on my forehead and going through hoops double and lying down and getting up again without spilling it. Then there's the bottle sprite and the short stilts and globe running, and globe dancing, and chair tricks, perform with the chairs, and the pole trick, the perche, with two boys, not one, mind you. We've been continuing ever since at this Risley business. I lay down on a carpet, and throw then somersets from feet to feet. I tell you what the music plays to it, it's the railway overtime and it begins now and then quicker and quicker, till I throw them fast as lightning. 
Sam does about 54 or 55 of these somersets, one after another, and Johnny does about 25 because he's littler. Then there's standing upright and standing one in one hand and one on the other. Then I throws them up in somersets and catch them on my palm, and then I chuck them on the ground. The art with me lying on the ground is that it takes the strength and the sight to see that I catch them properly, for if I missed, they might break their necks. The audience fancies that it's most with them tumbling, but everything depends upon me catching them properly. Every time they jump, I have to give them a jerk and turn them properly. It's almost as much work as if I was doing it myself. When they learn at first, they do it on a soft ground so as not to hurt themselves. It don't make the blood come to the head lying down so long on my back, only at first. I've done the Risley business first at penny exhibitions, and after that I went to fairs. Then I went round the country with a booth, a man named Manley it was, but we dropped that cause my little brother was knocked up, for it was too hard work for the little fellow, building up and taking down the booth, sometimes twice in a day, and then going off twenty miles further on to another fair, and building up again the next day. Then we went pitching about in the main streets of the towns in the country. Then I always had a drum and pipes. As soon as a crowd collected, I'd say, "'Gentlemen, I'm from the principal theatres in London.' And before I begin, I must have five shillings in the ring. Then we'd do some, and after that, when half was over, I'd say, Now, gentlemen, the better part is to come, and if you make it worth my while, I go on with this here entertainment. Then perhaps they'd give me two shillings more. I've done bad and done good in the country. In one day I've taken two pounds five shillings. And many days we've not taken eight shillings. And there was four of us, me and my two brothers and the drummer, who had two and sixpence a day, and a pot of beer besides. Take one week with another, we took regular two pounds five shillings, and out of that I'd send from twenty to thirty shillings a week home to my parents. Oh, I've been very good to my parents, and I've never missed it. I've been a wild boy too, and yet I've always taken care of mother and father. They've had twelve in family, and never a stain on their character, nor never a key turned on them, but are upright and honourable people. At a place called Brentford in Norfolk, where there's such a lot of wild rabbits, we done so well that we took a room and had bills printed and put out. We charged threepence each, and the room was crowded, for we shared twenty-five shillings between us. When the people seed me and my brothers come on, dressed all in red, and tumble about, they actually swore we were devils, and rushed out of the place, so that, though there was a room full, there was only two stopped to see the performances. One old man called out, Oh, wenches! They call their wives wenches. Come out, they be devils! We came out with red faces and horns and red dresses, and away they went screaming. There was one woman trampled on, and a child knocked out of her arms. In some of these country towns they're shocking strict, and never having seen anything of the kind, they're scared directly. About six months ago I went to Woolwich with the boys, and there was a chap that wanted to fight me, because I wouldn't go along with him. So I says... We won't have no fighting. So I went along with him to Gravesend, and then we asked permission of the mayor, because in country towns we often have to ask the mayor to let us go performing in the streets. There we done very well, taking twenty-five shillings in the day. Then we worked up by Chatham, and down to Herne Bay, and Ramsgate, and at Ramsgate we stopped a week, doing uncommon well on the sands for the people on the chairs would give sixpence and a shilling and say it was very clever, and too clever to be in the streets. We did Margate next, and then Deal, and on to Dover by the boat. At Dover the mayor wouldn't let us perform, and said if he catched us in the streets he'd have us took up. We were very hard up. So I said to Sam, 
You must go out one way, and I and Johnny the other, and busk in the public house. Sam got eight shillings and sixpence, and I four shillings. But I had a row with a sailor, and I was bruised, and had to lay up. When I was better, we moved to Folkestone. There was the German soldiers there, and we did very well. I went out one day with our carpet to a village close by, and some German officers made us perform and gave us five shillings, and then we went the round of the beer shops, and altogether we cleared five pounds before we finished that day. We also went up to the camp where the tents was, and I asked the colonel to let me perform before the men, and he said, well, it ain't usual, but you may if you like. The officers we found was so pleased, they kept on giving us two shilling pieces, and besides we had a lot of foreign coin, which we sold to a jeweller for ten shillings. I worked my way on to Canterbury and Winchester, and then by a deal of persuasion I got permission to perform in the back streets, and we done very well. Then we went on to Southampton. There was a cattle fair on. Celsi Fair is, I think, the name of it. And then I joined another troop of tumblers, and we worked the fair, and after that went on to Southampton. And when we began working on the Monday, there was another troop working as well. After we had pitched once or twice, this other troop came and pitched opposition against us. I couldn't believe it at first, but then I see which was their lay. Then says I, Now, I'll settle this. We was here, as it was, and they came right on to us, there, as it may be. So it was our dinner time, and we broke up and went off. After dinner we came out again, and pitched the carpet in a square, and they came close to us again, and as soon as they struck up, the people ran away to see the new ones. So I said, I don't want to injure them, but they shan't injure us. So I walked right into the middle of their ring and threw down the carpet, and says I, Now, ladies and gentlemen, the best performance is the one that deserves best support, and I'll show you what I can do. I went to work with the boys and was two hours doing all my tumbling tricks. They was regularly stunned. The silver and the halfpence covered the carpet right over, as much as it would hold. I think there was three pounds. Then I says, Now you've seen the tumbling, now see the perch. They had a perch too. It was taller than mine. But, as I told them, it was because I couldn't get no higher a one. So I went to work again, and cries I, Now, both boys up. Though I had only stood one on up to that time, and had never tried two of them. Up they goes, and the first time they come over but never hurt themselves. It was new to me, you see. Up again, lads, says I, and up they goes, and did it beautiful. The people regular applauded, like at a theatre. Down came the money in a shower, and one gentleman took his hat round, and went collecting for us. Says I to this other school, you tried to injure us, and what have you got by it? I beat you in tumbling, and if you can match the perch, do it. Then they says, We didn't try to injure you. Come and drink a gallon of beer. So off we went, and the police told them to choose their side of the town, and we would take ours. That settled the opposition, and we both done well. I've done the Risley in the streets of London, more so than at theatres and concerts. The stone paving don't hurt so much as you would think to lie down. We don't do it when it's muddy. The boys find no difference whatsoever in springing off the stones. It pays very well at times, you know, but we don't like to do it often because afterwards they don't like to appreciate you in concerts and theatres and likewise penny exhibitions. My brother Sam can jump like a frog on his hands, through his legs, out of a one-pair window and little Johnny throws out of a one-pair of stairs window a back somerset. It's astonishing how free the bones get by practice. My brother Sam can dislocate his limbs and replace them again, and when sleeping in bed I very often find him lying with his legs behind his neck. 
It's quite accidental, and done without knowing, and comes natural to him, from being always tumbling. Myself, I often in my dreams, often frighten my wife, by starting up and half throwing a somersault, fancying I'm at the theatre, and likewise I often lie with my heels against my head. We are the only family, or persons, going about the streets doing the risley. I've travelled all through England, Scotland, and Wales, and I don't know anybody but ourselves. When we perform in the London theatres, which we do when we can get an engagement, we get six or seven pounds a week between us. We've appeared at the pavilion two seasons running, likewise at the City of London and the Standard, and also all the cheap concerts in London. Then we are called The Sprites by the Nelson Family Will Appear, or The Sprites of Jupiter, or Sons of Syria, or Air Climbers of Arabia. Taking all the year round, I dare say my income comes to about 35 shillings, or two pounds, and out of that I have to find dresses. End of section 19 Section 20 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Street Exhibitors, Part 12 The Strong Man I have been in the profession for about 13 years, and I am 32 next birthday. Excepting four years that I was at sea, I've been solely by the profession. I'm what is termed a strong man, and perform feats of strength and posturing. What is meant by posturing is the distortion of the limbs, such as doing the splits and putting your leg over your head and pulling it down your back, a skipping over your leg, and such like business. Tumbling is different from posturing, and means throwing somersets and walking on your hands. And acrobatting means the two together, with mounting three stories high and balancing each other. These are the definitions I make. I was nineteen before I did anything of any note at all, and got what I call a living salary. Long before that, I had been trying the business, going in and out of these free concerts, and trying my hand at it, fancying I was very clever, but disgusting the audience, for they are mostly duffers at these free concerts, which is clearly the case, for they only do it for a pint every now and then, and depend upon passing the hat round after their performance. I never got much at collections, so I must have been a duffer. My father is an architect and builder, and his income now is never less than a thousand a year. Like a fool, I wouldn't go into his office. I wish I had. I preferred going to sea. I was always hankering after first one vessel and then another. I used to be fond of going down to the docks and such like, and looking at the vessels. I'd talk with the sailors about foreign countries and such like, and my ambition was to be a sailor. I was the scabby sheep of the family, and I've been punished for it. I never went into the governor's office, but when I was about fourteen, I was put to a stonemason, for I thought I should like to be a carver or something of that sort. I was two years there, and I should have done very well if I had stayed, for I earned a guinea a week when I left. Before I went to the stonemason, I was at the Victoria, taking checks, when there was any. I had an uncle there who kept the saloon there. I was always very partial to going to the theatre, for all our people are chapel people, and that I never liked. My father's parlour is always smothered with ministers, and mine with tumblers, and that's the difference. 
I used to go and see my uncle at the Vic, so as to get to the theatre for nothing. I wasn't paid for taking the cheques, but I knew the cheque taker, and he'd ask me to help him, and I was too glad to get inside a theatre to refuse the job. They were doing dreadful business. It was under Levi and before Glossop's time. It was before the glass curtain come out. The glass curtain was a splendid thing. It went straight up, never wound. You can even now see where the roof was hired to receive it. Levi has got the garrick now. They say he's not doing much. The first thing I did was at a little beer shop, corner of Southwark Bridge Road and Union Street. I had seen Herbert do the Grecian statues at the Vic in Hercules King of Clubs, and it struck me I could do them. So I knew this beer shop, and I bought half a crown's worth of tickets to be allowed to do these statues. It was on a boxing night, I remember. I did them, but they were dreadful bad. The people did certainly applaud, but what for I don't know, for I kept shaking and wobbling so that my marble statue was rather rickety, and there was a strong man in the room who had been performing them, and he came up to me and said that I was a complete duffer, and that I knew nothing about it at all. So I replied that he knew nothing about his feats of strength, and that I'd go and beat him. So I set to work at it, for I was determined to lick him. I got five quarter of hundred weights, and used to practice throwing them at a friend's backyard in the Waterloo Road. I used to make myself all over mud at it, besides having a knock of the head sometimes. At last I got perfect, chucking the quarter hundred, and then I tried a fourteen pound weight onto them, and at last I got up half hundreds. I learnt to hold up one of them at arm's length, and even then I was obliged to push it up with the other hand. I also threw them over my head, as well as catching them by the ring. I went to this beer shop as soon as I could do, and came out. I wasn't so good as he was at lifting, but that was all he could do, and I did posturing with the weights as well, and that licked him. He was awfully jealous, and I had been revenged. I had learnt to do a split holding a half hundred in my teeth, and rising with it without touching the ground with my hands. Now I can lift five, for I've had more practice. I had tremendous success at this beer shop. It hurt me awfully when I learnt to do the split with the weight on my teeth. It strained me all to pieces. I couldn't put my heels to the ground, not nicely, for it physicked my thighs dreadful. When I was hot, I didn't feel it, but as I cooled, I was cramped all to bits. It took me nine months before I could do it without feeling any pain. Another thing I learnt to do at this beer shop was to break the stone on my chest. This man used to do it as well, only in a very slight way, with thin bits and a cobbler's hammer. Now mine is regular flagstones. I've seen as many as twenty women faint seeing me do it. At this beer shop, when I first did it, the stone weighed about three quarters of a hundred and was an inch thick. I laid down on the ground, and the stone was put on my chest, and a man with a sledgehammer, twenty-eight pounds weight, struck it and smashed it. The way it is done is this. You rest on your heels and hands, and throw your chest up. There you are, like a stool, with the weight on you. When you see the blow coming, you have to give, or it would knock you all to bits. When I was learning to do this, I practised for nine months. I got a friend of mine to hit the stone. One day, I cut my chest open doing it. I wasn't paying attention to the stone, and never noticed that it was hollow, so that when the blow came down, the sharp edges of the stone, 
from my having nothing but a fleshing suit on, cut right into the flesh, and made two deep incisions. I had to leave it off for about a month. Strange to say, this stone-breaking never hurt my chest or my breathing. I rather think it has done me good, for I am strong and hearty, and never have illness of any sort. The first time I did it, I was dreadful frightened. I knew if I didn't stop still, I should have my brains knocked out pretty well. When I saw the blow coming, I trembled a good bit, but I kept still as I was able. It was a hard blow, for it broke the bit of Yorkshire paving about an inch thick into about sixty pieces. I got very hard up whilst I was performing at this beer shop. I had run away from home, and the performances were only two nights a week, and brought me in about six shillings. I wasn't engaged anywhere else. One night, a Mr. Emmanuel, who had a benefit at the Salmon Saloon, Union Street, asked me to appear at his benefit. He had never seen me, but only heard of my performances. I agreed to go, and he got out the bills, and christened me Signor C. Blank, and he had drawings made of the most extravagant kind, with me holding my arms out with about ten fifty-six pound weights hanging to them by the rings. He had the weights, hammers, and a tremendous big stone chained outside the door, and there used to be mobs of people there all day long looking at it. This was the first success I made. Mr. Emmanuel gave five shillings for the stone, and had it brought up to the saloon by two horses in a cart to make a sensation. It weighed from four to five hundredweight. I think I had such a thing as five men to lift it up for me. I had forgotten all about this engagement, and I was at the coffee house where I lodged. The fact was, I was in rags, and so shabby I didn't like to go. And if he hadn't come to fetch me, I should not have gone. He drove up in his chaise on the night in question to this coffee shop, and he says, Signor C. Blank, make haste, go and change your clothes and come along. I didn't know at first he was speaking to me, for it was the first time I had been Signor C. Blank. Then I told him I had got my best suit on, though it was very ragged and no mistake about it, for I remember there was a good hole at each elbow. He seemed astonished, and at last proposed that I should wear his greatcoat, but I wouldn't, because, as I told him, his coat would be as well known at the saloon as he himself was, and that it didn't suit me to be seen in another's clothes. So he took me just as I was. When we got there, the landlady was regularly flabbergasted to see a ragged fellow like me come to be star of the night. She'd hardly speak to me. There was a tremendous house, and they had turned above a hundred away. When I got into the saloon, Emmanuel says, What'll you have to drink? I said, Some brandy. But my landlord of the coffee house, who had come unbeknown to me, he grumbles out, Ask him what he'll have to eat, for he's had nothing since the slice of bread and butter for breakfast. I trod on his toe and says, Keep quiet, you fool. Emmanuel behaved like a regular brick and no mistake. He paid for the supper and everything. I was regularly ashamed when the landlord let it out, though. That supper put life into me, for it almost had the same effect upon me as drink. It soon got whispered about in the saloon that I was the strong man and everybody got handing me their glasses, so I was regularly tipsy when it was time to go on, and they had put me off to the last on purpose to draw the people and keep them there drinking. I had a regular success. When the women saw the five men put the stone on my chest, they all of them called out, Taunt! Taunt! It was a block, like a curb, 
about a foot thick and about four feet six inches long. I went with Emmanuel to buy it. I had never tried such a big one before. It didn't feel so heavy on the chest, for, you see, you've got such out-and-out -out good support on your hands and heels. I've actually seen one man raise a stone and another a wagon. It's the purchase done it. I've lifted up a cart horse right off his legs. The stone broke after six blows with a 28-pound sledgehammer. Then you should have heard the applause. I thought it would never give over. It smashed all to atoms, just like glass. And there was the people taking away the bits to keep us a remembrance. As I went out, the landlady asked me to have a bottle of soda water. The landlady was frightened and told me she had felt sure I should be killed. I was the second that ever done stone-breaking in England or abroad, and I'm the first that ever did such a big one. The landlady was so alarmed that she wouldn't engage me, for she said I must be killed one of the nights. Her behaviour was rather different as I went out to when I came in. I, of course, didn't go on in my rags. I had a first-rate stage dress. After this grand appearance, I got engaged at Gravesend Fair by Middleton, and there I had eight shillings a day, and I stopped with him three weeks over the fair. I used to do my performances outside on the parade, never inside. I had to do the stone-breaking about nine or ten times a day. They were middling stones, some larger and some smaller and the smaller ones about half a hundred weight, I suppose. Any man might bring his stone and hammer and break it himself. The one who struck was generally chosen from the crowd, the biggest chap they could find. I've heard him say to me, Now, old chap, I'll smash you all to bits, so look out. The fact is, the harder they strike, the better for me, for it smashes it at once, and don't keep the people in suspense. It was at Gravesend that I met with my second and last accident, with the cutting off the chest. It is the only one I ever had. The fellow who came up to break the stone was half tipsy and missed his aim, and obliged me by hitting my finger instead of the stone. I said to him, Mind what you are doing, but I popped my hand behind me, and when I got up, I couldn't make out what the people was crying out about till I looked round at my back and then I was smothered in blood. Middleton said, Good God, what's the matter? And I told him I was hit on the finger. When the cry was given off, All in to begin! I went into a booth close by and had some brandy and got a doctor to strap up the finger. And then I went on with the parade business just the same. It didn't pain me nothing like what I should have thought. It was too hard a knock to pain me much. The only time I felt it was when the doctor dressed it, for it gave me pepper taking the plaster off. I was at Gravesend some time, and I went to work again stonemasoning, and I had a guinea a week, and in the evening I used to perform at the Rose Inn, I did just as I liked there. I never charged them anything. I lived in the house, and they never charged me anything. It was a first-rate house. If I wanted five shillings, I'd get it from the landlord. I was there about eleven months, and all that time I lived there and paid nothing. I had a benefit there, and they wouldn't even charge me for printing the bills or cards or anything. It was quite a clear benefit, and every penny taken at the doors was given to me. I charged a shilling admittance, and the room was crowded, and they was even on the stairs, standing tiptoe to look at me. I wanted some weights, and asked a butcher to lend them to me, and he says, Lend them to you? Aye, take the machine and all if it'll serve you. I was a great favourite, as you may guess. After Gravesend, I came up to London, 
and went and played the monkey at the bower saloon. It was the first time I had done it. There was all the monkey business, jumping over tables and chairs, and all mischievous things, and there was climbing up trees, and up two perpendicular ropes. I was dressed in a monkey's dress. It's made of some of their hearth rugs, and my face was painted. It's very difficult to paint a monkey's face. I've a great knack that way, and can always manage anything of that sort. From the bower I went on to Portsmouth. I'd got hard up again, for I'd been idle for three months, for I couldn't get any money, and I never appear under price. I walked all the way to Portsmouth, carrying a half hundred weight, besides my dress, all the way. I played at the tap rooms on the road. I did pretty middling, earned my living on the road about two shillings a day. When I got to Portsmouth, I did get a job, and a good job it was, only one shilling and sixpence a night, but I thought it better to do that than nothing. I only did comic singing, and I only knew two songs, but I set to and learnt a lot. I am very courageous, and if I can't get my money one way, I will another. With us, if you've got a shilling, you're a fool if you spend that before you have another. I stopped at this public house for two months, and then a man who came from Port Sea, a town close by, came one night, and he asked me what I was doing. He had heard of what I could do, and he offered me two pounds a week to go with him and do the strong business. He kept the Star Inn at Port Sea. I stopped there such a thing as two years, and I did well. I had great success, for the place was crammed every night. For my benefit, Major Wyatt and Captain Holloway gave me their bespeak and permission for the men to come. The admission was sixpence. Half the regiment marched down, and there was no room for the public. I was on the stage for two hours doing my performances. I was tired and fainted away as dead as a hammer after the curtain fell. Among other things, I announced that I should, whilst suspended from the ceiling, lift a horse. I had this horse paraded about the town for a week before my night. There was such a house that numbers of people was turned away, and a comic singer who was performing at a house opposite, he put out an announcement that he too would lift a horse, and when the time came, he brought on a clothes horse. The way I did the horse was this. I was hanging by my ankles, and the horse was on a kind of platform under me. I had two sheets rolled up and tied round the horse like belly bands, and then I passed my arms through them and strained him up. I didn't keep him long in the air, only just lifted him off his legs. In the midst of it, the bandage got off his eyes, and then, what with the music and the applauding, the poor brute got frightened and began plunging. I couldn't manage him at all whilst he was kicking. He got his two hind legs over the orchestra and knocked all the float lights out. They kept roaring, Bring him out! Bring him out! as if they thought I was going to put him under my arm, a thundering big brute. I was afraid he'd crack his knees, and I should have to pay for him. The fiddler was rather uneasy, I can tell you, and the people began shifting about. I was frightened, and so I managed to pop part of the sheet over his head, and then I gave a tremendous strain and brought him back again. How the idea of lifting a horse ever came into my head, I don't know. It came in a minute. I had never tried it before. I knew I should have a tremendous purchase. The fact is, I had intended to do a swindle by having lines passed down my dress, and for somebody behind to pull the ropes and help me. The town was in an uproar when I announced I should do it. It was at my benefit that I first broke stones with my fist. I don't know whose original notion it was. I was not the first. There's a trick in it. It's done this way. Anybody can do it. You take a cobbler's lapstone, 
and it's put on a half hundredweight. You must hold it half an inch above. And then the concussion of the fist coming down smashes it all to bits. Anyone can do it. I cleared about eight pounds by my benefit. I was a regular swell in those days. The white coats had just come up, and I had one made with two shilling pieces for buttons, and with polished leather wellingtons I'd walk about the town, the king of the place. I've been down to Manchester performing. I've been, too, to the Standard Theatre, as well as the Victoria and the Marylebone. People won't believe I really do break the stone on my chest. Some ask what I wear under my dress, though the fact is that if I had anything hard there, it would just about kill me, for it's by yielding to the blow that I save myself. I actually gammoned one chap that the stones were made of small pieces stuck together with paste, and he offered to give me any sum to tell him what the paste was made of. When I'm engaged for a full performance, I do this. All the weights and the stone and the hammer are ranged in front of the stage. Then I come on dressed in silk tights with a spangled trunk. Then I enter at the back of the stage and first do several feats of posturing, such as skipping through my leg or passing it down my back or splits. Then I take a ladder and mount to the top and stand up on it and hold one leg in my hand, shouldering it, and then I give a spring with the other leg and shoot off to the other side of the stage and squash down with both legs open, doing a split. It's a very good trick and always gets around. Then I do a trick with a chair standing on the seat and I take one foot in my hand and make a hoop of the leg, and then hop with one leg through the hoop of the other, and spring over the back and come down in a split on the other side. I never miss this trick, though if the chair happens to be rickety, I may catch the toe, but it doesn't matter much. Then I begin my weight business. I take one half hundred weight and hold it up at arm's length and I also hold it out perpendicularly, and bring it up again, and swing it two or three times round the head, and then throw it up in the air, and catch it four or five times running. Not by the ring, as others do, but in the open hand. The next trick is doing the same thing with both hands instead of one, that is, with two weights at the same time. And then after that, I take up a half hundred by the teeth and shouldering the leg at the same, and in that style, I fall down into the splits. Then I raise myself up gradually till I'm upright again. After I'm upright, I place the weight on my forehead and lay down flat on my back with it, never touching with the hands. I take it off when I'm down and place it in my mouth and walk round the stage like a Greenwich pensioner, with my feet tucked up, like crossing the arms, and only using my knees. Then I tie three together, and hold them in my mouth, and I put one in each hand. Then I stand up with them, and support them. It's an awful weight, and you can't do much exhibiting with them. When I was at Vauxhall, Yarmouth, last year, I hurt my neck very badly in lifting those weights in the mouth. It pulled out the back of my neck, and I was obliged to give over work for months. It forced my head over one shoulder, and then it sunk, as if I'd got a stiff neck. I did nothing to it, and only went to a doctor chap, who made me bathe the neck in hot water, that's all. One of my most curious tricks is what I call the braces trick. It's a thing just like a pair of braces, only instead of a button, there's a half hundred weight at each end, so that there are two behind and two in front. Then I mount on two swinging ropes with a noose at the end, and I stretch out my legs into a split, 
and put a half hundred on each thigh, and take up another in my mouth. You may imagine how heavy the weight is when I tell you that I pulled the roof of a place in once at Chelsea. It was an exhibition then. The tiles and all come down and near smothered me. You must understand that in these tricks I have to put the weights on myself and raise them from the ground, and that makes it so difficult. The next and the best and most difficult trick of all is I have a noose close to the ceiling in which I place one of my ankles, and I have another loose noose with a hook at the end, and I place that on the other ankle. Two half hundreds are placed on this hook, and one in each hand. The moment these weights are put on this ankle, it pulls my legs right apart, so that they form a straight line from the ceiling, like a plumb line, and my body sticks out at the side horizontally, like a T-square sideways. I strike an attitude when I have the other weights in my hand, and then another half hundred is put in my mouth, and I am swung backwards and forwards for about eight or twelve times. It don't hurt the ankle because the sling is padded. At first it pulls you about and gives you a tremendous ricking. After this rope performance, I take a half hundred and swing it round about fifty times. It goes as rapidly as a wheel, and if I was to miss my aim, I should knock my brains out. I have done it seventy times, but that was to take the shine out of an opposition fellow. I always wind up with breaking the stone, and I don't mind how thick it is, so long as it isn't heavy enough to crush me. A common curbstone or a Yorkshire flag is nothing to me, and I've got so accustomed to this trick that once it took thirty blows with a twenty-eight pound sledgehammer to break the stone, and I asked for a cigar and smoked it all the while. I'll tell you another trick I've done, and that's walking on the ceiling. Of course, I daren't do it in the Professor Sands's style, for mine was a dodge. Professor Sands used an air-exhausting boot on the model of a fly's foot, and it was a legitimate performance indeed. He and another man to whom he gave the secret of his boots are the only two who ever did it. The chap that came over here wasn't the real Sands. The fact is well known to the profession that Sands killed himself on his benefit night in America. After walking on the marble slab in the circus, somebody bet him he couldn't do it on any ceiling, and he for a wager went to a town hall and done it, and the ceiling gave way, and he fell and broke his neck. The chap that came over here was Sands' attendant, and he took the name and the boots and came over as Professor Sands. The first who ever walked on the ceiling by a dodge was a man of the name of Herman, a wizard who wound up his entertainment at the City of London by walking on some planks suspended in the air. I was there and at once saw his trick. I knew it was a sleight-of-hand thing. I paid great attention and found him out. I then went to work in this way. I bought two planks about thirteen foot long and an inch thick. In these planks I had small traps about two inches long by one inch wide let into the wood and very nicely fitted so that the cracks could not be seen. The better to hide the cracks I had the wood painted marble and the blue veins arranged on the cracks. These traps were bound on the upper side with iron hooping to strengthen them. Then I made my boots. They were something like Chinese boots with a very thick sole, made on the principle of the bellows of an accordion. These bellows were round, about the size of a cheese plate, and six inches deep. To the sole of the boot I had an iron plate and a square tenter hook riveted in. Then came the performance. There was no net under me, and the planks was suspended about twenty feet from the stage. 
I went up the ladder and inserted the hook on one boot into the first trap. The sucker to the boot hid the hook and made it appear as if I held by suction. The traps were about six inches apart, and that gave me a very small step. The hooks being square ones, tender hooks, I could slip them out easily. It had just the same appearance as Sands, and nobody ever taught me how to do it. I did this feat at the Albion Concert Rooms, just opposite the Effingham Saloon. I had eighteen shillings a week there for doing it. I never did it anywhere else, for it was a bother to carry the planks about with me. I did it for a month, every night, three times. One night I fell down. You see, you can never make sure, for if you swung a little, it worked the hook off. I always had a chap walking along under me to catch me, and he broke my fall, so that I didn't hurt myself. I ran up again and did it a second time without an accident. There was a tremendous applause. I think I should have fallen on my hands if the chap hadn't been there. If the Secretary of State hadn't put down the balloon business, I should have made a deal of money. There is danger, of course, but so there is if you're twenty or thirty feet. They do it now fifty feet high, and that's as bad as if you were two hundred or a mile in the air. The only danger is getting giddy from the height, but those who go up are accustomed to it. I sold the ceiling walking trick to another fellow for two pounds after I had done with it, but he couldn't manage it. He thought he was going to do wonders. He took a half hundred weight along with him, but he swung like a pendulum, and down he come. Why, this walking on the ceiling of mine was very near the same as what Harvey Leach did at the Surrey as the gnome fly. He was a tremendous clever fellow. His upper part of the body was very perfectly made, but his legs was so short they weren't more than eighteen inches long. That's why he walked as much on his hands as his legs. That, what is it? at the Egyptian Hall, killed him. They'd have made a heap of money at it if it hadn't been discovered. He was in a cage and wonderfully got up. He looked awful. A friend of his comes in and goes up to the cage and says, How are you, old fellow? The thing was blown up in a minute. The place was in an uproar. It killed Harvey Leach, for he took it to heart and died. I reckon Astley's is the worst money for any man. If a fellow wants to be finished up, let him go there. It doesn't pay so well as the cheap concerts, unless a man is a very great star, and they must give him his money. There are six men, including myself, who do the strong business. That's all I'm beware of in London or England. Sometimes they change their names and comes out as hers or seniors or messieurs, but they are generally the same fellows. Most of our foreigners in England come out of Tower Street. There was a house of call there for professionals of all nations, but that public is done up now, and they mostly go to the Cooper's Arms now. If a strong man properly understands his business and pays attention to his engagements, his average earnings will be about two pounds ten shillings a week. As it is, they now make less than thirty shillings, but they spend it so readily that it doesn't go so far as a working man's pound. There's plenty of people to ask you, what'll you have? But if you're anything of a man... You're obliged to return the compliment at some time. The swells get hold of you. Perhaps a bottle of wine is called for, and then another. Well, then a fellow must be no good if he doesn't pay for the third when it comes. And the day's money don't run to it, and you're in a hole. End of section 20 Section 21 
of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Street Exhibitors, Part 13. The Street Juggler. The juggler from whom I received the following account was spoken of by his companions and friends as one of the cleverest that ever came out. He was at this time performing in the evening at one of the chief saloons on the other side of the water. He certainly appeared to have been successful enough when he first appeared in the streets, and the way in which he squandered the amount of money he then made is a constant source of misery to him, for he kept exclaiming, in the midst of his narrative, "'Ah, I might have been a gentleman now if I hadn't been the fool I was then.' As a proof of his talents and success, he assured me that, when Ramo Sami first came out, he not only learned how to do all the Indians' tricks, but also did them so dexterously that, when travelling, Sami has often paid him ten shillings not to perform in the same town with him. He was a short man with iron-grey hair, which had been shaved high upon the temples to allow him to assume the Indian costume. The skin of the face was curiously loose and formed deep lines about the chin, whilst in the cheeks there were dimples, or rather hollows, almost as deep as those on a sofa cushion. He had a singular look from his eyebrows and eyes being so black. His hands were small and delicate, and when he took up anything, he did it as if he were lifting the cup with the ball under it. "'I'm a juggler,' he said. But I don't know if that's the right term, for some people call conjurers jugglers, but it's wrong. When I was in Ireland, they called me a manualist, and it was a gentleman wrote the bill out for me. The difference I makes between conjuring and juggling is, one's deceiving to the eye, and the other's pleasing to the eye. Yes, that's it. It's dexterity. I dare say I've been at juggling forty years for I was between fourteen and fifteen when I began, and I'm fifty-six now. I remember Ramo Sami and all the first process of the art. He was the first as ever I knew, and very good indeed. There was no other to oppose him, and he must have been good then. I suppose I'm the oldest juggler alive. My father was a whitesmith and kept a shop in the Waterloo Road, and I ran away from him. There was a man of the name of Humphreys, kept a riding school in the Waterloo Road. There was very few houses there then, only brick fields. Aye, what is the Victoria Theatre now was then a pin factory and a hatter's. It wasn't open for performance then. And I used to go to this riding school and practice tumbling when the horse dung was thrown out, for I was very ambitious to be a tumbler. When I used to go on this here dung heap, Sometimes father would want me to blow the fire or strike for him, and he'd come after me and catch me tumbling, and take off his apron and wallop me with it all the way home. And the leather strings used to hurt, I can tell you. I first went to work at the pin factory, where the Coburg's built now, and dropped tumbling then. Then I went to a hatter's in Oakley Street, and there I took to tumbling again, and used to get practising on the wool packs. They made the hats then out of wool stuff and hair skins and such like, and you couldn't get a hat then under twenty-five shillings. I couldn't get my heart away from tumbling all the time I was there, for it was set on it. I'd even begin tumbling when I went out on errands, doing handspring and starts up. That's laying on your back and throwing yourself up. And round alls. That's throwing yourself backwards onto your hands and back again to your feet and walking on my hands. I never let any of the men see me practice. I had to sweep the warehouse up, and all the wool was there, and I used to have a go to myself in the morning, before they was up. The way I got into my professional career was this. I used to have to go and get the men's beer, for I was kept for that. You see, I had to go to the men's homes to fetch their breakfasts, and the dinners, and teas. I wish I had such a place now. The men gave me a shilling a week, and there was twelve of them when in full work, and the master gave me four shillings sixpence. 
Besides that, they never worked on a Monday, but I was told to fetch their food just the same, so that their wives mightn't know. And I had all their twelve dinners, breakfasts, and so on. I kept about six of the boys there, and anybody might have the victuals that liked, for I've sometimes put them on a post for somebody to find. I was one day going to fetch the men's beer when I meets another boy, and he says, You can't walk on your hands. Can't I? says I, and I puts down the cans, and off I started, and walked on my hands from one end of the street to the other pretty nigh. Mr. Sanders the rider, one of the oldest riders that was, before Ducrow's time, for Ducrow was apprentice of his, and he allowed Sanders thirty shillings a week for all his lifetime, was passing by, and he see me walking on my hands, and he come up to me and says, My boy, where do you belong to? And I answers, My father. And then he says, Do you think he'd let you come along with me? I told him I'd go and ask. And I ran off, but never went to father, you'll understand. And then in a minute or two, I came back and said, Father says yes, I may go when I think's proper. And then Mr. Sanders took me to Locke's Fields, and there was a gig, and he drove me down to Ware in Hertfordshire. You may as well say this here. The circuses at that time wasn't as they are now. They used to call it in the profession moulding, and the public termed it mountebanking. Moulding was making a ring in a field, for there was no booths then, and it comes from digging up the mould to make it soft for the horse's feet. There was no charge for seeing the exhibition, for it was in a field open to the public, but it was worked in this way. There was prizes given away, and the tickets to the lottery were one shilling each, and most of the people bought them, though they weren't obligated to do so. Sometimes the prizes would be a five-pound note, or a silver watch maybe, or a sack of flour, or a pig. They used to take the tickets round in a hat, and everybody saw what they drawed. They was all prizes, perhaps a penny ring, but there was no blanks. It was the last night that paid best. The first and second nights, Sanders would give them a first-rate prize, but when the last night came, then a half-crown article was the highest he'd give away, and that helped to draw up. I've knowed him give four pounds or five pounds away when he'd not taken two pounds. Mr. Sanders put me to tumbling in the ring. I could tumble well before I went with him, for I'd practised on this dung heap and in this hatter's shop. I beat all his apprentices what he had. He didn't give me anything a week, only my keep. But I was glad to run away and be a showman. I was very successful in the ring tumbling, and from that I got to be clever on the stilts and on the slack rope, or, as they call it in the profession, the walting rope. When I was ragged, I used to run home again and get some clothes. I've many a time seen him burst out into tears to see me come home so ragged. Ah, he'd say, where have you been now? Tumbling, I suppose. I'd answer, yes, father. And then he'd say, ah, your tumbling will bring you to the gallows. I'd stop with him till he gave me some fresh clothes, and then I'd bolt again. You see, I liked it. I'd go and do it for nothing. Now I dread it, but it's too late, unfortunately. I ran away from Sanders at last and went back to father. One night I went to the theatre, and there I see Ramo Sami doing his juggling, and in a minute I forgot all about the tumbling and only wanted to do as he did. Directly I got home, I got two of the plates and went into a back room and began practising, making it turn round on top of a stick. I broke nearly all the plates in the house doing this. That is, what I didn't break, I cracked. I broke the entire set of a dozen plates, and yet couldn't do it. When Mother found all her plates cracked, she said, It's that boy! And I had a good hiding. Then I put on my Sunday suit and bolted away again. I always bolted in my best clothes. I then went about tumbling in the public houses till I had got money enough to have a tin plate made with a deep rim. And with this tin plate I learnt it so that I could afterwards do it with a crockery one. 
I kept on my tumbling till I got a set of wooden balls turned, and I struck brass coffin nails all over them, so that they looked like metal when they was up, and I began teaching myself to chuck them. It took a long time learning it, but I was fond of it and determined to do it. I was doing pretty well with my tumbling, making perhaps my three shillings or four shillings a night, so I was pretty well off. Then I got some tin knives made and learnt to throw them, and I bought some iron rings and bound them with red and blue tape to make them look handsome, and I learnt to toss them the same as the balls. I practised balancing pipes too. Every time I went into a public house, I'd take a pipe away, so it didn't cost me anything. I dare say I was a twelve month before I could juggle well. When I could throw the three balls middling tidy, I used to do them on the stilts, and that was more than ever a man attempted in them days. And yet I was only sixteen or seventeen years of age. I must have been summit then, for I went to Oxford Fair, and there I was on my stilts, chucking my balls in the public streets, and a gentleman came up to me and asked me if I'd take an engagement, and I said, yes, if it was a good un, for I was taking money like smoke and he agreed to give me a pound a day during the fair. It was a week fair. I had so much money I didn't know what to do with it. I actually went and bought a silk neckerchief for every day in the week, and flash boots and caps, and everything I could see, for I never had so much money as in them days. The master too made his share out of me, for he took money like dirt. From Oxford I worked my way over to Ireland, I had got my hand into juggling now, but I kept on with my old apparatus, though I bought a new set in Dublin. I used to have a bag and a bit of carpet, and perform in streets. I had an Indian's dress made, with a long horsehair tail down my back, and white bag trousers trimmed with red like a Turk's, tied right round at the ankles, and a flesh-coloured skull cap. My coat was what is called a Turkish fly, in red velvet, cut off like a waistcoat, with a peak before and behind. I was a regular swell, and called myself the Indian Juggler. I used to perform in the barracks twice a day, morning and evening. I used to make a heap of money. I have taken in one pitch more than a pound. I dare say I've taken three pounds a day, and sometimes more indeed. I've saved a wagon and a booth there, a very nice one and the wagon cost me fourteen pounds second-hand. One of Vickery's it was, a wild beast wagon. I dare say I was six months in Dublin doing first-rate. My performances was just the same then as they is now, only I walked on stilts, and they was new then, and did the business. I was the first man ever seed in Ireland, either juggling or on the stilts. I had a drum and pipes, and I used to play them myself. I played any tune, anything, just what I could think of, to draw the crowd together. Then I'd mount the stilts and do what I called a drunken frolic, with a bottle in my hand, tumbling about and pretending to be drunk. Then I'd chuck the balls about, and the knives, and the rings, and twirl the plate. I wound up with the ball, throwing it in the air and catching it in a cup. I didn't do any balancing pipes on my nose, not whilst on the stilts. I used to go out one day on the stilts and one on the ground to do the balancing. I'd balance pipes, straws, peacock's feathers and the twirling plate. It took me a long time learning to catch the ball in the cup. I practised in the fields or streets, anywhere. I began by just throwing the ball a yard or two in the air and then went on gradually. The first I see do the ball was a man of the name of Dusan who came over with Ramosami. It's a very dangerous feat, and even now I'm never safe of it, for the least wind will blow it to the outside and spoil the aim. I broke my nose at derby races. A boy ran across the ring, and the ball, which weighs a quarter of a pound, was coming right on him, and would have fallen on his head and perhaps killed him, and I ran forward to save him, and couldn't take my aim proper, and it fell on my nose and broke it. It bled awfully, and it kept on for near a month. 
There happened to be a doctor looking on, and he came and plastered it up, and then I chucked the ball up again, for I didn't care what I did in them days, and the strain of its coming down made it burst out again. They actually gave me money not to throw the ball up any more. I got near a sovereign in silver, give me from the grand stand for that accident. At Newcastle, I met with another accident with throwing the ball. It came down on my head, and it regularly stunned me, so that I fell down. It swelled up, and every minute got bigger, till I almost thought I had a double head, for it felt so heavy I could scarce hold it up. I was obliged to knock off work for a fortnight. In Ireland, I used to make the people laugh, to throw up raw potatoes, and let them come down on my naked forehead and smash. People give more money when they laugh. No, it never hurt my forehead. It's got hardened, for I never suffered from headaches when I was practising. As you catch the ball in the cup, you are obliged to give, you know, and bend to it, or it would knock the brains out of you pretty well. I never heard of a man killing himself with the ball, and I've only had two accidents. I got married in Ireland, and then I started off with the booth and wagon. And she used to dance, and I'd juggle and balance. We went to the fairs, but it didn't answer, and we lost all, for my wife turned out a very bad sort of woman. She's dead now through drink. I went to the Isle of Man from Ireland. I had practised my wife in the stilts and learnt her how to use them, and we did well there. They never see such a thing in their lives, and we took money like dirt. They christened us the Manx Giants. If my wife had been like my present one, I should be a made gentleman by this time. But she drank away my booth and wagon and horse and all. I saved up about twenty pounds in the Isle of Man, and from there we went to Scotland, and there my wife died through drink. That took away all the money I had saved. We didn't do much in Scotland, only in one particular town, that's Edinburgh, on New Year's Day. We took a good deal of money, two pounds, I think, and we carried coppers about in a stocking with me. I travelled about in England and Wales when I married my second wife. She's a strong woman and lifts seven hundred pounds by the hair of her head. When I got back to London, I hadn't a shilling in my pocket, though my wife was very careful of me. But times got bad and what not. We got a situation at twelve shillings a day and all collections at Stepney Fair, which would sometimes come to a pound and at others thirty shillings, for collections is better than salary any days. That set us up in a little house which we've got now. I'm too old now to go out regularly in the streets. It tires me too much if I have to appear at a penny theatre in the evening. When I do go out in the streets, I carry a mahogany box with me to put my things out in. I've got three sets of things now, knives, balls and cups. In fact, I never was so well off in apparatus as now, and many of them have been given to me as presents by friends as have gained over performing. Knives and balls and all are very handsome. The balls, some a pound and some two pounds weight, and the knives about a pound and a half. When I'm out performing, I get into all the open places as I can. I goes up the commercial road and pitches at the Mile End Gate, or about Tower Hill, or such like. I'm well known in London, and the police knows me so well they very seldom interfere with me. Sometimes they say, That's not allowed, you know, old man. And I say, I shan't be above two or three minutes. And they say, Make haste then. And then I go on with the performance. I think I am the cleverest juggler out. I can do the pagoda, or the canopy as some calls it. That is a thing like a parasol, balanced by the handle, on my nose, and the sides held up by other sticks, and then with a pea shooter I blow away the supports. I also do what is called the birds and bush, which is something of the same, only you knock off the birds with a pea shooter. The birds is only made of cork, but it's very difficult because you have to take your balance again every bird as falls. Besides, you must be careful the birds don't fall in your eyes, or it would take away your sight and spoil the balance. The birds at back 
are hardest to knock off, because you have to bend back, and at the same time mind you don't topple the tree off. These are the only feats we perform in balancing, and the juggling is the same now as ever it was, for there ain't been no improvements on the old style as I ever heard on, and I suppose balls and knives and rings will last for a hundred years to come yet. I and my wife are now engaged at the Temple of Mystery in Old Street Road, and it says on the bills that they are at present exhibiting the following new and interesting talent, and then he calls me the renowned Indian juggler, performing his extraordinary feats with cups, balls, daggers, plates, knives, rings, balancing, and so on and so on. After the juggling, I generally has to do conjuring. I does what they call the pile of mags, that is, putting four halfpence on a boy's cap and making them disappear when I say, Presto, fly! Then there's the empty cups and making taters come under em, or there's bringing a cabbage into an empty hat. There's also making a shilling pass from a gentleman's hand into a nest of boxes, and such like tricks. But it ain't half so hard as juggling, nor anything like the work. I and my missus have five shillings sixpence a night between us, besides a collection among the company, which I reckon, on the average, to be as good as another pound a week, for we made that the last week we performed. I should say there ain't above twenty jugglers in all England. Indeed, I'm sure there ain't, such as goes about pitching in the streets and towns. I know there's only four others besides myself in London, unless some new one has sprung up very lately. You may safely reckon their earnings for the year round at a pound a week, that is, if they stick to juggling. But most of us join some other calling along with juggling, such as the wizard's business, and that helps out the gains. Before this year, I used to go down to the seaside in the summer and perform at the watering places. A chap by the name of Gordon is at Ramsgate now. It pays well on the sands, for in two or three hours, according to the tides, we picks up enough for the day. The Street Conjurer I call myself a wizard as well, but that's only the polite term for conjurer. In fact, I should think that wizard meant an astrologer, and more of a fortune teller. I was fifteen years of age when I first began my professional life. Indeed, I opened with Gentleman Cook at the Rotunda in Blackfriars Road, and there I did Jeremiah Stitchum to his Billy Button. My father held a very excellent situation in the customs, and lived at his ease in very affluent circumstances. His library alone was worth two hundred pounds. I was only ten years of age when my father died. He was a very gay man and spent his income to the last penny. He was a very gay man, very gay. After my mother was left a widow, the library was swept off for a year's rent. I was too young to understand its value, and my mother was in too much grief to pay attention to her affairs. Another six months' rent sold up the furniture. We took a small apartment close in the neighbourhood. My mother had no means, and we were left to shift for ourselves. I was a good boy, and determined to get something to do. The first day I went out, I got a situation at four shillings a week, to mind the boots outside a bootmaker's shop in Newington Causeway. The very first week I was there, I was discharged, for I fell asleep on my stool at the door, and a boy stole a pair of boots. From there I went to a baker's, and had to carry out the bread, and for four years I got different employments, as errand boy or anything. For many years the mall opposite Bedlam was filled with nothing else but shows and show people. All the caravans and swing boats and what not used to assemble there till the next fair was on. They didn't perform there, it was only their resting place. My mother was living close by, and every opportunity I had, I used to associate with the boys belonging to the shows, and then I'd see them practising their tumbling and tricks. I was so fond of this that I got practising with these boys. I'd go and paint my face as clown, and although dressed in my ordinary clothes, I'd go and tumble with the rest of the lads until I could do it as well as they could. 
I did it for devilment, that's what I call it, and that it was which first made me think of being a professional. From there I heard of a situation to sell oranges, biscuits and ginger beer at the Surrey Theatre. It was under Ellison's management. I sold the porter up in the gallery, and I had three halfpence out of every shilling, and I could make one shilling and sixpence a night. But the way I used to do it at the time was this. I went to fetch the beer, and then I'd get half a gallon of table beer, and mix it with the porter. And I tell you, I've made such a thing as fifteen shillings of a boxing night. I alone could sell five gallons of a night. But then their pints at that time was tin measures, and little more than half a pint. Besides, I'd froth it up. It was threepence a pint, and a wonderful profit it must have been. From there I got behind the scenes as supernumerary, at the time Nelson Lee was manager of the supers. At this time the Rotunda in the Blackfriars Road was an hotel kept by a Mr. Ford. Mr. Cook rented certain portions of the building and went to a wonderful expense building a circus there. The history of the Rotunda is that at one time it was a museum, and the lecture hall is there to the present day. It's a beautiful building, and the pillars are said to be very valuable and made of rice. It's all let to one party, a Frenchman, but he keeps the lecture hall closed. When Cook took the Rotunda, I asked him for an engagement, and he complied. I was mad for acting. I met with great success as Jeremiah Stitchum, and the first week he gave me one pound. Cook didn't make a good thing of it. Nobody could get their money, and the circus was closed. Then a Mr. Edwards took it. He was an optician, and opened it as a penny exhibition, with a magic lantern and a conjurer. Now comes how I became a conjurer. I couldn't tear myself away from the rotunda, I went there and hovered about the door day and night. I wanted to get a situation there. He knew me when I was in the circus, and he asked me what I was a doing of. I said, nothing, sir. Then he offered to give me one of the doorkeeper's places, from ten in the morning till eleven at night, for three shillings a day, and I took it. One day the conjurer that was there didn't come, but they opened the doors just the same, and there was an immense quantity of people waiting there. They couldn't do nothing without the conjurer. He always left his apparatus there of a night in a bag. Well, this Edwards, knowing that I could do a few tricks, he came up to me and asks whether I knew where the wizard lived. I didn't, and Edward says, What am I to do? I shall have to return this money. I shall go mad. I said, I could do a few tricks, and he says, well, go and do it. The people was making a row, stamping and calling out. Now then, is this here wizard coming? When I went in, I gave great satisfaction. I went and did all the tricks, just as the other had done it. At that time it was the custom to say after each performance, Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to inform you that I get no salary here and only have to rely upon your generosity for a collection. When the plate went round, I got one shilling and sixpence. Hello, I said to myself, is this the situation? Then I sold some penny books, explaining how the tricks was done, and I got sixpence more. That was two shillings. I had four shillings a day besides, and they would have sometimes twenty houses of a day, and I have seen thirty. The houses was not always very good. Sometimes we'd perform to seven or to twenty. It all told up. It was at night we did the principal work, crowded upwards of two hundred there. We weren't in the circus, but in the rotunda. I'd make fifteen shillings a night then. I got a permanent engagement then. I made too much money. I went and bought a pack of cards and card boxes and a pea caddy for passing peas from a handkerchief to a vase and linking rings and some tape. That, with tying knots in a silk handkerchief, concluded the whole of my performances. In fact, it was all I knew. My talking helped me immensely, for I could patter well to them, and the other wizard couldn't. I left the rotunda in consequence of the party having other novelties. He had Ambrosini, who done the sticks and string balls. 
but I was there three or four years, and that's a long time to be at one place. Then I joined a street performer. He used to do the fireproof business, such as eating the link and the burning tow, and so on. Then I manufactured a portable table. It folded up, and I could carry it under my arm. It was as large as an ordinary dressing table. We went in equal shares. I was dressed with ballet shirt and braces, with spangled tights and fleshings. We pulled our coats off when we begun to perform. All the tricks we carried in a bag. The first pitch we made was near Bond Street. He began with his part of the performance whilst I was dressing up the table. It was covered with black velvet with fringe and the apparatus ranged on it. After him, I began my performance and he went round for the knobbings. I did card tricks such as the sauter le coup with the little finger. It's dividing the pack in half and then bringing the bottom half to the top. And then, if there's a doubt, you can convey the top card to the bottom again. Or if there's any doubt, you can bring the pack to its original position. It was Lord de Roux's trick. He won heaps of money at it. He had pricked cards. You see, if you prick a card at the corner, card players skin their finger at the end so as to make it sensitive, and they can tell a pricked card in a moment. Besides sauter le coup, I used to do innumerable others, such as telling a named card by throwing a pack in the air and catching the card on a sword point. Then there was telling people's thoughts by the cards. All card tricks are feats of great dexterity and quickness of hand. I never used a false pack of cards. There are some made for amateurs, but professionals never use trick cards. The greatest art is what is termed forcing that is, making a party take the card you wish him to, and let him try ever so well, he will have it, though he's not conscious of it. Another feat of dexterity is slipping the card, that is, slipping it from top, bottom or centre, or placing one or two cards from the top. If you're playing a game at all fours, and you know the ace of clubs is at the bottom, you can slip it one from the top so that you know your partner opposite has it. These are the only two principal things in card tricks, and if you can do them dexteriously, you can do a great part of a wizard's art. Sauter le coup is the principal thing, and it's done by placing the middle finger in the centre of the pack, and then with the right hand working the change. I can do it with one hand. We did well with pitching in the streets. We take ten shillings off a morning and then go out in the afternoon again, and take perhaps fifteen shillings of nobbings. The footmen were our best customers in the morning, for they had leisure then. We usually went to the squares and such parts at the West End. This was twenty years ago, and it isn't anything like so good now, in consequence of my partner dying of consumption, brought on, I think, by fire-eating, for he was a very steady young fellow, and not at all given to drink. I was for two years in the streets with the fire-eating, and we made, I should say, such a thing as fifty shillings a week each. Then, you must remember, we could have made more, if we had liked. For some mornings, if we had had a good day before, we wouldn't go out if it was raining, or we had been up late. I next got a situation and went to a waxworks to do conjuring. It was a penny exhibition in the new cut, Lambeth. I had four shillings a day and nobbings, a collection, and what with selling my books, it came to ten shillings a day, for we had never less than ten, and often twenty, performances a day. They had the first dissecting figure there, a Samson, and they took off the cranium and showed the brains, and also the stomach, and showed the intestines. It was the first ever shown in this country, and the maker of it had, so they say, a pension, in one hundred pounds a year for having composed it. He was an Italian. We were burnt down at Birmingham, and I lost all my rattle traps. However, the inhabitants made up a subscription, which amply repaid me for my loss, and I then came to London, hearing that the Epsom races was on at the time, which I wouldn't have missed Epsom races, not at that time, not for any amount of money, 
for it was always good to one as three pounds, and I have had as much as seven pounds from one carriage alone. It was Lord Chesterfield's, and each gentleman in it gave us a sov. I went down with three acrobats to Epsom, but they were dealing unfair with me, and there was something that I didn't like going on. I quarrelled with them and joined with another conjurer, and it was on this very occasion we got the seven pounds from one carriage. We both varied in our entertainments, because when I had done my performance, he made a collection, and when he had done, I got the nobbings. We went to Lord Chesterfield's carriage on the hill, and there I did the sovereign trick. My lord, will you oblige me with the temporary loan of a sovereign? Yes, old fellow, what are you going to do with it? I then did passing the sovereign, he having marked it first, and then, though he held it tightly, I changed it for a farthing. I did this for Lord Waterford and Lord Waldegrave, and the whole of them in the carriage. I always said, Now, my lord, are you sure you hold it? Yes, old fellow. Now, my lord, if I was to take the sovereign away from you, without your knowing it, wouldn't you say I was perfectly welcome to it? He'd say, Yes, old fellow, go on. Then, when he opened the handkerchief, he had a farthing and all of them made me a present of the sovereign I had performed with. Then we went to the grand stand, and then, after our performance, they'd throw us halfpence from above. We had our table nicely fitted up. We wouldn't take halfpence. We would collect up the coppers, perhaps five or six shillings worth, and then we'd throw the great handful among the boys. A bit of silver, your honours, if you please. Then sixpence would come, and then a shilling, and in ten minutes we would have a sovereign. We must have earned our six pounds each that Epsom day, but then our expenses were heavy, for we paid three shillings a night for our lodging alone. It was about this time that I took to busking. I never went into tap rooms, only into parlours, because one parlour would be as good as a dozen tap rooms and two good parlours a night I was quite satisfied with. My general method was this. If I saw a good company in the parlour, I could tell in a moment whether they were likely to suit me. If they were conversing on politics, it was no good. You might as well attempt to fly. I have many a time gone into a parlour and called for my half-quartern of gin and little drop of cold water, and then, when I began my performances, it has been, no, no, we don't want anything of that kind. And there has been my half hour thrown away. The company I like best are jolly looking men who are sitting silently smoking or reading the paper. I always got the privilege of performing by behaving with civility to my patrons. Some conjurers, when the company ain't agreeable, will say, but I will perform. And then comes a quarrel and the room is in future forbid to that man. But I, if they objected, always said, Very well, gentlemen, I'm much obliged to you all the same. Perhaps another time. Bad tonight, better next night. Then when I came again, some would say, I didn't give you anything the other night, did I? Well, here's a fortney bit, and so on. When I went into a parlour, I usually performed with a big dice, three inches square, I used to go and call for a small drop of gin and water and put this dice on the seat beside me, as a bit of a draw. Directly I put it down, everybody was looking at it. Then I'd get into conversation with the party next to me and he'd be sure to say, What the juice is that? I'd tell him it was a musical box and he'd be safe to say, Well, I should like to hear it very much. Then I'd offer to perform, if agreeable, to the company. Often the party would offer to name it to the company, and he'd call to the other side of the room, for they all know each other in these parlours. I say, Mr. So-and-so, have you any objection to this gentleman showing us a little amusement? And they are, all of them, safe to say, Not in the least. I'm perfectly agreeable, if others are so. And then I'd begin. I'd pull out my cards and card boxes and the bonus genius or the wooden doll and then I'd spread a nice clean cloth, which I always carried with me, on the table and then I'd go to work. I worked the dice 
by placing it on the top of a hat, and with a penknife pretending to make an incision in the crown to let the solid block pass through. It is done by having a tin covering to the solid dice, and the art consists in getting the solid block into the hat without being seen. That's the whole of the trick. I begin by striking the block to show it is solid. Then I place two hats, one on the other, brim to brim. Then I slip the solid dice into the under hat and place the tin covering on the crown of the upper one. Then I ask for a knife and pretend to cut the hat crown the size of the tin can on the top, making a noise by dragging my nail along the hat, which closely resembles cutting with a knife. I've often heard people say, None of that! thinking I was cutting their hat. Then I say, Now, gentlemen, if I can pass this dice through the crown into the hat beneath, you'll say it's a very clever deception, because all conjurers acknowledge that they deceive. Indeed, I always say when I perform in parlours, If you can detect me and my deceptions, I shall be very much obliged to you by naming it, for it will make me more careful. But if you can't, the more credit to me. Then I place another tin box over the imitation dice. It fits closely. I say, presto, quick, be gone, and clap my hands three times, and then lift up the tin cases, which are both coloured black inside, and tumble the wooden dice out of the under hat. You see, the whole art consists in passing the solid block unseen into the hat. The old method of giving the order for the things to pass was this. Albri kira muma tosha kokus ko shiver de freak from the margin under the crippling hook. And that's a language. End of section 21